Section 1 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chufi Galeazzi. The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. Chapter 1. The Origin of the Lincoln Family. The Lincolns in Kentucky. Birth of Abraham Lincoln. Between the years 1635 and 1645, there came to the town of Hingham, Massachusetts, from the west of England, eight men named Lincoln. Three of these, Samuel, Daniel, and Thomas, were brothers. Their relationship, if any, to the other Lincolns who came over from the same part of England at about the same time is not clear. Two of these men, Daniel and Thomas, died without heirs, but Samuel left a large family, including four sons. Among the descendants of Samuel Lincoln's sons were many good citizens and prominent public officers. One was a member of the Boston Tea Party, and served as a captain of artillery in the War of the Revolution. Three served on the brig Hazard during the Revolution. Levi Lincoln, a great-great-grandson of Samuel, born in Hingham in 1749 and graduated from Harvard, was one of the Minutemen at Cambridge immediately after the Battle of Lexington, a delegate to the convention in Cambridge for framing a state constitution, and in 1781 was elected to the Continental Congress, but declined to serve. He was a member of the House of Representatives and of the Senate of Massachusetts, and was appointed Attorney General of the United States by Jefferson. For a few months preceding the arrival of Madison, he was Secretary of State, and in 1807 he was elected Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. In 1811 he was appointed Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court by President Madison, an office which he declined. From the close of the Revolutionary War, he was considered the head of the Massachusetts Bar. His eldest son, Levi Lincoln, born in 1782, had also an honorable career. He was a Harvard graduate, became governor of the state of Massachusetts, and held other important public offices. He received the degree of LLD from both Williams College and Harvard College. Another son of Levi Lincoln, Enoch Lincoln, served in Congress from 1818 to 1826. He became governor of Maine in 1827, holding the position until his death in 1829. Enoch Lincoln was a writer of more than ordinary ability. The fourth son of Samuel Lincoln was called Mordecai. Mordecai was a rich blacksmith, as an ironworker was called in those days, and the proprietor of numerous ironworks, sawmills, and gristmills, which, with a goodly amount of money, he distributed at his death among his children and grandchildren. Two of his children, Mordecai and Abraham, did not remain in Massachusetts, but removed to New Jersey, and thence to Pennsylvania, where both became rich, and dying left fine estates to their children. Their descendants in Pennsylvania have continued to this day to be well-to-do people, some of them having taken prominent positions in public affairs. Abraham Lincoln of Berks County, who was born in 1736 and died in 1806, filled many public offices, being a member of the General Assembly of Pennsylvania, of the State Convention of 1787, and of the State Constitutional Convention in 1790. One of the sons of this second Mordecai, John, received from his father three hundred acres of land lying in the Jerseys. But evidently he did not care to cultivate his inheritance, for about 1758 he removed to Virginia. Virginia John, as this member of the family was called, had five sons, one of whom, Jacob, entered the Revolutionary Army and served as a lieutenant at Yorktown. The third son was named Abraham, and to him his father conveyed, in 1773, a tract of 210 acres of land in what is now Rockingham County, Virginia. But though Abraham Lincoln prospered and added to these acres, he was not satisfied to remain many years in Virginia. It was not strange. The farm on which he lived lay close to the track of one of the earliest of those wonderful western migrations which, from time to time, have taken place in this country. Soon after John Lincoln came into Virginia, vague rumors began to be circulated there of a rich western land called Kentucky. 
these rumors rapidly developed into facts as journeys were made into the new land by john finley daniel boone and other adventure-loving men and settlers began to move thither from pennsylvania virginia and north carolina there were but two roads by which kentucky could be reached then the national highway from philadelphia to pittsburgh and thence by the ohio and the highway which ran from philadelphia southwestward through the virginia valley to cumberland gap and thence by a trail called the wilderness road northwest to the ohio at louisville the latter road was considered less dangerous and more practical than the former and by it the greater part of the emigrants journeyed now this road lay through rockingham county abraham lincoln was thus directly under the influence of a moving procession of restless seekers after new lands and unknown goods the spell came upon him and selling two hundred and forty acres of land in rockingham county for five thousand pounds of the current money of virginia a sum worth at that time not more than one hundred and twenty five pounds sterling he joined a party of travellers to the wilderness returning a few months later he moved his whole family consisting of a wife and five children into kentucky abraham lincoln was ambitious to become a landed proprietor in the new country and he entered a generous amount of land four hundred acres on long run in jefferson county eight hundred acres on green river near the green river lick five hundred acres in campbell county he settled near the first tract where he undertook to clear a farm it was a dangerous task for the indians were still troublesome and the settlers for protection were forced to live in or near forts or stations in seventeen eighty four when john filson published his history of kentucky though there was a population of thirty thousand in the territory there were but eighteen houses outside of the stations of these stations or stockades there were but fifty-two according to the tradition in the lincoln family abraham lincoln lived at hughes station on floyd creek in jefferson county all went well with him and his family until seventeen eighty eight then one day while he and his three sons were at work in their clearing an unexpected indian shot killed the father his death was a terrible blow to the family the large tracts of land which he had entered were still uncleared and his personal property was necessarily small the difficulty of reaching the country at that date as well as its wild condition made it impracticable for even a wealthy pioneer to own more stock or household furniture than was absolutely essential abraham lincoln was probably as well provided with personal property as most of his neighbors the inventory of his estate now owned by r t durrett l l d of louisville kentucky was returned by the appraisers on march tenth seventeen eighty nine it gives a clearer idea of the condition in which he left his wife and children than any description could do one sorrel horse eight pounds one black horse nine pounds ten shillings one red cow and calf four pounds ten shillings one brindle cow and calf four pounds ten shillings one red cow and calf five pounds one brindle bull yearling one pound one brindle heifer yearling one pound bar spear plough and tackling two pounds five shillings three weeding hoes seven pounds six shillings flax wheel six shillings pair smoothing irons fifteen shillings one dozen pewter plates one pound ten shillings two pewter dishes seventeen shillings six pence dutch oven and cule weighing fifteen pounds fifteen shillings small iron kettle and cule weighing twelve pounds twelve shillings tool adds ten shillings hand saw five shillings one inch auger six shillings three quarter auger four shillings six pence half inch auger three shillings drawing knife three shillings currying knife ten shillings courier's knife and barking iron six shillings old smooth bar gun ten shillings rifle gun fifty five shillings rifle gun three pounds ten shillings three pot trammels fourteen shillings one feather bed and furniture five pounds ten shillings ditto eight pounds five shillings 
one bed and turkey feathers and furniture one pound ten shillings steaking iron one shilling six pence candlestick one shilling six pence one axe nine shillings total sixty eight pounds sixteen shillings six pence soon after the death of abraham lincoln his widow moved from jefferson county to washington county here the eldest son mordecai who inherited nearly all of the large estate became a well-to-do and popular citizen the deed book of washington county contains a number of records of lands bought and sold by him at one time he was sheriff of his county and according to a tradition of his descendants a member of the kentucky legislature his name is not to be found however in the fullest collection of journals of the kentucky legislature which exists that of dr r t durrett of louisville kentucky mordecai lincoln is remembered especially for his sporting tastes his bitter hatred of the indians and his ability as a story-teller he remained in kentucky until late in life when he removed to hancock county illinois of josiah the second son we know very little more than the records show that he owned and sold land he left kentucky when a young man to settle on the blue river in harrison county indiana and there he died the two daughters married into well-known kentucky families the elder mary marrying ralph croom the younger nancy william broomfeld the death of abraham lincoln was saddest for the youngest of the children a lad of ten years at the time named thomas for it turned him adrift to become a wandering laboring boy before he had learned even to read thomas seems not to have inherited any of the father's estate and from the first to have been obliged to shift for himself for several years he supported himself by rough farm work of all kinds learning in the meantime the trade of carpenter and cabinet maker according to one of his acquaintances tom had the best set of tools in what was then and now washington county and was a good carpenter for those days when a cabin was built mainly with the axe and not a nail or bolt hinge in it only leathers and pins to the door and no glass although a skilled craftsman for his day he never became a thrifty or ambitious man he would work energetically enough when a job was brought to him but he would never seek a job but if thomas lincoln plied his trade spasmodically he shared the pioneer's love for land for when but twenty-five years old and still without the responsibility of a family he bought a farm in hardin county kentucky this fact is of importance proving as it does that thomas lincoln was not the altogether shiftless man he has been pictured certainly he must have been above the grade of the ordinary country boy to have had the energy and ambition to learn a trade and secure a farm through his own efforts by the time he was twenty-five he was illiterate never doing more in the way of writing than to bunglingly write his own name nevertheless he had the reputation in the country of being good-natured and obliging and possessing what his neighbors called good strong horse sense although he was a very quiet sort of a man he was known to be determined in his opinions and quite competent to defend his rights by force if they were too flagrantly violated he was a moral man and in the crude way of the pioneer religious in eighteen o six thomas lincoln married the early history of his wife nancy hanks has been until recently obscured by contradictory traditions the compilation of the genealogy of the hanks family in america which has been completed by mrs caroline hanks hitchcock though not yet printed has fortunately cleared up the mystery of her birth according to the records which mrs hitchcock has gathered and a brief summary of which she has published in a valuable little volume called nancy hanks the family to which thomas lincoln's wife belonged first came to this country in sixteen ninety nine and settled in plymouth massachusetts this early settler benjamin hanks had eleven children one of whom william went to virginia settling near the mouth of the rappahannock river william hanks had five sons four of whom about the middle of the eighteenth century moved to amelia county virginia where according to old deeds unearthed by mrs hitchcock they owned nearly a thousand acres of land 
Joseph Hanks, the youngest of these sons, married Nancy Shipley. This Miss Shipley was a daughter of Robert and Rachel Shipley, of Lurenburg County, Virginia, and a sister of Mary Shipley, who married Abraham Lincoln of Rockingham County, and who was the mother of Thomas Lincoln. About 1789, Joseph Hanks and a large number of his relatives in Amelia County moved into Kentucky, where he settled near what is now Elizabethtown. He remained here until his death in 1793. Joseph Hanks' will may still be seen in the county records of Bardstown. He leaves to each of his sons a horse, to each of his daughters a heifer yearling. Though these bequests, as well as the whole estate of 150 acres of land, was to be the property of his wife during her life, when it was to be divided equally among all the children. Soon after Joseph Hanks' death, his wife died, and the family was scattered. The youngest of the eight children left fatherless and motherless by the death of Joseph Hanks and his wife was a little girl called Nancy. She was but nine years old at the time, and a home was found for her with her aunt, Lucy Shipley, wife of Richard Berry, who had a farm in Washington County near Springfield. Nancy had a large number of relatives near there, all of whom had come from Virginia with her father. The little girl grew up into a sweet-tempered and beautiful woman, whom tradition paints not only as the center of all the country merrymaking, but as a famous spinner and housewife. It was probably at the house of Richard Berry that Thomas Lincoln met Nancy Hanks, for he doubtless spent more or less time nearby with his oldest brother, Mordecai Lincoln, who was a resident of Washington County and a friend and neighbor of the Berries. He may have seen her, too, at the home of her brother, Joseph Hanks, in Elizabethtown. This Joseph Hanks was a carpenter, and had inherited the old home of the family, and it was with him that Thomas Lincoln learned his trade. At all events, the two cousins became engaged, and on June 10, 1806, their marriage bond was issued according to the law of the time. Two days later, according to the marriage returns of the Reverend Jesse Head, they were married a fact duly attested also by the marriage certificate made out by the officiating minister. The marriage took place at the home of Richard Berry, near Beachland, in Washington County, Kentucky. It was celebrated in the boisterous style of one hundred years ago, and was followed by an infare given by the bride's guardian. To this celebration came all the neighbors, and, according to an entertaining Kentucky centenarian, Dr. Christopher Columbus Graham, even those who happened in the neighborhood were made welcome. He tells how he heard of the wedding while out hunting for roots, and went just to get a good supper. I saw Nancy Hanks Lincoln at her wedding, continues Mr. Graham, a fresh-looking girl, I should say over twenty. I was at the infair, too, given by John H. Parrott, her guardian, and only girls with money had guardians appointed by the court. We had bear meat, venison, wild turkey and ducks, eggs, wild and tame, so common that you could buy them at two bits a bushel, maple sugar swung on a string to bite off for coffee or whiskey, syrup in big gourds, peach and honey, a sheep that the two families barbecued whole over coals of wood burned in a pit and covered with green boughs to keep the juice in, and a race for the whiskey bottle. After his marriage, Thomas Lincoln settled in Elizabethtown. His home was a log cabin, but at that date few people in the state had anything else. Kentucky had been in the Union only fourteen years. When admitted, the few brick structures within its boundaries were easily counted, and there were only log schoolhouses and churches. Fourteen years had brought great improvements, but the majority of the population still lived in log cabins, so that the home of Thomas Lincoln was as good as most of his neighbors. Little is known of his position in Elizabethtown, though we have proof that he had credit in the community, for the descendants of two of the early storekeepers still remember seeing on their grandfather's account books sundry items charged to T. Lincoln. Tools and groceries were the chief purchases he made, though on one of the ledgers a pair of silk suspenders worth $1.50 was entered. He not only enjoyed a certain credit with the people of Elizabethtown, he was sufficiently respected by the public authorities to be appointed in 1816 a road surveyor, or, as the office is known in some localities, supervisor. 
it was not to be sure a position of great importance but it proved that he was considered fit to oversee a body of men at a task of considerable value to the community indeed all of the documents mentioning thomas lincoln which have been discovered show him to have had a much better position in hardin county than he has been credited with it was at elizabethtown that the first child of the lincolns a daughter was born soon after this event thomas lincoln decided to combine farming with his trade and moved to the farm he had bought in eighteen o three on the big south fork of nolan creek in hardin county now larue county three miles from hodgensville and about fourteen miles from elizabethtown here he was living when on february twelfth eighteen o nine his second child a boy was born the little newcomer was called abraham after his grandfather a name which had persisted through many preceding generations in both the lincoln and hanks families the home into which the child came was the ordinary one of the poorer western pioneer a one-roomed cabin with a huge outside chimney a single window and a rude door the description of its squalor and wretchedness which are so familiar have been overdrawn dr graham than whom there is no better authority on the life of that day and who knew thomas lincoln well declares energetically that it is all stuff about tom lincoln keeping his wife in an open shed in a winter the lincolns had a cow and calf milk and butter a good feather bed for i have slept on it they had home-woven kiverlids big and little pots a loom and wheel tom lincoln was a man and took care of his wife the lincoln home was undoubtedly rude and in many ways uncomfortable but it sheltered a happy family and its poverty affected the new child but little he grew to be robust and active and soon learned how endless are the delights and interests the country offers to a child he had several companions there was his sister nancy or sarah both names are given her two years his senior there was a cousin of his mother's ten years older dennis friend commonly called dennis hanks an active and ingenious leader in sports and mischief and there were the neighbors boys one of the latter austin gollaher lived to be over ninety years of age and to his death related with pride how he played with young lincoln in the shavings of his father's carpenter's shop hunted coons and ran the woods with him and once even saved his life yes mr gollaher was accustomed to say the story that i once saved abraham lincoln's life is true he and i had been going to school together for a year or more and had become greatly attached to each other then school disbanded on account of there being so few scholars and we did not see each other much for a long while one sunday my mother visited the lincolns and i was taken along abe and i played around all day finally we concluded to cross the creek to hunt for some partridges young lincoln had seen the day before the creek was swollen by a recent rain and in crossing on the narrow footlog abe fell in neither of us could swim i got a long pole and held it out to abe who grabbed it then i pulled him ashore he was almost dead and i was badly scared i rolled and pounded him in good earnest then i got him by the arms and shook him the water meanwhile pouring out of his mouth by this means i succeeded in bringing him to and he was soon all right then a new difficulty confronted us if our mothers discovered our wet clothes they would whip us this we dreaded from experience and determined to avoid it was june the sun was very warm and we soon dried our clothing by spreading it on the rocks about us we promised never to tell the story and i never did until after lincoln's tragic end when the little boy was about four years old the first real excitement of his life occurred his father moved from the farm on nolan creek to another some fifteen miles northeast on knob creek and here the child began to go to school at that day the schools in the west were usually accidental depending upon the coming of some poor and ambitious young man who was willing to teach a few terms while he looked for an opening to something better the terms were irregular their length being decided by the time the settlers felt able to board the master and pay his small salary the chief qualifications for a schoolmaster seemed to have been enough strength to keep the big boys in order 
the one high authority affirms that pluck went for a heap sight more in sinew with boys many of the itinerant masters were catholics strolling irishmen from the colony in tennessee or french priests from kaskaskia lincoln's first teacher zachariah riney was a catholic of his second teacher caleb hazel we know even less than of riney mr gollaher says that abraham lincoln in those days when he was his schoolmate was an unusually bright boy at school and made splendid progress in his studies indeed he learned faster than any of his schoolmates though so young he studied very hard he would get spicewood bushes hack them up on a log and burn them two or three together for the purpose of giving light by which he might pursue his studies probably the boy's mother had something to do with the spicewood illuminations tradition has it that mrs lincoln took great pains to teach her children what she knew and that at her knee they heard all the bible lore fairy tales and country legends that she had been able to gather in her poor life besides the a b c schools as lincoln called them the only other medium of education in the country districts of kentucky in those days was preaching itinerants like the schoolmasters the preachers of whatever denomination were generally uncouth and illiterate the code of morals they taught was mainly a healthy one and they no doubt did much to keep the consciences of the pioneers awake it is difficult to believe that they ever did much for the moral training of young lincoln though he certainly got his first notion of public speaking from them and for years in his boyhood one of his chief delights was to gather his playmates about him and preach and thump until he had his auditors frightened or in tears as soon as the child was strong enough to follow his father into the fields he was put to work at simple tasks bringing tools carrying water picking berries dropping seeds he learned to know his father's farm from line to line and years after when president of the united states he recalled in a conversation at the white house in the presence of dr j j wright of emporia kansas the arrangement of the fields and an incident of his own childish experience as a farmer's son mr president one of his visitors had asked how would you like when the war is over to visit your old home in kentucky i would like it very much mr lincoln replied i remember that old home very well our farm was composed of three fields it lay in the valley surrounded by high hills and deep gorges sometimes when there came a big rain in the hills the water would come down through the gorges and spread all over the farm the last thing that i remember of doing there was one saturday afternoon the other boys planted the corn in what we called the big field it contained seven acres and i dropped the pumpkin seed i dropped two seeds every other hill and every other row the next sunday morning there came a big rain in the hills it did not rain a drop in the valley but the water coming down through the gorges washed ground corn pumpkin seeds and all clear off the field end of section one Section two of the Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume One, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two: The Lincolns leave Kentucky for Southern Indiana. Conditions of life in their new home. In eighteen sixteen, a great event happened to the little boy. His father emigrated from Knob Creek to Indiana. This removal was partly on account of slavery, but chiefly on account of the difficulty in land titles in Kentucky, says his son. It was due as well, no doubt, to the fascination which an unknown country has always had for the adventurous, and to that restless pioneer spirit which drives even men of sober judgment continually towards the frontier, in search of a place where the conflict with nature is less severe some spot farther on to which a friend or a neighbor has proceeded and from which he sends back glowing reports it may be that thomas lincoln was tempted into indiana by the reports of his brother joseph who had settled on the big blue river in that state at all events in the fall of eighteen sixteen he started with wife and children and household stores to journey by horseback and by wagon from knob creek to a farm selected on a previous trip he had made 
this farm located near little pigeon creek about fifteen miles north of the ohio river and a mile and a half east of gentryville spencer county was in a forest so dense that the road for the travelers had to be hewed out as they went to a boy of seven years free from all responsibility and too vigorous to feel its hardships such a journey must have been a long delight and wonder life suddenly ceased its routine and every day brought forth new scenes and adventures little abraham saw forests greater than he had ever dreamed of peopled by strange birds and beasts and he crossed a river so wide that it must have seemed to him like the sea to thomas and nancy lincoln the journey was probably a hard and sad one but to the children beside them it was a wonderful journey into the unknown on arriving at the new farm an axe was put into the boy's hands and he was set to work to aid in clearing a field for corn and to help build the half-face camp which for a year was the home of the lincolns there were few more primitive homes in the wilderness of indiana in eighteen sixteen than this of young lincoln and there were few families even in that day who were forced to practice more makeshifts to get a living the cabin which took the place of the half-face camp had but one room with a loft above for a long time there was no window door or floor not even the traditional deerskin hung before the exit there was no oiled paper over the opening for light there was no puncheon covering on the ground the furniture was of their own manufacture the table and chairs were of the rudest sort, rough slabs of wood in which holes were bored and legs fitted in. Their bedstead, or rather bed frame, was made of poles held up by two outer posts, and the ends made firm by inserting the poles in auger holes that had been bored in a log which was a part of the wall of the cabin. Skins were its chief covering. Little Abraham's bed was even more primitive he slept on a heap of dry leaves in the corner of the loft to which he mounted by means of pegs driven into the wall their food if coarse was usually abundant the chief difficulty in supplying the larder was to secure any variety of game there was plenty deer bear pheasants wild turkeys ducks birds of all kinds there were fish in the streams and wild fruits of many kinds in the woods in the summer and these were dried for winter use but the difficulty of raising and milling corn and wheat was very great indeed in many places in the west the first flour cake was an historical event corn dodger was the everyday bread of the lincoln household the wheat cake being a dainty reserved for sunday mornings potatoes were the only vegetable raised in any quantity and there were times in the lincoln family when they were the only food on the table a fact proved to posterity by the oft-quoted remark of abraham to his father after the latter had asked a blessing over a dish of roasted potatoes that they were mighty poor blessings not only were they all the lincolns had for dinner sometimes one of their neighbors tells of calling there when raw potatoes pared and washed were passed around instead of apples or other fruit they even served as a kind of pioneer chaufrette being baked and given to the children to carry in their hands as they started to school or on distant errands in winter time the food was prepared in the rudest way for the supply of both groceries and cooking utensils was limited the former were frequently wanting entirely and as for the latter the most important item was the dutch oven an indispensable article in the primitive kitchen outfit was the gritter it was made by flattening out an old piece of tin punching it full of holes and nailing it on a board upon this all sorts of things were grated even ears of corn in which slow way enough meal was sometimes secured for bread old tin was used for many other contrivances besides the gritter and every scrap was carefully saved most of the dishes were of pewter the spoons iron the knives and forks horn-handled the Lincolns, of course, made their own soap and candles, and if they had cotton or wool to wear, they literally had to grow it. It is probable that young Abraham Lincoln wore little cotton or linsey woolsey. His trousers were of roughly tanned deerskin, his foot covering a homemade moccasin, his cap a coonskin. It was only the material for his blouse or shirt that was woven at home. 
if this costume had some obvious disadvantages it was not to be despised so good an authority as governor reynolds says of one of its articles the linsey woolsey shirt it was an excellent garment i have never felt so happy and healthy since i put it off these pretty pinching times as abraham lincoln once described his early days in indiana lasted until eighteen nineteen the year before nancy lincoln had died and for many months no more forlorn place could be conceived than this pioneer home bereft of its guiding spirit but finally thomas lincoln went back to kentucky and returned with a new wife sally bush johnston a widow with three children john sarah and matilda the new mother came well provided with household furniture bringing many things unfamiliar to little abraham one fine bureau one table one set of chairs one large clothes chest cooking utensils knives forks bedding and other articles she was a woman of energy thrift and gentleness and at once made the cabin homelike and taught the children habits of cleanliness and comfort abraham was ten years old when his new mother came from kentucky and he was already an important member of the family he was remarkably strong for his years and the work he could do in a day was a decided advantage to thomas lincoln the axe which had been put into his hand to help in making the first clearing he had never been allowed to drop indeed as he says himself from that till within his twenty-third year he was almost constantly handling that most useful instrument besides he drove the team cut the elm and lynn brush with which the stock was often fed learned to handle the old shovel plough to wield the sickle to thresh the wheat with a flail to fan and clean it with a sheet to go to mill and turn the hard-earned grist into flour in short he learned all the trade the settler's boy must know and so well that when his father did not need him he could hire him to the neighbors thomas lincoln also taught him the rudiments of carpentry and cabinet-making and kept him busy much of the time as his assistant in his trade there are houses still standing in a near gentryville on which it is said he worked as he grew older he became one of the strongest and most popular hands in the vicinity and much of his time was spent as a hired boy on some neighbor's farm for twenty-five cents a day paid to his father he was hostler plowman woodchopper and carpenter besides helping the women with the chores for them he was ready to carry water make the fire even tend the baby no wonder that a laborer who never refused to do anything asked of him who could strike with a maul heavier blows and sink an axe deeper into the wood than anybody else in the community and who at the same time was general help for the women never lacked a job in gentryville of all the tasks his rude life brought him none seems to have suited him better than going to the mill it was perhaps as much the leisure enforced by this trip as anything else that attracted him the machinery was primitive and each man waited his turn which sometimes was long in coming a story is told by one of the pioneers of illinois of going many miles with a grist and waiting so long for his turn that when it came he and his horse had eaten all the corn and he had none to grind this waiting with other men and boys on like errands gave an opportunity for talk story-telling and games which were lincoln's delight if abraham lincoln's life was rough and hard it was not without amusements at home the rude household was overflowing with life there was abraham and his sister a stepbrother and two stepsisters and a cousin of nancy hanks lincoln dennis friend hanks whom misfortune had made an inmate of the lincoln home quite enough to plan sports and mischief and keep time from growing dull thomas lincoln and dennis hanks were both famous story-tellers and the lincolns spent many a cosy evening about their cabin fire repeating the stories they knew of course the boys hunted not that abraham ever became a true sportsman indeed he seems to have lacked the genuine sporting instinct in a curious autobiography written entirely in the third person which lincoln prepared at the request of a friend in eighteen sixty he says of his exploits as a hunter a few days before the completion of his eighth year 
in the absence of his father a flock of wild turkeys approached the new log cabin and abraham with a rifle gun standing inside shot through a crack and killed one of them he has never since pulled the trigger on any larger game this exploit is confirmed by dennis hanks who says no doubt about a lincoln's killing the turkey he done it with his father's rifle made by william lutz of bullet county kentucky i have killed a hundred deer with her myself turkeys too numerous to mention but there were many other country sports which he enjoyed to the full he went swimming in the evenings fished with the other boys in pigeon creek wrestled jumped and ran races at the noon rests he was present at every country horse race and fox chase the sports he preferred were those which brought men together the spelling school the husking bee the raising and all of these he was the life by his wit his stories his good nature his doggerel verses his practical jokes and by a rough kind of politeness for even in indiana in those times there was a notion of politeness and one of lincoln's schoolmasters had given lessons in manners lincoln seems to have profited in a degree by them for mrs crawford at whose house he worked for some time declares that he always lifted his hat and bowed when he made his appearance there was of course a rough gallantry among the young people and lincoln's old comrades and friends in indiana have left many tales of how he went to see the girls of how he brought in the biggest backlog and made the brightest fire of how the young people sitting around it watching the way the sparks flew told their fortunes he helped pare apples shell corn and crack nuts he took the girls to meeting and to spelling school though he was not often allowed to take part in the spelling match for the one who chose first always chose abe lincoln and that was equivalent to winning as the others knew that he would stand up the longest the nearest approach to sentiment at this time of which we know is recorded in a story lincoln once told to an acquaintance in springfield it was a rainy day and he was sitting with his feet on the window-sill his eyes on the street watching the rain suddenly he looked up and said did you ever write out a story in your mind i did when i was a little codger one day a wagon with a lady and two girls and a man broke down near us and while they were fixing up they cooked in our kitchen the woman had books and read us stories and they were the first i had ever heard i took a great fancy to one of the girls and when they were gone i thought of her a great deal and one day when i was sitting out in the sun by the house i wrote out a story in my mind i thought i took my father's horse and followed the wagon and finally i found it and they were surprised to see me i talked with the girl and persuaded her to elope with me and that night i put her on my horse and we started off across the prairie after several hours we came to a camp and when we rode up we found it was the one we had left a few hours before and we went in the next night we tried again and the same thing happened the horse came back to the same place and then we concluded that we ought not to elope i stayed until i had persuaded her father to give her to me i always meant to write that story out and publish it and i began once but i concluded that it was not much of a story but i think that was the beginning of love with me his life had its tragedies as well as its touch of romance tragedies so real and profound that they gave dignity to all the crudeness and poverty which surrounded him and quickened and intensified the melancholy temperament which he inherited from his mother away back in eighteen sixteen when thomas lincoln had started to find a farm in indiana bidding his wife be ready to go into the wilderness on his return nancy lincoln had taken her boy and girl to a tiny grave that of her youngest child and the three had there said good-bye to a little one whom the children had scarcely known but for whom the mother's grief was so keen that the boy never forgot the scene two years later he saw his father make a green pine box and put his dead mother into it and he saw her buried not far from their cabin almost without prayer young as he was it was his efforts it is said which brought a parson from kentucky three months later to preach the sermon and conduct the service which seemed to the child a necessary honor to the dead 
as sad as the death of his mother was that of his only sister sarah married to aaron grigsby in eighteen twenty six she had died a year and a half later in childbirth a death which to her brother must have seemed a horror and a mystery apart from these family sorrows there was all the crime and misery of the community all of which came to his ears and awakened his nature he even saw in those days one of his companions go suddenly mad the young man never recovered his reason but sank into idiocy all night he would croon plaintive songs and lincoln himself tells how fascinated by this mysterious malady he used to rise before daylight to cross the fields to listen to this funeral dirge of the reason in spite of the poverty and rudeness of his life the depths of his nature were unclouded he could feel intensely and his imagination was quick to respond to the touch of mystery End of section two. Section three of the life of abraham lincoln volume one by ida m tarbell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three abraham lincoln's early opportunities the books he read trips to new orleans impression he made on his friends with all his hard living and hard work lincoln was getting in this period a desultory kind of education not that he received much schooling he went to school by littles he says in all it did not amount to more than a year and if we accept his own description of the teachers it was perhaps just as well that it was only by littles no qualification was required of a teacher beyond readin writin and cipherin to the rule of three if a straggler supposed to know latin happened to sojourn in the neighborhood he was looked upon as a wizard but more or less of a schoolroom is a matter of small importance if a boy has learned to read and to think of what he reads and that this boy had learned his stock of books was small but he knew them thoroughly and they were good books to know the bible aesop's fables robinson crusoe bunyan's pilgrim progress a history of the united states weems life of washington and the statutes of indiana these are the chief ones we know about some of these books he borrowed from the neighbors a practice which resulted in at least one casualty for weems life of washington he allowed to get wet and to make good the loss he had to pull fodder three days no matter the book became his then and he could read it as he would fortunately he took this curious work in profound seriousness which a wide-awake boy would hardly be expected to do to-day washington became an exalted figure in his imagination and he always contended later when the question of the real character of the first president was brought up that it was wiser to regard him as a godlike being heroic in nature and deeds as weems does than to contend that he was only a man who if wise and good still made mistakes and was guilty of follies like other men besides these books he borrowed many others he once told a friend that he read through every book he had ever heard of in that country for a circuit of fifty miles from everything he read he made long extracts with his turkey buzzard pen and briar root ink when he had no paper he would write on a board and thus preserve his selections until he secured a copy-book the wooden fire shovel was his usual slate and on its back he ciphered with a charred stick shaving it off when it had become too grimy for use the logs and boards in his vicinity he covered with his figures and quotations by night he read and worked as long as there was light and he kept a book in the crack of the logs in his loft to have it at hand at peep of day when acting as a ferryman on the ohio in his nineteenth year anxious no doubt to get through the books of the house where he boarded before he left the place he read every night until midnight every lull in his daily labor he used for reading rarely going to his work without a book when ploughing or cultivating the rough fields of spencer county he found frequently a half hour for reading for at the end of every long row the horse was allowed to rest and lincoln had his book out and was perched on stump or fence almost as soon as the plough had come to a standstill 
one of the few people still left in gentryville who remembers lincoln captain john lamar tells to this day of riding to mill with his father and seeing as they drove along a boy sitting on the top rail of an old-fashioned stake-and-rider worm fence reading so intently that he did not notice their approach his father turning to him said john look at that boy yonder and mark my words he will make a smart man out of himself i may not see it but you'll see if my words don't come true that boy was abraham lincoln adds mr lamar impressively in his habits of reading and study the boy had little encouragement from his father but his stepmother did all she could for him indeed between the two there soon grew up a relation of touching gentleness and confidence in one of the interviews a biographer of mr lincoln sought with her before her death mrs lincoln said i induced my husband to permit abe to read and study at home as well as at school at first he was not easily reconciled to it but finally he too seemed willing to encourage him to a certain extent abe was a dutiful son to me always and we took particular care when he was reading not to disturb him would let him read on and on till he quit of his own accord this consideration of his stepmother won the boy's confidence and he rarely copied anything that he did not take it to her to read asking her opinion of it and often when she did not understand it explaining the meaning in his plain and simple language among the books which fell into young lincoln's hand when he was about eighteen years old was a copy of the revised statutes of indiana we know from dennis hanks and from mr turnham of gentryville to whom the book belonged and from other associates of lincoln at the time that he read the book intently and discussed its contents intelligently it was a remarkable volume for a thoughtful lad whose mind had already been fired by the history of washington it opened with that wonderful document the declaration of independence following the declaration of independence was the constitution of the united states the act of virginia passed in seventeen eighty three by which the territory northwestward of the river ohio was conveyed to the united states and the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven for governing this territory containing that clause on which lincoln in the future based many an argument on the slavery question this article number six of the ordinance reads there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the said territory otherwise than in the punishment of crimes whereof the party shall have been duly convicted provided always that any person escaping into the same from whom labor or service is lawfully claimed in any one of the original states such fugitive may be lawfully reclaimed and conveyed to the person claiming his or her labor or service as aforesaid following this was the constitution and the revised laws of indiana three hundred and seventy-five pages of five hundred words each of statutes when lincoln finished this book as he had probably before he was eighteen we have reason to believe that he understood the principles on which the nation was founded how the state of indiana came into being and how it was governed his understanding of the subject was clear and practical and he applied it in his reading thinking and discussion after he had read the statutes of indiana lincoln had free access to the library of an admirer judge john pitcher of rockport indiana where he examined many books although so far away from the center of the world's activity he was learning something of current history one man in gentryville mr jones the storekeeper took a louisville newspaper and here lincoln went regularly to read and discuss its contents all the men and boys of the neighborhood gathered there and everything which the paper printed was subjected to their keen shrewd common sense it was not long before young lincoln became the favorite member of the group the one listened to most respectfully politics were warmly discussed by these gentryville citizens and it may be that sitting on the counter of jones grocery lincoln even argued on slavery it certainly was one of the live questions in indiana at that date for several years after the organization of the territory and in spite of the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven a system of thinly disguised slavery had existed 
and it took a sharp struggle to bring the state in without some form of the institution so uncertain was the result that when decided the word passed from mouth to mouth all over hoosierdom she has come in free she has come in free even in eighteen twenty four years after the admission to statehood the census showed one hundred and ninety slaves nearly all of them in the southwest corner where the lincolns lived and it was not in reality until eighteen twenty one that the state supreme court put an end to the question in illinois in eighteen twenty two to eighteen twenty four there was carried on one of the most violent contests between the friends and opponents of slavery which occurred before the repeal of the missouri compromise the effort to secure slave labor was nearly successful in the campaign pamphlets pro and con literally inundated the state the pulpits took it up and almost every stump in every county had its bellowing indignant orator so violent a commotion so near at hand could hardly have failed to reach gentryville there had been other anti-slavery agitation going on within hearing for several years in eighteen o four a number of baptist ministers of kentucky started a crusade against the institution which resulted in a hot contest in the denomination and the organization of the baptist licking locust association friends of humanity the rev jesse head the minister who married thomas lincoln and nancy hanks talked freely and boldly against slavery and one of their old friends christopher columbus graham the man who was present at their wedding says tom and nancy lincoln and sally bush were just steeped full of jesse head's notions about the wrong of slavery and the rights of man as explained by thomas jefferson and thomas paine in eighteen o six charles osborne began to preach immediate emancipation in tennessee ten years later he started a paper in ohio devoted to the same idea and in eighteen nineteen he transferred his crusade to indiana in eighteen twenty one benjamin lundy started in tennessee the famous genius devoted to the same doctrine and in eighteen twenty two at shelbyville only about one hundred miles from gentryville was started a paper similar in its views the abolition intelligencer at that time there were in kentucky five or six abolition societies and in illinois was an organization called the friends of humanity probably young lincoln heard but vaguely of these movements but some of them he must have heard and he must have connected them with the speech of mr pitt on the slave trade with mary's elegy the slaves and with the discussion given in his kentucky preceptor which has the most to complain of the indian or the negro all of which tradition declares he was fond of repeating it is not impossible that as frederick douglas first realized his own condition in reading a school speaker the columbian orator so abraham lincoln first felt the wrong of slavery in reading his kentucky or american preceptor lincoln was not only winning in these days in the jones grocery store a reputation as a talker and a storyteller he was becoming known as a kind of backwoods orator he could repeat with effect all the poems and speeches in his various school readers he could imitate to perfection the wandering preachers who came to gentryville and he could make a political speech so stirring that he drew a crowd about him every time he mounted a stump the applause he won was sweet and frequently he indulged his gifts when he ought to have been working so thought his employers and thomas his father it was trying no doubt to the hard-pushed farmers to see the men who ought to have been cutting grass or chopping wood throw down their scythes or axes and group around a boy whenever he mounted a stump to develop a pet theory or repeat with variations yesterday's sermon in his fondness for speech-making young lincoln attended all the trials of the neighborhood and frequently walked fifteen miles to boonville to attend court he wrote as well as spoke and some of his productions were printed through the influence of his admiring neighbors thus a local baptist preacher was so struck with one of abraham's essays on temperance that he sent it to ohio where it is said to have appeared in a newspaper another article on national politics so pleased a lawyer of the vicinity that he declared the world couldn't beat it 
in considering the different opportunities for development which the boy had at this time it should not be forgotten that he spent many months at one time or another on the ohio and mississippi rivers in fact all that abraham lincoln saw of men in the world outside of gentryville and its neighborhood until after he was twenty-one years of age he saw on these rivers for many years the ohio and the mississippi were the appian way the one route to the world for the western settlers to preserve it they had been willing in early times to go to war with spain or with france to secede from the union even to join spain or france against the united states if either country would ensure their right to the highway in the long years in which the ownership of the great river was unsettled every man of them had come to feel with benjamin franklin a neighbor might as well ask me to sell my street door in fact this waterway was their street door and all that many of them ever saw of the world passed here up and down the rivers was a continual movement odd craft of every kind possible on a river went by arks and sleds with tidy cabins where families lived and where one could see the washing stretched the children playing the mother on pleasant days rocking and sewing keel boats which dodged in and out and turned inquisitive noses up all the creeks and bayous great fleets from the alleghanies made up of a score or more of timber rafts and manned by forty or fifty rough boatmen orleans boats loaded with flour hogs produce of all kinds pirogues made from great trees broadhorns curious nondescripts worked by a wheel and after eighteen twelve steamboats all this traffic was leisurely men had time to tie up and tell the news and show their wares even the steamboats loitered as it pleased them they knew no schedule they stopped anywhere to let passengers off they tied up wherever it was convenient to wait for fresh wood to be cut and loaded or for repairs to be made waiting for repairs seems in fact to have absorbed a great deal of the time of these early steamers they were continually running on to sawyers or planters or wooden islands and they blew up with a regularity which was monotonous even as late as eighteen forty two when charles dickens made the trip down the mississippi he was often gravely recommended to keep as far aft as possible because the steamboats generally blew up forward with this varied river life abraham lincoln first came into contact as a ferryman and boatman when in eighteen twenty six he spent several months as a ferryman at the mouth of anderson creek where it joins the ohio this experience suggested new possibilities to him it was a custom among the farmers of ohio indiana and illinois at this date to collect a quantity of produce and float down to new orleans on a raft to sell it young lincoln saw this and wanted to try his fortune as a produce merchant an incident of his projected trip he related once to mr seward seward he said did you ever hear how i earned my first dollar no said mr seward well replied he i was about eighteen years of age and belonged as you know to what they call down south the scrubs people who do not own land and slaves are nobody there but we had succeeded in raising chiefly by my labor sufficient produce as i thought to justify me in taking it down the river to sell after much persuasion i had got the consent of my mother to go and had constructed a flatboat large enough to take the few barrels of things we had gathered to new orleans a steamer was going down the river we have you know no wharves on the western streams and the custom was if passengers were at any of the landings they were to go out in a boat the steamer stopping and taking them on board i was contemplating my new boat and wondering whether i could make it stronger or improve it in any part when two men with trunks came down to the shore in carriages and looking at the different boats singled out mine and asked who owns this i answered modestly i do will you said one of them take us and our trunks out to the steamer certainly said i i was very glad to have the chance of earning something and supposed that each of them would give me a couple of bits the trunks were put in my boat the passengers seated themselves on them and i sculled them out to the steamer 
They got on board, and I lifted the trunks and put them on the deck. The steamer was about to put on steam again when I called out, You have forgotten to pay me. Each of them took from his pocket a silver half-dollar and threw it on the bottom of my boat. I could scarcely believe my eyes as I picked up the money. You may think it was a very little thing, and in these days it seems to me like a trifle, but it was a most important incident in my life. I could scarcely credit that I, the poor boy, had earned a dollar in less than a day, that by honest work I had earned a dollar. I was a more hopeful and thoughtful boy from that time. Soon after this, while he was working for Mr. Gentry, the leading citizen of Gentryville, his employer decided to send a load of produce to New Orleans, and chose young Lincoln to go as a bow hand, to work the front oars. For this trip he received eight dollars a month in his passage back. Who can believe that he could see and be part of this river life without learning much of the ways and thoughts of the world beyond him? Every time a steamboat or a raft tied up near Anderson Creek, and he, with his companions, boarded it and saw its mysteries and talked with its crew, every time he rode out with passengers to a passing steamer, who can doubt that he came back with new ideas and fresh energy? The trips to New Orleans were, to a thoughtful boy, an education of no mean value. It was the most cosmopolitan and brilliant city of the United States at that date, and there young Lincoln saw life at its intensest. Such was Abraham Lincoln's life in Indiana. Such were the avenues open to him for study and for seeing the world. In spite of the crudeness of it all, in spite of the fact that he had no wise direction, that he was brought up by a father with no settled purpose, and that he lived in a pioneer community where a young man's life at best is but a series of makeshifts, Lincoln soon developed a determination to make something out of himself, and a desire to know, which led him to neglect no opportunity to learn. The only unbroken outside influence which directed and stimulated him in these ambitions was that coming first from his mother, then from his stepmother. These two women, both of them of unusual earnestness and sweetness of spirit, were one or the other of them at his side throughout his youth and young manhood. The ideal they held before him was the simple ideal of the early American, that if a boy is upright and industrious, he may aspire to any place within the gift of the country. The boy's instinct told him they were right. Everything he read confirmed their teachings, and he cultivated, in every way open to him, his passion to know and to be something. His zeal in study, his ambition to excel, made their impression on his acquaintances. Even then they pointed him out as a boy who would make something of himself. In 1865, thirty-five years after he left Gentryville, William H. Herndon, for many years a law partner of Lincoln, anxious to save all that was known of Lincoln in Indiana, went among his old associates, and with a sincerity and thoroughness worthy of grateful respect, interviewed them. At that time there were still living numbers of the people with whom Lincoln had been brought up. They all remembered something of him. It is curious to note that all of these people tell of his doing something different from what other boys did, something sufficiently superior to have made a keen impression upon them. In almost every case, each person had his own special reason for admiring Lincoln. A facility in making rhymes and writing essays was the admiration of many, who considered it the more remarkable because essays and poetry were not taught in school, and... Abe took it up on his own account. Many others were struck by the clever application he made of this gift for expression. At one period he was employed as a hand by a farmer who treated him unfairly. Lincoln took a revenge unheard of in Gentryville. He wrote doggerel rhymes about his employer's nose, a long and crooked feature about which the owner was very sensitive. The wit he showed in taking revenge for a social slight by a satire on the Grigsbys, who had failed to invite him to a wedding, made a lasting impression in Gentryville. 
that he should write so well as to be able to humiliate his enemies more deeply than if he had resorted to the method of taking revenge current in the country and thrashed them seemed to his friends a mark of surprising superiority his schoolmates all remembered his spelling he stood at the head of his class invariably and at the spelling matches in which the young people of the neighborhood passed many an evening the one who first began choosing sides always chose abe lincoln so often did he spell the school down that finally tradition says he was no longer allowed to take part in the matches very many of his old neighbors recalled his reading habits and how well stored his mind was with information his explanations of natural phenomena were so unfamiliar to his companions that he sometimes was jeered at for them though as a rule his listeners were sympathetic taking a certain pride in the fact that one of their number knew as much as lincoln did he was better read than the world knows or is likely to know exactly said one old acquaintance he often and often commented or talked to me about what he read seemed to read it out of the book as he went along did so with others he was the learned boy among us unlearned folks he took great pains to explain could do it so simply he was diffident then too one man was impressed by the character of the sentences lincoln had given him for a copy-book it was considered at that time said he that abe was the best penman in the neighborhood one day while he was on a visit at my mother's i asked him to write some copies for me he very willingly consented he wrote several of them but one of them i have never forgotten although a boy at that time it was this good boys who to their books apply will all be great men by and by his wonderful memory was recalled by many to save that which he found to his liking in the books he borrowed lincoln committed much to memory he knew many long poems and most of the selections in the kentucky preceptor by the time he was twenty-one in fact his mind was well stored with verse and prose all of his comrades remembered his stories and his clearness in argument when he appeared in company says nat grigsby the boys would gather and cluster around him to hear him talk mr lincoln was figurative in his speech talks and conversation he argued much from analogy and explained things hard for us to understand by stories maxims tales and figures he would almost always point his lesson or idea by some story that was plain and near us that we might instantly see the force and bearing of what he said this ability to explain clearly and to illustrate by simple figures of speech must be counted as the great mental acquirement of lincoln's boyhood it was a power which he gained by hard labor years later he related his experience to an acquaintance who had been surprised by the lucidity and simplicity of his speeches and who had asked where he was educated i never went to school more than six months in my life he said but i can say this that among my earliest recollections i remember how when a mere child i used to get irritated when anybody talked to me in a way i could not understand i do not think i ever got angry at anything else in my life but that always disturbed my temper and has ever since i can remember going to my little bedroom after hearing the neighbors talk of an evening with my father and spending no small part of the night walking up and down and trying to make out what was the exact meaning of their to me dark sayings i could not sleep although i tried to when i got on such a hunt for an idea until i had caught it and when i thought i had got it i was not satisfied until i had repeated it over and over until i had put it in language plain enough as i thought for any boy i knew to comprehend this was a kind of passion with me and it has stuck by me for i am never easy now when i am handling a thought till i have bounded it north and bounded it south and bounded it east and bounded it west mr herndon in his interviewing in indiana found that everywhere lincoln was remembered as kind and helpful the man or woman in trouble never failed to receive all the aid he could give them even a worthless drunkard of the village called him a friend as well he might 
lincoln having gathered him up one night from the roadside where he lay freezing and carried him on his back a long distance to a shelter in a fire the thoughtless cruelty to animals so common among country children revolted the boy he wrote essays on cruelty to animals harangued his playmates protested whenever he saw any wanton abuse of a dumb creature this gentleness made a lasting impression on his mates coupled as it was with the physical strength and courage to enforce his doctrines stories of his good heart and helpful life might be multiplied but they are summed up in what his stepmother said of the boy abe was a good boy and i can say what scarcely one woman a mother can say in a thousand abe never gave me a cross word or look and never refused in fact or appearance to do anything i requested him i never gave him a cross word in all my life his mind and mine what little i had seemed to run together he was here after he was elected president he was a dutiful son to me always i think he loved me truly i had a son john who was raised with abe both were good boys but i must say both now being dead that abe was the best boy i ever saw or expect to see End of chapter 3 Section 4 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. The LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 The Lincolns Leave Indiana. The Journey to Illinois. Abraham Lincoln Starts Out for Himself. In the spring of 1830, when Abraham Lincoln was 21 years old, his father, Thomas Lincoln, decided to leave Indiana. The reason Dennis Hanks gives for this removal was a disease called the milk sick. Abraham Lincoln's mother, Nancy Hanks Lincoln, and several of their relatives who had followed them from Kentucky had died of it. The cattle had been carried off by it. Neither brute nor human life seemed to be safe. As Dennis Hanks says, this was reason enough, ain't it, for leaving? Anyone who has traveled through the portions of Spencer County in which the Lincolns settled will respect Thomas Lincoln for his energy in moving. When covered with timber, as the land was when he chose his farm, it no doubt promised well. But fourteen years of hard labor showed him that the soil was niggardly and the future of the country unpromising today sixty-five years since the lincolns left spencer county the country remains as it was then dull commonplace unfruitful the towns show no signs of energy or prosperity there are no leading streets or buildings no man's house is better than his neighbor's and every man's house is ordinary for a long distance on each side of gentryville as one passes by rail no superior farm is to be seen no prosperous farm or manufactory it is a dead monotonous country where no possibilities of quick wealth have been discovered and which only centuries of tilling and fertilizing can make prosperous the place chosen for their new home was the sangamon country in central illinois it was at that day a country of great renown in the west the name meaning the land where there is plenty to eat one of the family john hanks a cousin of abraham's mother was already there and the inviting reports he had sent to indiana were no doubt what led the lincolns to decide on illinois as their future home gentryville saw young lincoln depart with genuine regret and his friends gave him a score of rude proofs that he would not be forgotten after he was gone one of these friends planted a cedar tree in his memory it still marks the site of the lincoln home the first monument erected to the memory of a man to whom the world will never cease to raise monuments the spot on the hill overlooking buckthorn valley where the lincolns said good-bye to their old home and to the home of sarah lincoln grigsby to the grave of the mother and wife to all their neighbors and friends is still pointed out buckthorn valley held many recollections dear to them all but to no one of the company was the place dearer than to abraham it is certain that he felt the parting keenly and that he never forgot his years in the hoosier state 
one of the most touching experiences he relates in all his published letters is his emotion at visiting his old indiana home fourteen years after he had left it so strongly was he moved by the scenes of his first conscious sorrows efforts joys ambitions that he put into verse the feelings they awakened while he never attempted to conceal the poverty and hardship of these days and would speak humorously of the pretty pinching times he experienced he never regarded his life at this time as mean or pitiable frequently he talked to his friends in later days of his boyhood and always with apparent pleasure mr lincoln told this story of his youth says leonard sweat as the story of a happy childhood there was nothing sad or pinched and nothing of want and no allusion to want in any part of it his own description of his youth was that of a happy joyous boyhood it was told with mirth and glee and illustrated by pointed anecdotes often interrupted by his jocund laugh and he was right there was nothing ignoble or mean in this indiana pioneer life it was rude but only with the rudeness which the ambitious are willing to endure in order to push on to a better condition than they otherwise would know these people did not accept their hardships apathetically they did not regard them as permanent they were only the temporary deprivations necessary in order to accomplish what they had come into the country to do for this reason they endured hopefully all that was hard it is worth notice too that there was nothing belittling in their life there was no pauperism no shirking each family provided for its own simple wants and had the conscious dignity which comes from being equal to a situation if their lives lacked culture and refinement they were rich in independence and self-reliance the company which emigrated to illinois included the family of thomas lincoln and those of dennis hanks and levi hall married to lincoln's stepsisters thirteen persons in all they sold land cattle and grain and much of their household goods and were ready in march of eighteen thirty for their journey all the possessions which the three families had to take with them were packed into big wagons to which oxen were attached and the caravan was ready the weather was still cold the streams were swollen and the roads were muddy but the party started out bravely inured to hardships alive to all the new sights on their route every day brought them amusement and adventures and especially to young lincoln the journey must have been of keen interest he drove one of the teams he tells us and according to a story current in gentryville he succeeded in doing a fair peddler's business on the route captain william jones in whose father's store lincoln had spent so many hours in discussion and in story-telling and for whom he had worked the last winter he was in indiana says that before leaving the state abraham invested all his money some thirty-odd dollars in notions though all the country through which they expected to pass was but sparsely settled he believed he could dispose of them a set of knives and forks was the largest item entered on the bill says captain jones the other items were needles pins thread buttons and other little domestic necessities when the lincolns reached their new home near decatur illinois abraham wrote back to my father stating that he had doubled his money on his purchases by selling them along the road unfortunately we did not keep that letter not thinking how highly we would have prized it in years afterwards the pioneers were a fortnight on their journey all we know of the route they took is from a few chance remarks of lincoln's to his friends to the effect that they passed through vincennes where he saw a printing press for the first time and through palestine where he saw a juggler performing sleight-of-hand tricks they reached macon county their new home from the south mr h c whitney says that once in decatur when he and lincoln were passing the courthouse together lincoln walked out a few feet in front and after shifting his position two or three times said as he looked up at the building partly to himself and partly to me here is the exact spot where i stood by our wagon when we moved from indiana twenty-six years ago this is at six feet from the exact spot he then told me he had frequently thereafter tried to locate the route by which they had come 
and that he had decided that it was near the main line of the Illinois Central Railroad. The party settled some ten miles west of Decatur, in Macon County. Here John Hanks had the logs ready cut for their new home, and Lincoln, Dennis Hanks, and Hall soon had a cabin erected. Mr. Lincoln says in his short autobiography of 1860, Here they built a log cabin, into which they removed, and made sufficient of rails to fence ten acres of ground, fenced and broke the ground, and raised a crop of sown corn upon it the same year. These are, or are supposed to be, the rails about which so much is being said just now, though these are far from being the first or only rails ever made by Abraham. If they were far from being his first and only rails, they certainly were the most famous ones he or anybody else ever split. This was the last work Lincoln did for his father, for in the summer of that year, 1830, he exercised the right of majority and started out to shift for himself. When he left his home, he went empty-handed. He was already some months over twenty-one years of age, but he had nothing in the world, not even a suit of respectable clothes, and one of the first pieces of work he did was to split four hundred rails for every yard of brown jeans dyed with white walnut bark that would be necessary to make him a pair of trousers. He had no trade, no profession, no spot of land, no patron, no influence. Two things recommended him to his neighbors. He was strong, and he was a good fellow. His strength made him a valuable laborer. Not that he was fond of hard labor. One of his Indiana employers says, Abe was no hand to pitch into work like killing snakes. But when he did work, it was with an ease and effectiveness which compensated his employer for the time he spent in practical jokes and extemporaneous speeches. He could lift as much as three ordinary men, and my how he would chop, says Dennis Hanks. His axe would flash and bite into a sugar tree or sycamore, and down it would come. If you heard him felling trees in a clearing, you would say there was three men at work by the way the trees fell. Standing six feet four, he could outlift, outwork, and outwrestle any man he came in contact with. Friends and employers were proud of his prowess and boasted of it never failing to pit him against any hero whose strength they heard vaunted. He himself was proud of it, and throughout his life was fond of comparing himself with tall and strong men. When the committee called on him in Springfield in 1860 to notify him of his nomination as president, Governor Morgan of New York was of the number, a man of great height and brawn. "'Pray, Governor, how tall may you be?' was Mr. Lincoln's first question." There is a story told of a poor man seeking a favor from him once at the White House. He was overpowered by the idea that he was in the presence of the President, and, his errand done, was edging shyly away, when Mr. Lincoln stopped him, insisting that he measure with him. The man was the taller, as Mr. Lincoln had thought, and he went away evidently as much abashed that he dared be taller than the President of the United States as that he had dared to venture into his presence. Governor Hoyt tells an excellent story illustrating this interest of Lincoln's in manly strength, and his involuntary comparison of himself with whomsoever showed it. It was in 1859, after Lincoln had delivered a speech at the Wisconsin State Agricultural Fair in Milwaukee. Governor Hoyt had asked him to make the rounds of the exhibits, and they went into a tent to see a strong man perform. He went through the ordinary exercises with huge iron balls, tossing them in the air, and catching them and rolling them on his arms and back. And Mr. Lincoln, who evidently had never before seen such a combination of agility and strength, watched him with intense interest, ejaculating under his breath now and then, "'By George!' by George. When the performance was over, Governor Hoyt, seeing Mr. Lincoln's interest, asked him to go up and be introduced to the athlete. He did so, and, as he stood looking down musingly on the man, who was very short, and evidently wondering that one so much smaller than he could be so much stronger, he suddenly broke out with one of his quaint speeches. 
why he said why i could lick salt off the top of your hat his strength won him popularity but his good nature his wit his skill in debate his stories were still more efficient in gaining him good will people liked to have him around and voted him a good fellow to work with yet such were the conditions of his life at this time that in spite of his popularity nothing was open to him but hard manual labor to take the first job which he happened upon rail splitting ploughing lumbering boating storekeeping and make the most of it thankful if thereby he earned his bed and board and a yearly suit of jeans was apparently all there was before abraham lincoln in eighteen thirty when he started out for himself through the summer and fall of eighteen thirty and the early winter of eighteen thirty one mr lincoln worked in the vicinity of his father's new home usually as a farm hand and rail splitter most of his work was done in company with john hanks before the end of the winter he secured employment of which he has given an account himself though in the third person during that winter abraham together with his stepmother's son john d johnston and john hanks yet residing in macon county hired themselves to denton offutt to take a flatboat from beardstown illinois to new orleans and for that purpose were to join him offutt at springfield illinois as soon as the snow should go off when it did go off which was about the first of march eighteen thirty one the country was so flooded as to make travelling by land impracticable to obviate which difficulty they purchased a large canoe and came down the sangamon river in it this is the time and manner of abraham's first entrance into sangamon county they found off it at springfield but learned from him that he had failed in getting a boat at beardstown this led to their hiring themselves to him for twelve dollars per month each and getting the timber out of the trees and building a boat at old sangamon town on the sangamon river seven miles northwest of springfield which boat they took to new orleans substantially on the old contract sangamon town where lincoln built the flatboat has since his day completely disappeared from the earth but then it was one of the flourishing settlements on the river of that name lincoln's advent in the town did not go unnoticed in a small community cut off from the world as old sangamon was every newcomer is scrutinized and discussed before he is regarded with confidence lincoln did not escape this scrutiny his appearance was so striking in fact that he attracted everybody's attention he was a tall gaunt young man says mr john roll of springfield then a resident of sangamon dressed in a suit of blue homespun jeans consisting of a roundabout jacket waistcoat and breeches which came to within about four inches of his feet the latter was encased in rawhide boots into the tops of which most of the time his pantaloons were stuffed he wore a soft felt hat which had at one time been black but now as its owner dryly remarked was sunburned until it was a combine of colors it took some four weeks to build the raft and in that period lincoln succeeded in captivating the entire village by his story-telling it was the custom in sangamon for the men folks to gather at noon and in the evening when resting in a convenient lane near the mill they had rolled out a long peeled log on which they lounged while they whittled and talked lincoln had not been long in sangamon before he joined this circle at once he became a favorite by his jokes and good humor as soon as he appeared at the assembly ground the men would start him to story-telling so irresistibly droll were his yarns that says mr roll whenever he'd end up in his unexpected way the boys on the log would whoop and roll off the result of the rolling off was to polish the log like a mirror the men recognizing lincoln's part in this polishing christened their seat abe's log long after lincoln had disappeared from sangamon abe's log remained and until it had rotted away people pointed it out and repeated the droll stories of the stranger when the flatboat was finished lincoln and his friends prepared to leave sangamon before he started however he was the hero of an adventure so thrilling that he won new laurels in the community 
Mr. Roll, who was a witness of the whole exciting scene, tells the story. It was the spring following the winter of the deep snow. Walter Carman, John Seaman, and myself, and at times others of the Carman boys, had helped Abe in building the boat, and when we had finished we went to work to make a dugout, or canoe, to be used as a small boat with the flat. We found a suitable log about an eighth of a mile up the river, and with our axes went to work under Lincoln's direction. The river was very high, fairly booming. After the dugout was ready to launch, we took it to the edge of the water, and made ready to let her go, when Walter Carman and John Seaman jumped in as the boat struck the water, each one anxious to be the first to get a ride. As they shot out from the shore, they found they were unable to make any headway against the strong current. Carmen had the paddle, and Seaman was in the stern of the boat. Lincoln shouted to them to head upstream and work back to shore, but they found themselves powerless against the stream. At last they began to pull for the wreck of an old flatboat, the first ever built on the Sangamon which had sunk and gone to pieces, leaving one of the stanchions sticking above the water. Just as they reached it, Seaman made a grab, and caught hold of the stanchion when the canoe capsized, leaving Seaman clinging to the old timber, and throwing Carmen into the stream. It carried him down with the speed of a mill-race. Lincoln raised his voice above the roar of the flood, and yelled to Carmen to swim for an old tree, which stood almost in the channel which the action of the high water had changed. Carmen, being a good swimmer, succeeded in catching a branch, and pulled himself up out of the water, which was very cold, and had almost chilled him to death, and there he sat shivering and chattering in the tree. Lincoln, seeing Carmen safe, called out to Seaman to let go the stanchion and swim for the tree. With some hesitation he obeyed and struck out, while Lincoln cheered and directed him from the bank. As Seaman neared the tree, he made one grab for a branch, and, missing it, went under the water. Another desperate lunge was successful, and he climbed up beside Carmen. Things were pretty exciting now, for there were two men in the tree, and the boat was gone. It was a cold, raw April day, and there was great danger of the men becoming benumbed and falling back into the water. Lincoln called out to them to keep their spirits up, and he would save them. The village had been alarmed by this time, and many people had come down to the bank. Lincoln procured a rope and tied it to a log. He called all hands to come and help roll the log into the water, and after this had been done, he, with the assistance of several others, towed it some distance up the stream. A daring young fellow by the name of Jim Dorrell then took his seat on the end of the log, and it was pushed out into the current, with the expectation that it would be carried downstream against the tree where Seaman and Carmen were. The log was well directed and went straight to the tree, but Jim, in his impatience to help his friends, fell a victim to his good intentions. Making a frantic grab at a branch, he raised himself off the log, which was swept from under him by the raging water, and he soon joined the other two victims upon their forlorn perch. The excitement on shore increased, and almost the whole population of the village gathered on the river bank. Lincoln had the log pulled up the stream, and, securing another piece of rope, called to the men in the tree to catch it if they could when he should reach the tree. He then straddled the log himself, and gave the word to push out into the stream. When he dashed into the tree, he threw the rope over the stump of a broken limb, and let it play until it broke the speed of the log, and gradually drew it back to the tree, holding it there until the three now nearly frozen men had climbed down and seated themselves astride. He then gave orders to the people on the shore to hold fast to the end of the rope which was tied to the log, and, leaving his rope in the tree, he turned the log adrift. The force of the current, acting against the taut rope, swung the log around against the bank, and all on board were saved. The excited people, who had watched the dangerous experiment with alternate hope and fear, now broke into cheers for Abe Lincoln, and praises for his brave act. This adventure made quite a hero of him along the Sangamon, and the people never tired telling of the exploit. 
the flatboat built and loaded the party started for new orleans about the middle of april they had gone but a few miles when they met with another adventure at the village of new salem there was a mill dam on it the boat stuck and here for nearly twenty-four hours it hung the bow in the air and the stern in the water the cargo slowly setting backwards shipwreck almost certain the village of new salem turned out in a body to see what the strangers would do in their predicament they shouted suggested and advised for a time but finally discovered that one big fellow in the crew was ignoring them and working out a plan of relief having unloaded the cargo into a neighboring boat lincoln had succeeded in tilting his craft then by boring a hole in the end extending over the dam the water was let out this done the boat was easily shoved over and reloaded the ingenuity which he had exercised in saving his boat made a deep impression on the crowd on the bank and it was talked over for many a day the proprietor of boat and cargo was even more enthusiastic than the spectators and vowed he would build a steamboat for the sangamon and make lincoln the captain lincoln himself was interested in what he had done and nearly twenty years later he embodied his reflections on this adventure in a curious invention for getting boats over shoals the raft over the new salem dam the party went on to new orleans reaching there in may eighteen thirty one and remaining a month it must have been a month of intense intellectual activity for lincoln since his first visit made with young gentry new orleans had entered upon her flush times commerce was increasing at a rate which dazzled speculators and drew them from all over the united states from eighteen thirty to eighteen forty no other american city increased in such a ratio exports and imports which in eighteen thirty one amounted to twenty six million dollars in eighteen thirty five had more than doubled the creole population had held the sway so far in the city but now it came into competition and often into conflict with a pushing ambitious and frequently unscrupulous native american party to these two predominating elements were added germans french spanish negroes and indians cosmopolitan in its make-up the city was even more cosmopolitan in its life everything was to be seen in new orleans in those days from the idle luxury of the wealthy creole to the organization of filibustering juntas the pirates still plied their trade in the gulf and the mississippi river brought down hundreds of river boatmen one of the wildest wickedest set of men that ever existed in any city lincoln and his companions ran their boat up beside thousands of others it was the custom to tie such craft along the river front where st mary's market now stands and one could walk a mile it is said over the tops of these boats without going ashore no doubt lincoln went too to live in the boatman's rendezvous called the swamp a wild rough quarter where roulette whiskey and the flintlock pistol ruled all of the picturesque life the violent contrasts of the city he would see as he wandered about and he would carry away the sharp impressions which are produced when mind and heart are alert sincere and healthy in this month spent in new orleans lincoln must have seen much of slavery at that time the city was full of slaves and the number was constantly increasing indeed one-third of the new orleans increase in population between eighteen thirty and eighteen forty was in negroes one of the saddest features of the institution was to be seen there in its aggravated form the slave market the better class of slaveholders of the south who looked on the institution as patriarchal and who guarded their slaves with conscientious care knew little it should be said of this terrible traffic their transfer of slaves was humane but in the open markets of the city it was attended by shocking cruelty and degradation lincoln witnessed in new orleans for the first time the revolting sight of men and women sold like animals mr herndon says that he often heard mr lincoln refer to this experience in new orleans for the first time he writes lincoln beheld the true horrors of human slavery he saw negroes in chains whipped and scourged 
against this inhumanity his sense of right and justice rebelled and his mind and conscience were awakened to a realization of what he had often heard and read no doubt as one of his companions has said slavery ran the iron into him then and there one morning in their rambles over the city the trio passed a slave auction a vigorous and comely mulatto girl was being sold she underwent a thorough examination at the hands of the bidders they pinched her flesh and made her trot up and down the room like a horse to show how she moved and in order as the auctioneer said that bidders might satisfy themselves whether the article they were offering to buy was sound or not the whole thing was so revolting that lincoln moved away from the scene with a deep feeling of unconquerable hate bidding his companions follow him he said boys let's get away from this if ever i get a chance to hit that thing meaning slavery i'll hit it hard mr herndon gives john hanks as his authority for this statement but according to mr lincoln's autobiography hanks did not go on to new orleans but having a family and finding that he was likely to be detained from home longer than he had expected he turned back at st louis though the story is told above probably grew to its present proportions by much telling there is reason to believe that lincoln was deeply impressed on this trip by something he saw in a new orleans slave market and that he often referred to it End of section four. section five of the life of abraham lincoln volume one by ida m tarbell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5. Lincoln secures a position. He studies grammar. First appearance in politics. The month in New Orleans passed swiftly, and in June 1831, Lincoln and his companions took passage up the river. He did not return, however, in the usual condition of the river boatman out of a job. According to his own way of putting it, during this boat enterprise acquaintance with offutt who was previously an entire stranger he conceived a liking for abraham and believing he could turn him to account he contracted with him to act as a clerk for him on his return from new orleans in charge of a store and mill at new salem the store and mill were however so far only in offutt's imagination and lincoln had to drift about until his employer was ready for him he made a short visit to his father and mother now in coles county near charleston fever and ague had driven the lincolns from their first home in macon county and then in july eighteen thirty one he went to new salem where as he says he stopped indefinitely and for the first time as it were by himself the village of new salem the scene of lincoln's mercantile career was one of the many little towns which in the pioneer days sprang up along the sangamon river a stream then looked upon as navigable and destined to be counted among the highways of commerce twenty miles northwest of springfield strung along the left bank of the sangamon parted by hollows and ravines is a row of high hills on one of these a long narrow ridge beginning with a sharp and sloping point near the river running south and parallel with the stream a little way and then reaching its highest point making a sudden turn to the west and gradually widening until lost in the prairie stood this frontier village the crooked river for a short distance comes from the east and seemingly surprised at meeting the bluff abruptly changes its course and flows to the north across the river the bottom stretches out half a mile back to the highlands new salem founded in eighteen twenty nine by james rutledge and john cameron and a dozen years later a deserted village is rescued only from oblivion by the fact that lincoln was once one of its inhabitants the town never contained more than fifteen houses all of them built of logs but it had an energetic population of perhaps one hundred persons among whom were a blacksmith a tinner a hatter a schoolmaster and a preacher new salem boasted a grist mill a sawmill two stores and a tavern but its day of hope was short in eighteen thirty seven it began to decline and by eighteen forty petersburg two miles down the river had absorbed its business and population 
Salem Hill is now only a green cow pasture. Lincoln's first sight of the town had been in April, 1831, when he and his crew had been detained in getting their flatboat over the Rutledge and Cameron Mill Dam. When he walked into New Salem three months later, he was not altogether a stranger, for the people remembered him as the ingenious flatboatman who had freed his boat from water by resorting to the miraculous expedient of boring a hole in the bottom. Offutt's goods had not arrived when Mr. Lincoln reached New Salem and he loafed about, so those who remember his arrival say, good-naturedly taking a hand in whatever he could find to do, and in his droll way making friends of everybody. By chance a bit of work fell to him almost at once, which introduced him generally, and gave him an opportunity to make a name in the neighborhood. It was election day. In those days elections in Illinois were conducted by the viva voce method, the people did try voting by ballot, but the experiment was unpopular. It required too much form, and in 1829 the former method of voting was restored. The judges and clerks sat at a table with the poll book before them. The voter walked up and announced the candidate of his choice, and it was recorded in his presence. There was no ticket peddling, and ballot box stuffing was impossible. The village schoolmaster, Mentor Graham by name, was clerk at this particular election, but his assistant was ill. Looking about for someone to help him, Mr. Graham saw a tall stranger loitering around the polling place, and called to him, "'Can you write?' "'Yes,' said the stranger. "'I can make a few rabbit tracks.' Mr. Graham evidently was satisfied with the answer, for he promptly initiated him and he filled his place not only to the satisfaction of his employer, but also to the delectation of the loiterers about the polls, for whenever things dragged, he immediately began to spit out a stock of Indian yarns. So droll were they that men who listened to Lincoln that day repeated them long after to their friends. He had made a hit in New Salem to start with, and here, as in Sangamon Town, it was by means of his story-telling. A few days later he accepted an offer to pilot down the Sangamon and Illinois rivers, as far as Beardstown, a flatboat bearing the family and goods of a pioneer bound for Texas. At Beardstown he found Offutt's goods waiting to be taken to New Salem. As he footed his way home, he found two men with a wagon and ox team going for the goods. Offutt had expected Lincoln to wait at Beardstown until the ox team arrived, and the Teamsters, not having any credentials, asked Lincoln to give them an order for the goods. This, sitting down by the roadside, he wrote out. One of the men used to relate that it contained a misspelled word, which he corrected. When the oxen and their drivers returned with the goods, the store was opened, in a little log house on the brink of the hill, almost over the river. The precise date of the opening of Denton Offutt's store is not known. We only know that on July 8, 1831, the County Commissioner's Court of Sangamon County granted Offutt a license to retail merchandise in New Salem, for which he paid five dollars, a fee which supposed him to have one thousand dollars worth of goods in stock. The Frontier store filled a unique place. Usually it was a general store and on its shelves were found most of the articles needed in a community of pioneers. But supplying goods and groceries was not its only function. It was the pioneers' intellectual and social center. It was the common meeting place of the farmers, the happy refuge of the village loungers. No subject was unknown there. The habitués of the place were equally at home in discussing politics, religion, or sports. Stories were told, jokes were cracked, and the news contained in the latest newspaper finding its way into the wilderness was repeated again and again. Lincoln could hardly have chosen surroundings more favorable to the highest development of the art of storytelling, and he had not been there long before his reputation for drollery was established. But he gained popularity and respect in other ways. There was, near the village, a settlement called Clary's Grove the most conspicuous part of whose population was an organization known as the Clary's Grove Boys. They exercised a veritable terror over the neighborhood, and yet they were not a bad set of fellows. Mr. Herndon, who knew personally many of the boys, says, 
They were friendly and good-natured. They could trench a pond, dig a bog, build a house. They could pray and fight, make a village, or create a state. They would do almost anything for sport or fun, love or necessity. Though rude and rough, though life's forces ran over the edge of the bowl, foaming and sparkling in pure deviltry for deviltry's sake, yet place before them a poor man who needed their aid, a lame or sick man, a defenseless woman or widow or an orphan child, they melted into sympathy and charity at once. They gave all they had and willingly toiled or played cards for more. Though there never was under the sun a more generous parcel of rowdies, a stranger's introduction was likely to be the most unpleasant part of his acquaintance with them. Denton Offutt, Lincoln's employer, was just the man to love to boast before such a crowd. He seemed to feel that Lincoln's physical prowess shed glory on himself, and he declared the country over that his clerk could lift more, throw farther, run faster, jump higher, and wrestle better than any man in Sangamon County. The Clary's Grove boys, of course, felt in honor bound to prove this false, and they appointed their best man, one Jack Armstrong, to throw Abe. Jack Armstrong was, according to the testimony of all who remember him, a powerful twister, square-built and strong as an ox, the best-made man that ever lived, and everybody knew that a contest between him and Lincoln would be close. Lincoln did not like to tussle and scuffle. He objected to wooling and pulling. But Offutt had gone so far that it became necessary to yield. The match was held on the ground near the grocery. Clary's Grove and New Salem turned out generally to witness the bout, and betting on the result ran high, the community as a whole staking their jackknives, tobacco plugs, and treats on Armstrong. The two men had scarcely taken hold of each other before it was evident that the Clary's Grove champion had met a match. The two men wrestled long and hard, but both kept their feet. Neither could throw the other and Armstrong, convinced of this, tried a foul. Lincoln no sooner realized the game of his antagonist than, furious with indignation, he caught him by the throat, and holding him out at arm's length, he shook him like a child. Armstrong's friends rushed to his aid, and for a moment it looked as if Lincoln would be routed by sheer force of numbers. But he held his own so bravely that the boys, in spite of their sympathies, were filled with admiration. What bid fair to be a general fight ended in a general handshake, even Jack Armstrong declaring that Lincoln was the best fellow who ever broke into the camp. From that day, at the cockfights and horse races, which were their common sports, he became the chosen umpire, and when the entertainment broke up in a row, a not uncommon occurrence, he acted the peacemaker, without suffering the peacemaker's usual fate. Such was his reputation with the Clary's Grove boys after three months in New Salem that when the fall muster came off, he was elected captain. Lincoln showed soon that, if he was unwilling to indulge in wooling and pulling for amusement, he did not object to it in the interests of decency and order. In such a community as New Salem, there are always braggarts who can only be made endurable by fear. To them, Lincoln soon became an authority more to be respected than sheriff or constable. If they transgressed in his presence, he thrashed them promptly with an imperturbable air, half indolent but wholly resolute, which was more baffling and impressive than even his iron grip and well-directed blows. A man came into the store one day and began swearing. Now, profanity in the presence of women Lincoln would never allow. He asked the man to stop, but he persisted, loudly boasting that nobody should prevent his saying what he wanted to. The women gone, the man began to abuse Lincoln so hotly that the latter said, Well, if you must be whipped, I suppose I might as well whip you as any other man and going outdoors with the fellow, he threw him on the ground and rubbed smartweed in his eyes until he bellowed for mercy. New Salem's sense of chivalry was touched, and Denton Offutt's clerk became more of a hero than ever. His honesty excited no less admiration. 
two incidents seem to have particularly impressed the community having discovered on one occasion that he had taken six and one-quarter cents too much from a customer he walked three miles that evening after his store was closed to return the money again he weighed out half a pound of tea as he supposed it was night and this was the last thing he did before closing up on entering in the morning he discovered a four-ounce weight in the scales he saw his mistake and closing up shop hurried off to deliver the remainder of the tea this unusual regard for the rights of others soon won him the title of honest abe as soon as the store was fairly under way lincoln began to look about for books since leaving indiana in march eighteen thirty he had had in his drifting life little leisure or opportunity for study though a great deal for observation of men and of life his experience made him realize more and more clearly that power over men depends upon knowledge he had found that he was himself superior to many of those who were called the great men of the country soon after entering macon county in march eighteen thirty when he was only twenty-one years old he had found he could make a better speech than at least one man who was before the public a candidate had come along where he and john hanks were at work and as john hanks tells the story the man made a speech it was a bad one and i said abe could beat it i turned down a box and abe made his speech the other man was a candidate abe wasn't abe beat him to death his subject being the navigation of the sangamon river the man after abe's speech was through took him aside and asked him where he had learned so much and how he could do so well abe replied stating his manner and method of reading what he had read the man encouraged him to persevere he studied men carefully comparing himself with them could he do what they did he seems never up to this time to have met one who was incomprehensible to him i have talked with great men he told his fellow clerk and friend green and i do not see how they differ from others then he found too that people listened to him that they quoted his opinions and that his friends were already saying that he was able to fill any position offutt even declared the country over that abe knew more than any man in the united states and that some day he would be president when he began to realize that he himself possessed the qualities which made men great in illinois that success depended upon knowledge and that already his friends credited him with possessing more than most members of the community his ambition was encouraged and his desire to learn increased why should he not try for a public position he began to talk to his friends of his ambition and to devise plans for self-improvement in order to keep in practice in speaking he walked seven or eight miles to debating clubs practicing polemics was what he called the exercise he seems now for the first time to have begun to study subjects grammar was what he chose he sought mentor graham the schoolmaster and asked his advice if you are going before the public mr graham told him you ought to do it but where could he get a grammar there was but one said mr graham in the neighborhood and that was six miles away without waiting for further information the young man rose from the breakfast table walked immediately to the place and borrowed this rare copy of kirkham's grammar from that time on for weeks he gave every moment of his leisure to mastering the contents of the book frequently he asked his friend green to hold the book while he recited and when puzzled by a point he would consult mr graham lincoln's eagerness to learn was such that the whole neighborhood became interested the greens lent him books the schoolmaster kept him in mind and helped him as he could and the village cooper let him come into his shop and keep up a fire of shavings sufficiently bright to read by at night it was not long before the grammar was mastered well lincoln said to his fellow clerk green if that's what they call a science i think i'll go at another before the winter was ended he had become the most popular man in new salem although he was but twenty-two years of age in february eighteen thirty two had never been to school an entire year in his life 
had never made a speech except in debating clubs and by the roadside had read only the books he could pick up and known only the men who made up the poor out-of-the-way towns in which he had lived encouraged by his great popularity among his immediate neighbors as he says himself he decided to announce himself in march eighteen thirty two as a candidate for the general assembly of the state the only preliminary expected of a candidate for the legislature of illinois at that date was an announcement stating his sentiments with regard to local affairs the circular in which lincoln complied with this custom was a document of about two thousand words in which he plunged at once into the subject he believed most interesting to his constituents the public utility of internal improvements at that time the state of illinois as indeed the whole united states was convinced that the future of the country depended on the opening of canals and railroads and the clearing out of the rivers in the sangamon country the population felt that a quick way of getting to beardstown on the illinois river to which point the steamer came from the mississippi was as lincoln puts it in his circular indispensably necessary of course a railroad was the dream of the settlers but when it was considered seriously there was always as lincoln says a heart appalling shock accompanying the amount of its cost which forces us to shrink from our pleasing anticipations the probable cost of this contemplated railroad is estimated at two hundred and ninety thousand dollars the barest statement of which in my opinion is sufficient to justify the belief that the improvement of the sangamon river is an object much better suited to our infant resources respecting this view i think i may say without the fear of being contradicted that its navigation may be rendered completely practicable as high as the mouth of the south fork or probably higher to vessels of from twenty-five to thirty tons burden for at least one-half of all common years and to vessels of much greater burden a part of the time from my peculiar circumstances it is probable that for the last twelve months i have given as particular attention to the stage of the water in this river as any other person in the country in the month of march eighteen thirty one in company with others i commenced the building of a flatboat on the sangamon and finished and took her out in the course of the spring since that time i have been concerned in the mill at new salem these circumstances are sufficient evidence that i have not been very inattentive to the stages of the water the time at which we crossed the mill dam being in the last days of april the water was lower than it had been since the breaking of winter in february or than it was for several weeks after the principal difficulties we encountered in descending the river were from the drifted timber which obstructions all know are not difficult to be removed knowing almost precisely the height of water at that time i believe i am safe in saying that it has often been higher as lower since from this view of the subject it appears that my calculations with regard to the navigation of the sangamon cannot but be founded in reason but whatever may be its natural advantages certain it is that it can never be practically useful to any great extent without being greatly improved by art the drifted timber as i have before mentioned is the most formidable barrier to this object of all parts of this river none will require so much labor in proportion to make it navigable as the last thirty or thirty-five miles and going with the meanderings of the channel when we are this distance above its mouth we are only between twelve and eighteen miles above beardstown in something near a straight direction and this route is upon such low ground as to retain water in many places during the season and in all parts as to draw two-thirds or three-fourths of the river water at all high stages this route is on prairie land the whole distance so that it appears to me by removing the turf a sufficient width and damming up the old channel the whole river in a short time would wash its way through thereby curtailing the distance and increasing the velocity of the current very considerably while there would be no timber on the banks to obstruct its navigation in the future and being nearly straight the timber which might float in at the head would be apt to go clear through 
there are also many places above this where the river in its zigzag course forms such complete peninsulas as to be easier to cut at the necks than to remove the obstruction from the bends which if done would also lessen the distance what the cost of this work would be i am unable to say it is probable however that it would not be greater than is common to streams of the same length finally i believe the improvement of the sangamon river to be vastly important and highly desirable to the people of the county and if elected any measure in the legislature having this for its object which may appear judicious will meet my approbation and receive my support lincoln could not have adopted a measure more popular at that moment the whole population of sangamon was in a state of wild expectation some six weeks before lincoln's circular appeared a citizen of springfield had advertised that as soon as the ice went off the river he would bring up a steamer the talisman from cincinnati and prove the sangamon navigable the announcement had aroused the entire country speeches were made and subscriptions taken the merchants announced goods direct per steamship talisman the country over and every village from beardstown to springfield was laid off in town lots when the circular appeared the excitement was at its height lincoln's comments in his circular on two other subjects on which all candidates of the day express themselves are amusing in their simplicity the practice of loaning money at exorbitant rates was then a great evil in the west lincoln proposed that the limits of usury be fixed and he closed his paragraph on the subject with these words which sound strange enough for a man who in later life showed so profound a reverence for law in cases of extreme necessity there could always be means found to cheat the law while in all other cases it would have its intended effect i would favor the passage of a law on this subject which might not be very easily evaded let it be such that the labor and difficulty of evading it could only be justified in cases of greatest necessity a general revision of the laws of the state was the second topic which he felt required a word considering the great probability he said that the framers of those laws were wiser than myself i should prefer not meddling with them unless they were first attacked by others in which case i should feel it both a privilege and a duty to take that stand which in my view might tend most to the advancement of justice of course he said a word for education upon the subject of education not presuming to dictate any plan or system respecting it i can only say that i view it as the most important subject which we as a people can be engaged in that every man may receive at least a moderate education and thereby be enabled to read the histories of his own and other countries by which he may duly appreciate the value of our free institutions appears to be an object of vital importance even on this account alone to say nothing of the advantages and satisfaction to be derived from all being able to read the scriptures and other works both of a religious and moral nature for themselves for my part i desire to see the time when education and by its means morality sobriety enterprise and industry shall become much more general than at present and should be gratified to have it in my power to contribute something to the advancement of any measure which might have a tendency to accelerate that happy period the audacity of a young man in his position presenting himself as a candidate for the legislature is fully equalled by the humility of the closing paragraphs of his announcement but fellow-citizens i shall conclude considering the great degree of modesty which should always attend youth it is probable i have already been more presuming than becomes me however upon the subjects of which i have treated i have spoken as i have thought i may be wrong in regard to any or all of them but holding it a sound maxim that it is better only sometimes to be right than at all times to be wrong so soon as i discover my opinions to be erroneous i shall be ready to renounce them every man is said to have his peculiar ambition 
whether it be true or not i can say for one that i have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed of my fellow-men by rendering myself worthy of their esteem how far i shall succeed in gratifying this ambition is yet to be developed i am young and unknown to many of you i was born and have ever remained in the most humble walks of life i have no wealthy or popular relations or friends to recommend me my case is thrown exclusively upon the independent voters of the county and if elected they will have conferred a favor upon me for which i shall be unremitting in my labors to compensate but if the good people in their wisdom shall see it fit to keep me in the background i have been too familiar with disappointments to be very much chagrined very soon after lincoln had distributed his handbills enthusiasm on the subject of the opening up of the sangamon rose to a fever the talisman actually came up the river scores of men went to beardstown to meet her among them lincoln of course and to him was given the honor of piloting her an honor which made him remembered by many a man who saw him that day for the first time the trip was made with all the wild demonstrations which always attended the first steamboat on either bank a long procession of men and boys on foot or horse accompanied the boat cannons and volleys of musketry were fired from every settlement passed at every stop speeches were made congratulations offered toasts drunk flowers presented it was one long hurrah from beardstown to springfield and foremost in the jubilation was lincoln the pilot the talisman went to the point on the river nearest to springfield and there tied up for a week when she went back lincoln again had the conspicuous position of pilot the notoriety this gave him was probably quite as valuable politically as the forty dollars he received for his service was financially while the country had been dreaming of wealth through the opening of the sangamon and lincoln had been doing his best to prove that the dream would be realized the store in which he clerked was petering out to use his expression the owner denton offutt had proved more ambitious than wise and lincoln saw that an early closing by the sheriff was probable but before the store was fairly closed and while the talisman was yet exciting the country an event occurred which interrupted all of lincoln's plans End of section 5 Section 6 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 The Black Hawk War Lincoln, chosen captain of a company, re-enlists as an independent ranger. End of the war one morning in april a messenger from the governor of the state rode into new salem scattering circulars the circular was addressed to the militia of the northwest section of the state and announced that the british band of sacs and other hostile indians headed by black hawk had invaded the rock river country to the great terror of the frontier inhabitants and it was called upon the citizens who were willing to aid in repelling them to rendezvous at beardstown within a week the name of black hawk was familiar to the people of illinois he was an old enemy of the settlers and had been a tried friend of the british the land his people had once owned in the northwest of the present state of illinois had been sold in eighteen o four to the government of the united states but with the provision that the indians could hunt and raise corn there until it was surveyed and sold to the settlers long before the land was surveyed however squatters had invaded the country and tried to force the indians west of the mississippi particularly envious were these whites of the lands at the mouth of the rock river where the ancient village and burial place of the sack stood and where they came each year to raise corn black hawk had resisted their encroachments and many violent acts had been committed on both sides finally however the squatters in spite of the fact that the line of settlement was still fifty miles away succeeded in evading the real meaning of the treaty and in securing a survey of the desired land at the mouth of the river black hawk exasperated and broken-hearted at seeing his village violated persuaded himself that the village had never been sold 
indeed, that land could not be sold. My reason teaches me, he wrote, that land cannot be sold. The great spirit gave it to his children to live upon, and cultivate as far as necessary for their subsistence. And so long as they occupy and cultivate it, they have the right to the soil. But if they voluntarily leave it, then any other people have a right to settle upon it. Nothing can be sold but such things as can be carried away. Supported by this theory, conscious in some way that he did not understand that he had been wronged, and urged on by White Cloud, the prophet, who ruled a Winnebago village on the Rock River, Black Hawk crossed the Mississippi in 1831, determined to evict the settlers. A military demonstration drove him back, and he was persuaded to sign a treaty never to return east of the Mississippi. I touched the goose quill to the treaty and was determined to live in peace, he wrote afterwards. But hardly had he touched the goose quill before his heart smote him. Longing for his home, resentment at the whites, obstinacy, brooding over the bad counsels of White Cloud and his disciple, Neopope, an agitating Indian who had recently been east to visit the British and their Indian allies, and who assured Black Hawk that the Winnebagos, Ottawas, Chippewas, and Potawatomis would join him in a struggle for his land, and that the British would send him guns, ammunition, provision, and clothing early in the spring, all persuaded the Hawk that he would be successful if he made an effort to drive out the Whites. In spite of the advice of many of his friends and of the Indian agent in the country, he crossed the river on April 6, 1832, and with some five hundred braves, his squaws, and children, marched to the Prophet's town, thirty-five miles up the Rock River. As soon as they heard of Black Hawk's invasion, the settlers of the northwestern part of the state fled in a panic to the forts, and from there rained petitions for protection on Governor Reynolds. General Atkinson, who was at Fort Armstrong, wrote to the governor for reinforcements, and accordingly on the 16th of April, Governor Reynolds sent out influential messengers with a sonorous summons. It was one of these messengers riding into New Salem who put an end to Lincoln's canvassing for the legislature, freed him from off its expiring grocery, and led him to enlist. There was no time to waste. The volunteers were ordered to be at Beardstown, nearly forty miles from New Salem, on April 22nd. Horses, rifles, saddles, blankets were to be secured. A company formed. It was a work of which the settlers were not ignorant. Under the laws of the state, every able-bodied male inhabitant between 18 and 45 was obliged to drill twice a year, or pay a fine of one dollar. As a dollar was hard to raise, says one of the old settlers, everybody drilled. Preparations were quickly made, and by April 22nd, the men were at Beardstown. The day before, at Richland, Sangamon County, Lincoln was elected captain of the company from Sangamon. According to his friend Green, it was something beside ambition which led him to seek the captaincy. One of the odd jobs which Lincoln had taken since coming into Illinois was working in a sawmill for a man named Kirkpatrick. In hiring Lincoln, Kirkpatrick had promised to buy him a cant hook, with which to move heavy logs. Lincoln had proposed, if Kirkpatrick would give him the two dollars which the cant hook would cost, to move the logs with a common hand spike. This the proprietor had agreed to, but when payday came he refused to keep his word. When the Sangamon Company of Volunteers was formed, Kirkpatrick aspired to the captaincy, and Lincoln, knowing it, said to Green, Bill, I believe I can make Kirkpatrick pay me that two dollars he owes me on the cant hook. I'll run against him for captain. And he became a candidate. The vote was taken in a field by directing the men at the command march to assemble around the one they wanted for captain. When the order was given, three-fourths of the men gathered around Lincoln. In Lincoln's third-person autobiography, he says he was elected to his own surprise, and adds, He says he has not since had any success in life which gave him so much satisfaction. The company was a motley crowd of men. Each had secured for his outfit what he could get, and no two were equipped alike. Buckskin breeches prevailed, and there was a sprinkling of coonskin caps. Each man had a blanket of the coarsest texture. 
flintlock rifles were the usual arm though here and there a man had a kramer over the shoulder of each was slung a powder horn the men had as a rule as little regard for discipline as for appearances and when the new captain gave an order were as likely to jeer at it as to obey it to drive the indians out was their mission and any order which did not bear directly on that point was little respected lincoln himself was not familiar with military tactics and made many blunders of which he used to tell afterwards with relish one of these was an early experience in giving orders he was marching with a front of over twenty men across a field when he desired to pass through a gateway into the next enclosure i could not for the life of me said he remember the proper word of command for getting my company endwise so that it could get through the gate so as we came near i shouted this company is dismissed for two minutes when it will fall in again on the other side of the gate nor was it only his ignorance of the manual which caused him trouble he was so unfamiliar with camp discipline that he once had his sword taken from him for shooting within limits another disgrace he suffered was on account of his disorderly company the men unknown to him stole a quantity of liquor one night and the next morning were too drunk to fall in when the order was given to march for their lawlessness lincoln wore a wooden sword two days but none of these small difficulties injured his standing with the company they soon grew so proud of his quick wit and great strength that they obeyed him because they admired him no amount of military tactics could have secured from the volunteers the cheerful following he won by his personal qualities the men soon learned too that he meant what he said and would permit no dishonorable performances a helpless indian took refuge in the camp one day and the men who were inspired by that wanton mixture of selfishness unreason and cruelty which seems to seize a frontiersman as soon as he scents a red man were determined to kill the refugee he had a safe conduct from general cass but the men having come out to kill indians and not having succeeded threatened to take revenge on the helpless savage lincoln boldly took the man's part and though he risked his life in doing it he cowed the company and saved the indian it was on the twenty seventh of april that the force of sixteen hundred men organized at beardstown started out the army was cold the roads heavy the streams turbulent the army marched first to yellow banks on the mississippi then to dixon on the rock river which they reached on may twelfth at dixon they camped and near here occurred the first bloodshed of the war a body of about three hundred and forty rangers under major stillman but not of the regular army asked to go ahead as scouts to look for a body of indians under black hawk rumored to be about twelve miles away the permission was given and on the night of the fourteenth of may stillman and his men went into camp black hawk heard of their presence by this time the poor old chief had discovered that the promises of aid from the indian tribes and the british were false and dismayed he had resolved to recross the mississippi when he heard the whites were near he sent three braves with a white flag to ask for a parley and permission to descend the river behind them he sent five men to watch proceedings stillman's rangers were in camp when the bearers of the flag of truce appeared the men were many of them half drunk and when they saw the indian truce bearers they rushed out in a wild mob and ran them into camp then catching sight of the five spies they started after them killing two the three who reached black hawk reported that the truce bearers had been killed as well as their two companions furious at this violation of faith black hawk raised a yell and sallied forth with forty braves to meet stillman's band who by this time were out in search of the indians black hawk too maddened to think of the difference of numbers attacked the whites to his surprise the enemy turned and fled in a wild riot nor did they stop at the camp which from its position was almost impregnable they fled in complete panic sauve qui peut through their camp across prairie and rivers and swamps to dixon twelve miles away 
the first arrival reported that two thousand savages had swept down on stillman's camp and slaughtered all but himself before the next night all but eleven of the band had arrived stillman's defeat as this disgraceful affair is called put all notion of peace out of black hawk's mind and he started out in earnest on the warpath governor reynolds excited by the reports of the first arrivals from the stillman stampede made out that night by candlelight a call for more volunteers and by the morning of the fifteenth had messengers out and his army in pursuit of black hawk but it was like pursuing a shadow the indians purposely confused their trail sometimes it was a broad path then it suddenly radiated to all points the whites broke their bands and pursued the savages here and there never overtaking them though now and then coming suddenly on some terrible evidences of their presence a frontier home deserted and burned slaughtered cattle scalps suspended where the army could not fail to see them this fruitless warfare exasperated the volunteers they threatened to leave and their officers had great difficulty in making them obey orders on reaching a point in the rock river beyond which lay the indian country a company under colonel zachary taylor refused to cross and held a public indignation meeting urging that they had volunteered to defend the state and had the right as independent american citizens to refuse to go out of its borders taylor heard them to the end and then spoke i feel that all gentlemen here are my equals in reality i am persuaded that many of them will in a few years be my superiors and perhaps in the capacity of members of congress arbiters of the fortunes and reputation of humble servants of the republic like myself i expect then to obey them as interpreters of the will of the people and the best proof that i will obey them is now to observe the orders of those whom the people have already put in the place of authority to which many gentlemen around me justly aspire in plain english gentlemen and fellow-citizens the word has been passed on to me from washington to follow black hawk and to take you with me as soldiers i mean to do both there are the flatboats drawn up on the shore and here are uncle sam's men drawn up behind you on the prairie the volunteers knew true grit when they met it they dissolved their meeting and crossed the river without uncle sam's men being called into action the march in pursuit of the indians led the army to ottawa where the volunteers became so dissatisfied that on may twenty seventh and twenty eighth governor reynolds mustered them out but a force in the field was essential until a new levy was raised and a few of the men were patriotic enough to offer their services among them lincoln who on may twenty ninth was mustered in at the mouth of the fox river by a man in whom thirty years later he was to have a keen interest general robert anderson commander at fort sumter in eighteen sixty one lincoln became a private in captain elijah isle's company of independent rangers not brigaded a company made up says captain isles in his footsteps and wanderings of generals colonels captains and distinguished men from the disbanded army general anderson says that at this muster lincoln's arms were valued at forty dollars his horse and equipment at one hundred and twenty dollars the independent rangers were a favored body used to carry messages and to spy on the enemy they had no camp duties and drew rations as often as they pleased so that as a private lincoln was really better off than as a captain the achievements and tribulations of this body of rangers to which he belonged are told with interesting detail by its commanding officer captain isles in his footsteps and wanderings while the other companies were ordered to scout the country he writes mine was held by general atkinson in camp as a reserve one company was ordered to go to rock river now dixon and report to colonel taylor afterwards president who had been left there with a few united states soldiers to guard the army supplies the place was also made a point of rendezvous just as the company got to dixon a man came in and reported that he and six others were on the road to galena and in passing through a point of timber about twenty miles north of dixon they were fired on and six killed he being the only one to make his escape 
Colonel Taylor ordered the company to proceed to the place, bury the dead, go on to Galena, and get all the information they could about the Indians. But the company took fright and came back to the Illinois River helter-skelter. General Atkinson then called on me and wanted to know how I felt about taking the trip, that he was exceedingly anxious to open communication with Galena and to find out, if possible, the whereabouts of the Indians before the new troops arrived. I answered the general that myself and men were getting rusty and were anxious to have something to do, and that nothing would please us better than to be ordered out on the expedition, that I would find out how many of my men had good horses and were otherwise well equipped, and what time we wanted to prepare for the trip. I called on him again at sunset and reported that I had about fifty men well equipped and eager, and that we wanted one day to make preparations. He said, go ahead, and he would prepare our orders. The next day was a busy one, running bullets and getting our flintlocks in order. We had no percussion locks then. General Henry, one of my privates, who had been promoted to the position of major of one of the companies, volunteered to go with us. I considered him a host, as he had served as lieutenant in the War of 1812 under General Scott, and was in the Battle of Lundy's Lane and several other battles. He was a good drill officer and could aid me much. After General Atkinson handed me my orders and my men were mounted and ready for the trip, I felt proud of them and was confident of our success, although numbering only forty-eight. Several good men failed to go, as they had gone down to the foot of the Illinois Rapids to aid in bringing up the boats of Army supplies. We wanted to be as little encumbered as possible, and took nothing that could be dispensed with other than blankets, tin cups, coffee pots, canteens, a wallet of bread, and some fat side meat, which we ate raw or broiled. When we arrived at Rock River, we found Colonel Taylor on the opposite side, in a little fort built of prairie sod. He sent an officer in a canoe to bring me over. I said to the officer that I would come over as soon as I got my men in camp. I knew of a good spring half a mile above, and I determined to camp at it. After the men were in camp, I called on General Henry, and he accompanied me. On meeting Colonel Taylor, he looked like a man born to command, he seemed a little piqued that I did not come over and camp with him. I told him we felt just as safe as if quartered in his one-horse fort. Besides, I knew what his orders would be, and wanted to try the mettle of my men before starting on the perilous trip I knew he would order. He said the trip was perilous, and that since the murder of the six men, all communications with Galena had been cut off, and it might be besieged, that he wanted me to proceed to Galena, and that he would have my orders for me in the morning, and asked what outfit I wanted. I answered, nothing but coffee, side meat, and bread. In the morning, my orders were to collect and bury the remains of the six men murdered, proceed to Galena, make a careful search for the signs of Indians, and find out whether they were aiming to escape by crossing the river below Galena, and get all information at Galena of their possible whereabouts before the new troops were ready to follow them. John Dixon, who kept a house of entertainment here, and had sent his family to Galena for safety, joined us, and hauled our wallets of corn and grub in his wagon, which was a great help. Lieutenant Harris, USA, also joined us. I now had fifty men to go with me on the march. I detailed two to march on the right, two on the left, and two in advance, to act as lookouts to prevent a surprise. They were to keep in full view of us, and to remain out until we camped for the night. Just at sundown of the first day, while we were at lunch, our advance scouts came in under whip and reported Indians. We bounced to our feet, and having a full view of the road for a long distance, could see a large body coming toward us. All eyes were turned to John Dixon, who, as the last one dropped out of sight coming over a ridge, pronounced them Indians. I stationed my men in a ravine crossing the road, where anyone approaching could not see us until within thirty yards. The horses I had driven back out of sight in a valley. I asked General Henry to take command. He said, No, stand at your post, and walked along the line talking to the men in a low, calm voice. Lieutenant Harris, USA, seemed much agitated. 
he ran up and down the line and exclaimed captain we will catch hell he had horse pistols belt pistols and a double-barreled gun he would pick the flints reprime and lay the horse pistols at his feet when he got all ready he passed along the line slowly and seeing the nerves of the men all quiet after general henry's talk to them said captain we are safe we can whip five hundred indians instead of indians they proved to be the command of general dodge from galena of one hundred and fifty men en route to find out what had become of general atkinson's army as since the murder of the six men communication had been stopped for more than ten days my lookout at the top of the hill did not notify us and we were not undeceived until they got within thirty steps of us my men then raised a yell and ran to finish their lunch when we got within fifteen miles of galena on apple creek we found a stockade filled with women and children and a few men all terribly frightened the indians had shot at and chased two men that afternoon who made their escape to the stockade they insisted in our quartering in the fort but instead we camped one hundred yards outside and slept what little sleep we did get with our guns on our arms general henry did not sleep but drilled my men all night so that the moment they were called they would bounce to their feet and stand in two lines the front ready to fire and fall back to reload while the others stepped forward to take their places they were called up a number of times and we got but little sleep we arrived at galena the next day and found the citizens prepared to defend the place they were glad to see us as it had been so long since they had heard from general atkinson and his army the few indians prowling about galena and murdering were simply there as a ruse on our return from galena near the forks of the apple river and gratiot roads we could see general dodge on the gratiot road on his return from rock river his six scouts had discovered my two men that i had allowed to drop in the rear two men who had been in stillman's defeat and having weak horses were allowed to fall behind having weak horses they had fallen in the rear about two miles and each took the other to be indians and such an exciting race i never saw until they got sight of my company then they came to a sudden halt and after looking at us a few moments wheeled their horses and gave up the chase my two men did not know but that they were indians until they came up with us and shouted indians they had thrown away their wallets and guns and used their ramrods as whips the few houses on the road that usually accommodated the travel were all standing but vacant as we went on our return we found them burned by the indians in my return to the illinois river i reported to general atkinson saying that from all we could learn the indians were aiming to escape by going north with the intention of crossing the mississippi river above galena the new troops had just arrived and were being mustered into service my company had only been organized for twenty days and as time had now expired the men were mustered out all but myself again volunteered for the third time it was the middle of june when captain isles and his company returned to dixon's ferry from their indian hunt and were mustered out on june twentieth lincoln was mustered in again by major anderson as a member of an independent company under captain jacob m early his arms were valued this time at only fifteen dollars his horse and equipments at eighty five dollars a week after re-enlistment lincoln's company moved northward with the army it was time they moved for black hawk was overrunning the country and scattering death wherever he went the settlers were wild with fear and most of the settlements were abandoned at a sudden sound at the merest rumor men women and children fled i well remember these troublesome times writes one illinois woman we often left our bread dough unbaked to rush to the indian fort near by when mr john bryant a brother of william cullen bryant visited the colony in princeton in eighteen thirty two he found it nearly broken up on account of the war everywhere crops were neglected for the able-bodied men were volunteering william cullen bryant who in june eighteen thirty four travelled on horseback from petersburg to near pekin and back wrote home 
every few miles on our way we fell in with bodies of illinois militia proceeding to the american camp or saw where they had encamped for the night they generally stationed themselves near a stream or a spring in the edge of a wood and turned their horses to graze on the prairie their way was barked or girdled and the roads through the uninhabited country were as much beaten and as dusty as the highways on new york island some of the settlers complained that they made war upon the pigs and chickens they were a hard-looking set of men unkempt and unshaved wearing shirts of dark calico and sometimes calico capotes soon after the army moved up the rock river the independent spy company of which lincoln was a member was sent with a brigade to the northwest near galena in pursuit of the hawk the nearest lincoln came to an actual engagement in the war was here the skirmish of kellogg's grove took place on june twenty fifth lincoln's company came up soon after it was over and helped bury the five men killed it was probably to this experience that he referred when he told a friend once of coming on a camp of white scouts one morning just as the sun was rising the indians had surprised the camp and killed and scalped every man i remember just how those men looked said lincoln as we rode up the little hill where their camp was the red light of the morning sun was streaming upon them as they lay head towards us on the ground and every man had a large red spot on the top of his head about as big as a dollar where the redskins had taken his scalp it was frightful but it was grotesque and the red sunlight seemed to paint everything all over lincoln paused as if recalling the vivid picture and added somewhat irrelevantly i remember that one man had buckskin breeches on early's company on returning from their expedition joined the main army on its northward march by the end of the month the troops crossed into michigan territory as wisconsin was then called and july was passed floundering in swamps and stumbling through forests in pursuit of the now nearly exhausted black hawk no doubt early's company saw the hardest service on the march for to it was allotted the scouting the farther the army advanced the more difficult was the situation finally the provisions gave out and july tenth three weeks before the last battle of the war that of bad axe in which the whites finally massacred most of the indian band lincoln's company was disbanded at whitewater wisconsin and he and his friends started for home the volunteers in returning suffered much from hunger more than one of them had nothing to eat on the journey except meal and water baked in rolls of bark laid by the fire lincoln not only went hungry on this return he had to tramp most of the way the night before his company started from whitewater he and one of his messmates had their horses stolen and excepting when their more fortunate companions gave them a lift they walked as far as peoria illinois where they bought a canoe and paddled down the illinois river to havana here they sold the canoe and walked across the country to New Salem. End of section six. Section seven of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume One, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter seven. Lincoln runs for state assembly and is defeated. Storekeeper. Student. Postmaster. Surveyor. On returning to New Salem, Lincoln at once plunged into electioneering. He ran as an avowed clay man, and the country was stiffly democratic. However, in those days political contests were almost purely personal. If the candidate was liked, he was voted for, irrespective of principle. The Democrats of New Salem worked for Lincoln out of their personal regard for him, said Stephen T. Logan, a young lawyer of Springfield, who made Lincoln's acquaintance in the campaign. He was as stiff as a man could be in his weak doctrines. They did this for him simply because he was popular, because he was Lincoln. It was the custom for the candidates to appear at every gathering which brought the people out, and if they had a chance, to make speeches. Then, as now, the farmers gathered at the county seat or at the largest town within their reach on Saturday afternoons to dispose of produce, buy supplies, see their neighbors, and get the news. 
During election time, candidates were always present, and a regular feature of the day was listening to their speeches. They never missed public sales, it being expected that after the Van Du, the candidates would take the auctioneer's place. Lincoln let none of these chances to be heard slip. Accompanied by his friends, generally including a few Clary's Grove boys, he always was present. The first speech he made was after a sale at Papsville. What he said there is not remembered, but an illustration of the kind of man he was, interpolated into his discourse, made a lasting impression. A fight broke out in the audience while he was on the stand, and observing that one of his friends was being worsted, he bounded into the group of contestants, seizing the fellow who had his supporter down, threw him, according to tradition, ten or twelve feet, mounted the platform, and finished the speech. Sangamon County could appreciate such a performance, and the crowd at Papsville that day never forgot Lincoln. His visits to Springfield were of great importance to him. Springfield was not, at that time, a very attractive place. Bryant, visiting it in June 1832, said that the houses were not as good as at Jacksonville, a considerable proportion of them being log cabins, and the whole town having an appearance of dirt and discomfort. Nevertheless, it was the largest town in the county, and among its inhabitants were many young men of breeding, education, and energy. One of these men Lincoln had become well acquainted with in the Black Hawk War, Major John T. Stewart, at that time a lawyer, and, like Lincoln, a candidate for the General Assembly. He met others at this time, who were to be associated with him more or less closely in the future, in both law and politics, among them Judge Logan and William Butler. With these men, the manners which had won him the day at Papsville were of little value. What impressed them was his very sensible speech, and his decided individuality and originality. The election came off on August 6th. Lincoln was defeated. This was the only time Abraham was ever defeated on a direct vote of the people, says his autobiographical notes. He had a consolation in his defeat, however, for in spite of the pronounced democratic sentiments of his precinct, he received, according to the official poll book in the county clerk's office at Springfield, 227 votes out of 300 cast. This defeat did not take him out of politics. Six weeks later, he filled his first civil office, that of clerk of the September election. The report, in his hand, still exists his first official document. In the following years, few elections were held in New Salem, at which Lincoln did not act as clerk. The election over, Lincoln began to look for work. One of his friends, an admirer of his physical strength, advised him to become a blacksmith, but it was a trade which afforded little leisure for study and for meeting and talking with men, and he had already resolved, it is evident, that books and men were essential to him. The only employment in New Salem which offered both employment and the opportunities he sought was clerking in a store. Now, the stores in New Salem were in more need of customers than of clerks, business having been greatly overdone. In the fall of 1832, four stores offered wares to the 100 inhabitants of New Salem. The most pretentious was that of Hill and McNeil, which carried a large line of dry goods. The three others, owned respectively by the Herndon brothers, Reuben Radford, and James Rutledge, were groceries. Failing to secure employment in any of these establishments, Lincoln resolved to buy a store. He was not long in finding an opportunity to purchase. James Herndon had already sold out his half-interest in Herndon's brother's store to William F. Berry and Rowan Herndon, not getting along well with Barry, was only too glad to find a purchaser of his half in the person of Abe Lincoln. Barry was as poor as Lincoln, but that was not a serious obstacle, for their notes were accepted for the Herndon stock of goods. They had barely hung out their sign when something happened which threw another store into their hands. Reuben Radford had made himself obnoxious to the Clary's Grove boys, and one night they broke in his doors and windows and overturned his counters and sugar barrels. It was too much for Radford, and he sold out next day to William G. Green for a $400 note signed by Green. 
at the latter's request lincoln made an inventory of the stock and offered him six hundred and fifty dollars for it a proposition which was cheerfully accepted barry and lincoln being unable to pay cash assumed the four hundred dollar note payable to radford and gave green their joint note for two hundred and fifty dollars the little grocery owned by james rutledge was the next to succumb barry and lincoln bought it at a bargain their joint note taking the place of cash the three stocks were consolidated their aggregate cost must have been not less than fifteen hundred dollars barry and lincoln had secured a monopoly of the grocery business in new salem within a few weeks two penniless men had become the proprietors of three stores and had stopped buying only because there were no more to purchase but the partnership it was soon evident was unfortunate barry though the son of a presbyterian minister was according to tradition a very wicked young man drinking gambling and taking an active part in all of the disturbances in the neighborhood in spite of the bad habits of his partner lincoln left the management of the business largely to him it was his love of books which was responsible for this poor business management he had soon discovered that storekeeping in new salem after all duties were done left a large amount of leisure on a man's hands it was his chance to read and he scoured the town for books hour after hour he was seen stretched on the counter his head on a cracker box or outside under a tree reading oblivious of business indifferent to the evident fact that barry was squandering whatever the firm might make it was in this period that lincoln discovered shakespeare and burns in new salem there was one of those curious individuals sometimes found in frontier settlements half poet half loafer incapable of earning a living in any steady employment yet familiar with good literature and capable of enjoying it jack kelso he repeated passages from shakespeare and burns incessantly over the odd jobs he undertook or as he idled by the streams for he was a famous fisherman and lincoln soon became one of his constant companions the tastes he formed in company with kelso he retained through life it was not only burns and shakespeare that interfered with the grocery keeping lincoln had begun seriously to read law his first acquaintance with the subject we have already seen had been made when a mere lad a copy of the revised statutes of indiana had fallen into his hands but from the time he left indiana in 1830 he had no legal reading until one day soon after the grocery was started there happened one of those trivial incidents which so often turn the current of a life it is best told in mr lincoln's own words one day a man who was migrating to the west drove up in front of my store with a wagon which contained his family and household plunder he asked me if i would buy an old barrel for which he had no room in his wagon and which he said contained nothing of special value i did not want it but to oblige him i bought it and paid him i think half a dollar for it without further examination i put it away in the store and forgot all about it some time after in overhauling things i came upon the barrel and emptying it upon the floor to see what it contained i found at the bottom of the rubbish a complete edition of blackstone's commentaries i began to read those famous works and i had plenty of time for during the long summer days when the farmers were busy with their crops my customers were few and far between the more i read this he said with unusual emphasis the more intensely interested i became never in my whole life was my mind so thoroughly absorbed i read until i devoured them but all this was fatal to business and by spring it was evident that something must be done to stimulate the grocery sales liquor selling was the expedient adopted for on the sixth of march eighteen thirty three the county commissioner's court of sangamon county granted the firm of barry and lincoln a license to keep a tavern at new salem it is probable that the license was procured not to enable the firm to keep a tavern but to retail the liquors which they had in stock each of the three groceries which barry and lincoln acquired had the usual supply of liquors and it was only natural that they should seek a way to dispose of the surplus quickly and profitably 
an end which could best be accomplished by selling it over the counter by the glass to do this lawfully required a tavern license and it is a warrantable conclusion that such was the chief aim of barry and lincoln in procuring a franchise of this character we are fortified in this conclusion by the coincidence that three other grocers of new salem were among those who took out tavern licenses in a community in which liquor drinking was practically universal at a time when whiskey was as legitimate an article of merchandise as coffee or calico when no family was without a jug when the minister of the gospel could take his dram without any breach of propriety it is not surprising that a reputable young man should have been found selling whiskey liquor was sold at all groceries but it could not be lawfully sold in a smaller quantity than one quart the law however was not always rigidly observed and it was the custom of storekeepers to treat their patrons the license issued to barry and lincoln read as follows ordered that william f barry in the name of barry and lincoln have a license to keep a tavern in new salem to continue twelve months from this date and that they pay one dollar in addition to the six dollars heretofore paid as per treasurer's receipt and that they be allowed the following rates viz french brandy per half pint twenty five peach brandy per half pint eighteen and three quarters apple brandy per half pint twelve holland gin per half pint eighteen and three quarters domestic per half pint twelve and a half wine per half pint twenty five rum per half pint eighteen and three quarters whiskey per half pint twelve and a half breakfast dinner or supper twenty five lodging per night twelve and a half horse per night twenty five single feed twelve and a half breakfast dinner or supper for stage passengers who gave bond as required by law thirty seven and a half at the granting of a tavern license the applicants therefore were required by law to file a bond the bond given in the case of barry and lincoln was as follows know all men by these presents we william f barry abraham lincoln and john bowling green are held and firmly bound unto the county commissioners of sangamon county in the full sum of three hundred dollars to which payment well and truly to be made we bind ourselves our heirs executors and administrators firmly by these presents sealed with our seal and dated this sixth day of march a d eighteen thirty three now the condition of this obligation is such that whereas the said barry and lincoln has obtained a license from the county commissioner's court to keep a tavern in the town of new salem to continue one year now if the said barry and lincoln shall be of good behavior and observe all the laws of this state relative to tavern keepers then this obligation to be void or otherwise remain in full force abraham lincoln seal william f barry seal bowling green seal this bond appears to have been written by the clerk of the commissioner's court and lincoln's name was signed by someone other than himself very likely by his partner barry business was not so brisk in barry and lincoln's grocery even after the license was granted that the junior partner did not welcome an appointment as postmaster which he received may eighteen thirty three the appointment of a Whig by a Democratic administration seems to have been made without comment. The office was too insignificant to make his politics an objection, say his autobiographical notes. The duties of the new office were not arduous, for letters were few, and their comings far between. At that date, the mails were carried by four-horse post-coaches from city to city, and on horseback from central points into the country towns the rates of postage were high a single sheet letter carried thirty miles or under cost six cents thirty to eighty miles ten cents eighty to one hundred and fifty miles twelve and one-half cents one hundred and fifty to four hundred miles eighteen and one-half cents over four hundred miles twenty-five cents a copy of one of the popular magazines set from new york to new salem would have cost fully twenty-five cents the mail was irregular in coming as well as light in its contents though supposed to arrive twice a week it sometimes happened that a fortnight or more passed without any mail 
under these conditions the new salem post office was not a serious care a large number of the patrons of the office lived in the country many of them miles away and generally lincoln delivered their letters at their doors these letters he would carefully place in the crown of his hat and distribute them from house to house thus it was in a measure true that he carried the new salem post office in his hat the habit of carrying papers in his hat clung to lincoln for many years later when he was a practicing lawyer in springfield he apologized for failing to answer a letter promptly by explaining when i received your letter i put it in my old hat and buying a new one the next day the old one was set aside and so the letter was lost sight of for a time but whether the mail was delivered by the postmaster himself or was received at the store it was the habit to stop and visit a while he who received a letter read it and repeated the contents if he had a newspaper usually the postmaster could tell him in advance what it contained for one of the perquisites of the early post office was the privilege of reading all printed matter before delivering it every day then lincoln's acquaintance in new salem through his position as postmaster became more intimate as the summer of eighteen thirty three went on the condition of the store became more and more unsatisfactory as the position of postmaster brought in only a small revenue lincoln was forced to take any odd work he could get he helped in other stores in the town split rails and looked after the mill but all this yielded only a scant and uncertain support and when in the fall he had an opportunity to learn surveying he accepted it eagerly the condition of affairs in illinois in the early thirties made a demand for the service of surveyors the immigration had been phenomenal there were thousands of farms to be surveyed and thousands of corners to be located speculators bought up large tracts and mapped out cities on paper it was years before the first railroad was built in illinois and as all inland traveling was done on horseback or in the stagecoach each year hundreds of miles of wagon roads were opened through woods and swamps and prairies as the county of sangamon was large and eagerly sought by immigrants the county surveyor in eighteen thirty three one john calhoun needed deputies but in a country so new it was no easy matter to find men with the requisite capacity with lincoln calhoun had little if any personal acquaintance for they lived twenty miles apart lincoln however had made himself known by his meteoric race for the legislature in eighteen thirty two and calhoun had heard of him as an honest intelligent and trustworthy young man one day he sent word to lincoln by pollard simmons who lived in the new salem neighborhood that he had decided to appoint him a deputy surveyor if he would accept the position going into the woods simmons found lincoln engaged in his old occupation of making rails the two sat down together on a log and simmons told lincoln what calhoun had said now calhoun was a jackson man he was for clay what did he know about surveying and why should a democratic official offer him a position of any kind he immediately went to springfield and had a talk with calhoun he would not accept the appointment he said unless he had the assurance that it involved no political obligation and that he might continue to express his political opinions as freely and frequently as he chose this assurance was given the only difficulty then in the way was the fact that he knew absolutely nothing of surveying but calhoun of course understood this and agreed that he should have time to learn with the promptness of action with which he always undertook anything he had to do lincoln procured flint and gibson's treatise on surveying and sought mentor graham for help at a sacrifice of some time the schoolmaster aided him to a partial mastery of the intricate subject lincoln worked literally day and night sitting up night after night until the crowing of the cock warned him of the approaching dawn so hard did he study that his friends were greatly concerned at his haggard face but in six weeks he had mastered all the books within reach relating to the subject a task which under ordinary circumstances would hardly have been achieved in as many months reporting to calhoun for duty greatly to the amazement of that gentleman 
he was at once assigned to the territory in the northwest part of the county and the first work he did of which there is any authentic record was in january eighteen thirty four in that month he surveyed a piece of land for russell godby dating the certificate january fourteenth eighteen thirty four and signing it j calhoun s s c by a lincoln lincoln was frequently employed in laying out public roads being selected for that purpose by the county commissioner's court so far as can be learned from the official records the first road he surveyed was from musick ferry on salt creek via new salem to the county line in the direction of jacksonville for this he was allowed fifteen dollars for five days service and two dollars and fifty cents for a plat of the new road the next road he surveyed according to the records was that leading from athens to sangamon town this was reported to the county commissioner's court november fourth eighteen thirty four but road surveying was only a small portion of his work he was more frequently employed by private individuals according to tradition when he first took up the business he was too poor to buy a chain and instead used a long straight grapevine probably this is a myth though surveyors who had experience in the early days say it may be true the chains commonly used at that time were made of iron constant use wore away and weakened the links and it was no unusual thing for a chain to lengthen six inches after a year's use and a good grapevine to use the words of a veteran surveyor would give quite as satisfactory results as one of those old-fashioned chains lincoln's surveys had the extraordinary merit of being correct much of the government work had been rather indifferently done or the government corners had been imperfectly preserved and there were frequent disputes between adjacent landowners about boundary lines frequently lincoln was called upon in such cases to find the corner in controversy his verdict was invariably the end of the dispute so general was the confidence in his honesty and skill some of these old corners located by him are still in existence the people of petersburg proudly remember that they live in a town which was laid out by lincoln this he did in eighteen thirty six and it was the work of several weeks lincoln's pay as a surveyor was three dollars a day more than he had ever before earned compared with the compensation for like services nowadays it seems small enough but at that time it was really princely the governor of the state received a salary of only one thousand dollars a year the secretary of state six hundred dollars and good board and lodging could be obtained for one dollar a week but even three dollars a day did not enable him to meet all his financial obligations the heavy debts of the store hung over him he was obliged to help his father's family the long distances he had to travel in his new employment had made it necessary to buy a horse and for it he had gone into debt my father says thomas watkins of petersburg who remembers the circumstances well sold lincoln the horse and my recollection is that lincoln agreed to pay him fifty dollars for it lincoln was a little slow in making the payments and after he had paid all but ten dollars my father who was a high-strung man became impatient and sued him for the balance lincoln of course did not deny the debt but raised the money and paid it i do not often tell this mr watkins adds because i have always thought that there never was such a man as lincoln and i have always been sorry father sued him between his duties as deputy surveyor and postmaster lincoln had a little leisure for the store and its management passed into the hands of barry the stock of groceries was on the wane the numerous obligations of the firm were maturing with no money to meet them both members of the firm in the face of such obstacles lost courage and when early in eighteen thirty four alexander and william trent asked if the store was for sale an affirmative answer was eagerly given a price was agreed upon and the sale was made now neither alexander trent nor his brother had any money but as barry and lincoln had bought without money it seemed only fair that they should be willing to sell on the same terms accordingly the notes of the trent brothers were accepted for the purchase price and the store was turned over to the new owners but about the time their notes fell due the trent brothers disappeared 
the few groceries in the store were seized by creditors and the doors were closed never to be opened again misfortunes now crowded upon lincoln his late partner barry soon reached the end of his wild career and one morning a farmer from the rock creek neighborhood drove into new salem with the news that he was dead the appalling debt which had accumulated was thrown upon lincoln's shoulders it was then too common a fashion among men who became deluged in debt to clear out in the expressive language of the pioneer as the trents had done but this was not lincoln's way he quietly settled down among the men he owed and promised to pay them for fifteen years he carried this burden a load which he cheerfully and manfully bore but one so heavy that he habitually spoke of it as the national debt talking once of it to a friend lincoln said that debt was the greatest obstacle i have ever met in life i had no way of speculating and could not earn money except by labor and to earn by labor eleven hundred dollars besides my living seemed the work of a lifetime there was however but one way i went to the creditors and i told them that if they would let me alone i would give them all i could earn over my living as fast as i could earn it as late as eighteen forty eight so we are informed by mr herndon mr lincoln then a member of congress sent home money saved from his salary to be applied on these obligations all the notes with interest at the high rates then prevailing were at last paid with a single exception lincoln's creditors seemed to be lenient one of the notes given by him came into the hands of a mr van bergen who when it fell due brought suit the amount of the judgment was more than lincoln could pay and his personal effects were levied upon these consisted of his horse saddle and bridle and surveying instruments james short a well-to-do farmer living on sand ridge a few miles north of new salem heard of the trouble which had befallen his young friend without advising lincoln of his plans he attended the sale bought in the horse and surveying instruments for one hundred and twenty dollars and turned them over to their former owner lincoln never forgot a benefactor he not only repaid the money with interest but nearly thirty years later remembered the kindness in a most substantial way after lincoln left new salem financial reverses came to james short and he removed to the far west to seek his fortune anew early in lincoln's presidential term he heard that uncle jimmy was living in california one day mr short received a letter from washington d c tearing it open he read the gratifying announcement that he had been commissioned an indian agent the kindness of mr short was not exceptional in lincoln's new salem career when the store had winked out as he put it and the post office had been left without headquarters one of his neighbors samuel hill invited the homeless postmaster into his store there was hardly a man or woman in the community who would not have been glad to have done as much it was a simple recognition on their part of lincoln's friendliness to them he was what they called obliging a man who instinctively did the thing which he saw would help another no matter how trivial or homely it was in the home of rowan herndon where he had boarded when he first came to the town he had made himself loved by his care of the children he nearly always had one of them around with him says mr herndon in the rutledge tavern where he afterwards lived the landlord told with appreciation how when the house was full lincoln gave up his bed went to the store and slept on the counter his pillow a web of calico if a traveller stuck in the mud in new salem's one street lincoln was always the first to help pull out the wheel the widows praised him because he chopped their wood the overworked because he was always ready to give them a lift it was the spontaneous unobtrusive helpfulness of the man's nature which endeared him to everybody and which inspired a general desire to do all possible in return there are many tales told of homely service rendered him even by the hard-working farmers wives around new salem there was not one of them who did not gladly put on a plate for abe lincoln when he appeared or would not darn or mend for him when she knew he needed it hannah armstrong the wife of the hero of clary's grove made him one of her family abe would come out to our house she said 
drink milk, eat mush, cornbread and butter, bring the children candy, and rock the cradle while I got him something to eat. Has stayed at our house two or three weeks at a time. Lincoln's pay for his first piece of surveying came in the shape of two buckskins, and it was Hannah who foxed them on his trousers. His relations were equally friendly in the better homes of the community. Even at the minister's, the Reverend John Cameron's, he was perfectly at home, and Mrs. Cameron was by him affectionately called Aunt Polly. It was not only his kindly service which made Lincoln loved, it was his sympathetic comprehension of the lives and joys and sorrows and interests of the people. Whether it was Jack Armstrong and his wrestling, Hannah and her babies, Kelso and his fishing and poetry, the schoolmaster and his books, with one and all he was at home. He possessed in an extraordinary degree the power of entering into the interests of others a power found only in reflective, unselfish natures, endowed with a humorous sense of human foibles, coupled with a great tenderness of heart. Men and women amused Lincoln, but so long as they were sincere, he loved them and sympathized with them. He was human in the best sense of that fine word. End of section 7 Section 8 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8. Electioneering in Illinois in 1834. Lincoln Reads Law. First Term as Assemblyman. Lincoln's First Great Sorrow. Now that the store was closed and his surveying increased, Lincoln had an excellent opportunity to extend his acquaintance by traveling about the country everywhere he won friends the surveyor naturally was respected for his calling's sake but the new deputy surveyor was admired for his friendly ways his willingness to lend a hand indoors as well as out his learning his ambition his independence throughout the county he began to be regarded as a right smart young man some of his associates appear even to have comprehended his peculiarly great character and dimly to have foreseen a splendid future. Often, says Daniel Greenburner, at one time clerk in Barry and Lincoln's grocery, I have heard my brother-in-law, Dr. Duncan, say he would not be surprised if some day Abe Lincoln got to be governor of Illinois. Lincoln, Mr. Burner adds, was thought to know a little more than anybody else among the young people. He was a good debater and liked it. He read much and seemed never to forget anything. Lincoln was fully conscious of his popularity, and it seemed to him in 1834 that he could safely venture to try again for the legislature. Accordingly, he announced himself as a candidate, spending much of the summer of 1834 in electioneering. It was a repetition of what he had done in 1832, though on the larger scale made possible by wider acquaintance. In company with the other candidates, he rode up and down the county, making speeches in the public squares, in shady groves, now and then in a log schoolhouse. In his speeches, he soon distinguished himself by the amazing candor with which he dealt with all questions, and by his curious blending of audacity and humility. Wherever he saw a crowd of men, he joined them, and he never failed to adapt himself to their point of view in asking for votes. If the degree of physical strength was their test for a candidate, he was ready to lift a weight or wrestle with the countryside champion. If the amount of grain a man could cut would recommend him, he seized the cradle and showed the swath he could cut. The campaign was well conducted, for in August he was elected one of the four assemblymen from Sangamon. The best thing which Lincoln did in the canvass of 1834 was not winning votes. It was coming to a determination to read law, not for pleasure, but as a business. In his autobiographical notes, he says, During the canvass, in a private conversation, Major John T. Stewart, one of his fellow candidates, encouraged Abraham to study law. After the election, he borrowed books of Stewart, took them home with him, and went at it in good earnest. He never studied with anybody. He seems to have thrown himself into the work with almost impatient ardor. 
as he tramped back and forth from springfield twenty miles away to get his law books he read sometimes forty pages or more on the way often he was seen wandering at random across the fields repeating aloud the points in his last reading the subject never seemed to be out of his mind it was the great absorbing interest of his life the rule he gave twenty years later to a young man who wanted to know how to become a lawyer was the one he practiced get books and read and study them carefully begin with blackstone's commentaries and after reading carefully through say twice take chitty's pleadings greenleaf's evidence and story's equity in succession work 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 is the main thing having secured a book of legal forms he was soon able to write deeds contracts and all sorts of legal instruments and he was frequently called upon by his neighbors to perform services of this kind in eighteen thirty four says daniel green burner my father isaac burner sold out to henry onstott and he wanted a deed written i knew how handy lincoln was that way and suggested that we get him we found him sitting on a stump all right said he when informed what we wanted if you will bring me a pen and ink and a piece of paper i will write it here i brought him these articles and picking up a shingle and putting it on his knee for a desk he wrote out the deed as there was no practicing lawyer nearer than springfield lincoln was often employed to act the part of advocate before the village squire at that time bowling green he realized that this experience was valuable and never so far as known demanded or accepted a fee for his services in these petty cases justice was sometimes administered in a summary way in squire green's court precedents and the venerable rules of law had little weight the squire took judicial notice of a great many facts often going so far as to fill simultaneously the two functions of witness and court but his decisions were generally just james mcgrady rutledge tells a story in which several of lincoln's old friends figure and which illustrates the legal practices of new salem jack kelso says mr rutledge owned or claimed to own a white hog it was also claimed by john ferguson the hog had wandered around bowling green's place until he felt somewhat acquainted with it ferguson sued kelso and the case was tried before squire green the plaintiff produced two witnesses who testified positively that the hog belonged to him kelso had nothing to offer save his own unsupported claim are there any more witnesses inquired the court he was informed that there were no more well said squire green the two witnesses we have heard have sworn to a blank lie i know this shoat and i know it belongs to jack kelso i therefore decide this case in his favor an extract from the record of the county commissioner's court illustrates the nature of the cases that came before the justice of the peace in lincoln's day it also shows the price put upon the privilege of working on sunday in eighteen thirty two january twenty ninth eighteen thirty two alexander gibson found guilty of sabbath breaking and fined twelve and a half cents fine paid into court signed edward robinson j p the session of the ninth assembly began december first eighteen thirty four and lincoln went to the capital then vandalia seventy-five miles southeast of new salem on the kaskaskia river in time for the opening vandalia was a town which had been called into existence in eighteen twenty especially to give the state government an abiding place its very name had been chosen it is said because it sounded well for a state capital as the tradition goes while the commissioners were debating what they should call the town they were making a wag suggested that it be named vandalia in honor of the vandals a tribe of indians which he said had once lived on the borders of the kaskaskia this he argued would conserve a local tradition while giving a euphonious title the commissioners pleased with so good a suggestion adopted the name when lincoln first went to vandalia it was a town of about eight hundred inhabitants its noteworthy features according to peck's gazetteer of illinois for eighteen thirty four being a brick courthouse a two-story brick edifice used by state officers 
a neat framed house of worship for the Presbyterian Society, with a cupola and bell, a framed meeting house for the Methodist Society, three taverns, several stores, five lawyers, four physicians, a land office, and two newspapers. It was a much larger town than Lincoln had ever lived in before, though he was familiar with Springfield, then twice as large as Vandalia, and he had seen the cities of the Mississippi. The assembly which he entered was composed of eighty-one members, twenty-six senators, and fifty-five representatives. As a rule, these men were of Kentucky, Tennessee, or Virginia origin, with here and there a Frenchman. There were but few Eastern men, for there was still a strong prejudice in the state against Yankees. The close bargains and superior airs of the emigrants from New England contrasted so unpleasantly with the open-handed hospitality and the easy ways of the Southerners and French that a pioneer's prospects were blasted at the start if he acted like a Yankee. A History of Illinois in 1837, published evidently to boom the state, cautioned the emigrant that if he began his life in illinois by affecting superior intelligence and virtue and catechizing the people for their habits of plainness and simplicity and their apparent want of those things which he imagines indispensable to comfort he must expect to be forever marked as a yankee and to have his prospects correspondingly defeated a hard-shell Baptist preacher of about this date showed the feeling of the people when he said, in preaching of the richness of the grace of the Lord, It tucks in the isles of the sea in the uttermost part of the yeth. It embraces the Eskimos and the Hottentots, and some, my dear brethren, go so far as to suppose that it tucks in the poor benighted Yankees, but I don't go that fur. When it came to an election of legislators, many of the people didn't go that fur, either. There was a preponderance of jean suits like Lincoln's in the assembly, and there were occasional coonskin caps and buckskin trousers. Nevertheless, more than one member showed a studied garb and a courtly manner. Some of the best blood of the South went into the making of Illinois, and it showed itself from the first in the assembly. The surroundings of the legislators were quite as simple as the attire of the plainest of them. The courthouse, in good old colonial style, with square pillars and belfry, was finished with wooden desks and benches. The state furnished her lawmakers few perquisites beyond their three dollars a day. A cork inkstand, a certain number of quills, and a limited amount of stationery were all the extras an Illinois legislator in 1834 got from his position. Scarcely more could be expected from a state whose revenues, from December 1st, 1834, to December 1st, 1836, were only about $125,000 with expenditures during the same period amounting to less than $165,000. Lincoln thought little of these things, no doubt. To him, the absorbing interest was the men he met. To get acquainted with them, measure them, compare himself with them, and discover wherein they were his superiors and what he could do to make good his deficiency. This was his chief occupation. The men he met were good subjects for such study. Among them were William L. D. Ewing, Jesse K. Dubois, Stephen T. Logan, Theodore Ford, and Governor Duncan, men destined to play large parts in the history of the state. One whom he met that winter in Vandalia was destined to play a great part in the history of the nation, the Democratic candidate for the office of state attorney for the first judicial district of Illinois a man four years younger than Lincoln. He was only twenty-one at the time. A newcomer, too, in the state, having arrived about a year before, under no very promising auspices either, for he had only thirty-seven cents in his pockets, and no position in view. But a man of metal, it was easy to see, for already he had risen so high in the district where he had settled that he dared contest the office of state attorney with John J. Hardin, one of the most successful lawyers of the state. This young man was Stephen A. Douglas. He had come to Vandalia from Morgan County to conduct his campaign, and Lincoln met him first in the halls of the old courthouse where he and his friends carried on with success their contest against Hardin. 
the ninth assembly gathered in a more hopeful and ambitious mood than any of its predecessors illinois was feeling well the state was free from debt the black hawk war had stimulated the people greatly for it had brought a large amount of money into circulation in fact the greater portion of the eight to ten million dollars the war had cost had been circulated among the illinois volunteers immigration too was increasing at a bewildering rate in eighteen thirty five the census showed a population of two hundred and sixty nine thousand nine hundred seventy four between eighteen thirty and eighteen thirty five two fifths of this number had come in in the northeast chicago had begun to rise even for a western town its growth had been unusually rapid declared peck's gazetteer of eighteen thirty four the harbor building there the proposed michigan and illinois canal the rise in town lots all promised to the state a great metropolis to meet the rising tide of prosperity the legislators of eighteen thirty four felt that they must devise some worthy scheme so they chartered a new state bank with a capital of one million five hundred thousand dollars and revived a bank which had broken twelve years before granting it a charter of three hundred thousand dollars there was no surplus money in the state to supply the capital there were no trained bankers to guide the concern there was no clear notion of how it was all to be done but a banking capital of one million eight hundred thousand dollars would be a good thing in the state they were sure and if the east could be made to believe in illinois as much as their legislators believed in her the stocks would go and so the banks were chartered but even more important to the state than banks was a highway for thirteen years plans for the illinois and michigan canal had been constantly before the assembly surveys had been ordered estimates reported the advantages extolled but nothing had been done now however the assembly flushed by the first thrill of the coming boom decided to authorize a loan of a half million on the credit of the state lincoln favored both these measures he did not however do anything especially noteworthy for either of the bills nor was the record he made in other directions at all remarkable he was placed on the committee of public accounts and expenditures and attended meetings with fidelity his first act as a member was to give notice that he would ask leave to introduce a bill limiting the jurisdiction of justices of the peace a measure which he succeeded in carrying through he followed this by a motion to change the rules so that it should not be in order to offer amendments to any bill after the third reading which was not agreed to though the same rule in effect was adopted some years later and is to this day in force in both branches of the illinois assembly he next made a motion to take from the table a report which had been submitted by his committee which met a like fate his first resolution relating to a state revenue to be derived from the sales of public lands was denied a reference and laid upon the table neither as a speaker nor an organizer did he make any especial impression on the body in the spring of eighteen thirty five the young representative from sangamon returned to new salem to take up his duties as postmaster and deputy surveyor and to resume his law studies he exchanged his rather exalted position for the humbler one with a light heart new salem held all that was dearest in the world to him at that moment and he went back to the poor little town with a hope which he had once supposed honor forbade his acknowledging even to himself glowing warmly in his heart he loved a young girl of that town and now for the first time though he had known her since he first came to new salem was he free to tell his love one of the most prominent families of the settlement in eighteen thirty one when lincoln first appeared there was of james rutledge the head of the house was one of the founders of new salem and at that time the keeper of the village tavern he was a high-minded man of a warm and generous nature and had the universal respect of the community he was a south carolinian by birth but had lived many years in kentucky before coming to illinois rutledge came of a distinguished family one of his ancestors signed the declaration of independence another was chief justice of the supreme court of the united states by appointment of washington 
and another was a conspicuous leader in the American Congress. The third of the nine children in the Rutledge household was a daughter, Anne Mays, born in Kentucky January 7, 1813. When Lincoln first met her, she was nineteen years old, and fresh as a flower. Many of those who knew her at that time have left tributes to her beauty and gentleness, and even today there are those living who talk of her with moistened eyes and softened tones. She was a beautiful girl, says her cousin, James McGrady Rutledge, and as bright as she was beautiful. She was well educated for that early day, a good conversationalist, and always gentle and cheerful, a girl whose company people liked. So fair a maid was not, of course, without suitors. The most determined of those who sought her hand was one John McNeil, a young man who had arrived in New Salem from New York soon after the founding of the town. Nothing was known of his antecedents, and no questions were asked. He was understood to be merely one of the thousands who had come west in search of fortune. That he was intelligent, industrious, and frugal, with a good head for business, was at once apparent for in four years from his first appearance in the settlement, besides earning a half-interest in a general store, McNeil had acquired a large farm a few miles north of New Salem. His neighbors believed him to be worth about twelve thousand dollars. John McNeil was an unmarried man, at least so he represented himself to be, and very soon after becoming a resident of New Salem, he formed the acquaintance of Anne Rutledge, then a girl of seventeen. It was a case of love at first sight, and the two soon became engaged, in spite of the rivalry of Samuel Hill, McNeil's partner. But Anne was, as yet, only a young girl, and it was thought very sensible in her and considerate in her lover that both acquiesced in the wishes of Anne's parents that, for some time at least, the marriage be postponed. Such was the situation when Lincoln appeared in New Salem. He naturally soon became acquainted with the girl. She was a pupil in Mentor Graham's school, where he frequently visited, and rumor says that he first met her there. However that may be, it is certain that in the latter part of 1832 he went to board at the Rutledge Tavern, and there was thrown daily into her company. During the next year, 1833, John McNeil, in spite of his fair prospects, became restless and discontented. He wanted to see his people, he said, and before the end of the year he decided to go east for a visit. To secure perfect freedom from his business while gone, he sold out his interest in his store. To Anne, he said that he hoped to bring back his father and mother, and to place them on his farm. This duty done, was his farewell word, you and I will be married. In the spring of 1834, McNeil started east. The journey overland by foot and horse was, in those days, a trying one, and on the way McNeil fell ill with chills and fever. It was late in the summer before he reached his home and wrote back to Anne, explaining his silence. The long wait had been a severe strain on the girl, and Lincoln had watched her anxiety with softened heart. It was to him, the New Salem postmaster, that she came to inquire for letters. It was to him she entrusted those she sent. In a way, the postmaster must have become the girl's confidant, and his tender heart must have been deeply touched. After the long silence was broken, and McNeil's first letter of explanation came, the cause of anxiety seemed removed. But strangely enough, other letters followed only at long intervals, and finally they ceased altogether. Then it was that the young girl told her friends a secret, which McNeil had confided to her before leaving New Salem. He had told her what she had never even suspected before, that John McNeil was not his real name, but that it was John McNamar. Shortly before he came to New Salem, he explained, his father had suffered a disastrous failure in business. He was the oldest son, and in the hope of retrieving the lost fortune, he resolved to go west, expecting to return in a few years and share his riches with the rest of the family. Anticipating parental opposition, he ran away from home, and, being sure that he could never accumulate anything with so numerous a family to support, he endeavored to lose himself by a change of name. All this Anne had believed and not repeated, but now, worn out by waiting, she took the story to her friends. 
with few exceptions they pronounced the story a fabrication and mcnamar an impostor his excuse seemed flimsy why had he worn this mask at best they declared he was a mere adventurer and was it not more probable that he was a fugitive from justice a thief a swindler or a murderer and who knew how many wives he might have with all new salem declaring john mcnamar false Anne rutledge could hardly be blamed for imagining that he was dead or had forgotten her it was not until mcneil or mcnamar had been gone many months and gossip had become offensive that lincoln ventured to show his love for Anne, and then it was a long time before the girl would listen to his suit convinced at last however that her former lover had deserted her she yielded to lincoln's wishes and promised in the spring of eighteen thirty five soon after lincoln's return from vandalia to become his wife but lincoln had nothing on which to support a family indeed he found it no trifling task to support himself as for Anne, she was anxious to go to school another year it was decided that in the autumn she should go with her brother to jacksonville and spend the winter there in an academy lincoln was to devote himself to his law studies and the next spring when she returned from school and he had been admitted to the bar they were to be married a happy spring and summer followed new salem took a cordial interest in the two lovers and presaged a happy life for them and all would undoubtedly have gone well if the young girl could have dismissed the haunting memory of her old lover the possibility that she had wronged him that he might reappear that he loved her still though she now loved another that perhaps she had done wrong a torturing conflict of memory love conscience doubt and morbidness lay like a shadow across her happiness and wore upon her until she fell ill gradually her condition became hopeless and lincoln who had been shut from her was sent for the lovers passed an hour alone in an anguished parting and soon after on august twenty fifth eighteen thirty five Anne died the death of Anne rutledge plunged lincoln into the deepest gloom that abiding melancholy that painful sense of the incompleteness of life which had been his mother's dowry asserted itself it filled and darkened his mind and his imagination tortured him with its black pictures one stormy night lincoln was sitting beside william green his head bowed on his hand while tears trickled through his fingers his friend begged him to control his sorrow to try to forget i cannot moaned lincoln the thought of the snow and rain on her grave fills me with indescribable grief he was seen walking alone by the river and through the woods muttering strange things to himself he seemed to his friends to be in the shadow of madness they kept a close watch over him and at last bowling green one of the most devoted friends lincoln then had took him home to his little log cabin half a mile north of new salem under the brow of a big bluff here under the loving care of green and his good wife nancy lincoln remained until he was once more master of himself but though he had regained self-control his grief was deep and bitter Anne rutledge was buried in concord cemetery a country burying ground seven miles northeast of new salem to this lonely spot lincoln frequently journeyed to weep over her grave my heart is buried there he said to one of his friends when mcnamar returned for mcnamar's story was true and two months after ann rutledge died he drove into new salem with his widowed mother and his brothers and sisters in the prairie schooner beside him and learned of ann's death he saw lincoln at the post office as he afterwards said and he seemed desolate and sorely distressed on himself apparently her death produced no deep impression within a year he married another woman and his conduct toward Anne Rutledge is to this day a mystery. In later life, when Lincoln's sorrow had become a memory, he told a friend who questioned him, I really and truly love the girl, and think often of her now. There was a pause, and then the president added, And I have loved the name of Rutledge to this day. 
when the death of anne rutledge came upon lincoln for a time threatening to destroy his ambition and blast his life he was in a most encouraging position master of a profession in which he had an abundance of work and earned fair fees hopeful of being admitted in a few months to the bar a member of the state assembly with every reason to believe that if he desired it his constituency would return him few men are as far advanced at twenty-six as was abraham lincoln intellectually he was far better equipped than he believed himself to be better than he has ordinarily been credited with being true he had had no conventional college training but he had by his own efforts attained the chief result of all preparatory study the ability to take hold of a subject and assimilate it the fact that in six weeks he had acquired enough of the science of surveying to enable him to serve as deputy surveyor shows how well trained his mind was the power to grasp a large subject quickly and fully is never an accident the nights Lincoln spent in Gentryville, lying on the floor in front of the fire, figuring on the fire shovel. The hours he passed in poring over the statutes of Indiana. The days he wrestled with Kirkham's grammar, alone made the mastery of Flint and Gibson possible. His struggle with Flint and Gibson made easier the volumes he borrowed from Major Stewart's law library. Lincoln had a mental trait which explains his rapid growth in mastering subjects. Seeing clearly was essential to him. He was unable to put a question aside until he understood it. It pursued him, irritated him until solved. Even in his Gentryville days, his comrades noted that he was constantly searching for reasons and that he explained so clearly. This characteristic became stronger with years. He was unwilling to pronounce himself on any subject until he understood it, and he could not let it alone until he had reached a conclusion which satisfied him. This scene clearly became a splendid force in Lincoln, for when he once had reached a conclusion, he had the honesty of soul to suit his actions to it. No consideration could induce him to abandon the line of conduct which his reason told him was logical joined to these strong mental and moral qualities was that power of immediate action which so often explains why one man succeeds in life while another of equal intelligence and uprightness fails as soon as lincoln saw a thing to do he did it he wants to know there is a book it may be a biography a volume of dry statutes a collection of verse no matter he reads and ponders it until he has absorbed all it has for him. He is eager to see the world. A man offers him a position as a hand on a Mississippi flatboat. He takes it without a moment's hesitation over the toil and exposure it demands. John Calhoun is ready to make him a deputy surveyor. He knows nothing of the science. In six weeks he has learned enough to begin his labors sangamon county must have representatives why not he and his circular goes out ambition alone will not explain this power of instantaneous action it comes largely from that active imagination which when a new relation or position opens seizes on all its possibilities and from them creates a situation so real that one enters with confidence upon what seems to the unimaginative the rashest undertaking lincoln saw the possibilities in things and immediately appreciated them but the position he filled in sangamon county in eighteen thirty five was not all due to these qualities much was due to his personal charm by all accounts he was big awkward ill-clad shy yet his sterling honor his unselfish nature his heart of the true gentleman inspired respect and confidence men might laugh at his first appearance but they were not long in recognizing the real superiority of his nature such was abraham lincoln at twenty-six when the tragic death of ann rutledge made all that he had attained all that he had planned seem fruitless and empty he was too sincere and just too brave a man to allow a great sorrow permanently to interfere with his activities 
he rallied his forces and returned to his law his surveying his politics he brought to his work a new power that insight and patience which only a great sorrow can give end of section eight section nine of the life of abraham lincoln volume one by ida m tarbell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine lincoln is re-elected to the illinois assembly his first published address protests against pro-slavery resolutions of the assembly the ninth general assembly of illinois held its opening session in the winter of eighteen thirty four thirty five it was lincoln's first experience as a legislator and it was rather a tame one but in december eighteen thirty five the members were called to an extra session which proved to be in every way more exciting and more eventful than its predecessors the chief reason for its being called was in itself calculated to exhilarate the hopeful young lawgivers a census had been taken since their last session and so large an increase in population had been reported that it was considered necessary to summon the assembly to reapportion the legislative districts when the reapportionment was made it was found that the general assembly was increased by fifty members the number of senators being raised from twenty-six to forty of representatives from fifty-five to ninety-one a growth of fifty members in four years excited the imagination of the state the dignity and importance of illinois suddenly assumed new importance it was imagined that the story of new york's growth in wealth and influence was to be repeated in this new country and every ambitious man in the assembly determined to lead in the rise of the state the work on internal improvements begun in the previous session took a new form the governor in calling the members together had said while i would urge the most liberal support of all such measures as tending with perfect certainty to increase the wealth and prosperity of the state i would at the same time most respectfully suggest the propriety of entrusting the construction of all such works where it can be done consistently with the general interest to individual enterprise the legislators acquiesced and in this session began to grant a series of private charters for internal improvements which had they been carried out would have given the state communication in eighteen forty almost if not quite equal to those of today the map on page one thirty five shows the incorporations of railroad and canal companies made in the extra session of the ninth assembly eighteen thirty five thirty six and in the regular session of the tenth eighteen thirty six thirty seven sixteen of the railroads were chartered in the former session lincoln and his colleagues did not devote their attention entirely to chartering railroads ten schools were chartered in the same session some of which exist today in the next session twelve academies and eighteen colleges received charters the absorbing topic of the winter however and the one in which lincoln was chiefly concerned was the threatened naturalization of the convention system in illinois up to this time candidates for office in the united states had generally nominated themselves as we have seen lincoln doing the only formality they imposed upon themselves was to consult a little unauthorized caucus of personal friends unless they were exceptionally cautious persons the disapproval of this caucus did not stand in their way at all so long as party lines were indistinct and the personal qualities of a candidate were considered rather than his platform this method of nomination was possible but with party organization it began to change in the case of presidential candidates the convention with its delegates and platform had just appeared the first full-fledged one being held but three years before in eighteen thirty two along with the presidential convention came the machine an organization of all those who belonged to a party intended to secure unity of effort by means of primaries and conventions one candidate was put forward by a party instead of a dozen being allowed to offer themselves the strength which the convention gave the democratic party which first adopted and developed it was enormous the whigs opposed the new institution 
they declared it was intended to abridge the liberties of the people by depriving individuals on their own mere motion of the privilege of becoming candidates and depriving each man of the right to vote for a candidate of his own selection and choice the efficacy of the new method was so apparent however that let the whigs preach as they would it was rapidly adopted in eighteen thirty five the whole machinery was well developed in new england and new york and had appeared in the west in the north of illinois the democrats had begun to organize under the leadership of two men of eastern origin and training ebenezer peck of chicago and stephen a douglas of jacksonville and this session of the illinois legislature the convention system became a subject of discussion the whigs lincoln among them violently opposed the new scheme it was a yankee contrivance they said favored only by new englanders like douglas or were still by monarchists like peck they recalled with pious indignation that peck was a canadian brought up under an aristocratic form of government that he had even deserted the liberal party of this government to go over to the ultra monarchists they declared it a remarkable fact that no man born and raised west of the mountains or south of the potomac had yet returned to vindicate the wholesale system of convention in spite of Whig warnings, however, the convention system was approved by a vote of 26 to 25. The Ninth Assembly expired at the close of this extra session, and in June, Lincoln announced himself as a candidate for the Tenth Assembly. A few days later, the Sangamon Journal published his simple platform. New Salem, June 13, 1836. To the editor of the journal, in your paper of last Saturday, I see a communication, over the signature of many voters, in which the candidates who are announced in the journal are called upon to show their hands. Agreed. Here's mine. I go for all sharing the privileges of government to assist in bearing its burdens. Consequently, I go for admitting all whites to the right of suffrage who pay taxes or bear arms, by no means excluding females if elected i shall consider the whole people of sangamon my constituents as well those that oppose as those that support me while acting as their representative i shall be governed by their will on all subjects upon which i have the means of knowing what their will is and upon all others i shall do what my own judgment teaches me will best advance their interests whether elected or not i go for distributing the proceeds of the sales of the public lands to the several states to enable our state in common with others to dig canals and construct railroads without borrowing money and paying the interest on it if alive on the first monday in november i shall vote for hugh l white for president very respectfully a lincoln the campaign which Lincoln began with this letter was in every way more exciting for him than those of 1832 and 1834. In the reapportionment of the legislative districts which had taken place the winter before, Sangamon County's delegation had been enlarged to seven representatives and two senators. This gave large new opportunities to political ambition and doubled the enthusiasm of political meetings but the increase of the representation was not all that made the campaign exciting party lines had never before been so clearly drawn in sangamon county nor personal abuse quite so frank one of lincoln's first acts was to answer a personal attack during his absence from new salem a rival candidate passed through the place and stated publicly that he was in possession of facts which if known to the public would entirely destroy lincoln's prospects at the coming election but he declared that he thought so much of lincoln that he would not tell what he knew lincoln met this mysterious insinuation with shrewd candor no one has needed favors more than i he wrote his rival and generally few have been less unwilling to accept them but in this case favor to me would be an injustice to the public and therefore i must beg your pardon for declining it that i once had the confidence of the people of sangamon county is sufficiently evident and if i have done anything either by design or misadventure 
which, if known, would subject me to a forfeiture of that confidence, he that knows of that thing and conceals it is a traitor to his country's interest. I find myself wholly unable to form any conjecture of what fact or facts, real or supposed, you spoke. But my opinion of your veracity will not permit me for a moment to doubt that you at least believed what you said. I am flattered with the personal regard you manifested for me, but I do hope that on mature reflection you will view the public interest as a paramount consideration, and therefore let the worst come. Usually, during the campaign, Lincoln was obliged to meet personal attacks, not by letter, but on the platform. Joshua Speed, who later became the most intimate friend that Lincoln probably ever had, tells of one occasion when he was obliged to meet such an attack on the very spur of the moment. A great mass meeting was in progress at Springfield, and Lincoln had made a speech which had produced a deep impression. I was then fresh from Kentucky, says Mr. Speed, and had heard many of her great orators. It seemed to me then, as it seems to me now, that I never heard a more effective speaker. He carried the crowd with him and swayed them as he pleased. So deep an impression did he make that George Forquet, a man of such celebrity as a sarcastic speaker and with a great reputation throughout the state as an orator, rose and asked the people to hear him. He began his speech by saying that this young man would have to be taken down, and he was sorry that the task devolved upon him. He made what was called one of his slasher gaff speeches, dealing much in ridicule and sarcasm. Lincoln stood near him with his arms folded, never interrupting him. When Forquet was done, Lincoln walked to the stand and replied so fully and completely that his friends bore him from the courthouse on their shoulders. So deep an impression did this first speech make upon me that I remember its conclusion now after a lapse of thirty-eight years. The gentleman commenced his speech, he said, by saying that this young man would have to be taken down, and he was sorry the task devolved upon him. I am not so young in years as I am in the tricks and trade of a politician, but live long or die young, I would rather die now than, like the gentleman, change my politics and, simultaneous with the change, receive an office worth three thousand dollars a year, and then have to erect a lightning rod over my house to protect a guilty conscience from an offended God." To understand the point of this, it must be explained that Forquet had been a Whig, but had changed his politics and had been appointed register of the land office, and over his house was the only lightning rod in the town or country. Lincoln had seen the lightning rod for the first time on the day before. This speech has never been forgotten in Springfield, and on my visits there I have repeatedly had the sight of the house on which this particular lightning rod was placed pointed out, and one or another of the many versions which the story has taken related to me. It was the practice at that date in Illinois for two rival candidates to travel over the district together. The custom led to much good-natured raillery between them, and in such contests Lincoln was rarely, if ever, worsted. He could even turn the generosity of a rival to account by his whimsical treatment. On one occasion, says Mr. Weir, a former resident of Sangamon County, he had driven out from Springfield in company with a political opponent to engage in joint debate. The carriage, it seems, belonged to his opponent. In addressing the gathering of farmers that met them, Lincoln was lavish in praise of the generosity of his friend. "'I am too poor to own a carriage,' he said." but my friend has generously invited me to ride with him. I want you to vote for me if you will, but if not, then vote for my opponent, for he is a fine man. His extravagant and persistent praise of his opponent appealed to the sense of humor in his rural audience, to whom his inability to own a carriage was by no means a disqualification. The election came off in August and resulted in the choice of a delegation from Sangamon County famous in the annals of Illinois. The nine successful candidates were Abraham Lincoln, John Dawson, Daniel Stone, Ninian W. Edwards, William F. Elkins, R. L. Wilson, Andrew McCormick, Job Fletcher, and Arthur Herndon. 
each one of these men was over six feet in height their combined stature being it is said fifty-five feet the long nine was the name sangamon county gave them as soon as the election was over lincoln occupied himself in settling another matter of much greater moment he went to springfield to seek admission to the bar the roll of attorneys and counselors at law on file in the office of the clerk of the supreme court of springfield illinois shows that his license was dated september ninth eighteen thirty six and that the date of the enrollment of his name upon the official list was march first eighteen thirty seven the first case in which he was concerned as far as we know was that of hawthorne against woolridge he made his first appearance in court in october eighteen thirty six although he had given much time during this year to politics and the law he had by no means abandoned surveying indeed he never had more calls the grandiose scheme of internal improvements initiated the winter before had stimulated speculation and lincoln frequently was obliged to be away for three and four weeks at a time laying out new towns or locating new roads every such trip added to his political capital such was his reputation throughout the country that when he got a job says the hon j n ruggles a friend and political supporter there was a picnic and jolly time in the neighborhood men and boys gathered from far and near ready to carry chain drive stakes and blaze trees if they could only hear lincoln's odd stories and jokes the fun was interspersed with foot races and wrestling matches to this day the old settlers in many a place of central illinois repeat the incidents of lincoln's sojourns in their neighborhood while surveying their town in december lincoln put away his surveying instruments to go to vandalia for the opening session of the tenth assembly larger by fifty members than its predecessor this body was as much superior in intellect as in numbers it included among its members a future president of the united states a future candidate for the same high office six future united states senators eight future members of the national house of representatives a future secretary of the interior and three future judges of the state supreme court here sat side by side abraham lincoln and stephen a douglas edward dickinson baker who represented at different times the states of illinois and oregon in the national councils o h browning a prospective senator and future cabinet officer and william l d ewing who had just served in the senate john logan father of the late general john a logan robert m cullum father of senator shelby m cullum john a mcclernand afterwards member of congress for many years and a distinguished general in the late civil war and many others of national repute the members came to vandalia full of hope and exultation in their judgment it needed only a few months of legislation to put their state by the side of new york and from the opening of the session they were overflowing with excitement and schemes in the general ebullition of spirits which characterized the assembly lincoln had little share only a week after the opening of the session he wrote to a friend mary owens at new salem that he had been ill though he believed himself to be about well then and he added but that with other things i cannot account for have conspired and have gotten my spirits so low that i feel i would rather be any place in the world than here i really cannot endure the thought of staying here ten weeks though depressed he was far from being inactive the sangamon delegation in fact had its hands full and to no one of the nine had more been entrusted than to lincoln in common with almost every delegation they had been instructed by their constituents to adopt a scheme of internal improvements complete enough to give every budding town in illinois easy communication with the world this for the state in general for sangamon county in particular they had been directed to secure the capital the change in the state's center of population made it advisable to move the seat of government northward from vandalia and springfield was anxious to secure it to lincoln was entrusted the work of putting through the bill to remove the capital in the same letter quoted from above he tells miss owens 
our chance to take the seat of government to Springfield is better than I expected. Regarding the internal improvement scheme, he feels less confident. Some of the legislature are for it and some against, which has the majority I cannot tell. It was not long, however, before all uncertainty about internal improvements was over. The people were determined to have them, and the assembly responded to their demands by passing an act which provided, at state expense, for railroads, canals, or river improvements in almost every county in Illinois. No finer bit of imaginative work was ever done, in fact, by a legislative body than the map of internal improvements laid out by the Tenth Assembly. With splendid disdain of town settlements and resources, they ran the railroads into the counties they thought ought to be opened up, and if there was no terminus, they laid out one. They improved the rivers and they dug canals, they built bridges and drained the swamps, they planned to make the waste places blossom and to people the forests with men. This project was to benefit every hamlet of the state, said its defenders, and to compensate the counties which were not to have railroads or canals, they voted them a sum of money for roads and bridges. There was no time to estimate exactly the cost of these fine plans, nor did they feel any need of estimates. That was a mere matter of detail. They would vote a fund, and when that was exhausted, they would vote more and so they appropriated sum after sum, $100,000 to improve the Rock River, $1,800,000 to build a road from Quincy to Danville, $4,000,000 to complete the Illinois and Michigan Canal, 250000 for the Western Mail Route, in all some $12,000,000. To carry out this elaborate scheme, they provided a commission, one of the first duties of which was to sell the bonds of the state to raise the money for the enterprise. The majority of the assembly seemed not to have entertained for a moment an idea that there would be any difficulty in selling, at a premium, the bonds of Illinois. On the contrary, says General Linder in his reminiscences, the enthusiastic friends of the measure maintained that instead of there being any difficulty in obtaining a loan of the fifteen or twenty millions authorized to be borrowed, our bonds would go like hotcakes and be sought for by the Rothschilds, the Baring Brothers, and others of that stamp, and that the premiums which we would obtain upon them would range from fifty to one hundred per cent and that the premium itself would be sufficient to construct most of the important works, leaving the principal sum to go into our treasury, and leave the people free from taxation for years to come. The scheme was carried without difficulty, and the work of raising money and of grading roadbeds began almost simultaneously. All of this seems insane enough today, knowing, as we do, that it ended in panic and bankruptcy, in deserted roadbeds and unpaid bills, but at that time the measure seemed to the legislature only the enterprise which the prospects of the country demanded. Illinois was not alone in confidence and recklessness. Her folly was that of the whole country. Never had there been a period of rasher speculation and inflation. The entire debt of the country had been paid, and a great income was pouring in on the federal government. The completion of certain works like the Erie Canal had stimulated trade and greatly increased the value of lands. Every variety of industry was succeeding. Capital was pouring in from Europe, which seemed dazzled at the thought of a nation free from debt, with a revenue so great that she was forced to distribute it quarterly to her states, as the United States began to do in January 1837. An exaggerated confidence in regard to the future of the country possessed both foreign and domestic capitalist. Credit was practically unlimited. Debt was the road to wealth and men could realize millions on the wildest schemes. Little wonder that Lincoln and his associates, ignorant of the history of finance and governed as they were by popular opinion, fell into the delusion of the day and sought to found a state on credit. Although Lincoln favored and aided in every way the plan for internal improvements, his real work was in securing the removal of the capital to Springfield. 
the task was by no means an easy one to direct for outside of the long nine there was of course nobody particularly interested in springfield and there were delegations from a dozen other counties hot to secure the capital for their own constituencies it took patient and clever manipulation to put the bill through certain votes lincoln no doubt gained for his cause by force of his personal qualities thus jesse k dubois says that he and his colleagues voted for the bill because they liked lincoln and wanted to oblige him but probably the majority he won by skilful log rolling the very few letters written by him at this time which have been preserved show this for instance a letter to john bennett in which he says mr edwards tells me you wish to know whether the act to which your town incorporation provision was attached passed into a law it did you can organize under the general incorporation law as soon as you choose i also tacked a provision on to a fellow's bill to authorize the relocation of the road from salem down to your town but i am not certain whether or not the bill passed neither do i suppose i can ascertain before the law will be published if it is a law there is nothing in his correspondence however to show that he ever sacrificed his principles in these trades everything we know of his transactions are indeed to the contrary general t h henderson of illinois says in his reminiscences of lincoln before i had ever seen abraham lincoln i heard my father who served with him in the legislature of eighteen thirty eight thirty nine and of eighteen forty forty one relate an incident in mr lincoln's life which illustrates his character for integrity and his firmness in maintaining what he regarded as right in his public acts in a marked manner i do not remember whether this incident occurred during the session of the legislature in eighteen thirty six thirty seven or eighteen thirty eight thirty nine but i think it was in that of eighteen thirty six thirty seven when it was said that there was a great deal of log rolling going on among the members but however that may be according to the story related by my father an effort was made to unite the friends of capital removal with the friends of some measure which lincoln for some reason did not approve what that measure was to which he objected i am not now able to recall but those who desired the removal of the capital to springfield were very anxious to effect the proposed combination and a meeting was held to see if it could be accomplished the meeting continued in session nearly all night when it adjourned without accomplishing anything mr lincoln refusing to yield his objections and to support the obnoxious measure another meeting was called and at the second meeting a number of citizens not members of the legislature from the central and northern parts of the state among them my father were present by invitation the meeting was long protracted and earnest in its deliberations every argument that could be thought of was used to induce mr lincoln to yield his objections and unite with his friends and thus secure the removal of the capital to his own city but without effect finally after midnight when everybody seemed exhausted with the discussion and when the candles were burning low in the room mr lincoln rose among the silence and solemnity which prevailed and my father said made one of the most eloquent and powerful speeches to which he had ever listened he concluded his remarks by saying you may burn my body to ashes and scatter them to the winds of heaven you may drag my soul down to the regions of darkness and despair to be tormented for ever but you will never get me to support a measure which i believe to be wrong although by doing so i may accomplish that which i believe to be right and the meeting adjourned as was to be expected the democrats charged that the whigs of sangamon had won their victory by bargain and corruption these charges became so serious that in an extra session called in the summer of eighteen thirty seven a few months after the bill passed lincoln had a bitter fight over them with general l d ewing who wanted to keep the capital of vandalia the arrogance of springfield said general ewing its presumption in claiming the seat of government is not to be endured the law has been passed by chicanery and trickery the springfield delegation has sold out to the internal improvement men and has promised its support to every measure that would gain a vote to the law removing the seat of government 
lincoln answered in a speech of such severity and keenness that the house believed he was digging his own grave for ewing was a high-spirited man who would not hesitate to answer by a challenge it was in fact only the interference of their friends which prevented a duel at this time between ewing and lincoln this speech to many of lincoln's colleagues was a revelation of his ability and character this was the first time says general linder that i began to conceive a very high opinion of the talents and personal courage of abraham lincoln a few months later the long nine were again attacked lincoln specially being abused the assailant this time was a prominent democrat mr j b thomas when he had ended lincoln replied in a speech which was long known in local political circles as the skinning of thomas no one doubted after this that lincoln could defend himself he became doubly respected as an opponent for his reputation for good-humoured raillery had already been established in his campaigns in a speech made in january he gave another evidence of his skill in the use of ridicule a resolution had been offered by mr linder to institute an inquiry into the management of the affairs of the state bank lincoln's remarks on the resolution form his first reported speech he began his remarks by good-humoured but nettling chaffing of his opponent mr chairman he said lest i should fall into the too common error of being mistaken in regard to which side i design to be upon i shall make it my first care to remove all doubt on that point by declaring that i am opposed to the resolution under consideration in toto before i proceed to the body of the subject i will further remark that it is not without a considerable degree of apprehension that i venture to cross the track of the gentleman from coles mr linder indeed i do not believe i could muster a sufficiency of courage to come in contact with that gentleman were it not for the fact that he some days since most graciously condescended to assure us that he would never be found wasting ammunition on small game on the same fortunate occasion he further gave us to understand that he regarded himself as being decidedly the superior of our common friend from randolph mr shields and feeling as i really do that i to say the most of myself am nothing more than the peer of our friend from randolph i shall regard the gentleman from coles as decidedly my superior also and consequently in the course of what i shall have to say whenever i shall have occasion to allude to that gentleman i shall endeavour to adopt that kind of court language which i understand to be due to decided superiority in one faculty at least there can be no dispute over the gentleman's superiority over me and most other men and that is the faculty of entangling a subject so that neither himself or any other man can find head or tail to it taking up the resolution on the bank he declared its meaning some gentlemen have their stock in their hands while others who have more money than they know what to do with want it and this and this alone is the question to settle which we are called on to squander thousands of the people's money what interest let me ask have the people in the settlement of this question what difference is it to them whether the stock is owned by judge smith or sam wiggins if any gentleman be entitled to stock in the bank which he is kept out of possession of by others let him assert his right in the supreme court and let him or his antagonist whichever may be found in the wrong pay the costs of suit it is an old maxim and a very sound one that he that dances should always pay the fiddler now sir in the present case if any gentleman whose money is a burden to them choose to lead off a dance i am decidedly opposed to the people's money being used to pay the fiddler no one can doubt that the examination proposed by this resolution must cost the state some ten or twelve thousand dollars and all this to settle a question in which the people have no interest and about which they care nothing these capitalists generally act harmoniously and in concert to fleece the people and now that they have got into a quarrel with themselves we are called upon to appropriate the people's money to settle the quarrel the resolution had declared that the bank practiced various methods which were to the great injury of the people 
lincoln took the occasion to announce his ideas of the people and the politicians if the bank really be a grievance why is it that no one of the real people is found to ask redress of it the truth is no such oppression exists if it did our people would groan with memorials and petitions and we would not be permitted to rest day or night till we had put it down the people know their rights and they are never slow to assert and maintain them when they are invaded let them call for an investigation and i shall stand ever ready to respond to the call but they have made no such call i make the assertion boldly and without fear of contradiction that no man who does not hold an office or does not aspire to one has ever found any fault of the bank it has doubled the prices of the products of their farms and filled their pockets with a sound circulating medium and they are all well pleased with its operations no sir it is the politician who is the first to sound the alarm which by the way is a false one it is he who by these unholy means is endeavoring to blow up a storm that he may ride upon and direct it is he and he alone that here proposes to spend thousands of the people's public treasure for no other advantage to them than to make valueless in their pockets the reward of their industry mr chairman this work is exclusively the work of politicians a set of men who have interests aside from the interests of the people and who to say the most of them are taken as a mass at least one step removed from honest men i say this with the greater freedom because being a politician myself none can regard it as personal the speech was published in full in the sangamon journal for january twenty eighth eighteen thirty seven and the editor commented mr lincoln's remarks on mr linder's bank resolution in the paper are quite to the point our friend carries the true kentucky rifle and when he fires he seldom fails of sending the shot home one other act of his in this session cannot be ignored it is a sinister note in the hopeful chorus of the tenth assembly for months there had come from the southern states violent protests against the growth of abolition agitation in the north garrison's paper the infernal liberator as it was called in the pro-slavery part of the country had been gradually extending its circulation and its influence and it already had imitators even on the banks of the mississippi the american anti-slavery society was now over three years old a deep unconquerable conviction of the iniquity of slavery was spreading throughout the north the south felt it and protested and the statesmen of the north joined them in their protest slavery could not be crushed said the conservatives it was sanctioned by the constitution the south must be supported in its claims and agitation stopped but the agitation went on and riots violence and hatred pursued the agitators in illinois in this very year eighteen thirty seven we have a printing office raided and an anti-slavery editor elijah lovejoy killed by the citizens of alton who were determined that it should not be said among them that slavery was an iniquity to silence the storm mass meetings of citizens the united states congress the state legislatures took up the question and again and again voted resolutions assuring the south that the abolitionists were not supported that the country recognized their right to their peculiar institution and that in no case should they be interfered with at springfield this same year eighteen thirty seven the citizens convened and passed a resolution declaring that the efforts of abolitionists in this community are neither necessary nor useful when the riot occurred in alton the springfield papers uttered no word of condemnation giving the affair only a laconic mention the illinois assembly joined in the general disapproval and on march third passed the following resolutions resolved by the general assembly of the state of illinois that we highly disapprove of the formulation of abolition societies and of the doctrines promulgated by them that the right of property in slaves is sacred to the slaveholding states by the federal constitution and that they cannot be deprived of that right without their consent 
that the general government cannot abolish slavery in the district of columbia against the consent of the citizens of said district without a manifest breach of good faith that the governor be requested to transmit to the states of virginia alabama mississippi new york and connecticut a copy of the foregoing report and resolutions lincoln refused to vote for these resolutions in his judgment no expression on the slavery question should go unaccompanied by the statement that it was an evil and he had the boldness to protest immediately against the action of the house he found only one man in the assembly willing to join him in his protest these two names are joined to the document they presented resolutions upon the subject of domestic slavery having passed both branches of the general assembly at its present session the undersigned hereby protest against the passage of the same they believe that the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy but that the promulgation of abolition doctrines tends rather to increase than abate its evils they believe that the congress of the united states has no power under the constitution to interfere with the institution of slavery in the different states they believe that the congress of the united states has the power under the constitution to abolish slavery in the district of columbia but that the power ought not to be exercised unless at the request of the people of the district the difference between these opinions and those contained in the resolutions is their reason for entering this protest dan stone a lincoln representatives from the county of sangamon the tenth assembly gave lincoln an opportunity to show his ability as a political maneuverer his power as a speaker and his courage in opposing what seemed to him wrong there had never been a session of the assembly when the members had the chance to make so wide an impression the character of the legislation on foot had called to vandalia numbers of persons of influence from almost every part of the state they were invariably there to secure something for their town or county and naturally made a point of learning all they could of the members and of getting as well acquainted with them as circumstances allowed game suppers seem to have been the means usually employed by visitors for bringing people together and lincoln became a favorite guest not only because he was necessary to the success of almost any measure but because he was so jovial a companion it was then that he laid the foundation of his extensive acquaintance throughout the state which in after years stood him in excellent stead the lobbyists were not the only ones in vandalia who gave suppers however not a bill was passed nor an election decided that a banquet did not follow mr john bryant the brother of william cullen was in vandalia that winter in the interest of his county and he attended one of these banquets given by the successful candidate for the united states senate lincoln was present of course and so were all the prominent politicians of the state after the company had gotten pretty noisy and mellow from their imbibitions of yellow seal and corn juice says mr bryant mr douglas and general shields to the consternation of the host and intense merriment of the guests climbed up on the table at one end encircled each other's waists and to the tune of a rollicking song pirouetted down the whole length of the table shouting singing and kicking dishes glasses and everything right and left helter-skelter for this night of entertainment to his constituents the successful candidate was presented with a bill in the morning for supper wines liquors and damages which amounted to six hundred dollars but boisterous suppers were not by any means the only feature of lincoln's social life that winter in vandalia there was another and quieter side in which he showed his rare companionableness and endeared himself to many people in the midst of the log rolling and jubilations of the session he would often slip away to some acquaintance's room and spend hours in talk and stories mr john bryant tells of his coming frequently to his room at the hotel and sitting with his knees up to his chin telling his inimitable stories and his triumphs in the house in circumventing the democrats major newton walker of lewiston who was in vandalia at the time says i used to play the fiddle a great deal and have played for lincoln a number of times 
he used to come over to where i was boarding and ask me to play and i would take the fiddle with me when i went over to visit him and when he grew weary of telling stories he would ask me to give him a tune which i never refused to do End of section nine. Section ten of the Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume One, by Ida M. Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Chapter ten. Lincoln begins to study law. Mary Owens. A newspaper contest. Growth of political influence. As soon as the assembly closed, Lincoln returned to New Salem, but not to stay. He had determined to go to Springfield. Major John Stewart, the friend who had advised him to study law, and who had lent him books, and with whom he had been associated closely in politics, had offered to take him as a partner. It was a good opening, for Stewart was one of the leading lawyers and politicians of the state, and his influence would place Lincoln at once in command of more or less business from every point of view the change seems to have been wise yet lincoln made it with foreboding to practice law he must abandon his business as a surveyor which was bringing him a fair income he must for a time at least go without a certain income if he failed what then the uncertainty weighed on him heavily the more so because he was burdened by the debts left from his store and because he was constantly called upon to aid his father's family thomas lincoln had remained in coles county but he had not in these six years in which his son had risen so rapidly been able to get anything more than a poor livelihood from his farm the sense of responsibility lincoln had towards his father's family made it the more difficult for him to undertake a new profession his decision was made however and as soon as the session of the tenth assembly was over he started for springfield his first appearance there is as pathetic as amusing he had ridden into town says joshua speed on a borrowed horse with no earthly property save a pair of saddle-bags containing a few clothes i was a merchant at springfield and kept a large country store embracing dry goods groceries hardware books medicines bedclothes mattresses in fact everything that the country needed lincoln came into the store with his saddle-bags on his arm he said he wanted to buy the furniture for a single bed the mattress blankets sheets coverlid and pillow according to the figures made by me would cost seventeen dollars he said that perhaps was cheap enough but small as the price was he was unable to pay it but if i would credit him till christmas and his experiment as a lawyer was a success he would pay then saying in the saddest tone if i fail in this i do not know that i can ever pay you as i looked up at him i thought then and i think now that i never saw a sadder face i said to him you seem to be so much pained at contracting so small a debt i think i can suggest a plan by which you can avoid the debt and at the same time attain your end i have a large room with a double bed upstairs which you are very welcome to share with me where is your room said he upstairs said i pointing to a pair of winding stairs which led from the store to my room he took his saddle-bags on his arm went upstairs set them on the floor and came down with the most changed expression of countenance beaming with pleasure he exclaimed well speed i am moved another friend william butler with whom lincoln had become intimate at vandalia took him to board life at springfield thus began under as favorable auspices as he could hope for after chicago springfield was at that day the most promising city in illinois it had some fifteen hundred inhabitants and the removal of the capital was certain to bring many more already in fact the town felt the effect the owner of real estate sees his property rapidly enhancing in value declared the sangamon journal the merchant anticipates a large accession to our population and a corresponding additional sale for his goods the mechanic already has more contracts offered him for building and improvements than he can execute the farmer anticipates the growth of a large and important town a market for the varied products of his farm 
indeed every class of our citizens look to the future with confidence that we trust will not be disappointed the effect was apparent too in society we used to eat all together said an old man who in the early thirties came to springfield as a hostler but about this time some came along and told the people they oughtn't to do so and then the hired folks ate in the kitchen this differentiation was apparent to lincoln and a little discouraging he was thinking at the time of this removal of marrying but he soon saw that it was quite out of the question for him to support a wife in springfield i am afraid you would not be satisfied he wrote the young woman there is a great deal of flourishing about in carriages here which it would be your doom to see without sharing it you would have to be poor without the means of hiding your poverty do you believe you could bear that patiently lincoln's idea of marrying mary owens of whom he asked this question was a result of a quixotic sense of honor which had curiously blinded him to the girl's real feelings for him the affair had begun in the fall of eighteen thirty six when a woman of his acquaintance who was going to kentucky on a visit proposed laughingly to bring back a sister of hers on condition that lincoln marry her i of course accepted the proposal lincoln wrote afterwards in a letter to mrs o h browning for you know i could not have done otherwise had i really been averse to it but privately between you and me i was most confoundedly well pleased with the project i had seen the said sister some three years before thought her intelligent and agreeable and saw no good objection to plodding life through hand in hand with her time passed on the lady took her journey and in due time returned sister in company sure enough this astonished me a little for it appeared to me that her coming so readily showed that she was a trifle too willing but on reflection it occurred to me that she might have been prevailed on by her married sister to come without anything concerning me ever having been mentioned to her and so i concluded that if no other objection presented itself i would consent to waive this another objection did present itself as soon as he saw the lady he was anything but pleased with her appearance but what could i do he continues in his letter to mrs browning i had told her sister that i would take her for better or for worse and i made a point of honour and conscience in all things to stick to my word especially if others had been induced to act on it which in this case i had no doubt they had for i was now fairly convinced that no other man on earth would have her and hence the conclusion that they were bent on holding me to my bargain well thought i i have said it and be the consequences what they may it shall not be my fault if i fail to do it at once i determined to consider her my wife and this done all my powers of discovery were put to work in search of perfections in her which might be fairly set off against her defects i tried to imagine her handsome which but for her unfortunate corpulency was actually true exclusive of this no woman that i have ever seen has a finer face i also tried to convince myself that the mind was much more to be valued than the person and in this she was not inferior as i could discover to any with whom i had been acquainted shortly after this without attempting to come to any positive understanding with her i set out for vandalia when and where you first saw me during my stay there i had letters from her which did not change my opinion of either her intellect or intention but on the contrary confirmed it in both all this while although i was fixed firm as the surge repelling rock in my resolution i found i was continually repenting the rashness which had led me to make it through life i have been in no bondage either real or imaginary from the thraldom of which i so much desired to be free after my return home i saw nothing to change my opinion of her in any particular she was the same and so was i i now spent my time in planning how i might get along in life after my contemplated change of circumstances should have taken place and how i might procrastinate the evil day for a time which i really dreaded as much perhaps more than an irishman does the halter 
lincoln was in this state of mind when he went to springfield and discovered how unfit his resources were to support a wife there although he put the question of poverty so plainly he assured miss owens that if she married him he would do all in his power to make her happy whatever woman may cast her lot with mine he wrote her should any ever do so it is my intention to do all in my power to make her happy and contented and there is nothing i can imagine that would make me more unhappy than to fail in the effort i know i should be much happier with you than the way i am provided i saw no signs of discontent in you what you have said to me may have been in the way of jest or i may have misunderstood it if so then let it be forgotten if otherwise i much wish you would think seriously before you decide what i have said i will most positively abide by provided you wish it my opinion is that you had better not do it you have not been accustomed to hardship and it may be more serious than you now imagine i know you are capable of thinking correctly on any subject and if you deliberate maturely upon this before you decide then i am willing to abide your decision this decidedly dispassionate view of their relation seems not to have brought any decision from miss owens for three months later mr lincoln wrote her an equally judicial letter telling her that he could not think of her with entire indifference that in all cases he wanted to do right and most particularly so in all cases with women and summing up his position as follows i now say that you can drop the subject dismiss your thoughts if you ever had any from me for ever and leave this letter unanswered without calling forth one accusing murmur from me and i will go even further and say that if it will add anything to your comfort or peace of mind to do so it is my sincere wish that you should do not understand by this that i wish to cut your acquaintance i mean no such thing what i do wish is that our further acquaintance shall depend upon yourself if such further acquaintance would contribute nothing to your happiness i am sure it would not to mine if you feel yourself in any degree bound to me i am now willing to release you provided you wish it while on the other hand i am willing and even anxious to bind you faster if i can be convinced that it will in any considerable degree add to your happiness this indeed is the whole question with me nothing would make me more miserable than to believe you miserable nothing more happy than to know you were so miss owens had enough discernment to recognize the disinterestedness of this love-making and she refused mr lincoln's offer she found him deficient in those little links which make up the chain of a woman's happiness she said when finally refused lincoln wrote the letter to mrs browning from which the above citations have been taken he concluded it with an account of the effect on himself of miss owens refusal i was mortified it seemed to me in a hundred different ways my vanity was deeply wounded by the reflection that i had so long been too stupid to discover her intentions and at the same time never doubting that i understood them perfectly and also that she whom i had taught myself to believe nobody else would have had actually rejected me with all my fancied greatness and to cap the whole i then for the first time began to suspect that i was really a little in love with her but let it all go i'll try and outlive it others have been made fools of by the girls but this can never with truth be said of me i most emphatically in this instance made a fool of myself i have now come to the conclusion never again to think of marrying and for this reason i would never be satisfied with any one who would be blockhead enough to have me the skill the courage and the good will lincoln had shown in his management of the bill for the removal of the capital gave him at once a position in springfield the entire long nine indeed were regarded by the county as its benefactors and throughout the summer there were barbecues and fireworks dinners and speeches in their honor the service rendered old sangamon by the present delegation was a continually recurring toast at every gathering 
at one sumptuous dinner the internal improvement scheme in all its phases was toasted again and again by the banqueters the long nine of old sangamon well done good and faithful servants drew long applause among those who offered volunteer toasts at this dinner were a lincoln esq and s a douglas esq at a dinner at athens given to the delegation eight formal toasts and twenty-five volunteers are quoted in the report of the affair in the sangamon journal among them were the following a lincoln he has fulfilled the expectations of his friends and disappointed the hopes of his enemies a lincoln one of nature's noblemen by a lincoln sangamon county will ever be true to her best interests and never more so than in reciprocating the good feelings of the citizens of athens and neighborhood lincoln had not been long in springfield before he was able to support himself from his law practice a result due no doubt very largely to his personal qualities and to his reputation as a shrewd politician not that he made money the fee book of lincoln and stewart shows that the returns were modest enough and that sometimes they even traded out their account nevertheless it was a satisfaction to earn a livelihood so soon of his peculiar methods as a lawyer at this date we know very little most of his cases are utterly uninteresting the very first year he was in springfield however he had one case which created a sensation and which is an admirable example of the way he could combine business and politics as well as of his merciless persistency in pursuing a man whom he believed unjust it seems that among the offices to be filled at the august election of eighteen thirty seven was that of probate justice of the peace one of the candidates was general james adams a man who had come on from the east in the early twenties and who had at first claimed to be a lawyer he had been an aspirant for various offices among them that of governor of the state but with little success a few days before the august election of eighteen thirty seven an anonymous handbill was scattered about the streets it was an attack on general adams charging him with having acquired the title to a ten-acre lot of ground near the town by the deliberate forgery of the name of joseph anderson of fulton county illinois to an assignment of a judgment anderson had died and his widow going to springfield to dispose of the land had been surprised to find that it was claimed by general adams she had employed stuart and lincoln to look into the matter the handbill which went into all of the details at great length concluded as follows i have only made these statements because i am known by many to be one of the individuals against whom the charge of forging the assignment and slipping it into the general's papers has been made and because our silence might be construed into a confession of the truth i shall not subscribe my name but hereby authorize the editor of the journal to give it up to any one who may call for it after the election at which general adams was successful the handbill was reproduced in the sangamon journal with a card signed by the editor in which he said to save any further remarks on this subject i now state that a lincoln esq is the author of the handbill in question the same issue of the paper contained a lengthy communication from general adams denying the charge of fraud the controversy was continued for several weeks in the newspapers general adams often filling six columns of a single issue of the springfield republican he charged that the assault upon him was the result of a conspiracy between a knot of lawyers doctors and others who wished to ruin his reputation lincoln's answers to adams are most emphatic in one case quoting several of his assertions he pronounced them all as false as hell as all this community must know adams replies were always voluminous such is the turn which things have lately taken wrote lincoln that when general adams writes a book i am expected to write a commentary on it replying to adams denunciation of the lawyers he said 
he attempted to impose himself upon the community as a lawyer and he actually carried the attempt so far as to induce a man who was under the charge of murder to entrust the defence of his life to his hands and finally took his money and got him hanged is this the man that is to raise a breeze in his favour by abusing lawyers if he is not a lawyer he is a liar for he proclaimed himself a lawyer and got a man hanged by depending on him lincoln concluded farewell general i will see you again at court if not before when and where we will settle the question whether you or the widow shall have the land the widow did get the land but this was not the worst thing that happened to adams the climax was reached when the sangamon journal published a long editorial written by lincoln no doubt on the controversy and followed it with a copy of an indictment found against adams in oswego county new york in eighteen eighteen the offence charged in this indictment was the forgery of a deed by adams a person of evil name and fame and of a wicked disposition lincoln's victory in this controversy undoubtedly did much to impress the community not necessarily that he was a good lawyer but rather that he was a clever strategist and a fearless enemy it was not in fact as a lawyer that he was prominent in the first years after he came to springfield it was as a politician the place he had taken among the leaders of the whig party in the winter of eighteen thirty six and eighteen thirty seven he easily kept the qualities which he had shown from the outstart of his public life were only strengthened as he gained experience and self-confidence he was the terror of the pretentious and insincere and had a way of exposing their shams by clever tricks which were unanswerable arguments thus it was considered necessary at that day by a candidate to prove the farmers that he was poor and like themselves horny-handed those politicians who wore good clothes and dined sumptuously were careful to conceal their regards for the elegancies of life from their constituents one of the democrats who in this period took particular pains to decry the whigs for their wealth and aristocratic principles was colonel dick taylor generally known in illinois as ruffleshirt taylor he was a vain and handsome man who habitually arrayed himself as gorgeously as the fashion allowed one day when he and lincoln had met in debate at a countryside gathering colonel dick became particularly bitter in his condemnation of whig elegance lincoln listened for a time and then slipping near the speaker suddenly caught his coat which was buttoned up close and tore it open a mass of ruffled shirt a gorgeous velvet vest and a great gold chain from which dangled numerous rings and seals were uncovered to the crowd lincoln needed to make no further reply that day to the charge of being a rag baron lincoln loved fair play as he hated shams and throughout these early years in springfield boldly insisted that friend and enemy have the chance do them a dramatic case of this kind occurred at a political meeting held one evening in the springfield courtroom which at that date was temporarily in a hall under stuart and lincoln's law office directly over the platform was a trap door lincoln frequently would lie by this opening during a meeting listening to the speeches one evening one of his friends e d baker in speaking angered the crowd and an attempt was made to pull him down before the assailants could reach the platform however a pair of long legs dangled from the trap door and in an instant lincoln dropped down beside baker crying out hold on gentlemen this is a land of free speech his appearance was so unexpected and his attitude so determined that the crowd soon was quiet and baker went on with his speech lincoln did not take a prominent place in his party because the whigs lacked material he had powerful rivals edward dickinson baker colonel john j hardin john t stewart ninian w edwards jesse k dubois o h browning were but a few of the brilliant men who were throwing all their ability and ambition into the contest for political honors in the state nor were the whigs a whit superior to the democrats william l d ewing ebenezer peck 
william thomas james shields john calhoun were in every respect as able as the best men of the whig party indeed one of the prominent democrats with whom lincoln came often in contact was popularly regarded as the most brilliant and promising politician of the state stephen a douglas his record had been phenomenal he had amazed both parties in eighteen thirty four by securing the appointment by the legislature to the office of state attorney for the first judicial circuit over john j hardin in eighteen thirty six he had been elected to the legislature and although he was at that time but twenty-three years of age he had shown himself one of the most vigorous capable and intelligent members indeed douglas's work in the tenth assembly gave him about the same position in the democratic party of the state at large that lincoln's work in the same body gave him in the whig party of his own district in eighteen thirty seven he had had no difficulty in being appointed register of the land office a position which compelled him to make his home in springfield it was only a few months after lincoln rode into town all his earthly possessions in a pair of saddle-bags that douglas appeared handsome polished and always with an air of prosperity the advent of the young democratic official was in striking contrast to that of the sad-eyed ill-clad poverty-stricken young lawyer from new salem from the first lincoln and douglas were thrown constantly together in the social life of the town and often pitted against each other in what were the real forums of the state at that day the space around the huge franklin stove of some obliging storekeeper the steps of somebody's law office a pile of lumber or a long timber lying in the public square where the new state house was going up in the fall of eighteen thirty seven douglas was nominated for congress on the democratic ticket his whig opponent was lincoln's law partner john t stewart the campaign which the two conducted was one of the most remarkable in the history of the state for five months of the spring and summer of eighteen thirty eight they rode together from town to town all over the northern part of illinois illinois at that time was divided into but three congressional districts the third in which sangamon county was included being made up of the twenty-two northernmost counties speaking six days out of seven when the election came off in august eighteen thirty eight out of thirty-six thousand votes cast stuart received a majority of only fourteen but even that majority the democrats always contended was won unfairly the campaign was watched with intense interest by the young politicians of springfield no one of them felt a deeper interest in it than lincoln who was himself a candidate for the state legislature and who was spending a great deal of his time in electioneering as the campaign of eighteen forty approached lincoln was more and more frequently pitted against douglas he had by this time no doubt learned something of the power of the little giant as douglas was already called certainly no man in public life between eighteen thirty seven and eighteen sixty had a greater hold on his followers the reasons for this grasp are not hard to find douglas was by nature buoyant enthusiastic impetuous he had that sunny boyishness which is so irresistible to young and old with it he had great natural eloquence when his deep rich voice rolled out fervid periods in support of the sub-treasury and the convention system or in opposition to internal improvements by the federal government the people applauded out of sheer joy at the pleasure of hearing him he was one of the few people in illinois whom the epithet of yankee never hurt he might be a yankee but when he sat down on the knee of some surly lawyer and confidentially told him his plans or at a political meeting took off his coat and rolled up his sleeves and pitched in to his opponent the sons of illinois forgot his origin in love for the man lincoln undoubtedly understood the charm of douglas and realized his power but he already had an insight into one of his political characteristics that few people recognized at that day in writing to stuart in eighteen thirty nine while the latter was attending congress lincoln said douglas has not been here since you left 
a report is in circulation here now that he has abandoned the idea of going to washington though this report does not come in a very authentic form so far as i can learn though by the way speaking of authenticity you know that if we had heard douglas say that he had abandoned the contest it would not be very authentic at that time the local issues which had formerly engaged illinois candidates almost entirely were lost sight of in national questions in springfield where the leaders of both parties were living many hot debates were held in private out of these grew in december eighteen thirty nine a series of public discussions extending over eight evenings and in which several of the first orators of the state took part lincoln was the last man on the list the people were nearly worn out when his turn came and his audience was small he began his speech with some melancholy self-deprecatory reflections complaining that the small audience cast a damp over his spirits which he was sure he would be unable to overcome during the evening he did better than he expected overcoming the damp on his spirits so effectually that he made what was regarded as the best speech of the series by a general request it was printed for distribution while there is little of the perfervid eloquence of eighteen forty in it as well as a good deal of the rather boisterous humor of the time a part of it is devoted to a careful examination of the statements of his opponents and a refutation of them by means of public documents as a good democrat was expected to do douglas had explained with plausibility why the van buren administration had in eighteen thirty eight spent forty million dollars lincoln takes up his statements one by one and proves as he says that the majority of them are wholly untrue douglas had attributed a part of the expenditures to the purchase of public lands from the indians now it happens said lincoln that no such purchase was made during that year it is true that some money was paid that year in pursuance of indian treaties but no more or rather not as much as had been paid on the same account in each of several preceding years again mr douglas says that the removal of indians to the country west of the mississippi created much of the expenditure of eighteen thirty eight i have examined the public documents in relation to this matter and find that less was paid for the removal of indians in that than in some former years the whole sum expended on that account in that year did not much exceed one quarter of a million for this small sum although we do not think the administration entitled to credit because large sums have been expended in the same way in former years we consent it may take one and make the most of it next mr douglas says that five millions of the expenditure of eighteen thirty eight consisted of the payment of the french indemnity money to its individual claimants i have carefully examined the public documents and thereby find this statement to be wholly untrue of the forty millions of dollars expended in eighteen thirty eight i am enabled to say positively that not one dollar consisted of payments on the french indemnities so much for that excuse next comes the post office he says that five millions were expended during that year to sustain that department by a like examination of public documents i find this also wholly untrue of the so often mentioned forty millions not one dollar went to the post office i return to another of mr douglas's excuses for the expenditures of eighteen thirty eight at the same time announcing the pleasing intelligence that this is the last one he says that ten millions of that year's expenditure were a contingent appropriation to prosecute an anticipated war with great britain on the main boundary question few words will settle this first that the ten millions appropriated was not made till eighteen thirty nine and consequently could not have been expended in eighteen thirty eight second although it was appropriated it has never been expended at all those who heard mr douglas recollect that he indulged himself in a contemptuous expression of pity for me now he's got me thought i but when he went on to say that five millions of the expenditure of eighteen thirty eight were payments of the french indemnities 
which i knew to be untrue that five millions had been for the post office which i knew to be untrue that ten millions had been for the main boundary war which i not only knew to be untrue but supremely ridiculous also and when i saw that he was stupid enough to hope that i would permit such groundless and audacious assertions to go unexposed i readily consented that on the score of both veracity and sagacity the audience should judge whether he or i were the more deserving of the world's contempt these citations show that lincoln had already learned to handle public documents and to depend for at least a part of his success with an audience upon a careful statement of facts the methods used in at least a portion of this speech are exactly those which made the irresistible strength of his speeches in eighteen fifty eight eighteen fifty nine and eighteen sixty but there was little of as good work done in the campaign of eighteen forty by lincoln or anybody else as is found in this speech it was a campaign of fun and noise and nowhere more so than in illinois lincoln was one of the five whig presidential electors and he flung himself into the campaign with confidence the nomination of harrison takes first rate he wrote to his partner stuart then in washington you know i am never sanguine but i believe we will carry the state the chance of doing so appears to me twenty-five per cent better than it did for you to beat douglas the whigs in spite of their dislike of the convention system organized as they never had before and even sent out a confidential circular of which lincoln was the author this circular provided for a remarkably complete organization of the state as the following extracts will show after due deliberation the following is the plan of organization and the duties required of each county committee one to divide their county into small districts and to appoint in each a subcommittee whose duty it shall be to make a perfect list of all the voters in their respective districts and to ascertain with certainty for whom they will vote if they meet with men who are doubtful as to the man they will support such voters should be designated in separate lines with the name of the man they will probably support two it will be the duty of said subcommittee to keep a constant watch on the doubtful voters and from time to time have them talked to by those in whom they have the most confidence and also to place in their hands such documents as will enlighten and influence them five on the first of each month hereafter we shall expect to hear from you after the first report of your subcommittees unless there should be found a great many doubtful voters you can tell pretty accurately the manner in which your county will vote in each of your letters to us you will state the number of certain votes both for and against us as well as the number of doubtful votes with your opinion of the manner in which they will be cast six when we have heard from all the counties we shall be able to tell with similar accuracy the political complexion of the state this information will be forwarded to you as soon as received every weapon lincoln thought of possible use in the contest he secured be sure to send me as many copies of the life of harrison as you can spare from other uses he wrote stuart be very sure to procure and send me the senate journal of new york of september eighteen fourteen i have a newspaper article which says that that document proves that van buren voted against raising troops in the last war and in general send me anything you think will be a good war club every sign of success he quoted to stuart the number of subscribers to the old soldier a campaign newspaper which the whig committee had informed the whigs of the state that they must take the names of van buren men who were weakening and to whom he wanted stuart to send documents the name of every theretofore doubtful person who had declared himself for harrison jaff bell has come out for harrison he put in a postscript to one letter ain't that a caution the monster political meetings held throughout the state did much to widen lincoln's reputation particularly one held in june in springfield twenty thousand people attended this meeting delegations coming from every direction it took fourteen teams to haul the delegation from chicago 
and they were three weeks on their journey. Each party carried some huge symbolic piece, the log cabin being the favorite. One of the cabins taken to Springfield was drawn by thirty yokes of oxen. In a hickory tree which was planted beside this cabin, coons were seen playing, and a barrel of hard cider stood by the door, continually on tap. Instead of a log cabin, the Chicago delegation dragged across country a government yawl, rigged up as a two-masted ship, with a band of music and a six-pounder cannon on board. There are many reminiscences of this great celebration, and Lincoln's part in it, still afloat in Illinois. General T. J. Henderson writes, in his entertaining reminiscences of Lincoln, The first time I remember to have seen Abraham Lincoln was during the memorable campaign of 1840, when I was a boy, fifteen years of age. It was in an immense Whig mass meeting, held at Springfield, Illinois, in the month of June of that year. The Whigs attended this meeting from all parts of the state in large numbers, and it was estimated that from forty to fifty thousand people were present. They came in carriages and wagons, on horseback and on foot. They came with log cabins drawn on wheels by oxen, and with coons, coonskins, and hard cider. They came with music and banners, and thousands of them came from long distances. It was the first political meeting I had ever attended and it made a very strong impression upon my youthful mind. My father, William H. Henderson, then a resident of Stark County, Illinois, was an ardent Whig, and having served under General William Henry Harrison, the then Whig candidate for president, in the war of 1812 to 1815, he felt a deep interest in his election, and although he lived about a hundred miles from Springfield, he went with a delegation from Stark County to this political meeting, and took me along with him. I remember that at this great meeting of the supporters of Harrison and Tyler, there were a number of able and distinguished speakers of the Whig party of the state of Illinois present. Among them were Colonel E. D. Baker, who was killed at Ball's Bluff on the Potomac in the late war, and who was one of the most eloquent speakers in the state, Colonel John J. Hardin, who was killed at the Battle of Buena Vista in the Mexican War, Fletcher Webster, a son of Daniel Webster, who was killed in the late war, S. Leslie Smith, a brilliant orator of Chicago, Reverend John Hogan, Ben Bond, and Abraham Lincoln. I heard all of these men speak on that occasion, and while I was too young to be a judge of their speeches, yet I thought them all to be great men, and none of them greater than Abraham Lincoln. The late Judge Scott of Illinois says of Lincoln's speech at that gathering, in an unpublished paper, Lincoln on the Stump and at the Bar, Mr. Lincoln stood in a wagon from which he addressed the mass of people that surrounded it. The meeting was one of unusual interest because of him who was to make the principal address. It was at the time of his greatest physical strength. He was tall and perhaps a little more slender than in later life, and more homely than after he became stouter in person. He was then only thirty-one years of age, and yet he was regarded as one of the ablest of the Whig speakers in that campaign. There was that in him that attracted and held public attention. Even then, he was the subject of popular regard because of his candid and simple mode of discussing and illustrating political questions. At times he was intensely logical, and was always most convincing in his arguments. The questions involved in that canvas had relation to the tariff, internal public improvements by the federal government, the distribution of the proceeds of the sales of public lands among the several states, and other questions that divided the political parties of that day. They were not such questions as enlisted and engaged his best thoughts. They did not take hold of his great nature, and had no tendency to develop it. At times he discussed the questions of the time in a logical way, but much time was devoted to telling stories to illustrate some phase of his argument though more often the telling of these stories was resorted to for the purpose of rendering his opponents ridiculous. That was a style of speaking much appreciated at that early day. In that kind of oratory he excelled most of his contemporaries. Indeed, he had no equal in the state. 
one story he told on that occasion was full of salient points and well illustrated the argument he was making it was not an impure story yet it was not one it would be seemly to publish but rendered as it was in his inimitable way it contained nothing that was offensive to a refined taste the same story might have been told by another in such a way that it would probably have been regarded as transcending the proprieties of popular address one characterizing feature of all the stories told by mr lincoln on the stump and elsewhere was that although the subject matter of some of them might not have been entirely unobjectionable yet the manner of telling them was so peculiarly his own that they gave no offence even to refined and cultured people on the contrary they were much enjoyed the story he told on this occasion was much liked by the vast assembly that surrounded the temporary platform from which he spoke and was received with loud bursts of laughter and applause it served to place the opposing party and its speakers in a most ludicrous position in respect to the question being considered and gave him a most favorable hearing for the arguments he later made in support of the measures he was sustaining although so active as a whig politician lincoln was not prominent at this period as a legislator few bills originated with him among these few one of interest is the illinois law requiring the examination of school teachers as to their qualifications and providing for the granting of official certificates of authority to teach in the pioneer days any person whom circumstances forced into the business was permitted to teach on december second eighteen forty lincoln offered the following resolution in the illinois house of representatives resolved that the committee on education be instructed to inquire into the expediency of providing by law for the examination as to the qualification of persons offering themselves as school teachers that no teacher shall receive any part of the public school fund who shall not have successfully passed such examination and that they report by bill or otherwise a motion to table this resolution was defeated within the ensuing three months the legislature passed an act making provision for organizing and maintaining common schools the act which was the foundation of the common school system of illinois section eighty one of this act providing for the qualification of teachers embodied lincoln's idea this section made it the duty of the school trustees in every township to examine any person proposing to teach school in their vicinity in relation to the qualifications of such person as a teacher or they might appoint a board of commissioners to conduct the examination and a certificate of qualification was to be issued by a majority of the trustees or commissioners since then of course all the states have passed laws providing for the examination of teachers in illinois no material change has been made in lincoln's plan for this section of the law was very likely drawn by lincoln except that the power of examination has been transferred from the trustees or commissioners to the county superintendent of schools an office then unknown end of section ten Section 11 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11. Lincoln's Engagement to Mary Todd. Breaking of the Engagement. Lincoln Shields Duel. Busy as Lincoln was with law and politics the first three years after he reached Springfield, he did not by any means fail to identify himself with the interests of the town and of its people in all the intellectual life of the place he took his part in the fall of eighteen thirty seven with a few of the leading young men he formed a young man's lyceum one of the very few of his early speeches which has been preserved was delivered before this body its subject being the perpetuation of our political institutions at the request of the members of the lyceum this address was published in the sangamon journal for february third eighteen thirty eight the most pleasing feature of his early life in the town was the way in which he attracted all classes of people to him he naturally from his political importance and from his relation to mr stewart was admitted to the best society 
but Lincoln was not received there from tolerance of his position only. The few members left of that interesting circle of Springfield in the thirties are emphatic in their statements that he was recognized as a valuable social factor. If indifferent to forms and little accustomed to conventional usages, he had a native dignity and self-respect which stamped him at once as a superior man. He had a good will, an easy adaptability to people, which made him take a hand in everything that went on. His name appears in every list of banqueters and merrymakers reported in the Springfield papers. He even served as a committeeman for cotillion parties. We liked Lincoln, though he was not gay, said one charming and cultivated old lady to me in Springfield. He rarely danced. He was never very attentive to ladies, but he was always a welcome guest everywhere and the center of a circle of animated talkers. Indeed, I think the only thing we girls had against Lincoln was that he always attracted all the men around him. Lincoln's kindly interest and perfectly democratic feeling attached him to many people whom he never met save on the streets. Indeed, his life in the streets of Springfield is a most touching and delightful study. He concerned himself in the progress of every building which was put up, of every new street which was opened. He passed nobody without recognition. He seemed always to have time to stop and talk. He became, in fact, part of Springfield's street life, just as he did of the town's politics and society. In 1840, Lincoln became engaged to be married to one of the favorite young women of Springfield, Miss Mary Todd, the sister-in-law of one of his political friends, a member of the Long Nine and a prominent citizen, Ninian W. Edwards. Miss Todd came from a well-known family of Lexington, Kentucky, her father, Robert S. Todd, being one of the leading citizens of his state. She had come to Springfield in 1839 to live with her sister, Mrs. Edwards. She was a brilliant, witty, high-educated girl, ambitious and spirited, with a touch of audacity which only made her more attractive, and she at once took a leading position in Springfield society. There were many young unmarried men in the town drawn there by politics, and Mr. Edwards' handsome home was open to them in the hospitable southern way. After Mary Todd became an inmate of the Edwards' house, the place was gayer than ever. She received much attention from Douglas, Shields, Lincoln, and several others. It was soon apparent, however, that Miss Todd preferred Lincoln. As the intimacy between them increased, Mr. and Mrs. Edwards protested. However honorable and able a man Lincoln might be, he was still a plebeian. His family were humble and poor. He was self-educated, without address or polish, careless of forms, indifferent to society. How could Mary Todd, brought up in a cultured home, accustomed to the refinements of life, ambitious for social position, accommodate herself to so grave a nature, so dull an exterior? Miss Todd knew her own mind, however. She loved Lincoln, and seems to have believed from the first in his future. Sometime in 1840 they became engaged. But it was not long before there came the clashing inevitable between two persons whose tastes and ambitions were so different. Miss Todd was jealous and exacting, Lincoln thoughtless and inattentive. He frequently failed to accompany her to the merrymakings which she wanted to attend, and she, naturally enough, resented his neglect, interpreting it as a purposed slight. Sometimes, in revenge, she went with Mr. Douglas or some other escort who offered. Reproaches and tears and misunderstandings followed. If the lovers made up, it was only to fall out again. At last Lincoln became convinced that they were incompatible, and resolved that he must break the engagement. But the knowledge that the girl loved him took away his courage. He felt that he must not draw back, and he became profoundly miserable. Whatever woman may cast her lot with mine, should any ever do so, it is my intention to do all in my power to make her happy and contented and there is nothing I can imagine that would make me more unhappy than to fail in the effort, Lincoln had written Miss Owens three years before. How could he make this brilliant, passionate creature, to whom he was betrothed, happy? 
a mortal dread of the result of the marriage a harrowing doubt of his own feelings possessed him the experience is not so rare in the history of lovers that it should be regarded as it often has been as something exceptional and abnormal in lincoln's case a reflective nature founded in melancholy like lincoln's rarely undertakes even the simpler affairs of life without misgivings he certainly experienced dread and doubt before entering on any new relation when it came to forming the most delicate and intimate of all human relations he staggered under a burden of uncertainty and suffering and finally broke the engagement so horrible a breach of honor did this seem to him that he called the day when it occurred the fatal first of january eighteen forty one and months afterward he wrote to his intimate friend speed i must regain my confidence in my own ability to keep my resolves when they are made in that ability i once prided myself as the only or chief gem of my character that gem i lost how and where you know too well i have not yet regained it and until i do i cannot trust myself in any matter of much importance the breaking of the engagement between miss todd and mr lincoln was known at the time to all their friends lincoln's melancholy was evident to them all nor did he indeed attempt to disguise it he wrote and spoke freely to his intimates of the despair which possessed him and of his sense of dishonor the episode caused a great amount of gossip as was to be expected after mr lincoln's assassination and mrs lincoln's sad death various accounts of the courtship and marriage were circulated it remained however for one of lincoln's law partners mr w h herndon to develop and circulate the most sensational of all the versions of the rupture according to mr herndon the engagement between the two was broken in the most violent and public way possible by mr lincoln's failing to appear at the wedding mr herndon even describes the scene in detail the time fixed for the marriage was the first day of january eighteen forty one careful preparations for the happy occasion were made at the edwards mansion the house underwent the customary renovation the furniture was properly arranged the rooms neatly decorated the supper prepared and the guests invited the latter assembled on the evening in question and awaited in expectant pleasure the interesting ceremony of marriage the bride bedecked in veil and silken gown and nervously toying with the flowers in her hair sat in the adjoining room nothing was lacking but the groom for some strange reason he had been delayed an hour passed and the guests as well as the bride were becoming restless but they were all doomed to disappointment another hour passed messengers were sent out over town and each returning with the same report it became apparent that lincoln the principal in this little drama had purposely failed to appear the bride in grief disappeared to her room the wedding supper was left untouched the guests quietly and wonderingly withdrew the lights in the edwards mansion were blown out and darkness settled over all for the night what the feelings of a lady as sensitive passionate and proud as miss todd were we can only imagine no one can ever describe them by daybreak after persistent search lincoln's friends found him restless gloomy miserable desperate he seemed an object of pity his friends speed among the number fearing a tragic termination watched him closely in their rooms day and night knives and razors and every instrument that could be used for self-destruction were removed from his reach mrs edwards did not hesitate to regard him as insane and of course her sister mary shared in that view no one can read this description in connection with the rest of mr herndon's text and escape the impression that if it is true there must have been a vein of cowardice in lincoln the context shows that he was not insane enough to excuse such a public insult to a woman to break his engagement was all things considered not an unusual or abnormal thing to brood over the rupture to blame himself to feel that he had been dishonorable was to be expected after such an act from one of his temperament 
nothing however but temporary insanity or constitutional cowardice could explain such conduct as here described mr herndon does not pretend to found his story on any personal knowledge of the affair he was in springfield at the time a clerk in speed's store but did not have then nor indeed did he ever have any social relations with the families in which mr lincoln was always a welcome guest his authority for the story is a remark which he says mrs ninian edwards made to him in an interview lincoln and mary were engaged everything was ready and prepared for the marriage even to the supper mr lincoln failed to meet his engagement cause insanity this remark it should be noted is not from a manuscript written by mrs edwards but in a report of an interview with her written by mr herndon supposing however that the statement was made exactly as mr herndon reports it it certainly does not justify any sensational description as mr herndon gives if such a thing had ever occurred it could not have failed to be known of course even to its smallest details by all the relatives and friends of both miss todd and mr lincoln nobody however ever heard of this wedding party until mr herndon gave his material to the public one of the closest friends of the lincolns throughout their lives was a cousin of mrs lincoln's mrs grimsley afterwards mrs dr brown mrs grimsley lived in springfield on the most intimate and friendly relations with mr and mrs lincoln and the first six months of their life in the white house she spent with them she was a woman of unusual culture and of the rarest sweetness and graciousness of character some months before mrs brown's death in august eighteen ninety five a copy of mr herndon's story was sent her with a request that she write for publication her knowledge of the affair in her reply she said did mr lincoln fail to appear when the invitations were out the guests invited and the supper ready for the wedding i will say emphatically no there may have been a little shadow of foundation for mr herndon's lively imagination to play upon in that the year previous to the marriage and when mr lincoln and my cousin mary expected soon to be married mr lincoln was taken with one of those fearful overwhelming periods of depression which induced his friends to persuade him to leave springfield this he did for a time but i am satisfied he was loyal and true to mary even though at times he may have doubted whether he was responding as fully as a manly generous nature should to such affection as he knew my cousin was ready to bestow on him and this because it had not the overmastering depth of an early love this everybody here knows therefore i do not feel as if i were betraying dear friends mrs john stewart the wife of lincoln's law partner at that time is still living in springfield a refined cultivated intelligent woman who remembers perfectly the life and events of that day when mr herndon's story first came to her attention her indignation was intense she protested that she had never before heard of such a thing mrs stewart was not however in springfield at that particular date but in washington her husband being a member of congress she wrote the following statement for this biography i cannot deny this as i was not in springfield for some months before and after this occurrence was said to have taken place but i was in close correspondence with relatives and friends during all this time and never heard a word of it the late judge broadwell told me that he had asked mr ninian edwards about it and mr edwards told him that no such thing had ever taken place all i can say is that i unhesitatingly do not believe such an event ever occurred i thought i had never heard of this till i saw it in herndon's book i have since been told that layman mentions the same thing i read layman at the time he published and felt very much disgusted but did not remember this particular assertion the first chapters of layman's book were purchased from herndon so herndon is responsible for the whole mrs lincoln told me herself all the circumstances of her engagement to mr lincoln of his illness and the breaking off of her engagement of the renewal and her marriage so i say i do not believe one word of this dishonorable story about mr lincoln 
another prominent member in the same circle with mr lincoln and miss todd is mrs b t edwards the widow of judge benjamin t edwards the sister-in-law of mr ninian edwards who had married miss todd's sister she came to springfield in eighteen thirty nine and was intimately acquainted with mr lincoln and miss todd and knew as well as another could know their affairs Mrs. Edwards is still living in Springfield, a woman of the most perfect refinement and trustworthiness. In answer to the question, is Mr. Herndon's description true, she writes, I am impatient to tell you that all that he says about this wedding, the time for which was fixed for the first day of January, is a fabrication. He has drawn largely upon his imagination in describing something which never took place. I know the engagement between Mr. Lincoln and Miss Todd was interrupted for a time, and it was rumored among her young friends that Mr. Edwards had rather opposed it. But I am sure there had been no time fixed for any wedding, that is, no preparations had ever been made until the day that Mr. Lincoln met Mr. Edwards on the street and told him that he and Mary were going to be married that evening. Upon inquiry, Mr. Lincoln said that they would be married in the Episcopal Church, to which Mr. Edwards replied, No, Mary is my ward, and she must be married at my house. If I remember rightly, the wedding guests were few, not more than thirty, and it seems to me all are gone now but Mrs. Wallace, Mrs. Levering, and myself, for it was not much more than a family gathering. Only two or three of Mary Todd's young friends were present. The entertainment was simple, but in beautiful taste but the bride had neither veil nor flowers in her hair with which to toy nervously. There had been no elaborate trousseau for the bride of the future President of the United States, nor even a handsome wedding gown, nor was it a gay wedding. Two sisters of Mrs. Lincoln, who are still living, Mrs. Wallace of Springfield and Mrs. Helm of Elizabethtown, Kentucky, deny emphatically that any wedding was ever arranged between Mr. Lincoln and Miss Todd but the one which did take place. That the engagement was broken after a wedding had been talked of, they think possible. But Mr. Herndon's story they deny emphatically. There is not a word of truth in it. Mrs. Wallace broke out, impulsively, before the question about the non-appearance of Mr. Lincoln had been finished. I was never so amazed in my life as when I read that story. Mr. Lincoln never did such a thing. Why, Mary Lincoln never had a silk dress in her life until she went to Washington. As Mr. Joshua Speed was, all through this period, Mr. Lincoln's closest friend, no thought or feeling of the one ever being concealed from the other, Mrs. Joshua Speed, who is still living in Louisville, Kentucky, was asked if she knew of the story. Mrs. Speed listened in surprise to Mr. Herndon's tale. I never heard of it before, she declared. I never heard of it. If it is true, I never heard of it. While the above investigation was going on, quite unexpectedly, a volunteer witness to the falsity of the story appeared. The Honorable H. W. Thornton of Millersburg, Illinois, was a member of the Twelfth General Assembly, which met in Springfield in 1840. During that winter, he was boarding near Lincoln, saw him almost every day, was a constant visitor at Mr. Edwards' house, and he knew Miss Todd well. He wrote to the author declaring that Mr. Herndon's statement about the wedding must be false, as he was closely associated with Miss Todd and Mr. Lincoln all winter, and never knew anything of it. Mr. Thornton went on to say that he knew beyond a doubt that the sensational account of Lincoln's insanity was untrue, and he quoted from the House Journal to show how it was impossible that, as Lehman says, using Herndon's notes, Lincoln went crazy as a loon and did not attend the legislature in 1841-1842 for this reason, or, as Herndon says, that he had to be watched constantly. According to the record taken from the journals of the House by Mr. Thornton, and which have been verified in Springfield, Mr. Lincoln was in his seat in the House on that fatal 1st of January, when he is asserted to have been groping in the shadow of madness, and he was also there on the following day. The 3rd of January was Sunday. On Monday the 4th he appears not to have been present. At least, he did not vote. But even this is by no means conclusive evidence that he was not there. 
on the fifth and on every succeeding day until the thirteenth he was in his seat from the thirteenth to the eighteenth inclusive he is not recorded on any of the roll calls and probably was not present but on the nineteenth when john j hardin announced his illness to the house as mr herndon says which announcement seems not to have gotten into the journal lincoln was again in his place and voted on the twentieth he is not recorded but on every subsequent day until the close of the session on the first of march lincoln was in the house thus during the whole of the two months of january and february he was absent not more than seven days as good a record of attendance perhaps as that made by the average member mr thornton says further mr lincoln boarded at william butler's near to dr henry's where i boarded the missing days from january thirteenth to nineteenth mr lincoln spent several hours each day at dr henry's a part of these days i remained with mr lincoln his most intimate friends had no fears of his injuring himself he was very sad and melancholy but being subject to these spells nothing serious was apprehended his being watched as stated in herndon's book was news to me until i saw it there but while Lincoln went about his daily duties, even on the fatal 1st of January, the day when he broke his word to Miss Todd, his whole being was shrouded in gloom. He did not pretend to conceal this from his friends. Writing to Mr. Stewart on January 23rd, he said, I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on the earth." whether i shall ever be better i cannot tell i awfully forebode i shall not to remain as i am is impossible i must die or be better it appears to me the matter you speak of on my account you may attend to as you say unless you shall hear of my condition forbidding it i say this because i fear i shall be unable to attend to any business here and a change of scene might help me in the summer he visited his friend speed who had sold his store in Springfield and returned to Louisville, Kentucky. The visit did much to brighten his spirits, for, writing back in September, after his return, to his friend's sister, he was even gay. A curious situation arose the next year, 1842, which did much to restore Lincoln to a more normal view of his relation to Miss Todd. In the summer of 1841, his friend Speed had become engaged. As the time for his marriage approached, he, in turn, was attacked by a melancholy not unlike that from which Lincoln had suffered. He feared he did not love well enough to marry, and he confided his fear to Lincoln. Full of sympathy for the trouble of his friend, Lincoln tried in every way to persuade him that his twinges of the soul were all explained by nervous stability. When Speed returned to Kentucky, Lincoln wrote him several letters in which he consoled, counseled or laughed at him these letters abound in suggestive passages from what did speed suffer from three special causes and a general one which lincoln proceeds to enumerate the general cause is that you are naturally of a nervous temperament and this i say from what i have seen of you personally and what you have told me concerning your mother at various times and concerning your brother william at the time his wife died the first special cause is your exposure to bad weather on your journey, which my experience clearly proves to be very severe on defective nerves. The second is the absence of all business and conversation of friends, which might divert your mind, give it occasional rest from the intensity of thought which will sometimes wear the sweetest idea threadbare and turn it to the bitterness of death. The third is the rapid and near approach of that crisis on which all your thoughts and feelings concentrate. Speed writes that his fiancée is ill, and his letter is full of gloomy forebodings of an early death. Lincoln hails these fears as an omen of happiness. I hope and believe that your present anxiety and distress about her health and her life— must and will forever banish those horrid doubts which i know you sometimes felt as to the truth of your affection for her if they can once and forever be removed 
and I almost feel a presentiment that the Almighty has sent your present affliction expressly for that object. Surely nothing can come in their stead to fill their immeasurable measure of misery. It really appears to me that you yourself ought to rejoice and not sorrow at this indubitable evidence of your undying affection for her. Why, Speed, if you did not love her, although you might not wish her death, you would most certainly be resigned to it. Perhaps this point is no longer a question with you, and my pertinacious dwelling upon it is a rude intrusion upon your feelings. If so, you must pardon me. You know the hell I have suffered on that point, and how tender I am upon it. I am now fully convinced that you love her as ardently as you are capable of loving. You are ever being happy in her presence, and your intense anxiety about her health, if there were nothing else, would place this beyond all dispute in my mind. I incline to think it probable that your nerves will fail you occasionally for a while, but once you get them firmly guarded now, that trouble is over forever. I think if I were you, in case my mind were not exactly right, I would avoid being idle. I would immediately engage in some business or go to making preparations for it, which would be the same thing. Mr. Speed's marriage occurred in February, and to the letter announcing it, Lincoln replied, I opened the letter with intense anxiety and trepidation, so much so that, although it turned out better than I expected, I have hardly yet, at a distance of ten hours, become calm. I tell you, Speed, our forebodings, for which you and I are peculiar, are all the worst sort of nonsense. I fancied, from the time I received your letter of Saturday, that the one of Wednesday was never to come, and yet it did come, and what is more, it is perfectly clear, both from its tone and handwriting, that you were much happier, or, if you think the term preferable, less miserable, when you wrote it than when you wrote the last one before. You had so obviously improved at the very time I so much fancied you would have grown worse. You say that something indescribably horrible and alarming still haunts you. You will not say that three months from now, I will venture. When your nerves once get steady now, the whole trouble will be over forever. Nor should you become impatient at their being even very slow in becoming steady. Again, you say, you much fear that that Elysium of which you have dreamed so much is never to be realized. Well, if it shall not, I dare swear that it will not be the fault of her who is now your wife. I now have no doubt that it is the peculiar misfortune of both you and me to dream dreams of Elysium far exceeding all that anything earthly can realize. His prophecy was true. In March, Speed wrote him that he was far happier than he had ever expected to be. Lincoln caught at the letter with pathetic eagerness. It cannot be told how it now thrills me with joy to hear you say you are far happier than you ever expected to be. That much I know is enough. I know you too well to suppose your expectations were not, at least, sometimes extravagant. And if the reality exceeds them all, I say, enough, dear Lord. I am not going beyond the truth when I tell you that the short space it took me to read your last letter gave me more pleasure than the total sum of all I have enjoyed since the fatal 1st of January, 1841. Since then, it seems to me I should have been entirely happy, but for the never-absent idea that there is one still unhappy whom I have contributed to make so. That still kills my soul." I cannot but reproach myself for even wishing to be happy while she is otherwise. She accompanied a large party on the railroad cars to Jacksonville last Monday, and on her return spoke, so that I have heard of it, of having enjoyed the trip exceedingly. God be praised for that. Evidently Lincoln was still unreconciled to his separation from Miss Todd. In the summer of 1842, only three or four months after the above letter was written, a clever ruse on the part of certain of their friends threw the two unexpectedly together, and an understanding of some kind evidently was reached, for during the season they met secretly at the house of one of Lincoln's friends, Mr. Simeon Francis. 
it was while these meetings were going on that a burlesque encounter occurred between lincoln and james shields for which miss todd was partly responsible and which no doubt gave just the touch of comedy necessary to relieve their tragedy and restore them to a healthier view of their relations among the democratic officials then living in springfield was the auditor of the state james shields he was a hot-headed blustering irishman not without ability and certainly courageous a good politician and on the whole a very well-liked man however the swagger and noise with which he accompanied the execution of his duties and his habit of being continually on the defensive made him the butt of whig ridicule nothing could have given greater satisfaction to lincoln and his friends than having an opponent who whenever they joked him flew into a rage and challenged them to fight at the time lincoln was visiting miss todd at mr francis's house the whigs were much excited over the fact that the democrats had issued an order forbidding the payment of state taxes in state banknotes the banknotes were in fact practically worthless for the state finances were suffering a violent reaction from the extravagant legislation of eighteen thirty six and eighteen thirty seven one of the popular ways of attacking an obnoxious political doctrine in that day was writing letters from some imaginary backwoods settlement setting forth in homely vernacular the writer's views of the question and showing how its application affected his part of the world these letters were really a rude form of the bigelow papers or nasby letters soon after the order was issued by the illinois officials demanding silver instead of banknotes in payment of taxes lincoln wrote a letter to a springfield paper from the lost townships signing it aunt rebecca in it he described the plight to which the new order had brought the neighborhood and he intimated that the only reason for issuing such an order was that the state officers might have their salaries paid in silver shields was ridiculed unmercifully in the letter for his vanity and his gallantry it happened that there were several young women in springfield who had received rather too pronounced attention from mr shields and who were glad to see him tormented among them were miss todd and her friend miss julia jane lincoln's letter from the lost townships was such a success that they followed it up with one in which aunt rebecca proposed to the gallant auditor and a few days later they published some very bad verses signed kathleen celebrating the wedding springfield was highly entertained less by the verses than by the fury of shields he would have satisfaction he said and he sent a friend one general whitesides to the paper to ask for the name of the writer of the communications the editor in a quandary went to lincoln who unwilling that miss todd and miss jane should figure in the affair ordered that his own name be given as the author of letters and poem this was only about ten days after the first letter had appeared on september second and Lincoln left Springfield in a day or two for a long trip on the circuit. He was at Tremont when, on the morning of the 17th, two of his friends, E. H. Merriman and William Butler, drove up hastily. Shields and his friend Whitesides were behind, they said, the irate Irishman vowing that he would challenge Lincoln. They, knowing that Lincoln was unpracticed both as to diplomacy and weapons, had started as soon as they had learned that Shields had left Springfield, had passed him in the night, and were there to see Lincoln through. It was not long before Shields and Whitesides arrived, and soon Lincoln received a note in which the indignant auditor said, I will take the liberty of requiring a full, positive, and absolute retraction of all offensive allusions used by you in these communications in relation to my private character and standing as a man, as an apology for the insults conveyed in them. This may prevent consequences which no one will regret more than myself." Lincoln immediately replied that, since Shields had not stopped to inquire whether he really was the author of the articles, had not pointed out what was offensive in them, had assumed facts and hinted at consequences, he could not submit to answer the note. Shields wrote again, but Lincoln simply replied that he could receive nothing but a withdrawal of the first note or a challenge. 
to this he steadily held even refusing to answer the question as to the authorship of the letters which shield finally put it was inconsistent with his honor to negotiate for peace with mr shields he said unless mr shields withdrew his former offensive letter seconds were immediately named whitesides by shields merriman by lincoln and though they talked of peace whitesides declared he could not mention it to his principal he would challenge me next and as soon cut my throat as not this was on the nineteenth and that night the party returned to springfield but in some way the affair had leaked out and fearing arrest lincoln and merriman left town the next morning the instructions were left with butler if shields would withdraw his first note and write another asking if lincoln was the author of the offensive articles and if so asking for gentlemanly satisfaction then lincoln had prepared a letter explaining the whole affair if shields would not do this there was nothing to do but fight lincoln left the following preliminaries for the duel first weapons cavalry broadswords of the largest size precisely equal in all respects and such as now used by the cavalry company at jacksonville second position a plank ten feet long and from nine to twelve inches broad to be firmly fixed on edge on the ground as the line between us which neither is to pass his foot over on forfeit of his life next a line drawn on the ground on either side of said plank and parallel with it each at the distance of the whole length of the sword and three feet additional from the plank and the passing of his own such line by either party during the fight shall be deemed a surrender of the contest third time on thursday evening at five o'clock if you can get it so but in no case to be at a greater distance of time than friday evening at five o'clock fourth place within three miles of alton on the opposite side of the river the particular spot to be agreed on by you as mr shields refused to withdraw his first note the entire party started for the rendezvous across the mississippi lincoln and merriman drove together in a dilapidated old buggy in the bottom of which rattled a number of broadswords it was the morning of the twenty second of september when the duelists arrived in town there are people still living in alton who remember their coming the party arrived about the middle of the morning says mr edward levis and soon crossed the river to a sandbar which at the time was by reason of the low water a part of the missouri mainland the means of conveyance was an old horse ferry that was operated by a man named chapman the weapons were in the keeping of the friends of the principals and no care was taken to conceal them in fact they were openly displayed naturally there was a great desire among the male population to attend the duel but the managers of the affair would not permit any but their own party to board the ferry-boat skiffs were very scarce and but a few could avail themselves of the opportunity in this way i had to content myself with standing on the levee and watching the proceedings at long range as soon as the parties reached the island the seconds began preparations for the duel the principals meanwhile seating themselves on logs on opposite sides of the field a half-cleared spot in the timber one of the spectators says i watched lincoln closely while he sat on his log awaiting the signal to fight his face was grave and serious i could discern nothing suggestive of old abe as we knew him i never knew him to go so long before without making a joke and i began to believe he was getting frightened but presently he reached over and picked up one of the swords which he drew from its scabbard then he felt along the edge of the weapon with his thumb like a barber feels of the edge of his razor raised himself to his full height stretched out his long arms and clipped off a twig from above his head with the sword there wasn't another man of us who could have reached anywhere near that twig and the absurdity of that long-reaching fellow fighting with cavalry sabres with shields who could walk under his arm came pretty near making me howl with laughter after lincoln had cut off the twig he returned the sword to the scabbard with a sigh and sat down but i detected the gleam in his eye which was always the forerunner of one of his inimitable yarns and fully expected him to tell a side-splitter there in the shadow of the grave shields's grave the arrangements for the affair were about completed when the duelists were joined by some unexpected friends 
Lincoln and Merriman, on their way to Alton, had stopped at White Hall for dinner. Across the street from the hotel lived Mr. Elijah Lott, an acquaintance of Merriman. Mr. Lott was not long in finding out what was on foot, and as soon as the duelists had departed, he drove to Carrollton, where he knew that Colonel John J. Hardin and several other friends of Lincoln were attending court, and warned them of the trouble. Hardin and one or two others immediately started for Alton. They arrived in time to calm Shields, and to aid the seconds in adjusting matters with honor to all concerned. That the duelists returned in good spirits is evident from Mr. Levis's reminiscences. It was not very long, says he, until the boat was seen returning to Alton. As it drew near, I saw what was presumably a mortally wounded man lying in the bow of the boat. His shirt appeared to be bathed in blood. I distinguished Jacob Smith, a constable, fanning the supposed victim vigorously. The people on the bank held their breath in suspense, and guesses were freely made as to which of the two men had been so terribly wounded. But suspense was soon turned to chagrin and relief when it transpired that the supposed candidate for another world was nothing more nor less than a log covered with a red shirt. This ruse had been resorted to in order to fool the people on the levee, and it worked to perfection. Lincoln and Shields came off the boat together, chatting in a nonchalant and pleasant manner. The Lincoln-Shields duel had so many farcical features, and Miss Todd had unwittingly been so much to blame for it, that one can easily see that it might have had considerable influence on the relations of the two young people. However that may be, something had made Mr. Lincoln feel that he could renew his engagement. Early in October, not a fortnight after the duel, he wrote Speed, "'You have now been the husband of a lovely woman nearly eight months. That you are happier now than the day you married her, I well know, for without you would not be living. But I have your word for it, too, and the returning elasticity of spirits which is manifested in your letters.' But I want to ask you a close question. Are you now, in feelings as well as judgment, glad that you are married as you are? From anybody but me, this would be an impudent question, not to be tolerated. But I know that you will pardon it in me. Please answer it quickly, as I am impatient to know. We do not know Speed's answer, nor the final struggle of the man's heart. We only know that on November 4th, 1842, Lincoln was married, the wedding being almost impromptu. Mrs. Dr. Brown, Miss Todd's cousin, in the same letter quoted from above, describes the wedding. One morning, bright and early, my cousin came down in her excited, impetuous way and said to my father, Uncle, you must go up and tell my sister that Mr. Lincoln and I are to be married this evening. And to me... Get on your bonnet and go with me to get my gloves, shoes, etc., and then to Mr. Edwards. When we reached there, we found some excitement over a wedding being sprung upon them so suddenly. However, my father, in his lovely Pacific way, poured oil upon the waters, and we thought everything was ship-shape when Mrs. Edwards laughingly said, How fortunately you selected this evening, for the Episcopal Sewing Society is to meet here, and my supper is all ordered. But that comfortable little arrangement would not hold, as Mary declared she would not make a spectacle for gossiping ladies to gaze upon and talk about. There had already been too much talk about her. Then my father was dispatched to tell Mr. Lincoln that the wedding would be deferred until the next evening. Clergymen, attendants, and intimate friends were notified, and on Friday evening, in the midst of a small circle of friends, with the elements doing their worst in the way of rain, the singular courtship culminated in marriage. This I know to be literally true, as I was one of her bridesmaids, Miss Jane, afterwards Mrs. Lyman Trumbull, and Miss Rodney being the others. End of section 11 Section 12 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. Lincoln becomes a candidate for Congress and is defeated. On the stump in 1844. Nominated and elected to the 30th Congress. 
For eight successive years, Lincoln had been a member of the General Assembly of Illinois. It was quite long enough, in his judgment, and his friends seemed to have wanted to give him something better, for in 1841 they offered to support him as a candidate for governor of the state. This, however, he refused. His ambition was to go to Washington. In 1842 he declined renomination for the assembly and became a candidate for Congress. He did not wait to be asked, nor did he leave his case in the hands of his friends. He frankly announced his desire and managed his own canvass. There was no reason, in Lincoln's opinion, for concealing political ambition. He recognized, at the same time, the legitimacy of the ambition of his friends, and entertained no suspicion or rancor if they contested places with him. Do you suppose that I should have ever got into notice if I had waited to be hunted up and pushed forward by older men? He wrote his friend Herndon once, when the latter was complaining that the older men did not help him on. The way for a young man to rise is to improve himself every way he can, never suspecting that anybody wishes to hinder him. Allow me to assure you that suspicion and jealousy never did help any man in any situation. There may sometimes be ungenerous attempts to keep a young man down, and they will succeed, too, if he allows his mind to be diverted from its true channel to brood over the attempted injury. Cast about and see if this feeling has not injured every person you have ever known to fall into it. Lincoln had something more to do, however, in 1842 than simply to announce himself in the innocent manner of early politics. The convention system introduced into Illinois in 1835 by the Democrats had been zealously opposed by all good Whigs, Lincoln included, until constant defeat taught them that to resist organization by an every-man-for-himself policy was hopeless and wasteful, and that if they would succeed they must meet organization with organization. In 1841, a Whig state convention had been called to nominate candidates for the office of governor and lieutenant governor. And now, in March 1843, a Whig meeting was held again at Springfield, at which the party's platform was laid, and a committee, of which Lincoln was a member, was appointed to prepare an address to the people of Illinois. In this address, the convention system was earnestly defended. Against this rapid adoption of the abominated system, many of the Whigs protested, and Lincoln found himself supporting, before his constituents, the tactics he had once warmly opposed. In a letter to his friend John Bennett of Petersburg, written in March 1843, he said, I am sorry to hear that any of the Whigs of your county, or of any county, should longer be against conventions. On last Wednesday evening, a meeting of all the Whigs then here from all parts of the state was held, and the question of the propriety of conventions was brought up and fully discussed, and at the end of the discussion, a resolution recommending the system of conventions to all the Whigs of the state was unanimously adopted. Other resolutions were also passed, all of which will appear in the next journal. The meeting also appointed a committee to draft an address to the people of the state, which address will also appear in the next journal. In it you will find a brief argument in favor of conventions, and, although I wrote it myself, I will say to you that it is conclusive upon the point, and cannot be reasonably answered. If there be any good Whig who is disposed still to stick out against conventions, get him at least to read the argument in their favor in the address. The brief argument which Lincoln thought so conclusive, if he did write it himself, justified his good opinion. After its circulation, there were few found to stick out against conventions. The Whigs of the various counties in the congressional district met on April 5th, as they had been instructed to do, and chose delegates. John J. Hardin of Jacksonville, Edward D. Baker, and Abraham Lincoln of Springfield were the three candidates for whom these delegates were instructed. To Lincoln's keen disappointment, the delegation from Sangamon County was instructed for Baker. A variety of social and personal influences, besides Baker's popularity, worked against Lincoln. It would astonish, if not amuse, the older citizens, wrote Lincoln to a friend, to learn that I, 
a stranger, friendless, uneducated, penniless boy working on a flatboat at ten dollars per month, have been put down here as the candidate of pride, wealth, and aristocratic family distinction. He was not only accused of being an aristocrat, he was called a deist. He had fought or been about to fight a duel. His wife's relations were Episcopalian and Presbyterian. He and she attended a Presbyterian church. These influences alone could not be said to have defeated him, he wrote, but they levied a tax of considerable percent upon my strength. The meeting that named Baker as its choice for Congress appointed Lincoln as one of the delegates to the convention. In getting Baker the nomination, Lincoln wrote to Speed, I shall be fixed a good deal like a fellow who has made a groomsman to a man that has cut him out and is marrying his own dear gal. From the first, however, he stood bravely by Baker. I feel myself bound not to hinder him in any way from getting the nomination. I should despise myself were I to attempt it, he wrote certain of his constituents, who were anxious that he should attempt to secure the nomination, in spite of his instructions. It was soon evident to both Lincoln and Baker that John J. Hardin was probably the strongest candidate in the district, and so it proved when the convention met, in May 1843, at Pekin. It has been frequently charged that in this Pekin convention, Hardin, Baker, and Lincoln agreed to take in turn the three next nominations to Congress, thus establishing a species of rotation in office. This charge cannot be sustained. What occurred at the Pekin Convention is here related by one of the delegates, the Honorable J. M. Ruggles of Havana, Illinois. When the convention assembled, writes Mr. Ruggles, Baker was there with his friend and champion delegate, Abraham Lincoln. The eyes and nose had been taken, and there were fifteen votes apiece, and one in doubt that had not arrived. That was myself. I was known to be a warm friend of Baker representing people who were partial to Hardin. As soon as I arrived, Baker hurried to me, saying, How is it? It all depends on you. On being told that, notwithstanding my partiality for him, the people I represented expected me to vote for Hardin, and that I would have to do so, Baker at once replied, You are right. There is no other way. The convention was organized, and I was elected secretary. Baker immediately arose and made a most thrilling address, thoroughly arousing the sympathies of the convention, and ended by declining his candidacy. Hardin was nominated by acclamation, and then came the episode. Immediately after the nomination, Mr. Lincoln walked across the room to my table and asked if I would favor a resolution recommending Baker for the next term. On being answered in the affirmative, he said, You prepare the resolution. I will support it, and I think we can pass it. The resolution created a profound sensation, especially with the friends of Hardin. After an excited and angry discussion, the resolution passed by a majority of one. Lincoln supported Hardin energetically in the campaign which followed. In a letter to the former, written on May 11th, just after the convention, he says, Butler informs me that he received a letter from you, in which you expressed some doubt as to whether the Whigs of Sangamon will support you cordially. You may at once dismiss all fears on that subject. We have already resolved to make a particular effort to give you the very largest majority possible in our county. From this, no Whig of the county dissents. We have many objects for doing it. We make it a matter of honor and pride to do it. We do it because we love the Whig cause. We do it because we like you personally. And last, we wish to convince you that we do not bear that hatred to Morgan County that you people have seemed so long to imagine. You will see by the journal of this week that we propose, upon pain of losing a barbecue, to give you twice as great a majority in this county as you shall receive in your own. I got up the proposal. Lincoln was true to his promise, and after Hardin was elected and in Washington, he kept him informed of much that went on in the district. 
thus in an amusing letter written in may eighteen forty four while the latter was in congress he tells him of one disgruntled constituent who must be pacified giving him at the same time a hint as to the temper of the locofocos knowing that you have correspondence enough i have forborne to trouble you heretofore he writes and i now only do so to get you to set a matter right which has got wrong with one of our best friends it is old uncle thomas campbell of spring creek berlin p o he has received several documents from you and he says they are old newspapers and old documents having no sort of interest in them he is therefore getting a strong impression that you treat him with disrespect this i know is a mistaken impression and you must correct it the way i leave to yourself robert w canfield says he would like to have a document or two from you the locos here are in considerable trouble about van buren's letter on texas and the virginia electors they are growing sick of the tariff question and consequently are much confounded at van buren's cutting them off from the new texas question nearly half the leaders swear they won't stand it of those are ford t campbell ewing calhoun and others they don't exactly say they won't go for van buren but they say he will not be the candidate and that they are for texas anyhow the resolution passed at the pekin convention in eighteen forty three was remembered and respected by the whigs when the time came to nominate hardin's successor baker was selected and elected lincoln working for him as loyally as he had for hardin in this campaign that of eighteen forty four lincoln was a presidential elector he went into the canvass with unusual ardor for henry clay was the candidate and lincoln shared the popular idolatry of the man his devotion was not merely a sentiment however he had been an intelligent student of clay's public life and his sympathy was all with the principles of the gallant harry of the west throughout the campaign he worked zealously traveling all over the state speaking and talking as a rule he was accompanied by a democrat the two went unannounced simply stopping at some friendly house on their arrival the word was sent around the candidates are here and the men of the neighborhood gathered to hear the discussion which was carried on in the most informal way the candidates frequently sitting tipped back against the side of the house or perched on a rail whittling during the debates nor was all of this electioneering done by argument many votes were still cast in illinois out of personal liking and the wily candidate did his best to make himself agreeable particularly to the women of the household the hon william l d ewing a democrat who traveled with lincoln in one campaign used to tell a story of how he and lincoln were eager to win the favor of one of their hostesses whose husband was an important man in his neighborhood neither had made much progress until at milking time mr ewing started after the woman of the house as she went to the yard took her pail and insisted on milking the cow himself he naturally felt that this was a master stroke but receiving no reply from the hostess to whom he had been talking loudly as he milked he looked around only to see her and lincoln leaning comfortably over the bars engaged in an animated discussion by the time he had completed his self-imposed task lincoln had captivated the hostess and all mr ewing received for his pains was hearty thanks for giving her a chance to have so pleasant a talk with mr lincoln lincoln's speeches at this time were not confined to his own state he made several in indiana being invited thither by prominent whig politicians who had heard him speak in illinois the first and most important of his meetings in indiana was at bruceville the democrats learning of the proposed whig gathering arranged one for the same evening with lieutenant william w carr of vincennes as speaker as might have been expected from the excited state of politics at the moment the proximity of the two mass meetings aroused party loyalty to a fighting pitch each party was determined to break up the other speaking writes miss o'flynn in a description of the bruceville meeting prepared from interviews with those who took part in it the night was made hideous with the rattle of tin pans and bells and the blare of cow horns 
in spite of all the din and uproar of the younger element a few grown-up male radicals and partisan women sang and cheered loudly for their favorites who kept on with their flow of political information lieutenant carr stood in his carriage and addressed the crowd around him while a local politician acted as grand marshal of the night and urged the yelling democratic legion to surge to the schoolhouse where abraham lincoln was speaking and run the whigs from their headquarters old men now living who were big boys then cannot remember any of the burning eloquence of either speaker as they now laughingly express it we were far more interested in the noise than the success of the speakers and we ran backward and forward from one camp to the other fortunately the remaining speeches in indiana were made under more dignified conditions one was delivered at rockport another from the door of a harness shop near gentryville lincoln's old home in indiana and a third at the old carter school in the same neighborhood at the delivery of the last many of lincoln's old neighbors were present and they still tell of the cordial way in which he greeted them and inquired for old friends after his speech he drove home with mr josiah crawford for whom he had once worked as a day laborer his interest in every familiar spot a saw pit where he had once worked the old swimming pool the town grocery the mill the blacksmith shop surprised and flattered everybody he went round inspecting everything declares one of his hosts so vivid were the memories which this visit to gentryville aroused so deep were lincoln's emotions that he even attempted to express them in verse a portion of the lines he wrote have been preserved the only remnants of his various early attempts at versification in this campaign of eighteen forty four lincoln for the second time in his political life met the slavery question the chief issue of that campaign was the annexation of texas the whigs under clay's leadership opposed it to annex texas without the consent of mexico would compromise our national reputation for fair dealing clay argued it would bring on war with mexico destroy the existing relations between north and south and compel the north to annex canada and it would tend to extend rather than restrict slavery a large party of strong anti-slavery people in the north felt that clay did not give enough importance to the anti-slavery argument and they nominated a third candidate james g burney this liberal party as it was called had a fair representation in illinois and lincoln must have encountered them frequently though what arguments he used against them if any we do not know no extracts of his eighteen forty four speeches being preserved the next year eighteen forty five he found the abolition sentiment stronger than ever prominent among the leaders of the third party in the state were two brothers williamson and madison durley of hennepin illinois they were outspoken advocates of their principles and even operated a station of the underground railroad lincoln knew the durleys and when visiting hennepin to speak solicited their support they opposed their liberty principles when lincoln returned to springfield he wrote williamson durley a letter which sets forth with admirable clearness his exact position on the slavery question at that period it is the most valuable document on the question which we have up to this point in lincoln's life when i saw you at home lincoln began it was agreed that i should write to you and your brother madison until i then saw you i was not aware of your being what is generally called an abolitionist or as you call yourself a liberty man though i well knew there were many such in your county i was glad to hear that you intended to attempt to bring about at the next election in putnam a union of the whigs proper and such of the liberty men as are whigs in principle on all questions save only that of slavery so far as i can perceive by such union neither party need yield anything on the point in difference between them if the whig abolitionists of new york had voted with us last fall mr clay would now be president whig principles in the ascendant and texas not annexed whereas by the division all that either had in stake in the contest was lost and indeed it was extremely probable beforehand that such would be the result 
as i always understood the liberty men deprecated the annexation of texas extremely and this being so why they should refuse to cast their votes so as to prevent it even to me seemed wonderful what was their process of reasoning i can only judge from what a single one of them told me it was this we are not to do evil that good may come this general proposition is doubtless correct but did it apply if by your votes you could have prevented the extension etc of slavery would it not have been good and not evil so to have used your votes even though it involved the casting of them for a slaveholder by the fruit the tree is to be known an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit if the fruit of electing mr clay would have been to prevent the extension of slavery could the act of electing have been evil but i will not argue further i perhaps ought to say that individually i never was much interested in the texas question i never could see much good to come of annexation inasmuch as they were already a free republican people on our own model on the other hand i never could very clearly see how the annexation would augment the evil of slavery it always seemed to me that slaves would be taken there in about equal numbers with or without annexation and if more were taken because of annexation still there would be just so many the fewer left where they were taken from it is possibly true to some extent that with annexation some slaves may be sent to texas and continued in slavery that otherwise might have been liberated to whatever extent this may be true i think annexation an evil i hold it to be a paramount duty of us in the free states due to the union of the states and perhaps to liberty itself paradox though it may seem to let the slavery of the other states alone while on the other hand i hold it to be equally clear that we should never knowingly lend ourselves directly or indirectly to prevent that slavery from dying a natural death to find new places for it to live in when it can no longer exist in the old of course i am not now considering what would be our duty in cases of insurrection among the slaves to recur to the texas question i understand the liberty men to have viewed annexation as a much greater evil than ever i did and i would like to convince you if i could that they could have prevented it without violation of principle if they had chosen at the time that lincoln wrote the above letter to the durley brothers he was working for a nomination to congress in eighteen forty three he had helped elect his friend hardin he had secured the nomination for baker in eighteen forty four and had worked faithfully to elect him now he felt that his duty to his friends was discharged and that he was free to try for himself he undoubtedly hoped that neither of his friends would contest the nomination baker did not but late in eighteen forty five it became evident that hardin might lincoln was worried over the prospect the paper at pekin has nominated hardin for governor he wrote his friend b f james in november and commenting on this the alton papers indirectly nominated him for congress it would give hardin a great start and perhaps use me up if the whig papers of the district should nominate him for congress if your feelings toward me are the same as when you saw me which i have no reason to doubt i wish you would let nothing appear in your paper which may operate against me you understand matters stand just as they did when i saw you baker is certainly off the track and i fear hardin intends to be on it hardin certainly was free to run for congress if he wanted to he had voluntarily declined the nomination in eighteen forty four because of the events of the pekin convention but he had made no promise to do so in eighteen forty six many of the whigs of the district had not expected him to be a candidate however arguing that lincoln because of his relation to the party should be given his turn we do not entertain a doubt wrote the editor of the sangamon journal in february eighteen forty six that if we could reverse the positions of the two men a very large portion of those who now support mr lincoln most warmly would support general hardin quite as well as time went on and lincoln found in all probability that hardin would enter the race it made him anxious and a little melancholy 
in writing to his friend dr robert bowl of lake in illinois on january seventh eighteen forty six he said since i saw you last fall i have often thought of writing you as it was then understood i would but on reflection i have always found that i had nothing new to tell you all has happened as i then told you i expected it would baker's declining harden's taking the track and so on if harden and i stood precisely equal that is if neither of us had been to congress or if we both had it would not only accord with what i have always done for the sake of peace to give way to him and i expect i should do it that i can voluntarily postpone my pretensions when they are no more than equal to those to which they are postponed you have yourself seen but to yield to harden under present circumstances seems to me as nothing else than yielding to one who would gladly sacrifice me altogether this i would rather not submit to that harden is talented energetic unusually generous and magnanimous i have before this affirmed to you and do not now deny you know that my only argument is that turn about is fair play this he practically at least denies if it would not be taxing you too much i wish you would write me telling the aspect of things in your county or rather your district and also send the names of some of your whig neighbors to whom i might with propriety write unless i can get someone to do this harden with his old franking list will have the advantage of me my reliance for a fair shake and i want nothing more in your county is chiefly on you because of your position and standing and because i am acquainted with so few others let me hear from you soon lincoln followed the vibrations of feeling in the various counties with extreme nicety studying every individual whose loyalty he suspected or whose vote was not yet pledged nathan dresser is here he wrote to his friend bennett on january fifteenth eighteen forty six and speaks as though the contest between harden and me is to be doubtful in menard county i know he is candid and this alarms me some i asked him to tell me the names of the men that were going strong for harden he said morris was about as strong as any now tell me is morris going it openly you remember you wrote me that he would be neutral nathan also said that some man who he could not remember had said lately that menard county was again to decide the contest and that made the contest very doubtful do you know who that was don't fail to write me instantly on receiving telling me all particularly the names of those who are going strong against me in january general hardin suggested that since he and lincoln were the only persons mentioned as candidates there be no convention but the selection be left to the whig voters of the district lincoln refused it seems to me he wrote hardin that on reflection you will see that the fact of your having been in congress has in various ways so spread your name in the district as to give you a decided advantage in such a stipulation i appreciate your desire to keep down excitement and i promise you to keep cool under all circumstances i have always been in the habit of acceding to almost any proposal that a friend would make and i am truly sorry that i cannot in this i perhaps ought to mention that some friends at different places are endeavoring to secure the honor of the sitting of the convention at their towns respectively and i fear that they would not feel much complimented if we shall make a bargain that it should sit nowhere after general hardin received this refusal he withdrew from the contest in a manly and generous letter which was warmly approved by the whigs of the district both men were so much loved that a break between them would have been a disastrous thing for the party we are truly glad that a contest which in its nature was calculated to weaken the ties of friendship has terminated amicably said the sangamon journal the charge that hardin baker and lincoln tried to ruin one another in this contest for congress has often been denied by their associates and never more emphatically than by judge gillespie an influential politician of the state hardin judge gillespie says was one of the most unflinching and unfaltering whigs that ever drew the breath of life he was a mirror of chivalry and so was baker 
lincoln had boundless respect for and confidence in them both he knew they would sacrifice themselves rather than do an act that could savor in the slightest degree of meanness or dishonor these men lincoln hardin and baker were bosom friends to my certain knowledge lincoln felt that they could be actuated by nothing but the most honorable sentiments towards him for although they were rivals they were all three men of the most punctilious honor and devoted friends i knew them intimately and can say confidently that there never was a particle of envy on the part of one towards the other the rivalry between them was of the most honorable and friendly character and when hardin and baker were killed hardin in mexico and baker at ball's bluff lincoln felt that in the death of each he had lost a dear and true friend after hardin's withdrawal lincoln went about in his characteristic way trying to soothe his and hardin's friends previous to general hardin's withdrawal he wrote one of his correspondents some of his friends and some of mine had become a little warm and i felt that for them now to meet face to face and converse together was the best way to efface any remnant of unpleasant feeling if any such existed i did not suppose that general hardin's friends were in any greater need of having their feelings corrected than mine were in may lincoln was nominated his democratic opponent was peter cartwright the famous methodist exhorter the most famous itinerant preacher of the pioneer era cartwright had moved from kentucky to illinois when still a young man to get into a free state and had settled in the sangamon valley near springfield for the next forty years he travelled over the state most of the time on horseback preaching the gospel in his unique and rugged fashion his district was at first so large extending from kaskaskia to galena that he was unable to traverse the whole of it in the same year he was elected to the legislature in eighteen twenty eight and again in eighteen thirty two lincoln in the latter year being an opposing candidate in eighteen forty when he was the democratic nominee for congress against lincoln he was badly beaten cartwright now made an energetic canvass his chief weapon against lincoln being the old charges of atheism and aristocracy but they failed of effect and in august lincoln was elected the contest over sudden and characteristic disillusion seized him being elected to congress though i am grateful to our friends for having done it has not pleased me as much as i expected he wrote speed end of section twelve section thirteen of the life of abraham lincoln volume one by ida m tarbell the sleeper fox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen lincoln in washington in eighteen forty seven he opposes the mexican war campaigning in new england in november eighteen forty seven lincoln started for washington the city in eighteen forty eight was little more than the outline of the washington of eighteen ninety nine the capital was without the present wings dome or western terrace the white house the city hall the treasury the patent office and the post office were the only public buildings standing then which have not been rebuilt or materially changed the streets were unpaved and their dust in summer and mud in winter are celebrated in every record of the period the parks and circles were still unplanted near the white house were a few fine old homes and capitol hill was partly built over although there were deplorable wastes between these two points the majority of the people lived in southeastern part of the city on or near pennsylvania avenue the winter that lincoln was in washington daniel webster lived on louisiana avenue near sixth street speaker winthrop and thomas h benton on c street near third john quincy adams and james buchanan the latter then secretary of state on f street between thirteenth and fourteenth many of the senators and congressmen were in hotels the leading ones of which were willard's coleman's gadsby's brown's young's fuller's and the united states stephen a douglas who was in washington for his first term as senator lived at willard's 
so inadequate were the hotel accommodations during the sessions that visitors to the town were frequently obliged to accept most uncomfortable makeshifts for beds seward visiting the city in eighteen forty seven tells of sleeping on a cot between two beds occupied by strangers the larger number of members lived in messes a species of boarding club over which the owner of the house occupied usually presided the national intelligencer of the day is sprinkled with announcements of persons prepared to accommodate a mess of members lincoln went to live in one of the best known of these clubs mrs spriggs in duff green's row on capitol hill this famous row has now entirely disappeared the ground on which it stood being occupied by the congressional library at mrs spriggs lincoln had as messmates several congressmen a r mcelvain james pollock john strom and john blanchard all of pennsylvania patrick tompkins of mississippi joshua r giddings of ohio and elisha embry of indiana among his neighbors in messes on capitol hill were andrew johnson of tennessee alexander h stephens of georgia and jefferson davis of mississippi one of the members of the mess at mrs spriggs's in the winter of eighteen forty seven eighteen forty eight was dr s c Busey of washington d c i soon learned to know and admire lincoln says dr Busey in his personal reminiscences and recollections for his simple and unostentatious manners kind-heartedness and amusing jokes anecdotes and witticisms when about to tell an anecdote during a meal he would lay down his knife and fork place his elbows upon the table rest his face between his hands and begin with the words that reminds me and proceed everybody prepared for the explosion sure to follow i recall with vivid pleasure the scene of merriment at the dinner after his first speech in the house of representatives occasioned by the descriptions by himself and others of the congressional mess of the uproar in the house during its delivery congressman lincoln was always neatly but very plainly dressed very simple and approachable in manner and unpretentious he attended to his business going promptly to the house and remaining till the session adjourned and appeared to be familiar with the progress of legislation the town then offered little in the way of amusement the adelphi theatre was opened that winter for the first time and presented a variety of mediocre plays at the olympia were lively and beautiful exhibitions of model artists hertz and savory the pianists then touring in the united states played several times in the season and there was a chinese museum add the exhibits of brown's paintings of the heroes of palo alto risaca monterey and buena vista and of powers greek slave the performances of dr valentine delineator of eccentricities a few lectures and numerous church socials and you have about all there was in the way of public entertainments in washington in eighteen forty eight but of dinners receptions and official gala affairs there were many lincoln's name appears frequently in the national intelligencer on committees to offer dinners to this or that great man in the spring of eighteen forty nine he was one of the managers of the inaugural ball given to taylor his friend washburn recalls an amusing incident of lincoln at this ball a small number of mutual friends says mr washburn including mr lincoln made up a party to attend the inauguration ball together it was by far the most brilliant inauguration ball ever given of course mr lincoln had never seen anything of this kind before one of the most modest and unpretending persons present he could not have dreamed that like honors were to come to him almost within a little more than a decade he was greatly interested in all that was to be seen and we did not take our departure until three or four o'clock in the morning when we went to the cloak and hat room mr lincoln had no trouble in finding his short cloak which little more than covered his shoulders but after a long search was unable to find his hat after an hour he gave up all idea of finding it taking his cloak on his arm he walked out into judiciary square deliberately adjusting it on his shoulders and started off bareheaded for his lodgings 
it would be hard to forget the sight of that tall and slim man with his short cloak thrown over his shoulders starting for his long walk home on capitol hill at four o'clock in the morning without any hat on another reminiscence of his homely and independent ways comes from the librarian of the supreme court at that period through lincoln's friend washburn mr lincoln the story goes came to the library one day for the purpose of procuring some law books which he wanted to take to his room for examination getting together all the books he wanted he placed them in a pile on a table taking a large bandana handkerchief from his pocket he tied them up and putting a stick which he had brought with him through a knot he had made in the handkerchief he shouldered the package and marched off from the library to his room in a few days he returned the books in the same way lincoln's simple sincere friendliness and his quaint humor soon won him a sure if quiet social position in washington he was frequently invited to mr webster's saturday breakfasts where his stories were highly relished for their originality and drollery dr busey recalls his popularity at one of the leading places of amusement on capitol hill congressman lincoln was very fond of bowling he says and would frequently join others of the mess or meet other members in a match game at the alley of james casparis which was near the boarding-house he was a very awkward bowler but played the game with great zest and spirit solely for exercise and amusement and greatly to the enjoyment and entertainment of the other players and bystanders by his criticisms and funny illustrations he accepted success and defeat with like good nature and humor and left the alley at the conclusion of the game without a sorrow or disappointment when it was known that he was in the alley there would assemble numbers of people to witness the fun which was anticipated by those who knew of his fund of anecdotes and jokes when in the alley surrounded by a crowd of eager listeners he indulged with great freedom in the sport of narrative some of which were very broad his witticism seemed for the most part to be impromptu but he always told the anecdotes and jokes as if he wished to convey the impression that he had heard them from someone but they appeared very many times as if they had been made for the immediate occasion another place where he became at home and was much appreciated was in the post office at the capitol during the christmas holidays says ben Purley poor mr lincoln found his way into the small room used as the post office of the house where a few jovial raconteurs used to meet almost every morning after the mail had been distributed into the members boxes to exchange such new stories as any of them might have acquired since they last met after modestly standing at the door for several days mr lincoln was reminded of a story and by new years he was recognized as the champion storyteller of the capital his favorite seat was at the left of the open fireplace tilted back in his chair with his long legs reaching over to the chimney jam he never told a story twice but appeared to have an endless repertoire of them always ready like the successive charges in a magazine gun and always pertinently adapted to some passing event it was refreshing to us correspondents compelled as we were to listen to so much that was prosy and tedious to hear this bright specimen of western genius tell his inimitable stories especially his reminiscences of the black hawk war but lincoln had gone to washington for work and he at once interested himself in the whig organization formed to elect the officers of the house there was only a small whig majority and it took skill and energy to keep the offices in the party lincoln's share in achieving this result was generally recognized as late as eighteen sixty twelve years after the struggle robert c winthrop of massachusetts who was elected speaker said in a speech in boston wherein he discussed lincoln's nomination to the presidency you will be sure that i remember him with interest if i may be allowed to remind you that he helped to make me the speaker of the thirtieth congress when the vote was a very close and strongly contested vote a week after congress organized lincoln wrote to springfield as you are all so anxious for me to distinguish myself i have concluded to do so before long and he did it but not exactly as his springfield friends wished the united states was then at war with mexico a war that the whigs abhorred 
lincoln had used his influence against it but hostilities declared he had publicly affirmed that every loyal man must stand by the army many of his friends hardin baker and shields among them were at that moment in mexico lincoln had gone to washington intending to say nothing in opposition to the war but the administration wished to secure from the whigs not only votes of supplies and men but a resolution declaring that the war was just and right lincoln with other members of his party in congress refused his sanction and voted for a resolution offered by mr ashburn which declared that the war had been unnecessarily and unconstitutionally begun on december twenty second he made his debut in the house by the famous spot resolutions a series of searching questions so clearly put so strong historically and logically that they drove the administration from the spot where the war began and showed that it had been the aggressor in the conquest the resolution ran whereas the president of the united states in his message of may eleventh eighteen forty six has declared that the mexican government not only refused to receive him the envoy of the united states or to listen to his propositions but after a long continued series of menaces has at last invaded our territory and shed the blood of our fellow citizens on our own soil and again in his message of december eighth eighteen forty six that we had ample cause of war against mexico long before the breaking out of hostilities but even then we forbore to take redress into our own hands until mexico herself became the aggressor by invading our soil in hostile array and shedding the blood of our citizens and yet again in his message of december seventh eighteen forty seven that the mexican government refused even to hear the terms of adjustment which he our minister of peace was authorized to propose and finally under wholly unjustifiable pretexts involved the two countries in war by invading the territory of the state of texas striking the first blow and shedding the blood of our citizens on our own soil and whereas this house is desirous to obtain a full knowledge of all the facts which go to establish whether the particular spot on which the blood of our citizens was so shed was or was not at that time our own soil therefore resolved by the house of representatives that the president of the united states be respectfully requested to inform this house first whether the spot on which the blood of our citizens was shed as in his message declared was or was not within the territory of spain at least after the treaty of eighteen nineteen until the mexican revolution second whether that spot is or is not within the territory which was wrested from spain by the revolutionary government of mexico third whether that spot is or is not within a settlement of people which settlement has existed ever since long before the texas revolution and until its inhabitants fled before the approach of the united states army fourth whether that settlement is or is not isolated from any and all other settlements by the gulf and the rio grande on the south and west and by wide uninhabited regions on the north and east fifth whether the people of that settlement or a majority of them or any of them have ever submitted themselves to the government or laws of texas or of the united states by consent or by compulsion either by accepting office or voting at elections or paying tax or serving on juries or having process served upon them or in any other way sixth whether the people of that settlement did or did not flee from the approach of the united states army leaving unprotected their homes and their growing crops before the blood was shed as in the message stated and whether the first blood so shed was or was not shed within the enclosure of one of the people who had thus fled from it seventh whether our citizens whose blood was shed as in his message declared were or were not at that time armed officers and soldiers sent into that settlement by the military order of the president through the secretary of war eighth whether the military force of the united states was or was not so sent into that settlement 
after general taylor had more than once intimated to the war department that in his opinion no such movement was necessary to the defense or protection of texas in january lincoln followed up these resolutions with a speech in support of his position his action was much criticized in illinois where the sound of the drum and the intoxication of victory had completely turned attention from the moral side of the question and lincoln found himself obliged to defend his position with even mr herndon his law partner who with many others objected to lincoln's voting for the ashburn resolution that vote wrote lincoln in answer to mr herndon's letter affirms that the war was unnecessarily and unconstitutionally commenced by the president and i will stake my life that if you had been in my place you would have voted just as i did would you have voted what you felt and knew to be a lie i know you would not would you have gone out of the house sculped the vote i expect not if you had skulked one vote you would have had to skulk many more before the end of the session richardson's resolutions introduced before i made any move or gave any vote upon the subject made the direct question of the justice of the war so that no man can be silent if he would you are compelled to speak and your only alternative is to tell the truth or a lie i cannot doubt which you would do this vote has nothing to do in determining my votes on the questions of supplies i have always intended and still intend to vote supplies perhaps not in the precise form recommended by the president but in a better form for all purposes except locofoco party purposes this determination to keep the wrong of the mexican war before the people even while voting supplies for it lincoln held to steadily in may a pamphlet was sent him in which the author claimed that in view of all the facts the government of the united states had committed no aggression in mexico not in view of all the facts lincoln wrote him there are facts which you have kept out of view it is a fact that the united states army in marching to the rio grande marched into a peaceful mexican settlement and frightened the inhabitants away from their homes and their growing crops it is a fact that fort brown opposite matamoras was built by that army within a mexican cotton field on which at the time the army reached it a young cotton crop was growing and which crop was wholly destroyed and the field itself greatly and permanently injured by ditches embankments and the like it is a fact that when the mexicans captured captain thornton and his command they found and captured them within another mexican field now i wish to bring these facts to your notice and to ascertain what is the result of your reflections upon them if you can deny that they are facts i think i can furnish proofs which shall convince you that you are mistaken if you admit that they are facts then i shall be obliged for a reference to any law of language law of states law of nations law of morals law of religions any law human or divine in which no authority can be found for saying those facts constitute no aggression possibly you consider those acts too small for notice would you venture to so consider them had they been committed by any nation on earth against the humblest of our people i know you would not then i ask is the precept whatever ye would that men should do to you do ye even so to them obsolete of no force of no application the routine work assigned lincoln in the thirtieth congress was on the committee on the post office and the post roads several reports were made by him from this committee these reports with the speech on internal improvements cover his published work in the house up to july as the whigs were to hold their national convention for nominating a candidate for the presidency in june lincoln gave considerable time during the spring to electioneering in his judgment the whigs could elect nobody but general taylor and he urged his friends in illinois to give up henry clay to whom many of them still clung mr clay's chance for an election he wrote is just no chance at all lincoln went to the convention which was held in philadelphia and as he prophesied old rough and ready was nominated he went back to washington full of enthusiasm in my opinion we shall have a most overwhelming glorious triumph he wrote a friend 
one unmistakable sign is that all the odds and ends are with us barn burners native americans tyler men disappointed office seekers locofocos and the lord knows what this is important if in nothing else in showing which way the wind blows in connection with alexander h stevens of whom he had become a warm friend toombs and preston lincoln formed the first congressional tailor club known as the young indians campaigning had already begun on the floor of congress and the members were daily making speeches for the various candidates on july twenty seventh lincoln made a speech for taylor it was a boisterous election speech full of merciless caricaturing and delivered with inimitable drollery it kept the house in an uproar and was reported the country over by the whig press the baltimore american in giving a synopsis of it called it the crack speech of the day and said of lincoln he is a very able acute uncouth honest upright man and a tremendous wag withal mr lincoln's manner was so good-natured and his style so peculiar that he kept the house in a continuous roar of merriment for the last half hour of his speech he would commence a point in his speech far up one of the aisles and keep on talking gesticulating and walking until he would find himself at the end of a paragraph down in the centre of the area in front of the clerk's desk he would then go back and take another head and work down again and so on through his capital speech this speech as well as the respect lincoln's work in the house had inspired among leaders of the party brought him an invitation to deliver several campaign speeches in new england at the close of congress and he went there early in september there was in new england at that date much strong anti-slavery feeling the whigs claimed to be free soilers as well as the party which appropriated that name and lincoln in the first speech he made defined carefully his position on the slavery question this was at worcester massachusetts on september twelfth the whig state convention had met to nominate a candidate for governor and the most eminent whigs of massachusetts were present curiously enough the meeting was presided over by ex-governor levi lincoln a descendant like abraham lincoln from the original samuel of hingham there were many brilliant speeches made but if we are to trust the reports of the day lincoln's was the one which by its logic its clearness and its humor did the most for the whig cause gentlemen inform me says one boston reporter who came too late for the exercises that it was one of the best speeches ever heard in worcester and that several whigs who had gone off on the free soil fizzle have come back again to the whig ranks a report of the speech was printed in the boston advertiser according to this report lincoln spent the first part of his hour defending general taylor against the charge of having no principles and improving him a good whig mr lincoln then passed said the advertiser to the subject of slavery in the states saying that the people of illinois agreed entirely with the people of massachusetts on this subject except perhaps that they did not keep so constantly thinking about it all agreed that slavery was an evil but that we are not responsible for it and cannot affect it in states of this union where we do not live but the question of the extension of slavery to new territories of this country is a part of our responsibility and care and is under our control in opposition to this mr lincoln believed that the self-named free soil party was far behind the whigs both parties opposed the extension as he understood it the new party had no principle except this opposition if their platform held any other it was in such a general way that it was like the pair of pantaloons the yankee peddler offered for sale large enough for any man small enough for any boy they therefore had taken a position calculated to break down their single important declared object they were working for the election of either general cass or general taylor the speaker then went on to show clearly and eloquently the danger of extension of slavery likely to result from the election of general cass to unite with those who annex the new territory to prevent the extension of slavery in that territory seemed to him to be in the highest degree absurd and ridiculous suppose these gentlemen succeeded in electing mr van buren 
they had no specific means to prevent the extension of slavery to new mexico and california and general taylor he confidently believed would not encourage it and would not prohibit its restriction but if general cass was elected he felt certain that the plans of farther extension of territory would be encouraged and those of the extension of slavery would meet no check the free soil men in claiming that name indirectly attempted deception by implying that whigs were not free soil men in declaring that they would do their duty and leave the consequences to god they merely gave an excuse for taking a course they were not able to maintain by a fair and full argument to make this declaration did not show what their duty was if it did we should have no use for judgment we might as well be made without intellect and when divine or human law does not clearly point out what is our duty we have no means of finding out what it is but using our most intelligent judgment of the consequences if there were divine law or human law for voting for martin van buren or if a fair examination of the consequences and first reasoning would show that voting for him would bring about the ends they pretended to wish then he would give up the argument but since there was no fixed law on the subject and since the whole probable result of their action would be an assistance in electing general cass he must say that they were behind the whigs in their advocacy of the freedom of the soil mr lincoln proceeded to rally the buffalo convention for forbearing to say anything after all the previous declarations of those members who were formerly whigs on the subject of the mexican war because the van burens had been known to have supported it he declared that of all the parties asking the confidence of the country this new one had less of principle than any other he wondered whether it was still the opinion of these free soil gentlemen as declared in the whereas at buffalo that the whig and democratic parties were both entirely dissolved and absorbed into their own body had the vermont election given them any light they had calculated on making as great an impression in that state as in any part of the union and there their attempts had been wholly ineffectual their failure there was a greater success than they would find in any other part of the union at the close of this truly masterly and convincing speech the advertiser goes on the audience gave three enthusiastic cheers for illinois and three more for the eloquent whig member from that state after the speech at worcester lincoln spoke at lowell dedham roxbury chelsea and cambridge and on september twenty second in tremont temple boston following a splendid oration by governor seward his speech on this occasion was not reported though the boston papers united in calling it powerful and convincing his success at worcester and boston was such that invitations came from all over new england asking him to speak but lincoln won something in new england of vastly deeper importance than a reputation for making popular campaign speeches here for the first time he caught a glimpse of the utter impossibility of ever reconciling the northern conviction that slavery was evil and unendurable and the southern claim that it was divine and necessary and he began here to realize that something must be done the first impression of slavery which abraham lincoln received was in his childhood in kentucky his father and mother belonged to a small company of western abolitionists who at the beginning of the century boldly denounced the institution as an iniquity so great an evil did thomas and nancy lincoln hold slavery that to escape it they were willing to leave their kentucky home and move to a free state thus their boy's first notion of the institution was that it was something to flee from a thing so dreadful that it was one's duty to go to pain and hardship to escape it in his new home in indiana he heard the debate on slavery go on the state he had moved into was in a territory made free for ever by the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven but there were still slaves and believers in slavery within its boundaries and it took many years to eradicate them close to his indiana home lay illinois and here the same struggle went on through all his boyhood the lad was too thoughtful not to reflect on what he heard and read of the differences of opinions on slavery 
by the time the statutes of indiana fell into his hands some time before he was eighteen years old he had gathered a large amount of practical information about the question which he was able then to weigh in the light of the great principles of the constitution the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven and the laws of indiana which he had begun to study with passionate earnestness when he left indiana for illinois he continued to be thrown up against slavery in his trip in eighteen thirty one to new orleans he saw its most terrible features as a young legislator he saw the citizens of his town and his fellows in the legislature ready to condemn as dangerous agitators those who dared call slavery an evil saw them secretly sympathize with outlawry like the alton riot and the murder of elijah lovejoy so keenly did he feel the danger of passing resolutions against abolitionists which tacitly implied that slavery was as the south was beginning to claim a divine institution that in eighteen thirty seven he was one of the only two members of the illinois assembly who were willing to publicly declare that the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy from time to time as he travelled on the mississippi and ohio he saw the workings of slavery in eighteen forty one coming home from a visit to louisville kentucky he was in the same boat with a number of negroes the sight so impressed him that he described it to a friend a gentleman had purchased twelve negroes in different parts of kentucky and was taking them to a farm in the south they were chained six and six together a small iron clevis was around the left wrist of each and this fastened to the main chain by a shorter one at a convenient distance from the others so that the negroes were strung together precisely like so many fish upon a trot line in this condition they were being separated forever from the scenes of their childhood their friends their fathers and mothers their brothers and sisters and many of them from their wives and children and going into perpetual slavery where the lash of the master is proverbially more ruthless and unrelenting than any other wear and yet amid all these distressing circumstances as we would think them they were the most cheerful and apparently happy creatures on board one whose offence for which he had been sold was an over-fondness for his wife played the fiddle almost continually and the others danced sang cracked jokes and played various games with cards from day to day how true it is that god tempers the wind to the shorn lamb or in other words that he renders the worst of human conditions tolerable while he permits the best to be nothing better than tolerable runaway slaves underground railway stations masters and men tracking negroes the occasional capture of a man or woman to be taken back to the south trials of fugitives all the features common in those years particularly in the states bordering on bond territory lincoln saw in eighteen forty seven he was even engaged to defend a slave owner's claim a case he lost the negro being allowed to go free it was not until eighteen forty four forty five however that the matter became an important element in his political life heretofore it had been a moral question only now however the annexation of texas made it a political one it became necessary that every politician and voter decide whether the new territory should be bond or free the abolitionists or liberty party grew rapidly in illinois lincoln found himself obliged not only to meet democratic arguments but the abolition theories and convictions when in eighteen forty seven he went to congress it was already evident that the mexican war would be settled by the acquisition of large new territory what was to be done with it the north had tried to forestall the south by bringing in a provision that whatever territory was acquired should be free for ever the wilmot proviso as it was called from the name of the originator went through as many forms as proteus though its intent was always the same from first to last lincoln voted for it i may venture to say that i voted for it at least forty times during the short time i was there he said in after years although he voted so persistently he did little or no debating on the question in the house and in the hot debates from which he could not escape he acted as a peacemaker 
at mrs spriggs's mess where he boarded in washington the wilmot proviso was the topic of frequent conversation and the occasion of very many angry controversies dr Busey, who was a fellow boarder says of lincoln's part in these discussions that though he may have been as radical as any in the household he was so discreet in giving expression to his convictions on the slavery question as to avoid giving offence to anybody and was so conciliatory as to create the impression even among the pro-slavery advocates that he did not wish to introduce or discuss subjects that would provoke a controversy when such conversation would threaten angry or even unpleasant contention he would interrupt it by interposing some anecdote thus diverting it into a hearty and general laugh and so completely disarrange the tenor of the discussion that the parties engaged would either separate in good humor or continue conversation free from discord this amicable disposition made him very popular with the household but when in eighteen forty eight lincoln went to new england he experienced for the first time the full meaning of the free soil sentiment as the new abolition sentiment was called massachusetts was quivering at that moment under the impassioned protests of the great abolitionists sumner was just deciding to abandon literature to devote his life to the cause of freedom and was speaking wherever he had the chance and often in scenes which were riots ah me such an assembly wrote longfellow in his journal after one of these speeches of sumner it was like one of beethoven's symphonies played in a sawmill whittier was laboring at amesbury by letters of counsel and encouragement to friends by his pure high-souled poems of protest and promise and by his editorials to the national era which he and his friends had just started in washington lowell was publishing the last of the biglow papers and preparing the whole for the book form he was writing too some of his noblest prose emerson palfrey hoar adams phillips garrison were all at work giddings had been there from ohio only a few days before lincoln arrived a great convention of free soilers and bolting whigs had been held in tremont temple and its earnestness and passion had produced a deep impression sensitive as lincoln was to every shade of popular feeling and conviction the sentiment in new england stirred him as he had never been stirred before on the question of slavery listening to seward's speech in tremont temple he seems to have had a sudden insight into the truth a quick illumination and that night as the two men sat talking he said gravely to the great anti-slavery advocate governor seward i have been thinking about what you said in your speech i reckon you are right we have got to deal with the slavery question and got to give much more attention to it hereafter than we have been doing end of section thirteen section fourteen of the life of abraham lincoln volume one by ida m tarbell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14. Lincoln at Niagara. Secures a patent for an invention. Abandons politics and decides to devote himself to the law. It was late in September when Lincoln started westward from his campaigning in New England. He stopped in Albany, New York, and in company with Thurlow Weed, called on Fillmore, then candidate for vice president. From Albany he went to Niagara. Mr. Herndon once asked him what made the deepest impression on him when he stood before the falls. The thing that struck me most forcibly when I saw the falls, he responded, was, where in the world did all that water come from? The memory of Niagara remained with him and aroused many speculations. Among various notes for lectures which Nicolay and Hay found among Mr. Lincoln's papers after his death, and published in his complete works, is a fragment on Niagara which shows how deeply his mind was stirred by the majesty of that mighty wonder. Niagara Falls. By what mysterious power is it that millions and millions are drawn from all parts of the world to gaze upon Niagara Falls? there is no mystery about the thing itself every effect is just as any intelligent man knowing the causes would anticipate without seeing it 
if the water moving onward in a great river reaches a point where there is a perpendicular jog of a hundred feet in descent in the bottom of the river it is plain the water will have a violent and continuous plunge at that point it is also plain the water thus plunging will foam and roar and send up a mist continuously in which last during sunshine there will be perpetual rainbows the mere physical of niagara falls is only this yet this is really a very small part of that world's wonder its power to excite reflection and emotion is its great charm the geologist will demonstrate that the plunge or fall was once at lake ontario and has worn its way back to its present position he will ascertain how fast it is wearing now and so get a basis for determining how long it has been wearing back from lake ontario and finally demonstrate by it that this world is at least fourteen thousand years old a philosopher of a slightly different turn will say niagara falls is only the lip of the basin out of which pours all the surplus water which rains down on two or three hundred thousand square miles of the earth's surface he will estimate with approximate accuracy that five hundred thousand tons of water fall with their full weight a distance of a hundred feet each minute thus exerting a force equal to the lifting of the same weight through the same space in the same time but still there is more it calls up the indefinite past when columbus first sought this continent when christ suffered on the cross when moses led israel through the red sea nay even when adam first came from the hand of his maker then as now niagara was roaring here the eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of america have gazed on niagara as ours do now contemporary with the first race of men and older than the first man niagara is strong and fresh to-day as ten thousand years ago the mammoth and mastodon so long dead that fragments of their monstrous bones alone testify that they ever lived have gazed on niagara in that long long time never still for a single moment never dried never froze never slept never rested in his trip westward to springfield from niagara there occurred an incident which started lincoln's mind on a new line of thought one which all that fall divided it with politics it happened that the boat by which he made part of the trip stranded in shallow water the devices employed to float her interested lincoln much he no doubt recalled the days when on the ohio the mississippi and the sangamon he had seen his own or neighbor's boat stuck on a sandbar for hours even days was there no way that these vexatious delays could be prevented in shallow streams he set himself resolutely at the task of inventing a practical device for getting boats over shoals when he reached springfield he began to build a model representing his idea he showed the deepest interest in the work and mr herndon says he would sometimes bring the model into his office and while whittling on it would talk of its merits and the revolution it was going to work on the western rivers when lincoln returned to washington he took the model with him and through mr z c robbins a lawyer of washington secured a patent he walked into my office one morning with a model of a western steamboat under his arm says mr robbins after a friendly greeting he placed his model on my office table and proceeded to explain the principles embodied therein that he believed to be his own invention and which if new he desired to secure by letters patent during my former residence in st louis i had made myself thoroughly familiar with everything appertaining to the construction and equipment of the flat bottom steamboats that were adapted to the shallow rivers of our western and southern states and therefore i was able speedily to come to the conclusion that mr lincoln's proposed improvements of that class of vessels was new and patentable and i so informed him thereupon he instructed me to prepare the necessary drawings and papers and prosecute an application for a patent for his invention at the united states patent office i complied with his instructions and in due course of proceedings procured for him a patent that fully covered all the distinguishing features of his improved steamboat the identical model that mr lincoln brought to my office can now be seen in the united states patent office 
but it was only his leisure which lincoln spent in the fall of eighteen forty eight on his invention all through october and the first days of november he was speaking up and down the state for taylor his zeal was rewarded in november by the election of the whig ticket and a few weeks later he went back to washington for the final session of the thirtieth congress he went back resolved to do something regarding slavery he seems to have seen but two things at that moment which could constitutionally be done the first was to allow the slaveholder no more ground than he had to accomplish this he continued to vote for the wilmot proviso the second was to abolish slavery in the district of columbia over ten years before in eighteen thirty seven lincoln had declared in the assembly of illinois that the congress of the united states had the power under the constitution to abolish slavery in the district of columbia but that the power ought not to be exercised unless at the request of the people of the district when he went to washington in eighteen forty seven he found a condition of things which made him feel that congress ought to exercise the power it had there had existed for years in the city a slave market a sort of negro livery stable where droves of negroes were collected temporarily kept and finally taken to southern markets precisely like droves of horses lincoln said in describing it in later years and this frightful place was in view from the windows of the capitol morally and intellectually shocked and irritated by this spectacle lincoln brooded over it until now in the second session of his term he decided to ask that congress exercise the power he had affirmed ten years before belonged to it and on january sixteenth eighteen forty nine he drew up and presented a bill to abolish slavery in the district of columbia with the consent of the voters of the district and with compensation to owners the bill caused a noise in the house but came to naught as indeed at that date any similar bill was bound to do it showed however more plainly than anything lincoln had done so far in congress his fearlessness when his convictions were aroused the inauguration of taylor on march fourth eighteen forty nine ended lincoln's congressional career the principal turnabout is fair play which he had insisted on in eighteen forty six when working for the nomination for himself he regarded as quite as applicable now it was not because he did not desire to return to congress i made the declaration that i would not be a candidate again he wrote herndon in january eighteen forty eight more from a wish to deal fairly with others to keep peace among our friends and to keep the district from going to the enemy than from any cause personal to myself so that if it should so happen that nobody else wishes to be elected i could not refuse the people the right of sending me again but to enter myself as a competitor of others or to authorize any one so to enter me is what my word and honor forbid and yet he was not willing to leave public life the term in congress had only increased his fondness for politics it had given him a touch of that fever for public office from which so few men who have served in congress ever entirely recover the whigs owed much to him and there was a general disposition to gratify any reasonable ambition he might have i believe that so far as the whigs in congress are concerned i could have the general land office almost by common consent he wrote speed but then sweet and don morrison and browning and cyrus edwards all want it and what is worse while i think i could easily take it myself i fear i shall have trouble to get it for any other man in illinois although he feared his efforts would be useless he pledged his support to his friend cyrus edwards while lincoln was looking after edwards interests a candidate appeared who was most objectionable to the whigs general justin butterfield lincoln did all he could to defeat butterfield save the one thing necessary ask the position for himself this he would not do until he learned that edwards had no chance then he applied but it was too late butterfield had secured the office while lincoln had been holding back when edwards found that lincoln had finally applied for the place he accused him of treachery lincoln was deeply hurt by the suspicion the better part of one's life consists of his friendships he wrote to judge gillespie 
and of them mine with mr edwards was one of the most cherished i have not been false to it at a word i could have had the office any time before the department was committed to mr butterfield at least mr ewing and the president say as much that word i forbore to speak partly for other reasons but chiefly for mr edwards's sake losing the office that he might gain it i was always for him but to lose his friendship by the effort for him would oppress me very much were i not sustained by the utmost consciousness of rectitude i first determined to be an applicant unconditionally on the second of june and i did so then upon being informed by a telegraphic dispatch that the question was narrowed down to mr b and myself and that the cabinet had postponed the appointment three weeks for my benefit not doubting that mr edwards was wholly out of the question i nevertheless would not then have become an applicant had i supposed he would thereby be brought to suspect me of treachery to him two or three days afterwards a conversation with levi davis convinced me mr edwards was dissatisfied but i was then too far in to get out his own letter written on the twenty fifth of april after i had fully informed him of all that had passed up to within a few days of that time gave assurance that i had that entire confidence from him which i felt my uniform and strong friendship for him entitled me to among other things it says whatever course your judgment may dictate is proper to be pursued shall never be accepted by me i also had had a letter from washington saying chambers of the republic had brought a rumor there that mr e had declined in my favor which rumor i judged came from mr e himself as i had not then breathed of his letter to any living creature in saying i had never before the second of june determined to be an applicant unconditionally i mean to admit that before then i had said substantially i would take the office rather than it should be lost to the state or given to one in the state whom the whigs did not want but i aver that in every instance in which i spoke of myself i intended to keep and now believe i did keep mr e above myself mr edwards first suspicion was that i had allowed baker to overreach me as his friend in behalf of don morrison i know this was a mistake and the result has proved it i understand his view now is that if i had gone to open war with baker i could have ridden him down and had the thing all my own way i believe no such thing with baker and some strong man from the military tract and elsewhere for morrison and we and some strong men from the wabash and elsewhere for mr e it was not possible for either to succeed i believed this in march and i know it now the only thing which gave either any chance was the very thing baker and i proposed an adjustment with themselves you may wish to know how butterfield finally beat me i cannot tell you particulars now but will when i see you in the meantime let it be understood that i am not greatly dissatisfied i wish the office had been so bestowed as to encourage our friends in future contests and i regret exceedingly mr edwards feelings towards me these two things away i should have no regrets at least i think i would not it was not until eleven years later that edwards forgave lincoln then at judge gillespie's request he promised to bury the hatchet with lincoln and to enter the campaign for him lincoln declared that he had no regrets about the way the general land office went but if he had not his whig friends in washington had they determined to do something for him and in the summer of eighteen forty nine summoned him to the capital to urge him to accept the governorship of oregon the territory would soon be a state it was believed and lincoln would then undoubtedly be chosen to represent it in the united states senate unquestionably a splendid political prospect was thus opened many of lincoln's friends advised him to accept his wife however disliked the idea of life in the far west and on her account he refused the place the events of the summer of eighteen forty nine seemed to lincoln to end his political career he had no time to brood over his situation however the necessity of earning a livelihood was too imperative 
His financial obligations were, in fact, considerable. The old debt for the New Salem store still hung over him. He had a growing family, and his father and mother, who were still living in Coles County, whither they had moved in 1831, were dependent upon him for many of the necessaries as well as all the comforts of their lives. At intervals, ever since he had left home, he had helped them, now by saving their land from the foreclosing of a mortgage, now by paying their doctor's bills, now by adding to the cheerfulness of their home. He was equally kind to his other relatives, visiting them and aiding them in various ways. Among these relatives were two cousins, Abraham and Mordecai, the sons of his uncle Mordecai Lincoln, who lived in Hancock County, in his congressional district. At Quincy, also in his district, lived with his family a brother of his mother, Joseph Hanks. Lincoln never went to Quincy without going to see his uncle Joseph and Uncle Joe's Jake, as he called one of his cousins. On these occasions, writes one of the latter's family, Mr. J. M. Hanks of Florence, Colorado, mirth and jollity abounded, for Mr. Lincoln indulged his bent of storytelling to the utmost, until a late hour. His half-brother, John Johnston, he aided for many years. His help did not always take the form of money. Johnston was shiftless and always in debt, and consequently restless and discontented. In 1851, he was determined to borrow money or sell his farm, and move to Missouri. He proposed to Mr. Lincoln that he lend him $80. Mr. Lincoln answered, What I propose is that you shall go to work, tooth and nail, for somebody who will give you money for it. I now promise you that, for every dollar you will, between this and the first of May, get for your own labor— either in money or as your own indebtedness, I will then give you one other dollar. In this I do not mean you shall go off to St. Louis, or the lead mines, or the gold mines in California, but I mean for you to go at it for the best wages you can get close to home in Coles County. Now, if you will do this, you will soon be out of debt, and what is better, you will have a habit that will keep you from getting in debt again." but if i should now clear you out of debt next year you would be just as deep in as ever you say you would almost give your place in heaven for seventy or eighty dollars then you value your place in heaven very cheap for i am sure you can with the offer i make get the seventy or eighty dollars for four or five months work a few months later lincoln wrote johnston in regard to his contemplated move to missouri what can you do in missouri better than here is the land any richer can you there any more than here raise corn and wheat and oats without work will anybody there any more than here do your work for you if you intend to go to work there is no better place than right where you are if you do not intend to go to work you cannot get along anywhere squirming and crawling about from place to place can do no good you have raised no crop this year, and what you really want is to sell the land, get the money, and spend it. Part with the land you have, and my life upon it, you will never own a spot big enough to bury you in. Half you will get for the land you will spend in moving to Missouri, and the other half you will eat, drink, and wear out, and no foot of land will be bought. Now, I feel it my duty to have no hand in such a piece of foolery. All this plain advice did not prevent Johnston trying to sell a small piece of land on which Mr. Lincoln had paid the mortgage in order to secure it to his stepmother during her life. When Mr. Lincoln received this proposition, he replied, Your proposal about selling the east forty acres of land is all that I want or could claim for myself, but I am not satisfied with it on mother's account. I want her to have her living— and I feel that it is my duty, to some extent, to see that she is not wronged. She had a right of dower, that is, the use of one-third for life, in the other two forties, but it seems she has already let you take that hook and line. She now has the use of the whole east forty as long as she lives, and if it be sold, of course she is entitled to the interest on all the money it brings as long as she lives. But you propose to sell it for three hundred dollars— take one hundred away with you, and leave her two hundred at eight percent, 
making her the enormous sum of sixteen dollars a year now if you are satisfied with treating her in that way i am not it is true that you are to have that forty for two hundred dollars at mother's death but you are not to have it before i am confident that land can be made to produce for mother at at least thirty dollars a year and i cannot to oblige any living person consent that she be put on an allowance of sixteen dollars a year it was these obligations which made lincoln resume at once the practice of the law he decided to remain in springfield although he had an opportunity to go in with a well-established chicago lawyer for many reasons life in springfield was satisfactory to him he had bought a home there in eighteen forty four and was deeply attached to it there too he was surrounded by scores of friends who had known him since his first appearance in the town and to many of whom he was related by marriage and he had the good will of the community in short he was a part of springfield the very children knew him for there was not one of them for whom he had not done some kind deed my first strong impression of mr lincoln says a lady of springfield was made by one of his kind deeds i was going with a little friend for my first trip alone on the railroad cars it was an epoch of my life i had planned for it and dreamed of it for weeks the day i was to go came but as the hour of the train approached the hackman through some neglect failed to call for my trunk as the minutes went on i realized in a panic of grief that i should miss the train i was standing by the gate my hat and gloves on sobbing as if my heart would break when mr lincoln came by why what's the matter he asked and i poured out all my story how big's the trunk there's still time if it isn't too big and he pushed through the gate and up to the door my mother and i took him up to my room where my little old-fashioned trunk stood locked and tied oh ho he cried wipe your eyes and come on quick and before i knew what he was going to do he had shouldered the trunk was downstairs and striding out of the yard down the street he went fast as his long legs could carry him i trotting behind drying my tears as i went we reached the station in time mr lincoln put me on the train kissed me good-bye and told me to have a good time it was just like him this sensitiveness to a child's wants made mr lincoln a most indulgent father he continually carried his boys about with him and their pranks even when they approached rebellion seemed to be an endless delight to him like most boys they loved to run away and the neighbors of the lincolns tell many tales of mr lincoln's captures of the culprits one of the prettiest of all these is a story told of an escape willie once made when three or four years old from the hands of his mother who was giving him a tubbing he scampered out of the door without the vestige of a garment on him flew up the street slipped under a fence into a great green field and took across it mr lincoln was sitting on the porch and discovered the pink and white runaway as he was cutting across the greensward he stood up laughing aloud while the mother entreated him to go in pursuit then he started in chase halfway across the field he caught the child and gathering him up in his long arms he covered his rosy form with kisses then mounting him on his back the chubby legs around his neck he rode him back to his mother and his tub it was a frequent custom with lincoln this of carrying his children on his shoulders he rarely went down street that he did not have one of his younger boys mounted on his shoulder while another hung to the tail of his long coat the antics of the boys with their father and the species of tyranny they exercised over him are still subjects of talk in springfield mr roland diller who was a neighbor of mr lincoln tells one of the best of the stories he was called to the door one day by hearing a great noise of children crying and there was mr lincoln striding by with the boys both of whom were wailing aloud why mr lincoln what's the matter with the boys he asked just what's the matter with the whole world lincoln replied i've got three walnuts and each wants two 
another of lincoln's springfield acquaintances the rev mr alcott of elgin illinois tells of seeing him coming away from church unusually early one sunday morning the sermon could not have been more than halfway through says mr alcott tad was slung across his left arm like a pair of saddle-bags and mr lincoln was striding along with long and deliberate steps toward his home on one of the street corners he encountered a group of his fellow townsmen mr lincoln anticipated the question which was about to be put by the group and taking his figure of speech from practices with which they were only too familiar said gentlemen i entered this colt but he kicked around so i had to withdraw him there was no institution in springfield in which lincoln had not taken an active interest in the first years of his residence and now that he had decided to remain in the town he resumed all his old relations from the daily visits to the drug stores on the public square which were the recognized rendezvous of springfield politicians and lawyers to his weekly attendance at the first presbyterian church that he was as regular in his attendance on the latter as on the former all his old neighbors testify in fact lincoln all his life went regularly to church the serious attention which he gave the sermons he heard is shown in a well-authenticated story of a visit he made in eighteen thirty seven with a company of friends to a camp meeting held six miles west of springfield at the salem church the sermon on this occasion was preached by one of the most vigorous and original individuals in the pulpit of that day the rev dr peter akers in this discourse was a remarkable and prophetic passage long remembered by those who heard it the speaker prophesied the downfall of castes the end of tyrannies and the crushing out of slavery as lincoln and his friends returned home there was a long discussion of the sermon it was the most instructive sermon and he is the most impressive preacher i have ever heard lincoln said it is wonderful that god has given such power to men i firmly believe his interpretation of prophecy so far as i understand it and especially about the breaking down of civil and religious tyrannies and odd as it may seem when he described those changes and revolutions i was deeply impressed that i should be somehow strangely mixed up with them if lincoln was not at this period a man of strictly orthodox beliefs he certainly was if we accept his own words profoundly religious in the letters which passed between lincoln and speed in eighteen forty one and eighteen forty two when the two men were doubting their own hearts and wrestling with their disillusions and forebodings lincoln frequently expressed the idea to speed that the almighty had sent their suffering for a special purpose when speed finally acknowledged himself happily married lincoln wrote to him i always was superstitious i believe god made me one of the instruments of bringing your fanny and you together which union i have no doubt he had foreordained then referring to his own troubled heart he added whatever he designs he will do for me yet stand still and see the salvation of the lord is my text just now only a few months after lincoln decided to settle permanently in springfield his father thomas lincoln fell dangerously ill lincoln in writing to john johnston his half-brother said i sincerely hope father may recover his health but at all events tell him to remember to call upon and confide in our great and good and merciful maker who will not turn away from him in any extremity he notes the fall of a sparrow and numbers the hairs of our heads and he will not forget the dying man who puts his trust in him lincoln's return to the law was characterized by a marked change in his habits he gave much more attention to study than he ever had before his colleagues in springfield and on the circuit noticed this change after court closed in the town on the circuit and the lawyers were gathered in the bar-room or on the veranda of the tavern telling stories and chaffing one another lincoln would join them though often but for a few minutes he would tell a story as he passed and while they were laughing at its climax would slip away to his room to study frequently this work was carried on far into the night placing a candle on a chair at the head of the bed says mr herndon he would study for hours 
i have known him to study in this position until two o'clock in the morning meanwhile i and the others who chanced to occupy the same room would be safely and soundly asleep although he worked so late he was in the habit of rising earlier than his brothers of the bar says judge weldon on such occasions he was wont to sit by the fire having uncovered the coals and muse ponder and soliloquize but it was not only the law that occupied him he began a serious course of general education studying mathematics astronomy poetry as regularly as a schoolboy who had lessons to recite in the winter of eighteen forty nine fifty he even joined a club of a dozen gentlemen of springfield who had begun the study of german the meetings of the class being held in his office much of lincoln's devotion to study at this period was due to his desire to bring himself in general culture up to the men whom he had been meeting in the east no man ever realized his own deficiencies in knowledge and experience more deeply than abraham lincoln nor made a braver struggle to correct them he often acknowledged to his friends the consciousness he had of his own limitations in the simplest matters of life mr h c whitney one of his old friends gives a pathetic example of this once on the circuit his friends missed him after supper when he returned some one asked him where he had been well i have been to a little show up at the academy he said he sat before the fire says mr whitney and narrated all the sights of that most primitive of county shows given chiefly to school children next night he was missing again the show was still in town and he stole in as before and entertained us with a description of new sights a magic lantern electrical machine etc i told him i had seen all these sights at school yes he said sadly i now have an advantage over you for the first time in my life seeing these things which are of course common to those who had what i did not a chance at an education when they were young it was to make up for the chance at an education which he did not have in youth that abraham lincoln at forty years of age after having earned the reputation of being one of the ablest politicians in illinois spent his leisure End of section 14section 15 of the life of abraham lincoln volume 1 by ida m tarbell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 15 lincoln on the circuit his humor and persuasiveness his manner of preparing cases examining witnesses and addressing juries when in 1849 lincoln decided to abandon politics finally and to devote himself to the law he had been practicing for 13 years in spite of the many interruptions electioneering and office-holding had caused he was well established rejoining his partner herndon the firm of lincoln and herndon had only been a name during lincoln's term in washington he took up the law with a singleness of purpose which had never before characterized his practice lincoln's headquarters were in springfield but his practice was itinerant the arrangements for the administration of justice in illinois in the early days were suited to the conditions of the country the state being divided into judicial circuits including more or less territory according to the population to each circuit a judge was appointed who each spring and fall traveled from county seat to county seat to hold court with the judge traveled a certain number of the best-known lawyers of the district each lawyer had of course a permanent office in one of the county seats and often at several of the others he had partners usually young men of little experience for whom he acted as a counsel in special cases this peripatetic court prevailed in illinois until the beginning of the fifties but for many years after when the towns had grown so large that a clever lawyer might have enough to do in his own county a few lawyers lincoln among them who from long association felt that the circuit was their natural habitat refused to leave it the circuit which lincoln traveled was known as the eighth judicial circuit it included fifteen counties in eighteen forty five though the territory has since been divided into more it was about one hundred and fifty miles long as by many broad 
there were no railroads in the eighth circuit until about eighteen fifty four and the court travelled on horseback or in carriages lincoln had no horse in the early days of his practice it was his habit then to borrow one or to join in a company of a half dozen or more in hiring a three-seated spring wagon later he owned a turnout of his own which figures in nearly all the traditions of the eighth circuit the horse being described as pokey and the buggy as rattling there was much that was irritating and uncomfortable in the circuit riding of the illinois court but there was more which was amusing to a temperament like lincoln's the freedom the long days in the open air the unexpected if trivial adventures the meeting with wayfarers and settlers all was an entertainment to him he found humor and human interest on the route where his companions saw nothing but commonplaces he saw the ludicrous in an assemblage of fowls says h c whitney one of his fellow itinerants in a man spading his garden in a clothesline full of clothes in a group of boys in a lot of pigs rooting at a mill door in a mother duck teaching her brood to swim in everything and anything the sympathetic observations of these long rides furnished humorous settings for some of his best stories if frequently on these trips he fell into sombre reveries and rode with head bent ignoring his companions generally he took part in all the frolicking which went on joining in practical jokes singing noisily with the rest sometimes even playing a juice harp when the county seat was reached the bench and bar quickly settled themselves in the town tavern it was usually a large two-story house with big rooms and long verandas there was little exclusiveness possible in these hostelries ordinarily judge and lawyer slept two in a bed and three or four beds in a room they ate at the common table with jurors witnesses prisoners out on bail travelling peddlers teamsters and laborers the only attempt at classification on the landlord's part was seating the lawyers in a group at the head of the table most of them accepted this distinction complacently lincoln however seemed to be indifferent to it one day when he had come in and seated himself at the foot with the fourth estate the landlord called to him you're in the wrong place mr lincoln come up here have you anything better to eat up there joe he inquired quizzically if not i'll stay here the accommodations of the taverns were often unsatisfactory the food poorly cooked the beds hard lincoln accepted everything with uncomplaining good nature though his companions habitually growled at the hardships of the life it was not only repugnance to criticism which might hurt others it was the indifference of one whose thoughts were always busy with problems apart from physical comfort who had little notion of the so-called refinements of life and almost no sense of luxury and ease the judge naturally was the leading character in these nomadic groups he received all the special consideration the democratic spirit of the inhabitants bestowed on any one and controlled his privacy and his time to a degree judge david davis who from eighteen forty eight presided over the eighth circuit as long as mr lincoln travelled it was a man of unusual force of character of large learning quick impulses and strong prejudices lincoln was from the beginning of their association a favorite with judge davis unless he joined the circle which the judge formed in his room after supper his honor was impatient and distraught interrupting the conversation constantly by demanding where's lincoln why don't lincoln come and when lincoln did come the judge would draw out story after story quieting everybody who interrupted with an impatient mr lincoln's talking if any one came to the door to see the host in the midst of one of lincoln's stories he would send a lawyer into the hall to see what was wanted and as soon as the door closed order lincoln to go ahead the appearance of the court in a town was invariably a stimulus to its social life in all of the county seats there were a few fine homes of which the dignity spaciousness and elegance still impressed the traveller through illinois the hospitality of these houses was generous dinners receptions and suppers followed one another as soon as the court began lincoln was a favorite figure at all these gatherings 
His favorite field, however, was the court. The courthouses of Illinois, in which he practiced, were not log houses, as has been frequently taken for granted. It is not probable, says a leading member of the Illinois Bar, Mr. Lincoln ever saw a log courthouse in central Illinois where he practiced law, unless he saw one in Decatur in Macon County. In a conversation between three members of the Supreme Court of Illinois, all of whom had been born in this state and had lived in it all their lives, and who were certainly familiar with the central portions of the state, all declared they had never seen a log courthouse in the state. The courthouses in which Lincoln practiced were stiff, old-fashioned wood or brick structures, usually capped by cupola or tower, and fronted by verandas with huge Doric or Ionic pillars. They were furnished inside in the most uncompromising style, hard white walls, unpainted woodwork, pine floors, wooden benches. Usually they were heated by huge Franklin stoves, with yards of stovepipe running wildly through the air, searching for an exit, and threatening, momentarily, to unjoint and tumble in sections. Few of the lawyers had offices in the town, and a corner of the courtroom, the shade of a tree in the courtyard, a sunny side of a building, were where they met with their clients and transacted business in the courts themselves there was a certain indifference to formality engendered by the primitive surroundings which however the judges never allowed to interfere with the seriousness of the work lincoln habitually when not busy whispered stories to his neighbors frequently to the annoyance of judge davis if lincoln persisted too long the judge would rap on the chair and exclaim come come mr lincoln i can't stand this there is no use trying to carry on two courts. I must adjourn mine or you yours, and I think you will have to be the one. As soon as the group had scattered, the judge would call one of the men to him and ask, What was that Lincoln was telling? I was never fined but once for contempt of court, says one of the clerks of the court in Lincoln's day. Davis fined me five dollars. Mr. Lincoln had just come in, and, leaning over my desk, had told me a story so irresistibly funny that I broke out into a loud laugh. The judge called me to order in haste, saying, This must be stopped. Mr. Lincoln, you are constantly disturbing this court with your stories. Then to me, you may find yourself five dollars for your disturbance. I apologized, but told the judge that the story was worth the money. In a few minutes, the judge called me to him. What was the story Lincoln told you? he asked. I told him, and he laughed aloud in spite of himself. Remit your fine, he ordered. The partiality of Judge Davis for Lincoln was shared by the members of the court generally. The unaffected friendliness and helpfulness of his nature had more to do with this than his wit and cleverness. If there was a new clerk in court, a stranger, unused to the ways of the place, Lincoln was the first, sometimes the only one, to shake hands with him and congratulate him on his election. No lawyer on the circuit was more unassuming than was Mr. Lincoln, says one who practiced with him. He arrogated to himself no superiority over anyone, not even the most obscure member of the bar. He treated everyone with that simplicity and kindness that friendly neighbors manifest in their relations with one another. He was remarkably gentle with young lawyers becoming permanent residents at the several county seats in the circuit where he had practiced for so many years. The result was he became the much-beloved senior member of the bar. No young lawyer ever practiced in the courts with Mr. Lincoln, who did not in all his after life have a regard for him akin to personal affection. I remember with what confidence I always went to him, says Judge Lawrence Weldon, who first knew Lincoln at the bar in 1854, because I was certain he knew all about the matter and would most cheerfully help me. I can see him now, through the decaying memories of thirty years, standing in the corner of the old courtroom, and as I approached him with a paper I did not understand, he said, Wait until I fix this plug of my gallus, and I will pitch into that like a dog at a root. While speaking, he was busily engaged in trying to connect his suspenders with his pants by making a plug perform the function of a button. 
if for any reason lincoln was absent from court he was missed perhaps as no other man on the eighth circuit would have been and his return greeted joyously he was not less happy to rejoin his friends ain't you glad i've come he would call out as he came up to shake hands the cases which fell to lincoln on the eighth circuit were of the sort common to a new country litigation over bordering lines and deeds over damages by wandering cattle over broils at country festivities few of the cases were of large importance when a client came to lincoln his first effort was to arrange matters if possible and to avoid a suit in a few notes for a law lecture prepared about eighteen fifty he says discourage litigation persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can point out to them how the nominal winner is often a real loser in fees expenses and waste of time as a peacemaker the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man there will still be business enough never stir up litigation a worse man can scarcely be found than one who does this who can be more nearly a fiend than he who habitually overhauls the register of deeds in search of defects in titles whereon to stir up strife and put money in his pocket a moral tone ought to be infused into the profession which should drive such men out of it he carried out this in his practice who was your guardian he asked a young man who came to him to complain that a part of the property left him had been withheld enoch kingsbury replied the young man i know mr kingsbury said lincoln and he is not the man to have cheated you out of a cent and i can't take the case and advise you to drop the subject and it was dropped we shall not take your case he said to a man who had shown that by a legal technicality he could win property worth six hundred dollars you must remember that some things legally right are not morally right we shall not take your case but we'll give you a little advice for which we will charge you nothing you seem to be a sprightly energetic man we would advise you to try your hand at making six hundred dollars in some other way where he saw injustice he was quick to offer his services to the wronged party a pleasant example of this is related by joseph jefferson in his autobiography in eighteen thirty nine jefferson then a lad of ten years travelled through illinois with his father's theatrical company after playing at chicago quincy peoria and pekin the company went in the fall to springfield where the sight of the legislature tempted the elder jefferson and his partner to remain throughout the season but there was no theatre not to be daunted they built one but hardly had they completed it before a religious revival broke out in the town and the church people turned all their influence against the theatre so effectually did they work that a law was passed by the municipality imposing a license which was practically prohibitory in the midst of our trouble says jefferson a young lawyer called on the managers he had heard of the injustice and offered if they would place the matter in his hands to have the license taken off declaring that he only desired to see fair play and he would accept no fee whether he failed or succeeded the young lawyer began his harangue he handled the subject with tact skill and humor tracing the history of the drama from the time when thespis acted in a cart to the stage of today he illustrated his speech with a number of anecdotes and kept the council in a roar of laughter his good humor prevailed and the exorbitant tax was taken off the young lawyer was lincoln having accepted a case lincoln's first object seemed to be to reduce it to its simplest elements if i can clean this case of technicalities and get it properly swung to the jury i'll win it he told his partner herndon one day he began by getting at what seemed to him the pivot on which it rested sure of that he cared little for anything else he trusted very little to books a great deal to common sense and his ideas of right and wrong in the make of his character mr lincoln had many elements essential to the successful circuit lawyer says one of his fellow practitioners he knew much of the law as written in the books and had that knowledge ready for use at all times 
that was a valuable possession in the absence of law books where none were obtainable on the circuit but he had more than a knowledge of the law he knew right and justice and knew how to make their application to the affairs of everyday life that was an element in his character that gave him power to prevail with the jury when arguing a case before them few lawyers ever had the influence with a jury that mr lincoln had when a case was clear to him and he was satisfied of its justice he trusted to taking advantage of the developments of the trial to win for this reason he made few notes beforehand rarely writing out his plan of argument those he left are amusingly brief for instance the notes made for a suit he had brought against a pension agent who had withheld as fee half of the pension he had obtained for the aged widow of a revolutionary soldier lincoln was deeply indignant at the agent and had resolved to win his suit he read up the revolutionary war afresh and when he came to address the jury drew a harrowing picture of the private soldier's sufferings and of the trials of his separation from his wife the notes for this argument ran as follows no contract not professional services unreasonable charge money retained by defendant not given by plaintiff revolutionary war soldiers bleeding feet plaintiff's husband soldier leaving home for the army skin defect close lincoln's reason for not taking notes as he told it to h w beckwith when a student in the danville office of lincoln and layman was notes are a bother taking time to make and more to hunt them up afterwards lawyers who do so soon get the habit of referring to them so much that it confuses and tires the jury he relied on his well-trained memory says mr beckwith that recorded and indexed every passing detail and by his skilful questions a joke or pat retort as the trial progressed he steered his jury from the bayous and eddies of side issues and kept them clear of the snags and sandbars if any were put in the real channel of his case much of his strength lay in his skill in examining witnesses he had a most remarkable talent for examining witnesses says an intimate associate with him it was a rare gift it was a power to compel a witness to disclose the whole truth even a witness at first unfriendly under his kindly treatment would finally become friendly and would wish to tell nothing he could honestly avoid against him if he could state nothing for him he could not endure an unfair use of testimony or the misrepresentation of his own position in the harrison murder case says mr t w s kidd of springfield a crier of the court in lincoln's day the prosecuting attorney stated that such a witness made a certain statement when mr lincoln rose and made such a plaintive appeal to the attorney to correct the statement that the attorney actually made the amend honorable and afterwards remarked to a brother lawyer that he could deny his own child's appeal as quickly as he could mr lincoln's sometimes under provocation he became violently angry in the murder case referred to above the judge ruled contrary to his expectations and as mr lincoln said contrary to the decision of the supreme court in a similar case both mr lincoln and judge logan who was with him in the case says mr kidd rose to their feet quick as thought i do think he was the most unearthly looking man i had ever seen he roared like a lion suddenly aroused from his lair and said and did more in ten minutes than i ever heard him say or saw him do before in an hour he depended a great deal upon his stories in pleading using them as illustrations which demonstrated the case more conclusively than argument could have done judge h w beckwith of danville illinois in his personal recollections of lincoln tells a story which is a good example of lincoln's way of condensing the law and the facts of an issue in a story a man by vile words first provoked and then made a bodily attack upon another the latter in defending himself gave the other much the worst of the encounter the aggressor to get even had the one who thrashed him tried in our circuit court upon a charge of an assault and battery mr lincoln defended 
and told the jury that his client was in the fix of a man who in going along the highway with a pitchfork on his shoulder was attacked by a fierce dog that ran out at him from a farmer's dooryard in parrying off the brute with the fork its prong stuck into the brute and killed him what made you kill my dog said the farmer what made him try to bite me but why did you not go at him with the other end of the pitchfork why did he not come after me with his other end at this mr lincoln whirled about in his long arms an imaginary dog and pushed its tail end toward the jury this was the defensive plea of son assault de main loosely that the other fellow brought on the fight quickly told and in a way the dullest mind would grasp and retain mr t w s kidd says that he once heard a lawyer opposed to lincoln trying to convince a jury that precedent was superior to law and that custom made things legal in all cases when lincoln arose to answer him he told the jury he would argue his case in the same way said he old squire bagley from menard came into my office and said lincoln i want your advice as a lawyer has a man what's been elected justice of the peace a right to issue a marriage license i told him he had not when the old squire threw himself back in his chair very indignantly and said lincoln i thought you was a lawyer now bob thomas and me had a bet on this thing and we agreed to let you decide but if this is your opinion i don't want it for i know a thundering sight better for i have been squire now eight years and have done it all the time his manner of telling stories was most effective when he chose to do so writes judge scott he could place the opposite party and his counsel too for that matter in a most ridiculous attitude by relating in his inimitable way a pertinent story that often gave him a great advantage with the jury a young lawyer had brought an action in trespass to recover damages done to his client's growing crops by defendant's hogs the right of action under the law of illinois as it was then depended on the fact whether the plaintiff's fence was sufficient to turn ordinary stock there was some little conflict in the evidence on that question but the weight of the testimony was decidedly in favor of the plaintiff and sustained beyond all doubt his cause of action mr lincoln appeared for defendant there was no controversy as to the damage done by defendant's stock the only thing in the case that could possibly admit of any discussion was the condition of plaintiff's fence and as the testimony on that question seemed to be in favor of plaintiff and as the sum involved was little in amount mr lincoln did not deem it necessary to argue the case seriously but by way of saying something in behalf of his client he told a little story about a fence that was so crooked that when a hog went through an opening in it invariably it came out on the same side from whence it started his description of the confused look of the hog after several times going through the fence and still finding itself on the side from which it had started was a humorous specimen of the best story-telling the effect was to make plaintiff's case appear ridiculous and while mr lincoln did not attempt to apply the story to the case the jury seemed to think it had some kind of application to the fence in controversy otherwise he would not have told it and shortly returned a verdict for the defendant those unfamiliar with his methods frequently took his stories as an effort to wring a laugh from the jury a lawyer a stranger to mr lincoln once expressed to general linder the opinion that this practice of lincoln was a waste of time don't lay that flattering unction to your soul linder answered lincoln is like tansy's horse he breaks to win but it was not his stories it was his clearness which was his strongest point he meant that the jury should see that he was right for this reason he never used a word which the dullest juryman could not understand rarely if ever did a latin term creep into his arguments a lawyer quoting a legal maxim one day in court turned to lincoln and said that is so is it not mr lincoln if that's latin lincoln replied you had better call another witness his illustrations were almost always of the homeliest kind he did not care to go among the ancients for figures he said 
much of the force of his argument writes judge scott lay in his logical statement of the facts of a case when he had in that way secured a clear understanding of the facts the jury and the court would seem naturally to follow him in his conclusions as to the law of the case his simple and natural presentation of the facts seemed to give the impression that the jury themselves were making the statement he had the happy and unusual faculty of making the jury believe they and not he were trying the case mr lincoln kept himself in the background and apparently assumed nothing more than to be an assistant counsel to the court or jury on whom the primary responsibility for the final decision of the case in fact rested he rarely consulted books during a trial lest he lose the attention of the jury and if obliged to translated their statements into the simplest terms in his desire to keep his case clear he rarely argued points which seemed to him unessential in law it is good policy never to plead what you need not lest you oblige yourself to prove what you cannot he wrote he would thus give away point after point with an indifferent i reckon that so until the point which he considered pivotal was reached and there he hung in making a speech says mr john hill mr lincoln was the plainest man i ever heard he was not a speaker but a talker he talked to juries and to political gatherings plain sensible candid talk almost as in conversation no effort whatever in oratory but his talking had wonderful effect honesty candor fairness everything that was convincing was in his manner and expressions this candor of which mr hill speaks characterized his entire conduct of a trial it is well understood by the profession says general mason brayman that lawyers do not read authorities favoring the opposing side i once heard mr lincoln in the supreme court of illinois reading from a reported case some strong points in favor of his argument reading a little too far and before becoming aware of it he plunged into an authority against himself pausing a moment he drew up his shoulders in a comical way and half laughing went on there there may it please the court i reckon i've scratched up a snake but as i'm in for it i guess i'll read it through then in his most ingenious and matchless manner he went on with his argument and won his case convincing the court that it was not much of a snake after all end of section fifteen Section 16 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. The LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16. Lincoln's Important Law Cases. Defense of a Slave Girl. The McCormick Case. The Armstrong Murder Case. The Rock Island Bridge Case. Abraham Lincoln's place in the legal circle of Illinois has never been clearly defined, the ordinary impression is that though he was a faithful and trusted lawyer he never rose to the first rank of his profession this idea has come from imperfect information concerning his legal career an examination of the reports of the illinois supreme court from eighteen forty when he tried his first case before that body to eighteen sixty one when he gave up his profession to become president of the united states shows that in this period of twenty years broken as it was from eighteen forty seven to eighteen forty nine by a term in congress and interrupted constantly from eighteen fifty four to eighteen sixty by his labors in opposition to the repeal of the missouri compromise lincoln was engaged in nearly one hundred cases before that court some of them of great importance this fact shows him to have been one of the leading lawyers of his state between ninety and one hundred cases before the supreme court of a state in twenty years is a record surpassed by but few lawyers it was exceeded by none of lincoln's illinois contemporaries among the cases in which he was prominent and of which we have reports there are several of dramatic import viewing them as we can now in connection with his later life one of the first in which he appeared before the illinois supreme court involved the freedom of a negro girl called nance 
in spite of the fact that illinois had been free since its admission as a state many traces of slavery still remained particularly in the southern and central parts of the state among the scattered slaveholders was one nathan cromwell of tazewell county who for some years had in his service a negro girl nance he claimed that nance was bound to him by indenture and that he had the right to sell her as any other property a right he succeeded finally in exercising one of his neighbors bailey by name bought the girl but the purchase was conditional bailey was to pay for his property only when he received from cromwell title papers showing that nance was bound to serve under the laws of the state these papers cromwell failed to produce before his death later his heirs sued bailey for the purchase price bailey employed lincoln to defend him the case was tried in september eighteen thirty nine and decided against bailey then in july eighteen forty one it was tried again before the supreme court of the state lincoln proved that nance had lived for several years in the state that she was over twenty one years of age that she declared herself to be free and that she had even purchased goods on her own account the list of authorities he used in the trial to prove that nance could not be held in bondage shows that he was already familiar with both federal and state legislation on the slavery question up to that date he went back to the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven to show that slavery was forbidden in the northwest territory he recalled the constitution that had made the state free in eighteen eighteen he showed that by the law of nations no person can be sold in a free state his argument convinced the court the judgment of the lower court was overruled and nance was free after lincoln's return from congress in eighteen forty nine he was engaged in some of the most important cases of the day one of these was a contest between the illinois central railroad at that time building and mclean county illinois this road had been exempted by the legislature from all state taxation on condition that it pay perpetually into the state treasury seven per cent of its annual gross earnings when the line was laid in mclean county the county authorities declared that the state legislature could not excuse the railroad company from paying county taxes accordingly the company's property was assessed and a tax levied if this claim of the county could be sustained it was certain to kill the railroad and great preparations were made for the defense the solicitor of the illinois central at that time was general mason brayman who retained lincoln the case was tried at bloomington before the supreme court and largely through the efforts of lincoln was won for the road according to herndon lincoln charged for his services a fee of two thousand dollars going to chicago he presented his bill why said the officer to whom he applied this is as much as a first-class lawyer would have charged stung by the ungrateful speech lincoln withdrew the bill left the office and at the first opportunity submitted the matter to his friends five thousand dollars they all agreed was a moderate fee considering what he had done for the road and six leading lawyers of the state signed a paper in which they declared that such a charge would not be unreasonable lincoln then sued the road for that amount and won his case he gave me my half says herndon and as much as we deprecated the avarice of great corporations we both thanked the lord for letting the illinois central railroad fall into our hands the current version of this story names general george b mcclellan as the testy official who snubbed lincoln when he presented the bill this could not have been the incident occurred in eighteen fifty five that year captain mcclellan spent in the crimea as one of a commission of three sent abroad to study the european military service as displayed in the crimean war it was not until january eighteen fifty seven that mcclellan resigned his commission in the united states army to become the chief engineer and afterwards vice-president of the illinois central railroad it was when an officer of the illinois central however that mcclellan first met lincoln long before the war he says in mcclellan's own story when vice president of the illinois central railroad i knew mr lincoln for he was one of the counsel of the company 
more than once i have been with him in out-of-the-way county seats where some important case was being tried and in the lack of sleeping accommodations have spent the night in front of a stove listening to the unceasing flow of anecdotes from his lips he was never at a loss and i could never quite make up my mind how many of them he had really heard before and how many he invented on the spur of the moment his stories were seldom refined but were always to the point it was through his legal practice that lincoln first met still another man who was to sustain a relation of the greatest importance to him in the war this man was edwin m stanton the meeting occurred in Cincinnati, in 1855, in connection with a patent case which is famous in the legal history of the country, and in which both Lincoln and Stanton had been retained as counsel. So much that is false has been written of this meeting, that a full and exact statement of the circumstances has been obtained for this work from Mr. George Harding of Philadelphia, the only one of either judges or counsel in the case living at this writing cyrus h mccormick owned reaping machine patents granted in eighteen forty five and eighteen forty seven says mr harding upon which he sued john m manny and company of rockford illinois mr manny had obtained patents also manny and company were large manufacturers of reaping machines under manny's patents mccormick contended that his patents were valid and secured to him a virtual monopoly of all practical reaping machines as constructed at that date if mccormick had been successful in his contention manny would have been enjoined his factory stopped and a claim of four hundred thousand dollars damages demanded from his firm mccormick's income from that monopoly would have been vastly increased hence the suit was very important to all parties and to the farming public the plaintiff mccormick had retained mr e n dickerson and reverdy johnson the former was entrusted with the preparation of the plaintiff's case and the argument before the court on the mechanics of the case mr p h watson who had procured manny's patents was given by manny the entire control of the defendant's case he employed mr george harding to prepare the defense for manny and to argue the mechanics of the case before the court in those times it was deemed important in patent cases to employ associate counsel not specially familiar with mechanical questions but of high standing in the general practice of the law and of recognized forensic ability if such counsel represented the defendant he urged upon the court the importance of treating the patentee as a quasi-monopolist whose claim should be limited to the precise mechanical contributions which he had made to the art while on the other hand the plaintiff's forensic counsel was expected to dwell upon the privations and labor of the patentee and to insist on a very liberal view of his claims and to hold that defendants who had appropriated any of his ideas should be treated as pirates the necessity of the forensic contribution in the argument of patent cases is not now recognized mccormick had selected mr reverdy johnson for the forensic part of his case mr watson was in doubt as to whom to select to perform this duty for the defendants at the suggestion of mr manny mr watson wrote to mr lincoln sending to him a retainer of five hundred dollars and requesting him to read the testimony which was sent to him from time to time as taken so that if mr watson afterward concluded to have him argue the case he would be prepared mr harding had urged the employment of mr stanton who was personally known to him and who then resided at pittsburgh with a view to determining finally who should argue the forensic part of manny's case mr watson personally visited springfield and conferred with mr lincoln on his way back from springfield he called upon mr stanton at pittsburgh and after a conference retained mr stanton and informed him distinctly that he was to make the closing argument in the case nevertheless mr lincoln was sent copies of the testimony he studied the testimony and was paid for so doing the same as mr stanton mr watson considered that it would be prudent for mr lincoln to be prepared in case of mr stanton's inability for any cause to argue the case so that at the outset mr stanton was selected by mr manny's direct representative to perform this duty 
when all the parties in council met at cincinnati mr lincoln was first definitely informed by mr watson of his determination that mr stanton was to close the case for defendants mr lincoln was evidently disappointed at mr watson's decision mr lincoln had written out his argument in full he was anxious to meet mr reverdy johnson in forensic contest the case was important as to the amount in dispute and of widespread interest to farmers mr lincoln's feelings were embittered moreover because the plaintiff's counsel subsequently in open court of their own motion stated that they perceived that there were three counsel present for defendant and that plaintiff had only two counsel present but they were willing to allow all three of defendants counsel to speak provided mr dickerson who had charge of the mechanical part of mccormick's case were permitted to make two arguments besides mr johnson's argument mr watson who had charge of defendants case declined this offer because the case ultimately depended upon mechanical questions and he thought that if mr dickerson were allowed to open the mechanical part of the case and then make a subsequent argument on the mechanics the temptation would be great to make an insufficient or misleading mechanical opening of the case at first and after mr harding had replied thereto to make a fuller or different mechanical presentation which could not be replied to by mr harding it was conceded that neither mr lincoln nor mr stanton was prepared to handle the mechanics of the case either in opening or reply in view of these facts mr watson decided that only two arguments would be made for manny and that mr harding would open the case for defendant on the mechanical part and mr stanton would close on the general propositions of law applicable to the case mr stanton said in court that personally he had no desire to speak but he agreed with mr watson that only two arguments should be made for defendants whether he spoke or not mr lincoln knowing mr watson's wishes insisted that mr stanton should make the closing argument and that he would not himself speak mr stanton accepted the position and did speak because he knew that such was the expressed wish and direction of mr watson who controlled the conduct of defendant's case mr lincoln kindly and gracefully but regretfully accepted the situation he attended and exhibited much interest in the case as it proceeded he sent to mr harding the written argument which he had prepared that he might have the benefit of it before he made his opening argument but requested mr harding not to show it to mr stanton the chagrin of mr lincoln at not speaking continued however and he felt that mr stanton should have insisted on his mr lincoln's speaking also while mr stanton merely carried out the positive direction of his client that there should be only two arguments for defendant and that he mr stanton should close the case and mr harding should open the case mr lincoln expressed to mr harding satisfaction at the manner in which the mechanical part of the case had been presented by him and after mr lincoln had been elected president he showed his recollection of it by tendering mr harding of his own motion a high position in regard to the personal treatment of mr lincoln while in attendance at cincinnati it is to be borne in mind that mr lincoln was known to hardly any one in cincinnati at that date and that mr stanton was probably not impressed with the appearance of mr lincoln it is true there was no personal intimacy formed between them while at cincinnati mr lincoln was disappointed and unhappy while in cincinnati and undoubtedly did not receive the attention which he should have received mr lincoln felt all this and particularly but unjustly reflected upon mr stanton as the main cause when mr lincoln was nominated for president mr stanton like many others in the country sincerely doubted whether mr lincoln was equal to the tremendous responsibility which he was to be called upon to assume as president this is to be borne in mind in view of events subsequent to the case at cincinnati mr stanton never called upon mr lincoln after he came to washington as president mr lincoln in alluding to mr stanton both before and after his election as president did not attempt to conceal his unkind feeling towards him which had its origin at cincinnati this feeling did not undergo a change until after he met mr stanton as secretary of war 
the occurrences narrated show how one great man may underrate his fellow-man mr stanton saw at cincinnati in mr lincoln only his gaunt rugged features his awkward dress and carriage and heard only his rural jokes but stanton lived to perceive in those rugged lineaments only expressions of nobility and loveliness of character and to hear from his lips only wisdom prudence and courage couched in language unsurpassed in literature but above all they show the nobility of mr lincoln's character in forgetting all unkind personal feeling engendered at cincinnati towards mr stanton and subsequently appointing him his secretary of war the above was narrated by mr harding for the main purpose of correcting the popular impression that mr stanton of his own motion rode over and displaced mr lincoln in the case at cincinnati for the truth is that mr stanton in the course he pursued was directed by his client's representative mr watson who believed that he was serving the best interests of his clients lincoln was first suggested to mr manny as counsel in this case by a younger member of the firm mr ralph emerson of rockford illinois mr emerson as a student of law had been thrown much into company with mr lincoln and had learned to respect his judgment and ability indeed it was lincoln who was instrumental in deciding him to abandon the law the young man had seen much in the practice of his chosen profession which seemed to him unjust and he had begun to feel that the law was incompatible with his ideals one evening after a particularly trying day in court he walked out with lincoln suddenly turning to his companion he said mr lincoln i want to ask you a question is it possible for a man to practice law and always do by others as he would be done by lincoln's head dropped on his breast and he walked in silence for a long way then he heaved a heavy sigh when he finally spoke it was of a foreign matter i have my answer said mr emerson and that walk turned the course of my life during the trial at cincinnati lincoln and mr emerson were thrown much together and mr emerson's recollections are particularly interesting as i was the sole intimate friend of mr lincoln in the case when it was decided that he should not take part in the argument he invited me to his room to express his bitter disappointment and it was with difficulty that i persuaded him to remain as counsel during the hearing we generally spent the afternoons together the hearing had hardly progressed two days before mr lincoln expressed to me his satisfaction that he was not to take part in the argument so many and so deep were the questions involved that he realized he had not given the subject sufficient study to have done himself justice the courtroom which during the first day or two was well filled greatly thinned out as the argument proceeded day after day but as the crowd diminished mr lincoln's interest in the case increased he appeared entirely to forget himself and at times rising from his chair walked back and forth in the open space of the courtroom as though he were in his own office pausing to listen intently as one point after another was clearly made out in our favor he manifested such delight in countenance and unconscious action that its effect on the judges one of whom at least already highly respected him was evidently stronger than any set speech of his could possibly have been the impression produced on the judges was evidently that mr lincoln was thoroughly convinced of the justice of our side and anxious that we should prevail not merely on account of his interest in his clients but because he thought our case was just and should triumph the final summing up on our side was by mr stanton and though he took but about three hours in its delivery he had devoted as many if not more weeks to its preparation it was very able and mr lincoln was throughout the whole of it a rapt listener mr stanton closed his speech in a flight of impassioned eloquence then the court adjourned for the day and mr lincoln invited me to take a long walk with him for block after block he walked rapidly forward not saying a word evidently deeply dejected at last he turned suddenly to me exclaiming emerson i am going home a pause i am going home to study law why i exclaimed 
mr lincoln you stand at the head of the bar in illinois now what are you talking about ah yes he said i do occupy a good position there and i think that i can get along with the way things are done there now but these college-trained men who have devoted their whole lives to study are coming west don't you see and they study their cases as we never do they've got as far as cincinnati now they will soon be in illinois another long pause then stopping and turning toward me his countenance suddenly assuming that look of strong determination which those who knew him best sometimes saw upon his face he exclaimed i am going home to study law i am as good as any of them and when they get out to illinois i will be ready for them the fee which lincoln received in the mccormick case including the retainer which was five hundred dollars the largest retainer ever received by lincoln amounted to nearly two thousand dollars except the sum paid him by the illinois central railroad it was probably the largest fee he ever received the two sums came to him about the same time and undoubtedly helped to tide over the rather unfruitful period from a financial standpoint which followed the period of his contest with douglas for the senate lincoln never made money from eighteen fifty to eighteen sixty his income averaged from two thousand to three thousand dollars a year in the forties it was considerably less the fee book of lincoln and herndon for eighteen forty seven shows total earnings of only fifteen hundred dollars the largest fee entered was one of one hundred dollars there are several of fifty dollars a number of twenty more of ten still more of five and a few of three dollars but lincoln's fees were as a rule smaller than his clients expected or his fellow lawyers approved of mr abraham brokaw of bloomington illinois tells the following story illustrating lincoln's idea of a proper fee one of mr brokaw's neighbors had borrowed about five hundred dollars from him and given his note when it became due the man refused to pay action was brought and the sheriff levied on the property of the debtor and finally collected the entire debt but at about that time the sheriff was in need of funds and used the money collected when brokaw demanded it from him he was unable to pay it and found to be insolvent thereupon brokaw employed stephen a douglas to sue the sureties on the official bond of the sheriff douglas brought the suit and soon collected the claim but douglas was at that time in the midst of a campaign for congress and the funds were used by him with the expectation of being able to pay brokaw later however he neglected the matter and went to washington without making any settlement brokaw although a lifelong and ardent democrat and a great admirer of douglas was a thrifty german and did not propose to lose sight of his money after fruitlessly demanding the money from douglas brokaw went to david davis then in general practice at bloomington told him the circumstances and asked him to undertake the collection of the money from douglas davis protested that he could not do it that douglas was a personal friend and a brother lawyer and democrat and it would be very disagreeable for him to have anything to do with the matter he finally said to brokaw you wait until the next term of court and lincoln will be here he would like nothing better than to have this claim for collection i will introduce you to him and i have no doubt he will undertake it shortly after brokaw was presented to lincoln stated his case and engaged his services lincoln promptly wrote douglas still at washington that he had the claim for collection and that he must insist upon prompt payment douglas very indignant wrote directly to brokaw that he thought the placing of the claim in lincoln's hands a gross outrage that he and brokaw were old friends and democrats and that brokaw ought not to place any such weapon in the hands of such an abolitionist opponent as lincoln and if he could not wait until douglas returned he should at least have placed the claim for collection in the hands of a democrat brokaw's thrift again controlled and he sent douglas's letter to lincoln thereupon lincoln placed the claim in the hands of long john wentworth then a democratic member of congress from chicago wentworth called upon douglas and insisted upon payment which shortly after was made and brokaw at last received his money 
"'And what do you suppose Lincoln charged me?' Brokaw says in telling the story. After hearing a few guesses, he answers, "'He charged me exactly three dollars and fifty cents for collecting nearly six hundred dollars.' Such charges were felt by the lawyers of the Eighth Circuit, with some reason, to be purely quixotic. They protested and argued, but Lincoln went on serenely charging what he thought his services worth. Ward Lehman, who was one of Lincoln's numerous circuit partners, says that he and Lincoln frequently fell out on the matter of fees. On one occasion, Lehman was particularly incensed. He had charged and received a good-sized fee for a case which the two had tried together and won. When Lehman offered Lincoln his share, he refused it. The fee was too large, he said. Part of it must be refunded, and he would not accept a cent until part of it had been refunded. Judge Davis heard of this transaction. He was himself a shrewd money-maker, never hesitating to take all he could legally get and he felt strong disgust at this disinterested attitude about money. Calling Lincoln to him, the judge scolded roundly. "'You are pauperizing this court, Mr. Lincoln. You are ruining your fellows. Unless you quit this ridiculous policy, we shall all have to go to farming.' But not even the ire of the bench moved Lincoln. If a fee was not paid, Lincoln did not believe in suing for it. Mr. Herndon says that he would consent to be swindled before he would contest a fee. The case of the Illinois Central Railroad, however, was an exception to this rule. He was careless in accounts, never entering anything on the book. When a fee was paid to him, he simply divided the money into two parts, one of which he put into his pocket and the other into an envelope which he labeled Herndon's half. Lincoln's whole theory of the conduct of a lawyer in regard to money is summed up in the notes for a law lecture which he left among his papers. The matter of fees is important, far beyond the mere question of bread and butter involved. Properly attended to, fuller justice is done to both lawyer and client. An exorbitant fee should never be claimed. As a general rule, never take your whole fee in advance, nor any more than a small retainer. When fully paid beforehand, you are more than a common mortal if you can feel the same interest in the case, as if something was still in prospect for you, as well as for your client. And when you lack interest in the case, the job will very likely lack skill and diligence in the performance. Settle the amount of fee and take a note in advance. Then you will feel that you are working for something, and you are sure to do your work faithfully and well. Never sell a fee note, at least not before the consideration service is performed. It leads to negligence and dishonesty, negligence by losing interest in the case, and dishonesty in refusing to refund when you have allowed the consideration to fail. If a client was poor, and Lincoln's sympathies were aroused, he not infrequently refused pay. There are a few well-authenticated cases of his offering his services to those whom he believed he could help, stipulating when he did it that he would make no charge. The best-known example of this is the Armstrong murder case. William, or Duff Armstrong, as he was generally called, was the son of Lincoln's New Salem friends, Jack and Hannah Armstrong. In August 1857, Duff and a number of his mates had joined a crowd of ruffians who had gathered on the outskirts of a camp meeting held near Havana in Macon County. He had drunk heavily for some days, and finally, in a broil on the night of August 29th, had beaten a comrade, one Metzger, who had provoked him to a fight. That same night, Metzger was hit with an ox yoke by another drunken reveler, Norris by name. Three days later, he died. Both Armstrong and Norris were arrested. Marks of two blows were on the victim, either of which might have killed him. That Norris had dealt one was proved. Did Armstrong deal the other? He claimed he had used nothing but his fists in the broil, but both the marks on Metzger were such as must have been made by some instrument. The theory was developed that one blow was from a slung shot used by Armstrong, and that he and Norris had acted in concert, deliberately planning to murder Metzger. Outraged by the cruelty of the deed, the whole countryside demanded the punishment of the prisoners. 
just at the time that armstrong was thrown into prison his father died his last charge to his wife hannah being sell everything you have and clear duff true to her trust hannah engaged two lawyers of havana both of whom are still living to defend her boy anxious lest the violence of public feeling should injure duff's chances the lawyers secured a change of venue to cass county their client remaining in prison until spring norris in the meantime was convicted and sentenced to eight years in the penitentiary when the lawyers and the witnesses assembled in beardstown may eighteen fifty eight for armstrong's trial it happened that lincoln was attending court in the town at that moment he was after stephen a douglas the most conspicuous man in illinois his future course in politics was a source of interest in the east as well as the west the coming contest with douglas for the senatorship for it was already probable that he would be the candidate in the convention which was only a month away was causing him intense anxiety yet occupied as he was with his profession and harassed by the critical political situation he did not hesitate an instant when hannah armstrong came to him for advice going to her lawyers he said he should like to assist them they of course were glad of his aid and he at once took the case in hand his first care was the selection of a jury not knowing the neighborhood well he could not discriminate closely as to individuals but he took pains as far as he could control the choice to have only young men chosen believing that they would be more favorable to the prisoner a surviving witness in the case estimates that the average age of the jury was not over twenty-three years the jury impaneled the examination of witnesses seems to have been conducted on behalf of the defense chiefly by lincoln many of the witnesses bore familiar names some were sons of clary's grove boys and lincoln had known their fathers the witnesses were kept out of the courtroom until called to testify says william a douglas i happened to be the first witness called and so heard the whole trial when william killian was called to the stand lincoln asked him his name william killian was the reply bill killian lincoln repeated in a familiar way tell me are you a son of old jake killian yes sir answered the witness well said lincoln somewhat aside you are a smart boy if you take after your dad as the trial developed it became evident that there could have been no collusion between armstrong and norris but there was strong evidence that armstrong had used a slung shot the most damaging evidence was that of one allen who swore that he had seen armstrong strike metzger about ten or eleven o'clock in the evening when asked how he could see he answered that the moon shone brightly under lincoln's questioning he repeated the statement until it was impossible that the jury should forget it with allen's testimony unimpeached conviction seemed certain lincoln's address to the jury was full of genuine pathos it was not as a hired attorney that he was there he said but to discharge a debt of friendship uncle abe says duff armstrong himself did his best talking when he told the jury what true friends my father and mother had been to him in the early days he told how he used to go out to jack armstrong's and stay for days how kind mother was to him and how many a time he had rocked me to sleep in the old cradle but lincoln was not relying on sympathy alone to win his case in closing he reviewed the evidence showing that all depended on allen's testimony and this he said he could prove to be false allen never saw armstrong strike metzger by the light of the moon for at the hour when he said he saw the fight between ten and eleven o'clock the moon was not in the heavens then producing an almanac he passed it to the judge and jury the moon which was on that night only in its first quarter had set before midnight this unexpected overthrow of the testimony by which lincoln had taken care that the jury should be most deeply impressed threw them into confusion there was a complete change of feeling lincoln saw it and as he finished his address and the jury left the room turning to the boy's mother he said aunt hannah your son will be free before sundown Lincoln had not misread his jury. Duff Armstrong was discharged as not guilty. 
there has long been a story current that the dramatic introduction of the almanac by which certainly the audience and jury were won was a pure piece of trickery on lincoln's part that the almanac was not one of eighteen fifty seven but of eighteen fifty three in which the figure three had been changed throughout to seven the best reply to this charge of forgery is the very evident one that it was utterly unnecessary the almanac for august eighteen fifty seven shows that the moon was exactly in the position where it served lincoln's client's interests best he did not need to forge an almanac the one of the period being all that he could want another murder case in which lincoln defended the accused occurred in august eighteen fifty nine the victim was a student in his own law office greek crafton the murderer peachy harrison was the grandson of lincoln's old political antagonist peter cartwright both young men were connected with the best families of the county the brother of one was married to the sister of the other they had been lifelong friends in an altercation upon some political question hot words were exchanged and harrison beside himself stabbed crafton who three days later died from the wound the best-known lawyers of the state were engaged for the case senator john m palmer and general a mcclernand were on the side of the prosecution among those who represented the defendant were lincoln herndon logan and senator shelby m cullum the tragic pathos of a case which involved as this did the deepest affections of almost an entire community reached its climax in the appearance in court of the venerable peter cartwright no face in illinois was better known than his no life had been spent in a more relentless war on evil eccentric and aggressive as he was he was honored far and wide and when he arose in the witness-stand his white hair crowned with this cruel sorrow the most indifferent spectator felt that this examination would be unbearable it fell to lincoln to question cartwright with the rarest gentleness he began to put his questions how long have you known the prisoner cartwright's head dropped on his breast for a moment then straightening himself he passed his hand across his eyes and answered in a deep quavering voice i have known him since a babe he laughed and cried on my knee the examination ended by lincoln drawing from the witness the story of how crafton had said to him just before his death i am dying i will soon part with all i love on earth and i want you to say to my slayer that i forgive him i want to leave this earth with a forgiveness of all who have in any way injured me this examination made a profound impression on the jury lincoln closed his argument by picturing the scene anew appealing to the jury to practice the same forgiving spirit that the murdered man had shown on his deathbed it was undoubtedly to his handling of the grandfather's evidence that harrison's acquittal was due a class of legal work which lincoln enjoyed particularly was that in which mathematical or mechanical problems were involved he never lost interest in his youthful pot-boiling profession of surveying and would go out himself to make sure of boundaries if a client's case required particular investigation indeed he was generally recognized by his fellow lawyers as an authority in surveying and as late as eighteen fifty nine his opinion on a disputed question was sought by a convention of surveyors who had met in springfield one of the most interesting cases involving mechanical problems which lincoln ever argued was that of the rock island bridge it was not however the calculations he used which made it striking the case was a dramatic episode in the war long waged by the mississippi against the plains beyond for decades the river had been the willing burden-bearer of the west now however the railroad had come the rock island road had even dared to bridge the stream to carry away the traffic which the river claimed in may eighteen fifty six a steamboat struck one of the piers of the bridge and was wrecked and burned one pier of the bridge was also destroyed the boat owners sued the railroad company the suit was the beginning of the long and violent struggle for commercial supremacy between st louis and chicago in chicago it was commonly believed that the st louis chamber of commerce had bribed the captain of the boat to run upon the pier 
and it was said that later when the bridge itself was burned the steamers gathered near and whistled for joy the case was felt to involve the future course of western commerce and when it was called in september eighteen fifty seven at chicago people crowded there from all over the west norman b judd afterwards so prominent in the politics of the state was the attorney of the road and he engaged lincoln among others as counsel lincoln made an address to the jury which those who remember it declare to have been one of his strongest legal arguments the two points relied upon by the opponents of the bridge says judge blodgett of chicago were first that the river was the great waterway for the commerce of the valley and could not legally be obstructed by a bridge second that this particular bridge was so located with reference to the channel of the river at that point as to make it a peril to all watercraft navigating the river and an unnecessary obstruction to navigation the first proposition had not at that time been directly passed upon by the supreme court of the united states although the wheeling bridge case involved the question but the court had evaded a decision upon it by holding that the wheeling bridge was so low as to be an unnecessary obstruction to the use of the bridge by steamboats the discussion of the first proposition on the part of the bridge company devolved mainly upon mr abraham lincoln i listened with much interest to his argument on this point and while i was not impressed by it as a specially eloquent effort as the word eloquent is generally understood i have always considered it as one of the ablest efforts i ever heard from mr lincoln at the bar his illustrations were apt and forcible his statements clear and logical and his reasons in favor of the policy and necessarily the right to bridge the river and thereby encourage the settlement and building up of the vast area of fertile country to the west of it were broad and statesmanlike the pith of his argument was in his statement that one man has as good a right to cross a river as another had to sail up or down it that these were equal and mutual rights which must be exercised so as not to interfere with each other like the right to cross a street or highway and the right to pass along it from this undeniable right to cross the river he then proceeded to discuss the means for crossing must it always be by canoe or ferry-boat must the products of all the boundless fertile country lying west of the river for all time be compelled to stop on its western bank be unloaded from the cars and loaded upon a boat and after the transit across the river be reloaded into cars on the other side to continue their journey east in this connection he drew a vivid picture of the future of the great west lying beyond the river and argued that the necessities of commerce demanded that the bridges across the river be a conceded right which the steamboat interests ought not to be allowed to successfully resist and thereby stay the progress of development and civilization in the region to the west while i cannot recall a word or sentence of the argument i well remember its effect on all who listened to it and the decision of the court fully sustained the right to bridge so long as it did not unnecessarily obstruct navigation all the papers in regard to the trial are supposed to have been burned in the chicago fire of eighteen seventy one but the speech which was reported by congressman hitt of illinois at that time court stenographer was published on september twenty fourth eighteen fifty seven in the chicago daily press afterwards united with the tribune according to this report the first part of the speech was devoted to the points judge blodgett outlines the second part was given to a careful explanation of the currents of the mississippi at the point where the bridge crossed lincoln succeeded in showing that had the pilot of the boat been as familiar as he ought to have been with the river he could easily have prevented the accident his argument was full of nice mathematical calculations clearly put and was marked by perfect candor indeed the honesty with which he admitted the points made by the opposite counsel caused considerable alarm to some of his associates mrs norman b judd mr judd was the attorney of the road says that mr joseph b knox who was also engaged with mr lincoln in the defense dined at her house the day that lincoln made his speech he sat down at the dinner table in great excitement writes mrs judd saying lincoln has lost the case for us 
the admissions he made in regard to the currents in the mississippi at rock island and moline will convince the court that a bridge at that point will always be a serious and constant detriment to navigation on the river wait until you hear the conclusion of his speech replied mr judd you will find his admission is a strong point instead of a weak one and on it he will found a strong argument that will satisfy you and as it proved mr judd was right the few cases briefly outlined here show something of the range of lincoln's legal work they show that not only his friends like hannah armstrong believed in his power with a jury but that great corporations like the illinois central railroad were willing to trust their affairs in his hands that he was not only a jury lawyer as has often been stated but trusted when it came to questions of law pure and simple if this study of his cases were continued it would only be to accumulate evidence to prove that lincoln was considered by his contemporaries one of the best lawyers of illinois it is worth notice too that he made his reputation as a lawyer and tried his greatest cases before his debate with douglas gave him a national reputation it was in eighteen fifty five that the illinois central engaged him first as counsel in eighteen fifty five that he went to cincinnati on the mccormick case in eighteen fifty seven that he tried the rock island bridge case thus his place was won purely on his legal ability unaided by political prestige his success came too in middle life lincoln was forty years old in eighteen forty nine when he abandoned politics definitely as he thought for the law he tried his greatest cases when he was from forty five to forty eight. End of section sixteen. Section seventeen of the Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume One, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter seventeen Lincoln re enters politics. From 1849 to 1854, Abraham Lincoln gave almost his entire time to his profession. Politics received from him only the attention which any public-spirited citizen, without personal ambition, should give. He kept close watch upon federal, state, and local affairs. He was active in the efforts made in Illinois in 1851 to secure a more thorough party organization in eighteen fifty two he was on the scott electoral ticket and did some canvassing but this was all he was yearly becoming more absorbed in his legal work losing more and more of his old inclination for politics when in may eighteen fifty four the repeal of the missouri compromise aroused him as he had never been before in all his life the missouri compromise was the second in that series of noble provisions for making new territory free territory which liberty-loving men have wrested from the United States Congress whenever the thirst for expansion has seized this country. The first of these was the Ordinance of 1787, prohibiting slavery in all the great Northwest Territory. The second, the Missouri Compromise, passed in 1820, was the result of a struggle to keep the Louisiana Purchase free it provided that missouri might come in as a slave state if slavery was never allowed north of thirty six degrees thirty minutes north latitude the next great expansion of the united states after the louisiana purchase resulted from the annexation of texas and of territory acquired by the mexican war the north was determined that this new territory should be free the south wanted it for slaves the struggle between them threatened the union for a time but it was adjusted by the compromise of eighteen fifty in which according to mr lincoln's summing up the south got their new fugitive slave law and the north got california by far the best part of our acquisition from mexico as a free state the south got a provision that new mexico and utah when admitted as states may come in with or without slavery as they may then choose and the north got the slave trade abolished in the district of columbia the north got the western boundary of texas thrown farther back eastward than the south desired but in turn they gave texas ten millions of dollars with which to pay her old debts for three years matters were quiet then nebraska sought territorial organization now by the missouri compromise slavery was forbidden in that section of the union 
but in spite of this fact stephen a douglas then a member of the senate of the united states introduced a bill to give nebraska and kansas the desired government to which later he added an amendment repealing the missouri compromise and permitting the people who should settle in the new territories to reject or establish slavery as they should see fit it was the passage of this bill which brought abraham lincoln from the courtroom to the stump his friend richard yates was running for re-election to congress lincoln began to speak for him but in accepting invitations he stipulated that it should be against the kansas nebraska bill that he talk his earnestness surprised his friends lincoln was coming back into politics they said and when douglas the author of the repeal was announced to speak in springfield in october of eighteen fifty four they called on lincoln to meet him douglas was having a serious struggle to reconcile his illinois constituency all the free sentiment of the state had been bitterly aroused by his part in the repeal of the missouri compromise and when he first returned to illinois it looked as if he would not be given even a hearing indeed when he first attempted to speak in chicago september first he was hooted from the platform with every day in the state however he won back his friends so great was his power over men and he was beginning to arouse something of his old enthusiasm when he went to springfield to speak at the annual state fair there was a great crowd present from all parts of the state and douglas spoke for three hours when he closed it was announced that lincoln would answer him the next day lincoln's friends expected him to do well in his reply but his speech was a surprise even to those who knew him best it was profound finished vigorous eloquent when had he mastered the history of the slavery question so completely they asked each other the anti-Nebraska speech of Mr. Lincoln, said the Springfield Journal the next day, was the profoundest, in our opinion, that he has made in his whole life. He felt upon his soul the truth's burn which he uttered, and all present felt that he was true to his own soul. His feelings once or twice swelled within, and came near stifling utterance. He quivered with emotion. The whole house was as still as death he attacked the nebraska bill with unusual warmth and energy and all felt that a man of strength was its enemy and that he intended to blast it if he could by strong and manly efforts he was most successful and the house approved the glorious triumph of truth by loud and continued huzzas the vigor and earnestness of lincoln's speech aroused the crowd to such enthusiasm that senator douglas felt obliged to reply to him the next day these speeches of october third fourth and fifth eighteen fifty four form really the first of the series of lincoln douglas debates they proved conclusively to the anti-nebraska politicians in illinois that lincoln was to be their leader in the fight they had begun against the extension of slavery although the speech of october fourth was not preserved we know from paul selby at that time editor of an independent paper in jacksonville illinois which had been working hard against the repeal of the missouri compromise that lincoln's speech at springfield was practically the same as one delivered twelve days later at peoria in reply to douglas of this latter a full report was preserved in his reply at peoria lincoln began by a brief but sufficient resume of the efforts of the north to apply the declaration of independence to all new territory which it acquired and failing in that to provide for the sake of peace a series of compromises reserving as much territory as possible to freedom he showed that the kansas nebraska bill was a direct violation of one of the greatest of these solemn compromises this he declared was wrong wrong in its direct effect letting slavery into kansas and nebraska and wrong in its prospective principle allowing it to spread to every other part of the wide world where men can be found inclined to take it this declared indifference but as i must think covert real zeal for the spread of slavery i cannot but hate i hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself i hate it because it deprives our republican example of its just influence in the world enables the enemies of free institutions with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrites 
causes the real friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity and especially because it forces so many men among ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principles of civil liberty criticizing the declaration of independence and insisting that there is no right principle of action but self-interest disavowing all prejudice against the southern people he generously declared they are just what we would be in their situation if slavery did not exist among them they would not introduce it if it did now exist among us we should not instantly give it up i surely will not blame them for not doing what i should not know how to do myself if all earthly power were given me i should not know what to do as to the existing institution my first impulse would be to free all the slaves and send them to liberia to their own native land but a moment's reflection would convince me that whatever of high hope there may be in this in the long run its sudden execution is impossible if they were all landed there in a day they would all perish in the next ten days and there are not surplus shipping and surplus money enough to carry them there in many times ten days i think i would not hold one in slavery at any rate yet the point is not clear enough for me to denounce people upon it does seem to me that systems of gradual emancipation might be adopted but for their tardiness in this i will not undertake to judge our brethren of the south the law which forbids the bringing of slaves from africa and that which has so long forbidden the taking of them into nebraska can hardly be distinguished on any moral principle and the repeal of the former could find quite as plausible excuses as that of the latter taking up the arguments by which the appeal of the missouri compromise was justified he answered them one by one with clearness and a great array of facts the chief of these arguments was that the repeal was in the interest of the sacred right of self-government and that the people of nebraska had a right to govern themselves as they chose voting for or against slavery as they pleased the doctrine of self-government is right lincoln said absolutely and eternally right but it has no just application as here attempted or perhaps i should rather say that whether it has such application depends on whether a negro is not or is a man if he is not a man in that case he who is a man may as a matter of self-government do just what he pleases with him but if the negro is a man is it not to that extent a total destruction of self-government to say that he too shall not govern himself when the white man governs himself that is self-government but when he governs himself and also governs another man that is more than self-government that is despotism if the negro is a man why then my ancient faith teaches me that all men are created equal and that there can be no moral right in connection with one man's making a slave of another judge douglas frequently with bitter irony and sarcasm paraphrases our argument by saying the white people of nebraska are good enough to govern themselves but they are not good enough to govern a few miserable negroes well i doubt not that the people of nebraska are and will continue to be as good as the average of people elsewhere i do not say the contrary what i do say is that no man is good enough to govern another man without that other's consent i say this is the leading principle the sheet anchor of american republicanism this peoria speech which is very long is particularly interesting to students of mr lincoln's speeches because in it is found the germ of many of the arguments which he elaborated in the next six years and used with tremendous effect with the peoria speech douglas had had enough of lincoln as an antagonist and he made a compact with him that neither should speak again in the campaign it was characteristic of douglas that on his way to chicago he should stop and deliver a speech at princeton but though lincoln had temporarily withdrawn from the stump he was by no means abandoning the struggle the iniquity of the kansas nebraska bill grew greater to him every day he meant to fight it to the end and he wanted to go where he could fight it directly he became a candidate for the general assembly of illinois from sangamon county and was elected by a large majority in november 
a little later he saw an opportunity for a larger position although illinois was strongly democratic the revolt against the nebraska bill had driven from the party a number of men members of the legislature who had signified their determination to vote only for an anti-nebraska senator this gave the whigs a chance and several candidates offered themselves among them lincoln resigning from the legislature members of the legislature could not become candidates for the senatorship he began his electioneering in the frank western style of those days by requesting his friends to support him i have really got it into my head to try to be united states senator he wrote his friend gillespie and if i could have your support my chances would be reasonably good but i know and acknowledge that you have as just claims to the place as i have and therefore i cannot ask you to yield to me if you are thinking of becoming a candidate yourself if however you are not then i should like to be remembered affectionately by you and also to have you make a mark for me with the anti-nebraska members down your way he sent a large number of similar letters to friends and by the first of january when the legislature reassembled he felt his chances of election were good i have more committals than any other man he wrote his friend washburn nevertheless he failed of the election just how he explained to washburn early in february i began with forty-four votes shields democratic forty-one and trumbull anti-nebraska five yet trumbull was elected in fact forty-seven different members voted for me getting three new ones on the second ballot and losing four old ones how came my forty-seven to yield to trumbull's five it was governor madison's work he has been secretly a candidate ever since before even the fall election all the members round about the canal were anti-nebraska but were nevertheless nearly all democrats and old personal friends of his his plan was to privately impress them with the belief that he was as good anti-nebraska as anyone else at least could be secured to be so by instructions which could be easily passed the nebraska men of course were not for madison but when they found out they could elect no avowed nebraska man they tardily determined to let him get whomever of our men he could by whatever means he could and ask him no questions the nebraska men were very confident of the election of madison though denying that he was a candidate and we very much believing also that they would elect him but they wanted first to make a show of good faith to shields by voting for him a few times and our secret madison men also wanted to make a show of good faith by voting with us a few times so we let off on the seventh ballot i think the signal was given to the nebraska men to turn to madison which they acted on to a man with one exception next ballot the remaining nebraska man and one pretended anti went over to him giving him forty-six the next still another giving him forty-seven wanting only three of an election in the meantime our friends with a view of detaining our expected bolters had been turning from me to trumbull till he had risen to thirty-five and i had been reduced to fifteen these would never desert me except by my direction but i became satisfied that if we could prevent madison's election one or two ballots more we could not possibly do so a single ballot after my friend should begin to return to me from trumbull so i determined to strike at once and accordingly advised my remaining friends to go for him which they did and elected him on the tenth ballot such is the way the thing was done i think you would have done the same under the circumstances i could have headed off every combination and been elected had it not been for madison's double game and his defeat now gives me more pleasure than my own gives me pain on the whole it is perhaps as well for our general cause that trumbull is elected the nebraska men confess that they hate it worse than anything that that could have happened it is a great consolation to see them worse whipped than i am not only had lincoln made the leading orator of the nebraska cry enough he had by his quick wit and his devotion to the cause secured an anti-nebraska senator for the state although for the time being campaigning was over lincoln by no means dropped the subject the struggle between north and south over the settlement of kansas grew every day more bitter 
violence was beginning and it was evident that if the people of the new territory should vote to make the state free it would be impossible to enforce the decision without bloodshed lincoln watched the developments with a growing determination never to submit to the repeal of the missouri compromise he would advocate its restoration so long as kansas remained a territory and if it ever sought to enter the union as a slave state he would oppose it he discussed the subject incessantly with his friends as he travelled the circuit and wrestled with it day and night in solitude a new conviction was gradually growing upon him he had long held that slavery was wrong but that it could not be touched in the state where it was recognized by the constitution all that the free states could require in his judgment was that no new territory should be open to slavery he held that all compromises adjusting difficulties between the north and south on the slavery question were as sacred as the constitution now he saw the most important of them all violated was it possible to devise a compromise which would settle forever the conflicting interests he turned over this question continually judge t lyle dickey of illinois once told the hon william pitt kellogg that when the excitement over the kansas nebraska bill first broke out he was with lincoln and several friends attending court one evening several persons including himself and lincoln were discussing the slavery question judge dickey contended that slavery was an institution which the constitution recognized and which could not be disturbed lincoln argued that ultimately slavery must become extinct after a while said judge dickey we went upstairs to bed there were two beds in our room and i remember that lincoln sat up in his nightshirt on the edge of the bed arguing the point with me at last we went to sleep early in the morning i woke up and there was lincoln half sitting up in bed dickey he said i tell you this nation cannot exist half slave and half free oh lincoln said i go to sleep as the months went on this idea took deeper root and in august eighteen fifty five we find it expressed in a letter to george robertson of kentucky our political problem now is can we as a nation continue together permanently forever half slave and half free the problem is too mighty for me may god in his mercy superintend the solution not only was he beginning to see that the union could not exist divided against itself he was beginning to see that in order to fight effectively against the repeal of the missouri compromise and the admission of kansas as a slave state he might be obliged to abandon the whigs all his life he had been a loyal henry clay whig ardent in his devotion to the party sincerely attached to its principles his friends were of that party and never had a man's party friends been more willing than his to aid his ambition but the whigs were afraid of the anti-nebraska agitation was he being forced from his party he hardly knew i think i am a whig he wrote his friend speed who had inquired where he stood but others say there are no whigs and that i am an abolitionist this was in august eighteen fifty five the events of the next few months showed him that he must stand by the body of men of all parties whig democratic abolition free soil who opposed the repeal of the missouri compromise and were slowly uniting into the new republican party to fight it the first decisive step to organize these elements in illinois was an editorial convention held on february twenty second eighteen fifty six at decatur one of the editors interested paul selby relates the history of the convention in an unpublished manuscript on the formation of the republican party in illinois from which the following account is quoted this movement first suggested by the morgan journal at jacksonville having received the approval of a considerable number of the anti-nebraska papers of the state resulted in the issue of the following call editorial convention all editors in illinois opposed to the nebraska bill are requested to meet in convention at decatur illinois on the twenty second of february next for the purpose of making arrangements for organizing the anti-nebraska forces in this state for the coming contest 
all editors favoring the movement will please forward a copy of their paper containing their approval to the office of illinois state chronicle decatur twenty-five papers endorse the call but on the day of the meeting only about half that number of editors put in an appearance one reason for the small number was the fact that on the night before a heavy snowstorm had fallen throughout the state obstructing the passage of trains on the two railroads centering at decatur the meeting was held in the parlor of the castle house afterwards the oglesby house now called the st nicholas hotel those present and participating in the opening proceedings as shown by the official report were e c dougherty register rockford charles faxon post princeton a n ford gazette lakin thomas j pickett republican peoria virgil y ralston whig quincy charles h ray tribune chicago george schneider Staats zeitung chicago paul selby journal jacksonville b f shaw telegraph dixon w j usry chronicle decatur and o p wharton advertiser rock island in the organization paul selby was made chairman and w j usry secretary while messrs ralston ray wharton dougherty prickett and schneider constituted a committee on resolutions the platform adopted as a basis of common and concerted action among the members of the new organization embraced a declaration of principles that would be regarded in this day as most conservative republicanism recognizing the legal rights of the slave states to hold and enjoy their property in slaves under their state laws reaffirming the principles of the declaration of independence with its correlative doctrine that freedom is national and slavery sectional declaring assumption of the right to extend slavery on the plea that it is essential to the security of the institution an invasion of our rights which must be resisted demanding the restoration of the missouri compromise and the restriction of slavery to its present authorized limits advocating the maintenance of the naturalization laws as they are and favoring the widest tolerance in matters of religion and faith a rebuke to know nothingism pledging resistance to assaults upon the common school system and closing with a demand for reformation in the administration of the state government as second only in importance to the question of slavery itself mr lincoln was present in decatur during the day and although he did not take part in the public deliberations of the convention he was in close conference with the committee on resolutions and the impress of his hand is seen in the character of the platform adopted messrs ray and schneider of the chicago press were also influential factors in shaping the declaration of principles with which the new party in illinois started on its long career of almost uninterrupted success the day's proceedings ended with a complimentary banquet given to the editors at the same hotel by the citizens of decatur speeches were made in response to toasts by mr lincoln r j oglesby afterwards major-general of volunteers and three times governor of illinois then a young lawyer of decatur ray of the chicago tribune ralston of the quincy whig and others among the editors in the course of his speech referring to a movement which some of the editors present had inaugurated to make him the anti-nebraska candidate for governor at the ensuing election mr lincoln spoke in substance as follows i wish to say why i should not be a candidate if i should be chosen the democrats would say it was nothing more than an attempt to resurrect the dead body of the old whig party i would secure the vote of that party and no more and our defeat will follow as a matter of course but i can suggest a name that will secure not only the old whig vote but enough anti-nebraska democrats to give us the victory that man is colonel william h bissell here mr lincoln again displayed his characteristic unselfishness and sagacity that he would at that time have regarded an election to the governorship of the great state of illinois as an honor not worth contending for will scarcely be presumed he was seeking more important results however in the interest of freedom and good government 
the ending of the political chaos that had prevailed for the past two years and the consolidation of the forces opposed to slavery extension in a compact political organization bissell had been an officer in the mexican war with a good record had afterwards as a member of congress from the bellevue district opposed the kansas nebraska bill and had refused to be browbeaten by jefferson davis into the retraction of statements he had made on the floor of congress as will appear later he was nominated and lincoln's judgment vindicated by his election and the unification of the elements which afterwards composed the republican party one of the last acts of the editorial convention was the appointment of a state central committee consisting of one member for each congressional district and two for the state at large some of the names were suggested by mr lincoln while others received his approval a supplementary resolution recommended the holding of a state convention at bloomington on the twenty ninth of may following and requested the committee just appointed to issue the necessary call it is a coincidence of some interest that on the day the illinois editors were in session at decatur a convention of representatives from different states with a similar object in view for the country at large was in session at pittsburgh pennsylvania the latter was presided over by the venerable francis p blair of maryland while among its most prominent members appear such names as those of governor e d morgan of new york horace greeley preston king david wilmot oliver p morton joshua r giddings zachariah chandler and many others of national reputation a national committee there appointed called the first national convention of the republican party held at philadelphia on the seventeenth of june in the interval between the decatur meeting and the bloomington convention called for may twenty ninth the excitement in the county over kansas grew almost to a frenzy the new state was in the hands of a pro-slavery mob her governor a prisoner her capital in ruins her voters intimidated the newspapers were full of accounts of the attack on sumner in the united states senate by brooks one of the very men who had been expected to be a leader in the bloomington convention paul selby was lying at home prostrated by a cowardly blow from a political opponent little wonder then that when the convention met its members were resolved to take radical action the convention was opened with john m palmer afterwards united states senator in its chair and in a very short time it had adopted a platform appointed delegates to the national convention nominated a state ticket completed in short all the work of organizing the republican party in illinois after this work of organizing and nominating was finished there was a call for speeches the convention felt the need of some powerful amalgamating force which would wield its discordant elements in spite of the best intentions of the members their most manful efforts they knew in their hearts that they were still political enemies that the whig was still a whig the democrat a democrat the abolitionist an abolitionist man after man was called to the platform and spoke without producing any marked effect when suddenly there was a call raised of a name not on the program lincoln lincoln give us lincoln the crowd took it up and made the hall ring until a tall figure rose in the back of the audience and slowly strode down the aisle as he turned to his audience there came gradually a great change upon his face there was an expression of intense emotion judge scott of bloomington once told the author it was the emotion of a great soul even in stature he seemed greater he seemed to realize it was a crisis in his life lincoln in fact had come to the parting of the ways in his political life to the moment when he must publicly break with his party for two years he had tried to fight slavery extension under the name of a whig he had found it could not be done and now in spite of the efforts of his conservative friends who had vainly tried to keep him away from the bloomington convention he was facing that convention was openly acknowledging that henceforth he worked with the republican party lincoln's extraordinary human insight and sympathy told him as he looked at his audience that what this body of splendid 
earnest but groping men needed was to feel that they had undertaken a cause of such transcendent value that beside it all previous alliances ambitions and duties were as nothing if he could make them see the triviality of their differences as compared with the tremendous principle of the new party he was certain they would go forth republicans in spirit as well as in name he began his speech then deeply moved and with a profound sense of the importance of the moment at first he spoke slowly and haltingly but gradually he grew in force and intensity until his hearers arose from their chairs and with pale faces and quivering lips pressed unconsciously towards him starting from the back of the broad platform on which he stood his hands on his hips he slowly advanced towards the front his eyes blazing his face white with passion his voice resonant with the force of his conviction as he advanced he seemed to his audience fairly to grow and when at the end of a period he stood at the front line of the stage hands still on the hips head back raised on his tiptoes he seemed like a giant inspired at that moment he was the handsomest man i ever saw judge scott declared so powerful was his effect on his audience that men and women wept as they cheered and children there that night still remember the scene though at the time they understood nothing of its meaning as he went on there came upon the convention the very emotion he sought to arouse every one in that before incongruous assembly came to feel as one man to think as one man and to purpose and resolve as one man says one of his auditors he had made every one of them pure republican he did something more the indignation which the outrages in kansas and throughout the country had aroused was uncontrolled men talked passionately of war it was at this meeting that lincoln after firing his hearers by an expression which became a watchword of the campaign we won't go out of the union and you shan't poured oil on the wrath of the illinois opponents of the nebraska bill by advising ballots not bullets nothing illustrates better the extraordinary power of lincoln's speech at bloomington than the way he stirred up the newspaper reporters it was before the stenographer had become acclimated in illinois the longhand reports were regularly taken of course all the leading papers of the state leaning towards the new party had reporters at the convention among these was mr joseph medill it was my journalistic duty says mr medill though a delegate to the convention to make a longhand report of the speeches delivered for the chicago tribune i did make a few paragraphs of what lincoln said in the first eight or ten minutes but i became so absorbed in his magnetic oratory that i forgot myself and ceased to take notes and joined with the convention in cheering and stamping and clapping to the end of his speech i well remember that after lincoln sat down and calm had succeeded the tempest i waked out of a sort of hypnotic trance and then thought of my report for the tribune there was nothing written but an abbreviated introduction it was some sort of satisfaction to find that i had not been scooped as all the newspaper men present had been equally carried away by the excitement caused by the wonderful oration and had made no report or sketch of the speech a number of lincoln's friends young lawyers most of them were accustomed to taking notes of speeches and as usual sharpened their pencils as he began i attempted for about fifteen minutes says mr herndon lincoln's law partner as was usual with me then to take notes but at the end of that time i threw pen and paper away and lived only in the inspiration of the hour the result of this excitement was that when the convention was over there was no reporter present who had anything for his newspaper they all went home and wrote burning editorials about the speech and its great principle but as to reproducing it they could not men came to talk of it all over illinois they realized that it had been a purifying fire for the party but as to what it contained no one could say gradually it became known as lincoln's lost speech from the very mystery of it its reputation grew greater as time went on 
but though the convention so nearly to a man lost its head there was at least one auditor who had enough control to pursue his usual habit of making notes of the speeches he heard this was a young lawyer on the same circuit as lincoln mr h c whitney for some three weeks before the convention lincoln and whitney had been attending court at danville they had discussed the political situation in the state carefully and to whitney lincoln had stated his convictions and determinations in a way whitney had absorbed lincoln's speech beforehand as indeed any one must have done who was with lincoln when he was preparing an address it being his habit to discuss points and to repeat them aloud indifferent to who heard him whitney had gone to the convention intending to make notes knowing as he did that lincoln had not written out what he was going to say fortunately he had a cool enough head to keep to his purpose he made his notes and on returning to judge davis's home in bloomington where he with lincoln and one or two others were staying he enlarged them while the others discussed the speech these notes whitney kept for many years always intending to write them out but never attending to it until the author in eighteen ninety six learned that he had them and urged him to expand them this mr whitney did and the speech was first published in mcclure's magazine for september eighteen ninety six mr whitney does not claim that he has made a full report he does claim that the argument is correct and that in many cases the expressions are exact a few quotations will show anyone familiar with lincoln's speeches that mr whitney has caught much of their style for instance the following we come we are here assembled together to protest as well as we can against a great wrong and to take measures as well as we now can to make that wrong right to place the nation as far as it may be possible now as it was before the repeal of the missouri compromise and the plain way to do this is to restore the compromise and to demand and determine that kansas shall be free while we affirm and reaffirm if necessary our devotions to the principles of the declaration of independence let our practical work here be limited to the above we know that there is not a perfect agreement of sentiment here on the public questions which might be rightfully considered in this convention and that the indignation which we all must feel cannot be helped but all of us must give up something for the good of the cause there is one desire which is uppermost in the mind one wish common to us all to which no dissent will be made and i counsel you earnestly to bury all resentment to sink all personal feeling make all things work to a common purpose in which we are united and agreed about and which all present will agree is absolutely necessary which must be done by any rightful mode if there be such slavery must be kept out of kansas the test the pinch is right there if we lose kansas to freedom an example will be set which will prove fatal to freedom in the end we therefore in the language of the bible must lay axe to the root of the tree temporizing will not do longer now is the time for decision for firm persistent resolute action we have made a good beginning here to-day as our methodist friends would say i feel it is good to be here while extremists may find some fault with the moderation of our platform they should remember that the battle is not always to the strong nor the race to the swift in grave emergencies moderation is generally safer than radicalism and as this struggle is likely to be long and earnest we must not by our action repel any who are in sympathy with us in the main but rather win all that we can to our standard we must not belittle nor overlook the facts of our condition that we are new and comparatively weak while our enemies are entrenched and relatively strong they have the administration and the political power and right or wrong at present they have the numbers our friends who urge an appeal to arms with so much force and eloquence should recollect that the government is arrayed against us and that the numbers are now arrayed against us as well or to state it nearer to the truth they are not yet expressly and affirmatively for us 
and we should repel friends rather than gain them by saying anything savoring of revolutionary methods as it now stands we must appeal to the sober sense and patriotism of the people we will make converts day by day we will grow strong by calmness and moderation we will grow strong by the violence and injustice of our adversaries and unless truth be a mockery and justice a hollow lie we will be in the majority after a while and then the revolution which we will accomplish will be none the less radical from being the result of pacific measures the battle of freedom is to be fought out on principle slavery is a violation of the eternal right we have temporized with it from the necessities of our condition but as sure as god reigns and school-children read that black foul lie can never be consecrated into god's hallowed truth i will not say that we may not sooner or later be compelled to meet force by force but that time has not yet come and if we are true to ourselves may never come do not mistake that the ballot is stronger than the bullet therefore let the legions of slavery use bullets let us wait patiently till november and file ballots at them in return and by that peaceful policy i believe we shall ultimately win did you ever my friends seriously reflect upon the speed with which we are tending downwards within the memory of men now present the leading statesmen of virginia could make genuine red-hot abolitionist speeches in old virginia and as i have said now even in free kansas it is a crime to declare that it is free kansas the very sentiments that i and others have just uttered would entitle us and each of us to the ignominy and seclusion of a dungeon and yet i suppose that like paul we were free-born but if this thing is allowed to continue it will be but one step further to impress the same rule in illinois the conclusion of all is that we must restore the missouri compromise we must highly resolve that kansas must be free we must reinstate the birthday promise of the republic we must reaffirm the declaration of independence we must make good in essence as well as in form madison's avowal that the word slave ought not to appear in the constitution and we must even go further and decree that only local law and not that time-honored instrument shall shelter a slaveholder we must make this a land of liberty in fact as it is in name but in seeking to attain these results so indispensable if the liberty which is our pride and boast shall endure we will be loyal to the constitution and to the flag of our union and no matter what our grievance even though kansas shall come in as a slave state and no matter what theirs even if we shall restore the compromise we will say to the southern disunionists we won't go out of the union and you shan't End of section 17. Section 18 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18. The Lincoln-Douglas Debates. Part 1. The greatest speech ever made in Illinois, and it puts Lincoln on the track for the presidency, was the comment made by enthusiastic Republicans on Lincoln's speech before the Bloomington Convention. Conscious that it was he who had put the breath of life into their organization, the party instinctively turned to him as its leader. The effect of this local recognition was at once perceptible in the national organization less than three weeks after the delivery of the bloomington speech the national convention of the republican party met in philadelphia june seventeenth to nominate candidates for the presidency and vice-presidency lincoln's name was the second proposed for the latter office and on the first ballot he received one hundred and ten votes the news reached him at urbana illinois where he was attending court one of his companions reading from a daily paper just received from chicago the results of the ballot the simple name lincoln was given without the name of the man's state 
Lincoln said indifferently that he did not suppose it could be himself, and added that there was another great man of the name, a man from Massachusetts. The next day, however, he knew that it was himself to whom the convention had given so strong an endorsement. He also knew that the ticket chosen was Fremont and Dayton. The campaign of the following summer and fall was one of intense activity for Lincoln. In Illinois and the neighboring states, he made over fifty speeches, only fragments of which have been preserved. One of the first important ones was delivered on July 4th, 1856, at a great mass meeting at Princeton, the home of the Lovejoys and the Bryants. The people were still irritated by the outrages in Kansas, and by the attack on Sumner in the Senate, and the temptation to deliver a stirring and indignant oration must have been strong. Lincoln's speech was, however, a fine example of political wisdom, an historical argument admirably calculated to convince his auditors that they were right in their opposition to slavery extension, but so controlled and sane that it would stir no impulsive radical to violence. There probably was not uttered in the United States on that critical 4th of July, 1856, when the very foundation of the government was in dispute and the day itself seemed a mockery, a cooler, more logical speech than this by the man who, a month before, had driven a convention so nearly mad that the very reporters had forgotten to make notes. And the temper of this Princeton speech Lincoln kept throughout the campaign. In spite of the valiant struggle of the Republicans, Buchanan was elected, but Lincoln was in no way discouraged. The Republicans had polled 1,341,264 votes in the country. In Illinois, they had given Fremont nearly 100,000 votes, and they had elected their candidate for governor, General Bissell. Lincoln turned from arguments to encouragement and good counsel. All of us, he said at a Republican banquet in Chicago, a few weeks after the election, who did not vote for Mr. Buchanan, taken together, are a majority of 400,000. But in the late contest we were divided between Fremont and Fillmore. Can we not come together for the future? Let everyone who really believes and is resolved that free society is not and shall not be a failure, and who can conscientiously declare that in the last contest he has done only what he thought best, let every such one have charity to believe that every other one can say as much. Thus, let bygones be bygones, let past differences as nothing be, and with steady eye on the real issue, let us re-inaugurate the good old central idea of the Republic. We can do it. The human heart is with us. God is with us. We shall again be able not to declare that all states as states are equal, nor yet that all citizens as citizens are equal, but to renew the broader, better declaration, including both these and much more, that all men are created equal. The spring of 1857 gave Lincoln a new line of argument. Buchanan was scarcely in the presidential chair before the Supreme Court, in the decision of the Dred Scott case, declared that a Negro could not sue in the United States courts, and that Congress could not prohibit slavery in the territories. This decision was such an evident advance of the slave power that there was a violent uproar in the North. Douglas went at once to Illinois to calm his constituents. What, he cried, oppose the Supreme Court? Is it not sacred? To resist it is anarchy. Lincoln met him fairly on the issue in a speech at Springfield in June 1857. We believe as much as Judge Douglas, perhaps more, in obedience to and respect for the judicial department of government, but we think the Dred Scott decision is erroneous. We know the court that has made it has often overruled its own decisions, and we shall do what we can to have it overrule this. We offer no resistance to it. 
if this important decision had been made by the unanimous concurrence of the judges and without any apparent partisan bias and in accordance with legal public expectation and with the steady practice of the departments throughout our history and had been in no part based on assumed historical facts which are not really true or if wanting in some of these it had been before the court more than once and had there been affirmed and reaffirmed through a course of years it then might be perhaps would be factious nay even revolutionary not to acquiesce in it as a precedent but when as is true we find it wanting in all these claims to the public confidence it is not resistance it is not factious it is not even disrespectful to treat it as not having yet quite established a settled doctrine for the country let douglas cry awful anarchy revolution as much as he would lincoln's arguments against the dred scott decision appealed to common sense and won him commendation all over the country even the radical leaders of the party in the east seward sumner theodore parker began to notice him to read his speeches to consider his arguments with every month of eighteen fifty seven lincoln grew stronger and his election in illinois as united states senatorial candidate in eighteen fifty eight against douglas would have been insured if douglas had not suddenly broken with buchanan and his party in a way which won him the hearty sympathy and respect of a large part of the republicans of the north by a flagrantly unfair vote the pro-slavery leaders of kansas had secured the adoption of the lecompton constitution allowing slavery in the state president buchanan urged congress to admit kansas with her bogus constitution douglas who would not sanction so base an injustice opposed the measure voting with the republicans steadily against the admission the buchananists outraged at what they called douglas's apostasy broke with him then it was that a part of the republican party notably horace greeley at the head of the new york tribune struck by the boldness and nobility of douglas's opposition began to hope to win him over from the democrats to the republicans their first step was to counsel the leaders of their party in illinois to put up no candidate against douglas for the united states senatorship in eighteen fifty eight lincoln saw this change on the part of the republican leaders with dismay greeley is not doing me right he said i am a true republican and have been tried already in the hottest part of the anti-slavery fight and yet i find him taking up douglas a veritable dodger once a tool of the south now its enemy and pushing him to the front he grew so restless over the returning popularity of douglas among the republicans that herndon his law partner determined to go east to find out the real feelings of the eastern leaders towards lincoln herndon had for a long time been in correspondence with the leading abolitionists and had no difficulty in getting interviews the returns he brought back from his canvas were not altogether reassuring seward sumner phillips garrison beecher theodore parker all spoke favorably of lincoln and seward sent him word that the republicans would never take up so slippery a quantity as douglas had proved himself but greeley the all-important greeley was lukewarm the republican standard is too high he told herndon we want something practical douglas is a brave man forget the past and sustain the righteous good god righteous eh groaned herndon in his letter to lincoln but though the encouragement which came to lincoln from the east in the spring of eighteen fifty eight was meagre that which came from illinois was abundant there the republicans supported him in whole-hearted devotion in june the state convention meeting in springfield to nominate its candidate for senator declared that abraham lincoln was its first and only choice as the successor of stephen a douglas the press was jubilant unanimity is a weak word wrote the editor of the bloomington pantograph to express the universal and intense feeling of the convention lincoln 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 was the cry everywhere whenever the senatorship was alluded to 
delegates from chicago and from cairo from the wabash and the illinois from the north the center and the south were alike fierce with enthusiasm whenever that loved name was breathed enemies at home and misjudging friends abroad who have looked for dissension among us on the question of the senatorship will please take notice that our nomination is a unanimous one and that in the event of a republican majority in the next legislature no other name than lincoln's will be mentioned or thought of by a solitary republican legislator one little incident in the convention was a pleasing illustration of the universality of the lincoln sentiment cook county had brought a banner into the assemblage inscribed cook county for abraham lincoln during a pause in the proceedings a delegate from another county rose and proposed with the consent of the cook county delegation to amend the banner by substituting for cook county the word which i hold in my hand at the same time unrolling a scroll and revealing the word illinois in huge capitals the cook delegation promptly accepted the amendment and amidst a perfect hurricane of hurrahs the banner was duly altered to express the sentiment of the whole republican party of the state thus illinois for abraham lincoln on the evening of the day of his nomination lincoln addressed his constituents the first paragraph of his speech gave the key to the campaign he proposed a house divided against itself cannot stand i believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free i do not expect the house to fall but i do expect it will cease to be divided it will become all one thing or all the other then followed the famous charge of conspiracy against the slavery advocates the charge that pierce buchanan chief justice taney and douglas had been making a concerted effort to legalize the institution of slavery in all the states old as well as new north as well as south he marshaled one after another of the measures that the pro-slavery leaders had secured in the past four years and clinched the argument by one of his inimitable illustrations when we see a lot of framed timbers different portions of which we know have been gotten out at different times and places and by different workmen stephen franklin roger and james for instance and when we see these timbers joined together and see they exactly make the frame of a house or a mill all the tenons and mortises exactly fitting and all the lengths and proportions of the different pieces exactly adapted to their respective places and not a piece too many or too few not omitting even scaffolding or if a single piece be lacking we see the place in the frame exactly fitted and prepared yet to bring such a piece in in such a case we find it impossible not to believe that stephen and franklin and roger and james all understood one another from the beginning and all worked upon a common plan or draft drawn up before the first blow was struck the speech was severely criticized by lincoln's friends it was too radical it was sectional he heard the complaints unmoved if i had to draw a pen across my record he said one day and erase my whole life from sight and i had one poor gift or choice left as to what i should save from the wreck i should choose that speech and leave it to the world unerased the speech was in fact one of great political adroitness it forced douglas to do exactly what he did not want to do in illinois explain his own record during the past four years explain the true meaning of the kansas nebraska bill discuss the dred scott decision say whether or not he thought slavery so good a thing that the country could afford to extend it instead of confining it where it would be in course of gradual extinction douglas wanted the republicans of illinois to follow greeley's advice forgive the past he wanted to make the most among them of his really noble revolt against the attempt of his party to fasten an unjust constitution on kansas lincoln would not allow him to bask for an instant in the sun of that revolt 
he crowded him step by step through his party's record and compelled him to face what he called the profound central truth of the republican party slavery is wrong and ought to be dealt with as wrong but it was at once evident that douglas did not mean to meet the issue squarely he called the doctrine of lincoln's house divided against itself speech sectionalism his charge of conspiracy false his talk of the wrong of slavery extension abolitionism this went on for a month then lincoln resolved to force douglas to meet his arguments and challenged him to a series of joint debates douglas was not pleased his reply to the challenge was irritable even slightly insolent to those of his friends who talked with him privately of the contest he said i do not feel between you and me that i want to go into this debate the whole country knows me and has me measured lincoln as regards myself is comparatively unknown and if he gets the best of this debate and i want to say he is the ablest man the republicans have got i shall lose everything and lincoln will gain everything should i win i shall gain but little i do not want to go into a debate with abe publicly however he carried off the prospect confidently even jauntily mr lincoln he said patronizingly is a kind amiable intelligent gentleman in the meantime his constituents boasted loudly of the fine spectacle they were going to give the state the little giant chawing up old abe many of lincoln's friends looked forward to the encounter with foreboding often in spite of their best intentions they showed anxiety shortly before the first debate came off at ottawa says judge h w beckwith of danville illinois i passed the chenery house then the principal hotel in springfield the lobby was crowded with partisan leaders from various sections of the state and mr lincoln from his greater height was seen above the surging mass that clung about him like a swarm of bees to their ruler he looked careworn but he met the crowd patiently and kindly shaking hands answering questions and receiving assurances of support the day was warm and at the first chance he broke away and came out for a little fresh air wiping the sweat from his face as he passed the door he saw me and taking my hand inquired for the health and views of his friends over in vermilion county he was assured they were wide awake and further told that they looked forward to the debate between him and senator douglas with deep concern from the shadow that went quickly over his face the pained look that came to give quickly way to a blaze of eyes and quiver of lips i felt that mr lincoln had gone beneath my mere words and caught my inner and current fears as to the result and then in a forgiving jocular way peculiar to him he said sit down i have a moment to spare and will tell you a story having been on his feet for some time he sat on the end of the stone step leading into the hotel door while i stood closely fronting him you have he continued seen two men about to fight yes many times well one of them brags about what he means to do he jumps high in the air cracking his heels together smites his fists and wastes his breath trying to scare somebody you see the other fellow he says not a word here mr lincoln's voice and manner changed to a great earnestness and repeating you see the other man says not a word his arms are at his side his fists are closely doubled up his head is drawn to the shoulder and his teeth are set firm together he is saving his wind for the fight and as sure as it comes off he will win it or die a trying he made no other comment but arose bade me good-bye and left me to apply the illustration it was inevitable that douglas's friend should be sanguine lincoln's doubtful the contrast between the two candidates was almost pathetic senator douglas was the most brilliant figure in the political life of the day winning in personality fearless as an advocate magnetic in eloquence shrewd in political manoeuvring he had every quality to captivate the public his resources had never failed him from his entrance into illinois politics in eighteen thirty four he had been the recipient of every political honor his party had to bestow 
for the past eleven years he had been a member of the united states senate where he had influenced all the important legislation of the day and met in debate every strong speaker of north and south in eighteen fifty two and again in eighteen fifty six he had been a strongly supported though unsuccessful candidate for the democratic presidential nomination in eighteen fifty eight he was put at or near the head of every list of possible presidential candidates made up for eighteen sixty how barren lincoln's public career in comparison three terms in the lower house of the state assembly one term in congress then a failure which drove him from public life now he returns as a bolter from his party a leader in a new organization which the conservatives are denouncing as visionary impractical revolutionary no one recognized more clearly than lincoln the difference between himself and his opponent with me he said sadly in comparing the careers of himself and douglas the race of ambition has been a failure a flat failure with him it has been one of splendid success he warned his party at the outset that with himself as a standard-bearer the battle must be fought on principle alone without any of the external aids which douglas's brilliant career gave senator douglas is of world-wide renown he said all the anxious politicians of his party or who have been of his party for years past have been looking upon him as certainly at no distant day to be the president of the united states they have seen in his round jolly fruitful face post offices land offices marshalships and cabinet appointments charge ships and foreign missions bursting and sprouting out in wonderful exuberance ready to be laid hold of by their greedy hands and as they have been gazing upon this attractive picture so long they cannot in the little distraction that has taken place in the party bring themselves to give up the charming hope but with greedier anxiety they rush about him sustain him and give him marches triumphal entries and receptions beyond what even in the days of his highest prosperity they could have brought about in his favor on the contrary nobody has ever expected me to be president in my poor lean lank face nobody has ever seen that any cabbages were sprouting out these are disadvantages all taken together that the republicans labor under we have to fight this battle upon principle and upon principle alone if one will take a map of illinois and locate the points of the lincoln and douglas debates held between august twenty first and october fifteenth eighteen fifty eight he will see that the whole state was traversed in the contest the first took place at ottawa about seventy-five miles southwest of chicago on august twenty first the second at freeport near the wisconsin boundary on august twenty seventh the third was in the extreme southern part of the state at jonesboro on september fifteenth three days later the contestants met one hundred and fifty miles northeast of jonesboro at charleston the fifth sixth and seventh debates were held in the western part of the state at galesburg october seventh quincy october thirteenth and alton october fifteenth constant exposure and fatigue were unavoidable in meeting these engagements both contestants spoke almost every day through the intervals between the joint debates and as railroad communication in illinois in eighteen fifty eight was still very incomplete they were often obliged to resort to horse carriage or steamer to reach the desired points judge douglas succeeded however in making this difficult journey something of a triumphal procession he was accompanied throughout the campaign by his wife a beautiful and brilliant woman and by a number of distinguished democrats on the illinois central railroad he always had a special car sometimes a special train frequently he swept by lincoln sidetracked in an accommodation or freight train the gentleman in that car evidently smelt no royalty in our carriage laughed lincoln one day as he watched from the caboose of a laid-up freight train the decorated special of douglas flying by it was only when lincoln left the railroad and crossed the prairie to speak at some isolated town that he went in state the attentions he received were often very trying to him 
he detested what he called fizzle gigs and fireworks and would squirm in disgust when his friends gave him a genuine prairie ovation usually when he was going to a point distant from the railway a distinguished citizen met him at the station nearest the place with a carriage when they were come within two or three miles of the town a long procession with banners and band would appear winding across the prairie to meet the speaker a speech of greeting was made and then the ladies of the entertainment committee would present lincoln with flowers sometimes even winding a garland about his head and lank figure his embarrassment at these attentions was thoroughly appreciated by his friends at the ottawa debate the enthusiasm of his supporters was so great that they insisted on carrying him from the platform to the house where he was to be entertained powerless to escape from the clutches of his admirers he could only cry don't boys let me down come now don't but the boys persisted and they tell today proudly of their exploit and of the cordial handshake lincoln all embarrassed as he was gave each of them when at last he was free on arrival at the towns where the joint debates were held douglas was always met by a brass band and a salute of thirty-two guns the union was composed of thirty-two states in eighteen fifty eight and was escorted to the hotel in the finest equipage to be had lincoln's supporters took delight in showing their contempt of douglas's elegance by affecting a republican simplicity often carrying their candidate through the streets on a high and unadorned hay-rack drawn by farm horses the scenes in the towns on the occasions of the debates were perhaps never equalled at any other of the hustings of this country no distance seemed too great for the people to go no vehicle too slow or fatiguing at charleston there was a great delegation of men women and children present which had come in a long procession from indiana by farm wagons afoot on horseback and in carriages the crowds at three or four of the debates were for that day immense there were estimated to be from eight thousand to fourteen thousand people at quincy some six thousand at alton from ten thousand to fifteen thousand at charleston some twenty thousand at ottawa many of those at ottawa came the night before it was a matter of but a short time says mr george Beatty of ottawa until the few hotels the livery stables and private houses were crowded and there were no accommodations left then the campaigners spread out about the town and camped in whatever spot was most convenient they went along the bluff and on the bottom lands and that night the campfires spread up and down the valley for a mile made it look as if an army was gathered about us when the crowd was massed at the place of the debate the scene was one of the greatest hubbub and confusion on the corners of the squares and scattered around the outskirts of the crowd were fakers of every description selling painkillers and ague cures watermelons and lemonade jugglers and beggars plied their trades and the brass bands of all the four corners within twenty-five miles tooted and pounded at hail columbia happy land or columbia the gem of the ocean conspicuous in the processions at all the points was what lincoln called the basket of flowers thirty-two young girls in a resplendent car representing the union at charleston a thirty-third young woman rode behind the car representing kansas she carried a banner inscribed i will be free a motto which brought out from nearly all the newspaper reporters the comment that she was too fair to be long free the mottoes at the different meetings epitomized the popular conception of the issues and the candidates among the lincoln sentiments were illinois born under the ordinance of eighty seven free territories and free men free pulpits and free preachers free press and a free pen free schools and free teachers westward the star of empire takes its way the girls link on to lincoln their mothers were for clay abe the giant killer edgar county for the tall sucker a striking feature of the crowds was the number of women they included the intelligent and lively interest they took in the debates caused much comment no doubt mrs douglas's presence had something to do with this 
they were particularly active in receiving the speakers and at quincy lincoln on being presented with what the local press described as a beautiful and elegant bouquet took pains to express his gratification at the part women everywhere took in the contest while this helter-skelter outpouring of prairiedom had the appearance of being little more than a great jollification a lawless country fair in reality it was with the majority of the people a profoundly serious matter with every discussion it became more vital indeed in the first debate which was opened and closed by douglas the relation of the two speakers became dramatic it was here that douglas hoping to fasten on lincoln the stigma of abolitionist charged him with having undertaken to abolitionize the old whig party and having been in eighteen fifty four a subscriber to a radical platform proclaimed at springfield this platform douglas read lincoln when he replied could only say he was never at the convention knew nothing of the resolutions but the impression prevailed that he was cornered the next issue of the chicago press and tribune dispelled it that paper had employed to report the debates the first shorthand reporter in chicago mr robert l hitt now a member of congress and the chairman of the committee on foreign affairs mr hitt when douglas began to read the resolutions took an opportunity to rest supposing he could get the original from the speaker he took down only the first line of each resolution he missed douglas after the debate but on reaching chicago where he wrote out his report he sent out an assistant to the files to find the platform adopted at the springfield convention it was brought but when mr hitt began to transcribe it he saw at once that it was widely different from the one douglas had read there was great excitement in the office and the staff ardently republican went to work to discover where the resolutions had come from it was found that they originated at a meeting of radical abolitionists with whom lincoln had never been associated the press and tribune announced the forgery as it was called in a caustic editorial the little dodger cornered and caught within a week even the remote school districts of illinois were discussing douglas's action and many of the most important papers of the nation had made it a subject of editorial comment almost without exception douglas was condemned no amount of explanation on his part helped him the particularity of douglas's charge said the louisville journal precludes the idea that he was simply and innocently mistaken lovers of fair play were disgusted and those of douglas's own party who would have applauded a trick too clever to be discovered could not forgive him for one which had been found out greeley came out bitterly against him and before long wrote to lincoln and herndon that douglas was like the man's boy who he said didn't weigh so much as he expected and he always knew he wouldn't douglas's error became a sharp-edged sword in lincoln's hand without directly referring to it he called his hearer's attention to the forgery every time he quoted a document by his elaborate explanation that he believed unless there was some mistake on the part of those with whom the matter originated and which he had been unable to detect that this was correct once when douglas brought forth a document lincoln blandly remarked that he could scarcely be blamed for doubting its genuineness since the introduction of the springfield resolutions at ottawa End of section eighteen Section nineteen of the Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume One by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eighteen The Lincoln Douglas Debates, Part two. It was in the second debate at Freeport that Lincoln made the boldest stroke of the contest. Soon after the Ottawa debate, in discussing his plan for the next encounter with a number of his political friends, Washburn, Cook, Judd, and others, he told them he proposed to ask Douglas four questions, which he read. One and all cried halt at the second question. Under no condition, they said, must he put it. If it were put, Douglas would answer it in such a way as to win the senatorship the morning of the debate while on the way to freeport lincoln read the same questions to mr joseph medill i do not like this second question mr lincoln said mr medill 
the two men argued to their journey's end but lincoln was still unconvinced even after he reached freeport several republican leaders came to him pleading do not ask that question he was obdurate and he went on the platform with a higher head a haughtier step than his friends had noted in him before lincoln was going to ruin himself the committee said despondently one would think he did not want the senatorship the mooted question ran in lincoln's notes can the people of a united states territory in any lawful way against the wish of any citizen of the united states exclude slavery from its limits prior to the formation of a state constitution lincoln had seen the irreconcilableness of douglas's own measure of popular sovereignty which declared that the people of a territory should be left to regulate their domestic concerns in their own way subject only to the constitution and the decision of the supreme court in the dred scott case that slaves being property could not under the constitution be excluded from a territory he knew that if douglas said no to this question his illinois constituents would never return him to the senate he believed that if he said yes the people of the south would never vote for him for president of the united states he was willing himself to lose the senatorship in order to defeat douglas for the presidency in eighteen sixty i am after larger game the battle of eighteen sixty is worth a hundred of this he said confidently the question was put and douglas answered it with rare artfulness it matters not he cried what way the supreme court may hereafter decide as to the abstract question whether slavery may or may not go into a territory under the constitution the people have the lawful means to introduce it or exclude it as they please for the reason that slavery cannot exist a day or an hour anywhere unless it is supported by local police regulations those police regulations can only be established by the local legislature and if the people are opposed to slavery they will elect representatives to that body who will by unfriendly legislation effectually prevent the introduction of it into their midst if on the contrary they are for it their legislation will favor its extension his democratic constituents went wild over the clever way in which douglas had escaped lincoln's trap he now practically had his election the republicans shook their heads lincoln only was serene he alone knew what he had done the freeport debate had no sooner reached the pro-slavery press than a storm of protest went up douglas had betrayed the south he had repudiated the supreme court decision he had declared that slavery could be kept out of the territories by other legislation than a state constitution the freeport doctrine or the theory of unfriendly legislation as it became known spread month by month and slowly but surely made douglas an impossible candidate in the south the force of the question was not realized in full by lincoln's friends until the democratic party met in charleston south carolina in eighteen sixty and the southern delegates refused to support douglas because of the answer he gave to lincoln's question in the freeport debate of eighteen fifty eight do you recollect the argument we had on the way up to freeport two years ago over the question i was going to ask judge douglas lincoln asked mr joseph medill when the latter went to springfield a few days after the election of eighteen sixty yes said medill i recollect it very well don't you think i was right now we were both right the question hurt douglas for the presidency but it lost you the senatorship yes and i have won the place he was playing for from the beginning of the campaign lincoln supplemented the strength of his arguments by inexhaustible good humor douglas physically worn harassed by the trend which lincoln had given the discussions irritated that his adroitness and eloquence could not so cover the fundamental truth of the republican position but that it would up again often grew angry even abusive lincoln answered him with most effective raillery at havana where he spoke the day after douglas he said i am informed that my distinguished friend yesterday became a little excited 
nervous perhaps and he said something about fighting as though referring to a pugilistic encounter between him and myself did anybody in this audience hear him use such language cries of yes i am informed further that somebody in his audience rather more excited and nervous than himself took off his coat and offered to take the job off judge douglas's hands and fight lincoln himself did anybody here witness that warlike proceeding laughter and cries of yes well i merely desire to say that i shall fight neither judge douglas nor his second i shall not do this for two reasons which i will now explain in the first place a fight would prove nothing which is an issue in this contest it might establish that judge douglas is a more muscular man than myself or it might demonstrate that i am a more muscular man than judge douglas but this question is not referred to in the cincinnati platform nor in either of the springfield platforms neither result would prove him right nor me wrong and so of the gentleman who volunteered to do this fighting for him if my fighting judge douglas would not prove anything it would certainly prove nothing for me to fight his bottle holder my second reason for not having a personal encounter with the judge is that i don't believe he wants it himself he and i are about the best friends in the world and when we get together he would no more think of fighting me than of fighting his wife therefore ladies and gentlemen when the judge talked about fighting he was not giving vent to any ill feeling of his own but merely trying to excite well enthusiasm against me on the part of his audience and as i find he was tolerably successful we will call it quits more difficult for lincoln to take good-naturedly than threats and hard names was the irrelevant matters which douglas dragged into the debates to turn attention from the vital arguments thus douglas insisted repeatedly on taunting lincoln because his zealous friends had carried him off the platform at ottawa lincoln was so frightened by the questions put to him said douglas that he could not walk he tried to arouse the prejudice of the audience by absurd charges of abolitionism lincoln wanted to give negroes social equality he wanted a negro wife he was willing to allow fred douglas to make speeches for him again he took up a good deal of lincoln's time by forcing him to answer to a charge of refusing to vote supplies for the soldiers in the mexican war lincoln denied and explained until at last at charleston he turned suddenly to douglas's supporters dragging one of the strongest of them the hon o b ficklin with whom he had been in congress in eighteen forty eight to the platform i do not mean to do anything with mr ficklin he said except to present his face and tell you that he personally knows it to be a lie and mr ficklin had to acknowledge that lincoln was right judge douglas said lincoln in speaking of this policy is playing cuttlefish a small species of fish that has no mode of defending himself when pursued except by throwing out a black fluid which makes the water so dark the enemy cannot see it and thus it escapes the question at stake was too serious in lincoln's judgment for platform jugglery every moment of his time which douglas forced him to spend answering irrelevant charges he gave begrudgingly he struggled constantly to keep his speeches on the line of solid argument slowly but surely those who followed the debates began to understand this it was douglas who drew the great masses to the debates in the first place it was because of him that the public men and the newspapers of the east as well as of the west watched the discussions but as the days went on it was not douglas who made the impression during the hours of the speeches the two men seemed well mated i can only recall one fact of the debates says mrs william crotty of seneca illinois that i felt so sorry for lincoln while douglas was speaking and then to my surprise i felt so sorry for douglas when lincoln replied the disinterested to whom it was an intellectual game felt the power and charm of both men partisans had each reason enough to cheer it was afterwards as the debates were talked over by auditors as they lingered at the country store or were grouped on the fence in the evening or when they were read in the generous reports which the newspapers of illinois and even of other states gave 
that the thoroughness of lincoln's argument was understood even the first debate at ottawa had a surprising effect i tell you says mr george Beatty of ottawa that debate set people thinking on these important questions in a way they hadn't dreamed of i heard any number of men say this thing is an awfully serious question and i have about concluded lincoln has got it right my father a thoughtful god-fearing man said to me as we went home to supper george you are young and don't see what this thing means as i do douglas's speeches of squatter sovereignty please you younger men but i tell you that with us older men it's a great question that faces us we've either got to keep slavery back or it's going to spread all over the country that's the real question that's behind all this lincoln is right and that was the feeling that prevailed i think among the majority after the debate was over people went home talking about the danger of slavery getting a hold in the north this territory had been democratic la salle county on the morning of the day of the debate was democratic but when the next day came around hundreds of democrats had been made republicans owing to the light in which lincoln had brought forward the fact that slavery threatened it was among lincoln's own friends however that his speeches produced the deepest impression they had believed him to be strong but probably there was no one of them who had not felt dubious about his ability to meet douglas many even feared a fiasco gradually it began to be clear to them that lincoln was the stronger could it be that lincoln really was a great man the young republican journalists of the press and tribune scripps hitt medill began to ask themselves the question one evening as they talked over lincoln's arguments a letter was received it came from a prominent eastern statesman who is this man that is replying to douglas in your state he asked do you realize that no greater speeches have been made on public questions in the history of our country that his knowledge of the subject is profound his logic unanswerable his style inimitable similar letters kept coming from various parts of the country before the campaign was over lincoln's friends were exultant their favorite was a great man a full-grown man as one of them wrote in his paper the country at large watched lincoln with astonishment when the debates began there were republicans in illinois of wider national reputation judge lyman trumbull then senator was better known he was an able debater and a speech which he made in august against douglas's record called from the new york evening post the remark this is the heaviest blow struck at senator douglas since he took the field in illinois it is unanswerable and we suspect that it will be fatal trumbull's speech the post afterwards published in pamphlet form besides trumbull owen lovejoy oglesby and palmer were all speaking that lincoln should not only have so far outstripped men of his own party but should have out-argued douglas was the cause of comment everywhere no man of this generation said the evening post editorially at the close of the debate has grown more rapidly before the country than lincoln in this canvass as a matter of fact lincoln had attracted the attention of all the thinking men of the country the first thing that really awakened my interest in him said henry ward beecher was his speech parallel with douglas in illinois and indeed it was that manifestation of ability that secured his nomination to the presidency but able as were lincoln's arguments deep as was the impression he had made he was not elected to the senatorship douglas won fairly enough though it is well to note that if the republicans did not elect a senator they gained a substantial number of votes over those polled in eighteen fifty six lincoln accepted the result with a serenity inexplicable to his supporters to him the contest was but one battle in a durable struggle little matter who won now if in the end the right triumphed from the first he had looked at the final result not at the senatorship i do not claim gentlemen to be unselfish he said at chicago in july i do not pretend that i would not like to go to the united states senate i make no such hypocritical pretense 
but i do say to you that in this mighty issue it is nothing to you nothing to the mass of the people of the nation whether or not judge douglas or myself shall ever be heard of after this night it may be a trifle to either of us but in connection with this mighty question upon which hang the destinies of the nation perhaps it is absolutely nothing the intense heat and fury of the debates the defeat in november did not alter a jot this high view i am glad i made the late race he wrote mr a g henry it gave me a hearing on the great and durable question of the age which i would have had in no other way and though i now sink out of view and shall be forgotten i believe i have made some marks which will tell for the cause of civil liberty long after i am gone at that date perhaps no one appreciated the value of what lincoln had done as well as he did himself he was absolutely sure he was right and that in the end people would see it though he might not rise he knew his cause would douglas had the ingenuity to be supported in the late contest both as the best means to break down and to uphold the slave interest he wrote no ingenuity can keep these antagonistic elements in harmony long another explosion will soon occur his whole attention was given to conserving what the republicans had gained we have some one hundred and twenty thousand clear republican votes that pile is worth keeping together to consoling his friends you are feeling badly he wrote to n b judd chairman of the republican committee and this too shall pass away never fear to rallying for another effort the cause of civil liberty must not be surrendered at the end of one or even one hundred defeats if lincoln had at times a fear that his defeat would cause him to be set aside it soon was dispelled the interest awakened in him was genuine and it spread with the wider reading and discussion of his arguments he was besieged by letters from all parts of the union congratulations encouragements criticisms invitations for lectures poured in upon him and he became the first choice of his entire party for political speeches the greater number of these invitations he declined he had given so much time to politics since eighteen fifty four that his law practice had been neglected and he was feeling poor but there were certain of the calls which could not be resisted douglas spoke several times for the democrats of ohio in the nineteen fifty nine campaign for governor and lincoln naturally was asked to reply he made but two speeches one at columbus on september sixteenth and the other at cincinnati on september seventeenth but he had great audiences on both occasions the columbus speech was devoted almost entirely to answering an essay by douglas which had been published in the september number of harper's magazine and which began by asserting that under our complex system of government it is the first duty of american statesmen to mark distinctly the dividing line between federal and local authority it was an elaborate argument for popular sovereignty and attracted national attention indeed at the moment it was the talk of the country lincoln literally tore it to bits what is judge douglas's popular sovereignty he asked it is as a principle no other than that if one man chooses to make a slave of another man neither that other man nor anybody else has a right to object applied in government as he seeks to apply it it is this if in a new territory into which a few people are beginning to enter for the purpose of making their homes they choose to either exclude slavery from their limits or to establish it there however one or the other may affect the persons to be enslaved or the infinitely greater number of persons who are afterward to inhabit that territory or the other members of the families or communities of which they are but an incipient member or the general head of the family of states as parent of all however their action may affect one or the other of these there is no power or right to interfere that is douglas's popular sovereignty applied it was in this address that lincoln uttered the oft-quoted paragraphs i suppose the institution of slavery really looks small to him 
he is so put up by nature that a lash upon his back would hurt him but a lash upon anybody else's back does not hurt him that is the build of the man and consequently he looks upon the matter of slavery in this unimportant light judge douglas ought to remember when he is endeavoring to force this policy upon the american people that while he is put up that way a good many are not he ought to remember that there was once in this country a man by the name of thomas jefferson supposed to be a democrat a man whose principles and policy are not very prevalent among democrats to-day it is true but that man did not take exactly this view of the insignificance of the element of slavery which our friend judge douglas does in contemplation of this thing we all know he was led to exclaim i tremble for my country when i remember that god is just we know how he looked upon it when he thus expressed himself there was danger to this country danger of the avenging justice of god in that little unimportant popular sovereignty question of judge douglas he supposed there was a question of god's eternal justice wrapped up in the enslaving of any race of men or any man and that those who did so braved the arm of jehovah that when a nation thus dared the almighty every friend of that nation had cause to dread his wrath choose thee between jefferson and douglas as to what is the true view of this element among us one interesting point about the columbus address is that in it appears the germ of the cooper institute speech delivered five months later in new york city lincoln made so deep an impression in ohio by his speeches that the state republican committee asked permission to publish them together with the lincoln douglas debates as campaign documents in the presidential election of the next year in december he yielded to the persuasion of his kansas political friends and delivered five lectures in that state only fragments of which have been preserved unquestionably the most effective piece of work he did that winter was the address at cooper institute new york on february twenty seventh he had received an invitation in the fall of eighteen fifty nine to lecture at plymouth church brooklyn to his friends it was evident that he was greatly pleased by the compliment but that he feared that he was not equal to an eastern audience after some hesitation he accepted provided they would take a political speech if he could find time to get up no other when he reached new york he found that he was to speak there instead of brooklyn and felt that he was certain to have a distinguished audience fearful lest he was not as well prepared as he ought to be conscious too no doubt that he had a great opportunity before him he spent nearly all of the two days and a half before his lecture in revising his matter and in familiarizing himself with it in order that he might be sure that he was heard he arranged with his friend mason brayman who had come to new york with him to sit in the back of the hall and in case he did not speak loud enough to raise his high hat on a cane mr lincoln's audience was a notable one even for new york it included william cullen bryant who introduced him horace greeley david dudley field and many more well-known men of the day it is doubtful if there were any persons present even his best friends who expected that lincoln would do more than interest his hearers by his sound arguments many have confessed since that they feared his queer manner and quaint speeches would amuse people so much that they would fail to catch the weight of his logic but to the surprise of everybody lincoln impressed his audience from the start by his dignity and his seriousness his manner was to a new york audience a very strange one but it was captivating wrote an auditor he held the vast meeting spellbound and as one by one his oddly expressed but trenchant and convincing arguments confirmed the soundness of his political conclusions the house broke out in wild and prolonged enthusiasm i think i never saw an audience more thoroughly carried away by an orator the cooper union speech was founded on a sentence from one of douglas's ohio speeches our fathers when they framed the government under which we live understood this question just as well and even better than we do now douglas claimed that the fathers held that the constitution forbade the federal government controlling slavery in the territories 
lincoln with infinite care had investigated the opinions and votes of each of the fathers whom he took to be the thirty-nine men who signed the constitution and showed conclusively that a majority of them certainly understood that no proper division of local from federal authority nor any part of the constitution forbade the federal government to control slavery in the federal territories not only did he show this of the thirty-nine framers of the original constitution but he defied anybody to show that one of the seventy-six members of the congress which framed the amendments to the constitution ever held any such view let all he said who believe that our fathers who framed the government under which we live understood this question just as well and even better than we do now speak as they spoke and act as they acted upon it this is all republicans ask all republicans desire in relation to slavery as those fathers marked it so let it be again marked as an evil not to be extended but to be tolerated and protected only because of and so far as its actual presence among us makes that toleration and protection a necessity let all the guarantees those fathers gave it be not grudgingly but fully and fairly maintained for this republicans contend and with this so far as i know or believe they will be content one after another he took up and replied to the charges the south was making against the north at the moment sectionalism radicalism giving undue prominence to the slave question stirring up insurrection among slaves refusing to allow constitutional rights and to each he had an unimpassioned answer impregnable with facts the discourse was ended with what lincoln felt to be a precise statement of the opinion of the question on both sides and of the duty of the republican party under the circumstances this portion of his address is one of the finest early examples of that simple and convincing style in which most of his later public documents were written if slavery is right he said all words acts laws and constitutions against it are themselves wrong and should be silenced and swept away if it is right we cannot justly object to its nationality its universality if it is wrong they cannot justly insist upon its extension its enlargement all they ask we could readily grant if we thought slavery right all we ask they could as readily grant if they thought it wrong their thinking it right and our thinking it wrong is the precise fact upon which depends the whole controversy thinking it right as they do they are not to blame for desiring its full recognition as being right but thinking it wrong as we do can we yield to them can we cast our votes with their view and against our own in view of our moral social and political responsibilities can we do this wrong as we think slavery is we can yet afford to let it alone where it is because that much is due to the necessity arising from its actual presence in the nation but can we while our votes will prevent it allow it to spread into the national territories and to overrun us here in these free states if our sense of duty forbids this then let us stand by our duty fearlessly and effectively let us be diverted by none of those sophistical contrivances wherewith we are so industriously plied and belabored contrivances such as groping for some middle ground between the right and the wrong vain is the search for a man who should be neither a living man nor a dead man such is the policy of don't care on a question about which all true men do care such as union appeals beseeching true union men to yield to disunionists reversing the divine rule and calling not the sinners but the righteous to repentance such as invocations to washington imploring men to unsay what washington said and undo what washington did neither let us be slandered from our duty by false accusations against us nor frightened from it by menaces of destruction to the government nor of dungeons to ourselves let us have faith that right makes might and in that faith let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it
from new york lincoln went to new hampshire to visit his son robert then at phillips exeter academy his coming was known only a short time before he arrived and hurried arrangements were made for him to speak at concord manchester exeter and dover at concord the address was made in the afternoon on only a few hours notice nevertheless he had a great audience so eager were men at the time to hear anybody who had serious arguments on the slavery question something of the impression lincoln made in new hampshire may be gathered from the following article mr lincoln in new hampshire which appeared in the boston atlas and bee for march fifth the concord statesman says that notwithstanding the rain of thursday rendering travelling very inconvenient the largest hall in that city was crowded to hear mr lincoln the editor says it was one of the most powerful logical and compacted speeches to which ever it was our fortune to listen an argument against the system of slavery and in defense of the position of the republican party from the deductions of which no reasonable man could possibly escape he fortified every position assumed by proofs which it is impossible to gainsay and while his speech was at intervals enlivened by remarks which elicited applause at the expense of the democratic party there was nevertheless not a single word which tended to impair the dignity of the speaker or weaken the force of the great truths he uttered the statesman adds that the address was perfect and was closed by a peroration which brought his audience to their feet we are not extravagant in the remark that a political speech of greater power has rarely if ever been uttered in the capital of new hampshire at its conclusion nine roof-raising cheers were given three for the speaker three for the republicans of illinois and three for the republicans of new hampshire on the same evening mr lincoln spoke at manchester to an immense gathering in smith's hall the mirror a neutral paper gives the following enthusiastic notice of his speech the audience was a flattering one to the reputation of the speaker it was composed of persons of all sorts of political notions earnest to hear one whose fame was so great and we think most of them went away thinking better of him than they anticipated they should he spoke an hour and a half with great fairness great apparent candor and with wonderful interest he did not abuse the south the administration or the democrats or indulge in any personalities with the solitary exception of a few hits at douglas's notions he is far from prepossessing in personal appearance and his voice is disagreeable and yet he wins your attention and good will from the start he indulges in no flowers of rhetoric no eloquent passages he is not a wit a humorist or a clown yet so great a vein of pleasantry and good nature pervades what he says gliding over a deep current of practical argument he keeps his hearers in a smiling good mood with their mouths open ready to swallow all he says his sense of the ludicrous is very keen and an exhibition of that is the clincher of all his arguments not the ludicrous acts of persons but ludicrous ideas hence he is never offensive and steals away willingly into his train of belief persons who are opposed to him from the first half hour his opponents would agree with every word he uttered and from that point he began to lead them off little by little cunningly till it seemed as if he had got them all into his fold he displays more shrewdness more knowledge of the masses of mankind than any public speaker we have heard since long jim wilson left for california from new hampshire lincoln went to connecticut where on march fifth he spoke at hartford on march sixth at new haven on march eighth at woonsocket on march ninth at norwich there are no reports of the new hampshire speeches but two of the connecticut speeches were published in part and one in full their effect was very similar according to the newspapers of the day to that in new hampshire described by the atlas and bee by his debates with douglas and the speeches in ohio kansas new york and new england lincoln had become a national figure in the minds of all the political leaders of the country and of the thinking men of the north never in the history of the united states had a man become prominent in a more logical and intelligent way 
at the beginning of the struggle between the repeal of the missouri compromise in eighteen fifty four abraham lincoln was scarcely known outside of his own state even most of the men whom he had met in his brief term in congress had forgotten him yet in four years he had become one of the central figures of his party and now by worsting the greatest orator and politician of his time he had drawn the eyes of the nation to him it had been a long road he had travelled to make himself a national figure twenty-eight years before he had deliberately entered politics he had been beaten but had persisted he had succeeded and failed he had abandoned the struggle and returned to his profession his outraged sense of justice had driven him back and for six years he had travelled up and down illinois trying to prove to men that slavery extension was wrong it was by no one speech by no one argument that he had wrought every day his ceaseless study and pondering gave him new matter and every speech he made was fresh he could not repeat an old speech he said because the subject enlarged and widened so in his mind as he went on that it was easier to make a new one than an old one he had never yielded in his campaign to tricks of oratory never played on emotions he had been so strong in his convictions of the right of his case that his speeches had been arguments pure and simple their elegance was that of a demonstration in euclid they persuaded because they proved he had never for a moment counted personal ambition before the cause to ensure an ardent opponent of the kansas nebraska bill in the united states senate he had at one time given up his chance for the senatorship to show the fallacy of douglas's argument he had asked a question which his party pleaded with him to pass by assuring him that it would lose him the election in every step of this six years he had been disinterested calm unyielding and courageous he knew he was right and could afford to wait the result is not doubtful he told his friends we shall not fail if we stand firm we shall not fail wise counsels may accelerate or mistakes delay it but sooner or later the victory is sure to come the country amazed at the rare moral and intellectual character of lincoln began to ask questions about him and then his history came out a pioneer home little schooling few books hard labor at all the many trades of the frontiersman a profession mastered a nights by the light of a friendly cooper's fire an early entry into politics and law and then twenty-five years of incessant poverty and struggle the homely story gave a touch of mystery to the figure which loomed so large men felt a sudden reverence for a mind and heart developed to those noble proportions in so unfriendly a habitat they turned instinctively to one so familiar with strife for help in solving the desperate problem with which the nation had grappled and thus it was that at fifty years of age lincoln became a national figure End of section 19. Section 20 of The Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19. Lincoln's Nomination in 1860, Part 1. The possibility of Abraham Lincoln becoming the presidential candidate of the Republican Party in 1860 was probably first discussed by a few of his friends in 1856. The dramatic speech which, in May of that year, gave him the leadership of his party in Illinois, and the unexpected and flattering attention he received a few weeks later at the Republican National Convention suggested the idea but there is no evidence that anything more was excited than a little speculation the impression lincoln made two years later in the lincoln and douglas debates kindled a different feeling it convinced a number of astute illinois politicians that judicious effort would make lincoln strong enough to justify the presentation of his name as a candidate in eighteen sixty on the ground of pure availability one of the first men to conceive this idea was jesse w fell a local politician of bloomington illinois during the lincoln and douglas debates fell was traveling in the middle and eastern states 
he was surprised to find that lincoln's speeches attracted general attention that many papers copied liberally from them and that on all sides men plied him with questions about the career and personality of the new man before fell left the east he had made up his mind that lincoln must be pushed by his own state as its presidential candidate one evening soon after returning home he met lincoln in bloomington where the latter was attending court and drew him into a deserted law office for a confidential talk i have been east lincoln said he as far as boston and up into new hampshire travelling in all the new england states save maine in new york new jersey pennsylvania ohio michigan and indiana and everywhere i hear you talked about very frequently i have been asked who is this man lincoln of your state now canvassing in opposition to senator douglas being as you know an ardent republican and your friend i usually told them we had in illinois two giants instead of one that douglas was the little one as they all knew but that you were the big one which they didn't all know but seriously lincoln judge douglas being so widely known you are getting a national reputation through him and the truth is i have a decided impression that if your popular history and efforts on the slavery question can be sufficiently brought before the people you can be made a formidable if not a successful candidate for the presidency what's the use of talking of me for the presidency was lincoln's reply whilst we have such men as seward chase and others who are so much better known to the people and whose names are so intimately associated with the principles of the republican party everybody knows them nobody scarcely outside of illinois knows me besides is it not as a matter of justice due to such men who have carried this movement forward to its present status in spite of fearful opposition personal abuse and hard names i really think so fell continued his persuasions and finally requested lincoln to furnish him a sketch of his life which could be put out in the east the suggestion grated on lincoln's sensibilities he had no chance why force himself fell he said rising and wrapping his old gray shawl around his tall figure i admit that i am ambitious and would like to be president i am not insensible to the compliment you pay me and the interest you manifest in the matter but there is no such good luck in store for me as the presidency of these united states besides there is nothing in my early history that would interest you or anybody else and as judge davis says it won't pay good night and he disappeared into the darkness lincoln's defeat in november eighteen fifty eight in the contest for the united states senatorship in no way discouraged his friends a few days after the november election when it was known that douglas had been re-elected senator the chicago democrat then edited by long john wentworth printed an editorial nearly a column in length headed abraham lincoln his work in the campaign then just closed was reviewed and commended in the highest terms his speeches the democrat declared will be recognized for a long time to come as the standard authorities upon those topics which overshadow all others in the political world of our day and our children will read them and appreciate the great truths which they so forcibly inculcate with even a higher appreciation of their worth than their fathers possessed while listening to them we for our part said the democrat further consider that it would be but a partial appreciation of his services to our noble cause that our next state republican convention should nominate him for governor as unanimously and enthusiastically as it did for senator with such a leader and with our just cause we would sweep the state from end to end with a triumph so complete and perfect that there would be scarce enough of the scattered and demoralized forces of the enemy left to tell the story of its defeat and this state should also present his name to the national republican convention first for president and next for vice-president we should then say to the united states at large that in our opinion the great man of illinois is abraham lincoln and none other than abraham lincoln all through the year eighteen fifty nine a few men in illinois worked 
quietly but persistently to awaken a demand throughout the state for lincoln's nomination the greater number of these were lawyers on lincoln's circuit his lifelong friends men like judge davis leonard sweat and judge logan who not only believed in him but loved him and whose efforts were doubly effective because of their affection in addition to these were a few shrewd politicians who saw in lincoln the available man the situation demanded and a group represented by john m palmer who remembering lincoln's magnanimity in throwing his influence to trumbell in eighteen fifty four in order to send a sound anti-nebraska man to the united states senate wanted as senator palmer himself put it to pay lincoln back then there were a few young men who had been won by lincoln in the debates with douglas and who threw youthful enthusiasm and conviction into their support the first time his name was suggested as a candidate in the newspapers indeed was because the young editor of the central illinois gazette mr w o stoddard had caught a glimpse of lincoln's inner might and concluding in a sudden burst of boyish exultation that lincoln was the greatest man he had ever seen or heard of had rushed off and written an editorial nominating him for the presidency this editorial was published on may fourth eighteen fifty nine the work which these men did at this time cannot be traced with any definiteness it consisted mainly in talking up their candidate they were greatly aided by the newspapers the press indeed followed a concerted plan that had been carefully laid out by the republican state committee in the office of the chicago tribune to give an appearance of spontaneity to the newspaper canvas it was arranged that the country papers should first take up lincoln's name joseph medill editor of the tribune and secretary of the committee says that a rock island paper opened the campaign lincoln soon felt the force of this effort in his behalf letters came to him from unexpected quarters offering aid everywhere he went on the circuit men sought him to discuss the situation in the face of an undoubted movement for him he quailed the interest was local could it ever be more above all had he the qualifications for president of the united states he asked himself these questions as he pondered a reply to an editor who had suggested announcing his name and he wrote i must in all candor say i do not think myself fit for the presidency this was in april eighteen fifty nine in the july following he still declared himself unfit even in the following november he had little hope of nomination for my single self he wrote to a correspondent who had suggested the putting of his name on the ticket i have enlisted for the permanent success of the republican cause and for this object i shall labor faithfully in the ranks unless as i think not probable the judgment of the party shall assign me a different position the last weeks of eighteen fifty nine and the first of eighteen sixty convinced lincoln however that fit or not he was in the field fell who as corresponding secretary of the republican state central committee had been traveling constantly in the interests of the organization brought him such proof that his candidacy was generally approved of that in december eighteen fifty nine he consented to write the little sketch of his life now known as lincoln's autobiography he wrote it with a little inward shrinking a half shame that it was so meagre there is not much of it he apologized in sending the document for the reason i suppose that there is not much of me if anything be made out of it i wish it to be modest and not to go beyond the material by the opening of eighteen sixty lincoln had concluded that though he might not be a very promising candidate at all events he was now in so deep that he must have the approval of his own state and he began to work in earnest for that i am not in a position where it would hurt much for me not to be nominated on the national ticket he wrote to norman b judd but i am where it would hurt some for me to not get the illinois delegates can you help me a little in your end of the vineyard the plans of the lincoln men were well matured about the first of december eighteen fifty nine medill had gone to washington ostensibly as a tribune correspondent but really to promote lincoln's nomination 
before writing any lincoln letters for the tribune says mr medill in his reminiscences i began preaching lincoln among the congressmen i urged him chiefly upon the ground of availability in the close and doubtful states with what seemed like reasonable success february sixteenth eighteen sixty the tribune came out editorially for lincoln and medill followed a few days later with a ringing letter from washington naming lincoln as a candidate on whom both conservative and radical sentiment could unite and declaring that he now heard lincoln's name mentioned for president in washington ten times as often as it was one month ago about the time when medill was writing thus norman b judd as a member of the republican national committee was executing a maneuver the importance of which no one realized but the illinois politicians this was securing the convention for chicago as the spring passed and the counties of illinois held their conventions lincoln found that save in the north where seward was strong he was unanimously recommended as the candidate at chicago when the state convention met at decatur may ninth and tenth he received an ovation of so picturesque and unique a character that it colored all the rest of the campaign the delegates were in session when lincoln came in as a spectator and was invited to a seat on the platform soon after richard oglesby one of lincoln's ardent supporters asked that an old democrat of macon county be allowed to offer a contribution to the convention the offer was accepted and a curious banner was borne up the hall the standard was made of two weather-worn fence rails decorated with flags and streamers and bearing the inscription abraham lincoln the rail candidate for president in eighteen sixty two rails from a lot of three thousand made in eighteen thirty by thomas hanks and abe lincoln whose father was the first pioneer of macon county a storm of applause greeted the banner followed by cries of lincoln lincoln rising lincoln said pointing to the banner i suppose i am expected to reply to that i cannot say whether i made those rails or not but i am quite sure i have made a great many just as good the speech was warmly applauded and one delegate an influential german and an ardent seward man george schneider after witnessing the demonstration turned to his neighbor and said seward has lost the illinois delegation he was right for when later john m palmer brought forth a resolution that abraham lincoln is the choice of the republican party of illinois for the presidency and the delegates from this state are instructed to use all honorable means to secure his nomination by the chicago convention and to vote as a unit for him it was enthusiastically adopted while the politicians of illinois were thus preparing for the campaign the republicans of the east hardly realized that lincoln was or could be made a possibility in the first four months of eighteen sixty his name was almost unmentioned as a presidential candidate in the public prints of the east in a list of twenty-one prominent candidates for the presidency in eighteen sixty prepared by d w bartlett and published in new york towards the end of eighteen fifty nine lincoln's name is not mentioned nor does it appear in a list of thirty-four of our living representative men prepared for presidential purposes by john savage and published in philadelphia in eighteen sixty the most important notice at this period of which we know was a casual mention in an editorial in the new york evening post february fifteenth the post considered it time for the republicans to speak out about the nominee at the coming convention and remarked with such men as seward and chase banks and lincoln and others in plenty let us have two republican representative men to vote for this was ten days before the cooper union speech and the new england tour which undoubtedly did much to recommend lincoln as a logical and statesmanlike thinker and debater though there is no evidence that it created him a presidential following in the east save perhaps in new hampshire indeed it was scarcely to be expected that prudent and conservative men would conclude that because he could make a good speech he would make a good president they knew him to be comparatively untrained in public life and comparatively untrained in large affairs 
they naturally preferred a man who had a record for executive statesmanship up to the opening of the convention in may there was in fact no specially prominent mention of lincoln by the eastern press greeley intent on undermining seward though as yet nobody perceived him to be so printed in the new york weekly tribune the paper which went to the country at large correspondence favoring the nomination of bates and reed mclean and bell cameron fremont dayton chase wade but not lincoln the new york herald of may first in discussing editorially the nominee of the black republicans recognized four living two dead aspirants the living were seward banks chase and cameron the dead bates and mclean may tenth the independent in an editorial on the nomination at chicago said give us a man known to be true upon the only question that enters into the canvas a seward a chase a wade a sumner a fessenden a banks but it did not mention lincoln his most conspicuous eastern recognition before the convention was in harper's weekly of may twelfth his face being included in a double page of portraits of eleven prominent candidates for the republican presidential nomination at chicago brief biographical sketches appeared in the same number the last and the shortest of them being of lincoln it was on may sixteenth that the republican convention of eighteen sixty formally opened at chicago but for days before the city was in a tumult of expectation and preparation the audacity of inviting a national convention to meet there in the condition in which chicago chanced to be at that time was purely chicagoan no other city would have risked it in ten years chicago had nearly quadrupled its population and it was believed that the feat would be repeated in the coming decade in the first flush of youthful energy and ambition the town had undertaken the colossal task of raising itself bodily out of the grassy marsh where it had been originally placed to a level of twelve feet above lake michigan and of putting underneath a good solid foundation when the invitation to the convention was extended half the buildings in chicago were on stilts some of the streets had been raised to the new grade others still lay in the mud half the sidewalks were poised high on piles and half were still down on a level with the lake a city with a conventional sense of decorum would not have cared to be seen in this demoralized condition but chicago perhaps conceived that it would but prove her courage and confidence to show the country what she was doing and so she had the convention come but it was not the convention alone which came besides the delegates the professional politicians the newspaper men and the friends of the several candidates there came a motley crowd of men hired to march and cheer for particular candidates a kind of out-of-door clack which did not wait for a point to be made in favor of its man but went off in rounds of applause at the mere mention of his name new york brought the greatest number of these professional applauders the leader of them being a notorious prize-fighter and street politician a sort of white blackbird says bromley one tom higher with the new york delegation which numbered all told fully two thousand seward men came dodworth's band one of the celebrated musical organizations of that day while new york sent the largest number pennsylvania was not far behind there being about one thousand five hundred persons present from that state from new england long as was the distance there were many trains of excursionists the new england delegation took gilmore's band with it and from boston to chicago stirred up every community in which it stopped with music and speeches several days before the convention opened fully one half of the members of the united states house of representatives were in the city to still further increase the throng were hundreds of merely curious spectators whom the flattering inducements of the fifteen railroads centering in chicago at that time had tempted to take a trip there were fully forty thousand strangers in the city during the sitting of the convention the streets for a week were the forum of this multitude processions for seward for cameron for chase for lincoln marched and countermarched 
brave with banners and transparencies and noisy with country bands and hissing rockets every street corner became a rostrum where impromptu harangues for any of a dozen candidates might be happened upon in this hurly-burly two figures were particularly prominent tom hyer who managed the open-air sewer demonstration and horace greeley who was conducting independently his campaign against seward greeley in his fervor talked incessantly it was only necessary for some one to say in a rough but friendly way there's old greeley and all within hearing distance grouped about him not infrequently the two or three to whom he began speaking increased until that which had started as a conversation ended as a speech in this half spontaneous half organized demonstration of the streets lincoln's followers were conspicuous state pride made chicago feel that she must stand by her own lincoln banners floated across every street and buildings and omnibuses were decorated with lincoln emblems when the illinois delegation saw that new york and pennsylvania had brought in so many outsiders to create enthusiasm for their respective candidates they began to call in supporters from the neighboring localities leonard sweat says that they succeeded in getting together fully ten thousand men from illinois and indiana ready to march shout or fight for lincoln as the case required not only was the city full of people days before the convention began but the delegations had organized and actual work was in progress every device conceivable by an ingenious opposition was resorted to in order to weaken seward the most formidable of the candidates the night before the opening of the convention a great mass meeting was held in the wigwam the seward men had arranged to have only advocates of their own candidates speak but the clever opposition detected the game and william d kelly of pennsylvania who was for lincoln or for wade got the floor and held it until nearly midnight doggedly talking against time until an audience of twelve thousand had dwindled to less than one thousand one of the first of the delegations to begin activities was that of illinois the tremont house had been chosen as its headquarters and here were gathered almost all the influential friends lincoln had in the state they came determined to win if human effort could compass it and men never put more intense and persistent energy into a cause judge davis was naturally the head of the body but judge logan leonard sweat john m palmer richard oglesby n b judd jesse w fell and a score more were with him we worked like nailers governor oglesby often declared in after years the effort for lincoln had to begin in the illinois delegation itself in spite of the rail episode at decatur the state convention was by no means unanimous for lincoln our delegation was instructed for him wrote leonard sweat to josiah drummond but of the twenty-two votes in it by uncautiously selecting the men there were eight who would have gladly gone for seward the reason of this is in this fact the northern counties of this state are more overwhelmingly republican than any other portion of the continent i could pick twenty-five contiguous counties giving larger republican majorities than any other adjacent counties in any state the result is many people there are for seward and such men had crept upon the delegation they intended in good faith to go for lincoln but talked despondingly and really wanted and expected finally to vote as i have indicated we had also in the north and about chicago a class of men who always want to turn up on the winning side and who would do no work although their feelings were really for us for fear it would be the losing element and would place them out of favor with the incoming power these men were dead weights the center and south with many individual exceptions to the classes i have named were warmly for lincoln whether he won or lost the lawyers of our circuit went there determined to leave no stone unturned and really they aided by some of our state officers and a half dozen men from various portions of the state were the only tireless sleepless unwavering and ever vigilant friends he had End of section twenty